19th session of the April 9th, 2019 meeting of the city council. In this part of the meeting, the council re will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the council members will move to the courtyard conference room for closed session. I would like to now ask our, our clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown is currently absent. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to speak to any items listed on closed session? And seeing absolutely no one here, I'm gonna assume no. <laughs> um, so at this moment, we'll adjourn the meeting to our courtyard conference room where our council will now go into its closed session unless we have our city attorney having. A yes, meeting. I have an announcement. I sent the council a message on Sunday um, alerting you to an amicus opportunity in a case entitled State of Oregon et al. versus Azar, um, and another case entitled Essential Access Health Inc. v. Azar. This is a legal challenge to a new, to a new Title X family planning program that would shift tens of millions of dollars from Planned Parenthood toward faith-based clinics. The reason I'm requesting that you add this as a subsequent need item is that it came to my attention after the agenda was prepared and um, there's a need to take action by noon today. Okay. So, so moved. Okay. <laughs> um, second, the motion by Council McCrone, seconded by myself to add this as a closed session agenda item to today's agenda. Thank you, uh, City Attorney Kondardi. Do you need a vote? Oh, forgive me. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously with Councilmember Brown not present. Okay, does that conclude your updates? We'll go ahead and adjourn this time. to welcome you to our 12.30, now 12.40 p.m. session of the April 9th, 2019 meeting of the City Council. And I would like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Crone is absent. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown is absent. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Is absent. And Ma Mayor Watkins? Here. If you could please, um, uh, clerk, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance.
So this is our opportunity to have um, introduction of new employees. If I could please ask our uh, water conservation manager, Toby Goddard, to come on up and introduce his new employee. Welcome. Hello, Toby. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council Members, uh, Toby Goddard, Water Department. I'm really pleased to introduce Margaret Haddon, who is our newest water conservation representative, but she goes by Maggie, so please call her Maggie. Maggie comes to us from Laverne, which is in the San Gabriel Valley uh, in, in Los Angeles County, but she came up here to go to the University of California and graduated in two th 2018 from UCSC with a bachelor's in environmental studies and a minor in education. And she has worked in the UCSC Sustainability Office. She's also interned at the Monterey Bay Sanct National Marine Sanctuary Exploration Center on various youth education programs. Um, she came to us last year as a temp. We declared a water shortage alert last year and she was helping us with field enforcement of water restrictions. So she first worked with us as a temp and now she's a regular employee with the water department. She will be responsible for outreach and education, both in the office and at events and online with water waste enforcement resolution, a uh, number of uh, appliance and uh, plumbing fixture rebates and our retrofit ordinance, uh, helping us roll out rain barrels and a new home water use report as well as other special projects. I should also note that she's attained already a uh, certification as a water use efficiency practitioner with the California Nevada section of the America Water Works Association. And in doing so will help us in the water department achieve our mission of providing a safe, adequate and reliable water supply for the nearly 100,000 people that we serve from Santa Cruz to Capitola. So in her personal life, she does knitting, crocheting, goes to the beach, and plays piano. So please help me welcome Maggie to the water department. Thank you, Toby. Thank you. Welcome, Maggie. So at this time, I'd like to invite up Mark Zettel, our Director of Public Works, to introduce his new employee. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Eli McManus. Um, he's our new solid waste worker. Um, Eli was born in Santa Cruz. And he spent seven years in Kauai growing up and then returned and graduated from Santa Cruz High. Currently lives uh, in the county in, uh, off of 41st Avenue. Uh, he has a, a fiance and a newborn son, four months old. So that keeps him pretty busy when he's not at work. Um, work experience, he worked for First Alarm for two years and another two years in the hotel business. He worked at um, Best Western on Ocean Street for two years. Uh, graduated from Santa Cruz High and became a certified uh, general mechanic. And when he's not working and spending time with his fiance and son, he likes fishing for rock cod off his kayak and drawing comics. So please join me in welcoming Eli. Welcome, Eli. And um, last but certainly not least, we have our chief of police uh, introducing his new employee and or or any. <laughs> Please come up and, and welcome. Thank you. Well, Mayor, Council, Deputy Chief of Police, Dan Flippo. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce two of our uh, newest uh, employees that uh, work for our records unit. Um, I'll start with Brianna Cash first. Uh, so Brianna uh, is our, our newest employee, just most recently hired. Uh, she was born and raised in a small town in Iowa. Uh, she went to college twice. Uh, she graduated uh, Graceland University um, with a BA in psychology and then went back to, uh, to college at Simpson College and graduated with a BA in French in secondary education. She had hopes of uh, being a teacher and then uh, in about 2012, her husband, uh, Alex, and then moved uh, to the Bay Area. Uh, he got a job in the Bay, Bay Area and she uh, came out here. Um, 
at that point, she really excelled in some uh, <coughs> office administrative skills. Uh, she worked for a place called Reliance Metal Center in Union City. Uh, and she was the ISO administrator and then managed all the company's quality systems. Uh, and so a lot of that administrative uh, work and duties is really gonna pay well for our team at the records, uh, in the records unit. She is, uh, has been married for seven years. Uh, she's really enjoying being closer to the Redwoods, the beaches and the coastal communities that we have here in the Santa Cruz area. Uh, she likes spending uh, time with her dog, which is a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel named Luna. Uh, she enjoys playing the guitar. She reads uh, sci-fi and fantasy fiction and loves playing video games and board games. Uh, we are really excited to have her on the team. I will let you know, she was being recruited by the uh, UCSC for the records job up there. And I would wanna thank my team and for her for choosing our, I think the records family that we have, the team we have going really helped win her over and, and we're, we're glad to have her. So, <laughs> good, my records team. Good job All right. recruiting. <laughs> okay. All right, second, but not least, this is Andrew. He's kind of a newer employee. He's actually been here for almost three years. However, it was brought to my attention that we never ever introduced him. And so his team <laughs> pushed him to the forefront and said, we're doing this. And I am more than happy to. Uh, Andrew was born and raised in Gilroy. Uh, he attended San Jose State. He was a security manager for about five years over in San Jose. Uh, he wanted to work closer to home. He uh, currently lives in Aptos with his wife, Christy. Uh, so he uh, applied with us uh, for our records uh, position. He uh, st uh, started that, like I said, about three years ago. Uh, he has a 19-month-old uh, son, Tanner. Uh, so he, in his off time, he enjoys chasing his toddler all around the house. Uh, he does enjoy woodworking and uh, working around his house. He's also really uh, lately uh, gotten in some physical fitness activities, which is good for all of us. Um, I did ask him what he enjoys most about working at the PD, and he really said he uh, enjoys the family atmosphere of the department, and we enjoy having him as part of our family. So please join me in welcoming Andrew and Brianna. I just wanna say one thing. We, we, we haven't, for years, really introduced any of our police officers that have been hired, and I just wanna say that that's something we can work on. The challenge that we have is a lot of the hires that we're hiring are brand new train, trainees, they have to go to the academy, which is about six months, and then they're in about a four to five month in-house internal process that's all, uh, or training program that's all designated by state mandates. And so we really don't know if they're a full-time employee for about a year out, but I'd be more than happy to uh, you know, work on some way, because we, I, I, I wanna give you some numbers, I know this is an introduction, but real short, since 2018 and year to date 2019, we have hired 22 police officers, which is an incredible number. But before we start high-fiving, unfortunately, due to retirements, uh, people leaving the profession, uh, we've lost 21 in the same period. So for an immense amount of work, and I wanna uh, thank my staff for doing the recruiting and the hiring, uh, we're at plus one for now. So we're gonna keep, keep moving forward with that, but that's the, uh, so hopefully we'll have a whole slew of new officers to introduce and get, uh, get the community to know them. Uh, I also wanna take this opportunity, if you know good men and women that would like to work at the police department, please send them their way and I'd, I'd be more than happy to get them into the process. And, uh, and then on a side note, not to bum me out even further, but uh, the other struggle we have is right now we have 19 employees that are out on medical injury. So with the losses and the turnover, that's, that's kind of where we're working with our staff. But we'll keep at it and uh, we'll maintain positive. And like I said, we'll be uh, introducing more new employees here shortly. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deputy Chief, and welcome to the new employees um, and some of the ones that have been with us for a few years. It's nice to meet you. At this time, we will have a presentation, and I'd like to invite up Rachel Kaufman and Chris Reyes um, to talk about the clam chowder fundraiser. Here, you'll want to announce the removal of the first one. And I'd like to also announce that we um, will not be having a Clarity Arts presentation this afternoon. That has been removed from the agenda. Thank you for the reminder. Rachel. Hi, Mayor and Council. My name is Rachel Kaufman. I'm Recreation Superintendent with Parks and Recreation. 
I also am wearing two hats today because as I'm recreation superintendent now, I was recreation supervisor for special events and I oversaw the clam chowder cook-off. So I'm here for both reasons. And I'm also here with Chris Reyes from the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. And we just wanna highlight the success of this great collaboration of this event. We've been having the clam chowder cook-off for uh, 38 years now, and we uh, boast that it's the largest and longest running clam chowder cook-off in the country. So Santa Cruz, we have some pride in that. And um, so if Chris wants to come on up and we'll talk a little bit about this event. We've had such a success over the years that in 2017, we actually expanded the event to two days. And since doing that, um, the the response has just been outstanding. And you never know when you make a change to an event, you know, will this succeed? Will they come out on two days? We're not sure. Well, it surpassed our expectation. And now both days are extremely busy. Saturdays professional, um, I'm sorry, Saturdays amateurs compete, Sundays professionals compete, and we get the same amount of crowds, the Dream In is booked. It's just been a very successful partnership over the years. And so over the last three years that we have done the expansion, you know, we've averaged about $90,000 of fundraising that, that this event has brought in, which is a really large amount. And we really appreciate this collaboration. And I also just wanna highlight that each year we have about 80 teams compete and they come from um, all over Northern California, Sacramento, Stockton, San Jose. And this year with all of these teams coming from all over, we even have one from Idaho. Our very own um, Rosie McCann's downtown Santa Cruz won Best Boston this year in a blind judging. So it just shows that Santa Cruz has a lot of pride in clam chowder, a lot of talent, our culinary skills. And so it was fun to highlight that um, for this year. So I just wanna thank um, the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk and give Chris an opportunity to speak as well on this great collaboration. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Reyes from the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Just wanna say thank you to the Parks and Rec staff for their support and engagement on this event. Uh, as Rachel said, this has been 38 years, next year will be 39. Uh, really got started um, because the city had been doing a chili cook-off at Harvey West and was looking to do a clam chowder event, thought it would work, wanted to pair their expertise of running an event like that with our ability to promote and draw uh, people to Santa Cruz. And so it was born of that. And the first few years that we had it, it was actually in Neptune's Kingdom. We covered the golf course and did all the cooking in there and all the tasting and testing and judging in there. And as it got bigger, we expanded it. And while the faces have changed at the boardwalk and at Parks and Rec, the event continues to grow each year and it's been a big success. We're very proud and, and happy about the public-private partnership of this event and look forward to continuing it for many years to come, hopefully. And so we just wanted to uh, say thank you, particularly to the Parks and Rec staff and their team for all the energy and enthusiasm they bring to it because it's been a big success for us as well and something our guests and visitors to Santa Cruz really look forward to. So thank you to staff and to your team and thanks to the city for supporting this and we look forward to hopefully many more years of a successful collaboration. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. For thank you so much for the presentation and for the good work that goes to support our city. Um, so at this moment, I just would like to make a few announcements um, and then we'll move on to our regular agenda. So this afternoon, we will have overflow seating available in the Tony Hill room at the Civic Auditorium. Agenda item 15, which is homelessness and the gateway encampment and the four subsequent items related will begin at a time certain of 4 p.m. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and is streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. Hudson Sances is our technician for both this afternoon and evening sessions and I would like to thank him for his work. All city council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. If you would like to communicate with us about an agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This provides us with an opportunity to review your email and include it in the, with the rest of our agenda packet. 
Please do bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and the city council do constitute public records and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have sensitive or private information that you do not wish to be made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption. And I ask and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you're inside and outside of the council chambers. So at this time, I would like to ask if any of the council members have any statements of disqualification today. Okay. Seeing none. Are there um, any uh, additions or deletions to the agenda this afternoon? No. No? Okay. A brief announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. Oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. this evening. I'll look to our city attorney to provide a report on our closed session. City Attorney Kendall. Thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the City Council. City Council met at 1030 this morning in closed session. Prior to the closed session, the Council added as a subsequent need item a request for amicus support in the case of the State of Oregon versus, uh, State of Oregon et al. versus Azar. Um, that was a case filed in Oregon and California challenging new changes to the federal Title X family planning program that would shift tens of millions of dollars from Planned Parenthood toward faith-based clinics. Um, several cities, including New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, Baltimore, Columbus, Ohio, and Chicago are planning to file an amicus brief in support of the plaintiffs in that case um, today and by motion in closed session, the council unanimously authorized um, the city of Santa Cruz to join as an amicus in that matter. Secondly, um, item A on the closed session agenda this, uh, this morning was a conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, the case of Hatch Pomerantz versus the city of Santa Cruz et al. Um, discussion of that uh, item was deferred uh, until after the close of the evening session um, this evening. Secondly, the council met with its labor, negotiator, labor negotiators to uh, discuss uh, labor negotiations with respect to mid-managers, uh, operating engineers, local three, supervisors, uh, fire management, uh, police management, and the, the police officers ex association and executives council met with and gave direction, but there was no reportable action taken. Um, there was one item of considering initiation of litigation and two items of significant exposure to litigation. There was no reportable action on those items. Thank you, City Attorney Kandati. So first up is the consent agenda, and those are items three through 11 in our agenda packets. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to pull any items? Council Member Glover. Items nine and 10, please. Council Member Brown. Mm -hmm. I just have a question on five and six. Okay. Any other items to be pulled? Oh. Uh, I'll go and pull five and six. I'd like to hear more about it. Okay. okay. So at this time, we'll go ahead and um, see if there are any members of the public that would like to um, address the council, request an item be pulled, or speak to any item on our consent agenda, with the exception of items pulled by council members, which include item fit five, six, nine, and ten. Now would be the time to um, address the council for public comment. You'll have two minutes. Uh -huh. This is for item, any item on this consent agenda, items three through 11, ex with the exception of item five, six, nine, and 10, which you will have an opportunity to address any of those items separately. Preliminary. 
Okay, you'll have an opportunity, I believe, to speak to that item, which will be at 4 p.m. time certain this afternoon. That would be oral communications at 7 p.m. Okay. Oral communications is the time for members of the community to address the council on items that are not on the agenda at 7 p.m. That's right. Okay. So seeing um, no members of the public interested in speaking to items three and ele through 11 on our consent agenda, with the exception of item five, six, nine, and 10, um, we'll go ahead and return back to council for um, action and or deliberation. Mm -hmm. Council member. I'll move the consent agenda with the exceptions of five, six, nine, and 10. Second. So we have a motion by council member Matthews, second by uh, count, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Cummings. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, so the first item we have polled is item number five, which we'll go ahead and ask Councilmember Crone if he had any questions or Councilmember Brown if they wanted to. Councilmember Brown. Well, I have one question specific to five in relation to six, and then my other question relates to both. So um, we'll go ahead and five and take them all together or I'll start with five. So the, my question related to item five was the, um, so my calculation shows that we're looking at about a 13% of the total being requested here would go for design development. Um, and then, but which just seems high. And so I'm just wondering, that just seems high to me if, if we could get some kind of um, report on why those numbers are higher than a standard. Um, percentage for design in a, in a bid. Okay. And then the other question I have is related to both. Um, these were non-competitive bids. If we could hear just a little bit more about that. So the question is uh, for item five in regards to the, um, the amount. Do you feel uh, Susan, oh, Susan, Susan Emmett, sir, okay, from the Susan. library director. Okay. Hi, Susan Nimitz. I'm the director of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Um, thank you for having me up today. We're really excited about uh, the opportunity to move forward with both our Brantsa 40 and Garfield Park projects. Um, you know, with Measure S, there were funds set aside for all 10 libraries, and we are madly trying to um, work through the eight-year time limit on those funds and get all the projects done. I know it's unusual for us to request um, a non-bid structure to this, um, but what we've been doing is trying to develop some expertise as we through, uh, move through the projects across multiple jurisdictions so we can benefit from the strength of that. Um, David Tanza, who we're um, hoping to hire as our owner's rep for the city of Santa Cruz has um, done the project in Capitola. Um, he's also um, done in the past the project in Scotts Valley um, and has a great familiarity with um, both building public libraries and uh, projects in the Santa Cruz community. Um, in terms of Abe Jason, he's an architect from Boulder Creek and he has been hired on um, several projects in the community, uh, sorry, Boulder Creek. He's from um, Berkeley, sorry. Be nice if he was from Boulder Creek. Um, he's from Berkeley and he um, has also done public libraries, but he's helping us do designs for La Selva Beach, Boulder Creek, um, and the Live Oak original project. So we really do believe we can capture that expertise. We don't have to start all the way over and move forward with these two projects. Our hope is to break ground. You know, these are just remodel projects, Garfield Park, it will be a modest remodel because they have a decent infrastructure and are ADA compliant. Um, but Brands of 40 is a bigger, bigger remodel because the building's a lot older. We're hoping to have community meetings in May of this year. And um, we're looking at May 15th for um, Garfield Park and May 22nd for uh, Brands of 40 and um, we will send invites to you, but we have to get this passed first. Does that answer your question? The only other question was with respect to the design, the percentage uh, for the design contract being a little higher than what I understand is standard. Um, 
I think we got. David was arguing to me that it was lower considering the size of the projects and scopes of the project. And the smaller the project, te it tends to be higher design fees, is my understanding. Thank you, Susan. Does that answer the questions for council? Uh, it does, and I appreciate um, the library director being here, and also the um, knowing that when the community meetings are, that was a, a question that I had a, as, as well, and I'm happy to move the item when it's time. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there mem any member of the community who would like to address us on item number five on our consent agenda? Okay. Seeing none, we'll return back then for uh, council action. I believe, uh, Council Vercone, you uh, were moving yeah, item, number five? item number five. Okay. Second. So motion by Councilman Vercone, seconded by Councilman Brown. Further discussion, Councilman? Just I want to say how happy I am to see these two projects moving forward and um, bringing Measure S to our community. And I know there are representative friends of the library in the audience as well. So I want to thank them for being here. Awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, without further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. And I'm also ready to move six because she sort of combined her answers that, that questions I had. So did you get your questions answered as yes. well? Okay. So is there any member of the community who would like to address us on item number six of our consent agenda? Okay. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back to the council. So, so moved. motion by Councilmember Cohn, uh, second by Councilmember Brown. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That two passes unanimously. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move on to item number nine which I believe was pulled by Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Um, I just had a question for Director Dettel, and that was pertaining to the uh, process in which the decision was made for the replacement of the storm drain pipes. It looks like there were 5,600 linear feet of new six inch, 12 inch, and 18 inch sanitary sewage and storm drain pipes. Just curious, uh, has there been any exploration or conversation around the implementation of any energy generating pipes for our water and sewage systems like they've adopted in say Portland, for example? Um, I would, we've, we've looked at it occasionally at the wastewater treatment plant. It's probably the only place we've looked at because of the constant flow mm -hmm. towards the outfall where we would go out. Um, I don't know if the water departments looked at it in their distribution um, system. We definitely don't look at it in the sanitary sewer on uh, the collection system just because of obstructions and those type of things. So that would be the only location I think it would be potentially there. Um, when we last time we looked at it, it was about three years, th three years ago and the technology wasn't quite as reliable as we, as we would have liked. We're willing to look at it again, but at this, at that time it was not, not there at that point. So. Great, yeah, that was just, um, just wanted to know the, the timeline associated with that also, and if it's been something that we've already been looking at, if it's something we've never thought about before, or if it's something that we can continue to look at. So it sounds like y'all have already been kind of uh, looking at the possibilities of implementation, and what are, uh, when do you plan on potentially looking at it again? Do we have any more of these projects coming down the pipeline? Um, you know, the wastewater treatment plant is an energy, uh, it, energy known um, or re recognized for energy production. They product, produce a, about 70% of their power based on the methane um, presented at the plant. And then they also have solar panels to offset some of the, some of the electricity that's used. Um, they're constantly innovating. The first thing they did is they changed all their lights out to LEDs, which is the most cost effective way. And then they reduced their energy use. And then um, they've reduced all their motors um, trying to reduce the, the load. Um, they will change their um, procedures and practices based on the time of use for the energy charges. They're on that. So um, if anybody's gonna find the most efficient way to operate that plant, I, I have very confidence in them. Um, as far as this specific item, we'll have to look and see if, it, if the technology's changed um, in the last three years, and we were happy to look at it again. Okay, those are all my questions. Any further questions on this item from council? Okay. Any member of the community who would like to address the council on item number nine on our consent <coughs> agenda? Okay. Seeing none, we'll return back for action and deliberation. Council McGovern. Uh, I'll move to um, accept or adopt um, consent agenda number nine, um, just with the the statement that I'd love to see future storm drain and water pipe replacement uh, be cross-referenced and look at energy generating pipe technology if possible. Okay, 
We have a motion by Councilmember Glover. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Brown. Any further discussion? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously as well. Um, item number 10, which is the Santa Cruz Bike Share Contract Amendment, amendment and we have Claire here. <coughs> yeah, Claire Flaisley, Transportation Planner, just available for any questions you have. Hello. Um, so I was just curious, just looking at the contract as it exists right now, uh, in section 1B2A, it specifies around the reimbursement of electricity costs uh, that a, the vendor shall reimburse city for electrical costs resulting from the charging docks at the minimum rate of $5 per month per charging dock as of the month that the dock is installed and so on and so forth. The city may adjust the electric, uh, electricity reimbursement rate at the city's sole discretion with 30 days advance notice uh, from the vendor. So uh, just a question I have is, can you explain the $5 per month reimbursement rate that the city is receiving from Uber? And uh, is there a reason that it's a reimbursement instead of Uber purchasing the electricity from the city? We do not currently have any charging docks installed yet. This was in anticipation of installing charging docks, so it hasn't come into play yet. Um, it was set up as a reimbursement rate because it's based upon the ability to increase and decrease that number of docks that we have. So it's on a per space. We know that there's gonna be a minimum and it allows for that flexibility to say, you can retrofit other existing docks to become charging stations. And we have a framework on how to do that. And uh, just, do you know just in general the ridership that the JUMP program has per month? Yeah, we're, we have around 30,000 per month aggregated since um, May of last year when we launched. We've had over 250,000 rides. 250,000 rides, wow. Um, so that's really impressive. Uh, thank you for getting that set up here. Uh, just wondering with the fee rate that's associated with the jump bike program, which is a dollar for 10 minutes and so on and so forth, then they would just based off of those numbers, even if everyone was just riding for 10 minutes with 200,000 uh, rides, that's about $200,000 being generated by Uber based off of just these rough calculations. I know that they have 30 day uh, passes and all those other kinds of things, but just based off of that, what would, I mean, or maybe you would have a better idea, what would your estimate be of the total money generated by Uber since the start of the program? Um, I wouldn't be able to make a guess on that right now. Uh, they are also responsible for all program costs. So there's 10 full-time employees that they employ in the city of Santa Cruz. They rent a warehouse space in the Harvey West neighborhood. They purchase all the capital equipment, maintain all the capital equipment, et cetera. So there's the revenue and there's the expenditure side in terms of revenue because we have a couple different plans. We have a pay as you go, a monthly, a boost, low income. Um, and they've also done some promotional. I wouldn't be able to come up with a rough number for you. Totally, um, I appreciate that. And then just the last question, um, do you know of other cities that have agreement with the Uber jump bikes and that have money coming back to the city? Not that I know of. No, okay. Um, I just, the reason why I ask is it just, you know, especially with Uber and its background and how much money they're generating just worldwide as a corporation, it just seems strange to me that we're allowing them to operate a bike share program in Santa Cruz without seeing any revenue coming back towards the city. And especially when we have locally based uh, electric bike companies that we could be supporting and offering that money to support local business. So it's just something that continues to rub me in a weird way just with regards to the uh, support that we're giving to Uber and its political realities and all kinds of other stuff. So anyway, just bringing that up, uh, but I appreciate you answering those great questions. That's everything. Councilman Brown. Hi, um, thanks for being here. So I just have a quick question. I know we've talked about in the past and I'm trying to continue the conversation about accountability for users who are leaving jump bikes in obstructing roads, walkways, et cetera. Uh, I'd just like to hear any updates. We haven't had any report back on that. Um, yeah. So this might be a time to hear yeah, more. Yeah, sure. So standard operating procedure is that when the jump team goes out to retrieve bikes, either to bring them in for servicing or to bring them in for charging, if the bike is parked inappropriately, they report it for the previous user to be contacted. The previous user is then contacted by Jump, and if they repeat this behavior, then their account will be suspended. Since we um, started the program, there were a couple warnings in the very beginning as people were getting used to it, but we have suspended 120 user accounts. 
And part of that is that um, that is what the jump team does. The other part of it is that any individual can report improperly bikes, improperly parked bikes to jump as well by emailing support at jumpbikes.com with the bike number on the back and the time of day. Jump will then follow the same procedure and notify the previous user. Most of the time, people just need that one nudge to know not to be oblivious about what they're doing. Most people aren't intentionally thinking, I'm gonna ruin someone's day by parking this bike in the middle of the sidewalk. It's just that <clears throat> lots of times people don't think of people other than themselves. So with usually a gentle reminder, the behavior has changed and you know, the more people that are contacted, the better, and the more that we can also model good parking behavior, the better. The other thing that Jump's doing to um, proactively address it rather than reactively is they're working on a contract with Ecology Action right now to do uh, education and encouragement and training in Santa Cruz. They should be releasing a calendar of what those events are going to be next month to line up with May's Bike Month. So we're excited about that, having Ecology Action already have community ties and connections to the community and being able to delve deeper into that to, to partner with Jump on Education. Thank you. I just have one really quick related, it's, it's a follow up to that. Can I, can I, um, if there's any way that we can get a handle on the bike or no, the bikes that continue to be left on the Laurel Street Hill heading up towards Mission, it's not a location where I personally feel safe to pull over and look at the bike number, but it's a location that I have seen Jump Bikes in the bikeway on multiple occasions, um, and it just is a, a terrible place in addition to all the other obstructions. That one seems particularly a, a safety matter. I'll so. flag that for our ops team. Thank you. We have another question over here. I'm gonna do Council Member Crone since you haven't had a question, and then we'll return back to Council Member Thanks Crone. a lot. Um, I had a question for the uh, city attorney. We talked about uh, maybe uh, people sleeping on the sidewalk and blocking the right of way. Um, what can we do to um, enforce our right of way? Because this is, Conservatively, 12 people have, you know, a dozen folks have come forward, two in, 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 who are wheelchair bound, um, telling me that this is an issue. Yes, and, and um, both the state law and the, and the municipal code provide um, or, or prohibit obstructing public rights of way. And that has been discussed in the context of, of homeless uh, encampments. Um, the same rules would apply to the parking of jump bikes in a public right of way, and that is, um, in order for it to be a citable offense, it has to, it has to actually impede the flow of pedestrian or or wheelchair traffic uh, on the public right of way. So, in other words, if it's parked unobtrusively and there's a wide enough path of travel, then that would not constitute an obstruction. Would would our just our the folks who give parking tickets would they be giving tickets for obstruction, or would that be a, a police matter? How, what do I tell people? Can I, can I tell them to call somebody to, you know, if they want that person cited for continuing to block, you know, they, they leave in the same place all the time? Call the police department. Yeah. Um, oh, issue, issues about helmets, uh, a big issue. Um, I noticed, um, uh, Claire, I really appreciate you getting back to me on um, uh, the questions that I, I posed because they're all from various people who have who've, uh, written to me. Um, any statistics on riders under the age of 18, if they wear a helmet, can they be eligible to ride? We do not track this data. They are not eligible uh, to ride in, uh, under any circumstances if under 18. You cannot sign the user agreement if you are under 18. You are not eligible to ride if you're under 18. The education that we put out is if you are a parent, do not sign your child up for a jump account. If you are a parent and your child has a credit card, check their credit card statement. If you are a parent, do not give your child your jump account login. Can we um, maybe work with Ecology Action on this as well? I, I mean, I, 10 kids uh, under the age of 15 passed me all on jump bikes um, day before yesterday. That is one of the elements included, yes. It, it is, okay, and, and also the helmet issue. Um, it would be great to hear about other cities and how they're dealing with any lawsuits against the city uh, for either fatalities or severe injuries from not wearing a helmet. Do, do you keep up with that or is that? I don't, California Vehicle Code does not, it's not compulsory to wear a helmet if you are over the age of 18. We always recommend that you wear a helmet. Jump offers helmet discount programs. We're looking at some helmet giveaway programs coming up as well. Hopefully for the TDM program that we approved, we'll also be purchasing some helmets as incentives that we can give out. But more broadly, it, it's not compulsory per vehicle code. Are there any cities that you know that um, uh, have laws to that you know any over 18 has to 
wear a helmet as well? Not that I know of in the state of California. There's some research that is associated with mandatory helmet laws leading to lower bicycle ridership. Um, but for the most part, again, we encourage you to wear a helmet. We love your brain. Do try your best. Do you have another question? Yeah, um, I think we had spoken before whether, I think it was either in this meeting or somewhere else, but that there's the intention for the Uber jump bike program to expand both in Santa Cruz and then potentially in Watsonville. I want to clarify if that's true. So what's in front of you today is program expansion as part of contract amendment two. Right. Um, other local jurisdictions, UCSC Capitola and the county are all exploring the potential to expand as well which um, I'm really encouraged by because it would increase mobility options for people who live just outside city limits or in an easy bike ride to city limits to be able to use jump across jurisdictions. Great. Um, I am just uh, concerned with that and the length of time of these contracts that we as a city are setting the example for our fellow county members to break deals mm -hmm. with or enter into deals with Uber that is not seeing revenue coming back into the cities. So is it possible in these uh, contract negotiations or in the expansion to then request five cents per ride or something nominal, small, to be able to come back to the city so that we can see some form of positive revenue generation from the bike share program? That's not something in front of you today, but that is something that I can inquire about. It's not something that we negotiated in the preliminary contract or was offered in any of the RFP responses that we got from the seven separate firms that responded to our bike share RFPs. Is it, so in, I'll, in, so let me just clarify, in the seven RFPs that you received, or responses to the RFPs, I guess, none of them had any uh, revenue coming back to the city? Correct. And who, who are those bike programs? Oh, um, Social Bicycles, Zagster, B-Cycle, Buigan, Cycle Hop, Lattice, and one from Spain whose name is escaping me. Impressive off the top of the head. And are any of those local companies? Um, B-Cycle had partnered with a local bike shop, Epicenter Cycles, who was a Trek dealer. And even with our local preferences in bidding, they did not, um, they were not the first or second choice. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Claire. I'm glad that it was brought up in terms of the youth ridership because sometimes I too see youth or people doubled up and at one point I think I saw somebody tripled up on a jump bike. So it's nice to know that they're working on some education and outreach efforts. Um, and then also just really highlighting that, um, how it really is this great alignment between um, this effort with our climate action plan in terms of some of the rewards that we receive from um, those goals being met. So if there aren't any further questions from council, we'll go ahead and uh, open it up to the community for any questions and um, return for action. So this is item number uh, 10 on our consent agenda. Are there any members of the community who would like to address the council on this item? Okay, and you will be given uh, two minutes. Good afternoon, my name is Aldo Giacchino. Uh, I have two points. The first one is uh, concerns the um, the proposed amendment that is before you, it has an internal discrepancy that I would like to <coughs> you to focus on and put aside. And, and at the bottom of page eight, beginning of nine, in section 2.2.2, .2 it states that on launch date and thereafter, there shall be no less than 25 stations in the bike share program. Exhibit E, which is on page 21, Exhibit E, however, lists all the encroachment permits in all of the stations, and there is a list that numbers 23 sites. So the contract says there shall be a minimum of 25, no less than 25, and the list is only 23. I'm very concerned about this for the possibility that you approve a contract that does not have a complete list and somebody either at the staff level or at the Uber level sneaks in some additional locations. As you know, I and my neighbors who use West Cliff Drive have a lot of concerns about this program. It has been very successful, but it has, it has changed West Cliff Drive and sidewalk 
into a parking lot for these bicycles. And I'm concerned about having more stations that feed directly onto Westcliff Drive. Other stations elsewhere are perfectly fine. The program works well otherwise. But the, the bicycles blocking Westcliff Drive are a major problem. If you recall, we asked you to delete the bicycle station at Woodrow and Westcliff Drive. Uh, you took, took you. action your and postponed that. Your time is up. Time is up. Please, Thank you. Please delete Thank you. it. Okay. Any other member of the community who would like to address us on item number 10? Okay, you'll be given two minutes. Hello. Um, I had a chance to look at a couple of the towers at the rental stations, and the two that I looked at particularly don't say anything about under 18 not being allowed to ride. And it seems like that that should be on the towers because people, I do see them reading, and because it says nothing, they're left to believe it's fine. So I'd like to see that addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the community who would like to address this? Okay. Mayor, Council, my name's Clayton Markle. Um, oddly, this came up short notice for me. I'd actually written a letter to Council concerning not so much the program, but the parking specifically. I have the same concerns. I have a little bit of concern that we are putting yet another hub in when no one seems to use the thing. I live half a block from one. They've been abandoned in front of my house. I have the same questions. What is the city doing to try and get Uber and Jump to enforce their policies? They used to have language, you'd be charged a $25 fee. That's since been removed. They give you, when I call the station, I've called in, I don't know how many bicycles. I get the same spiel. There's been language problems. I had to call three times to get some bikes out. Day after that, more bikes parked there. The contract we have is the only leverage that the city has to get them to enforce this. They claim to, they claim to educate. I asked them today, no, we get them an email. Okay, it doesn't seem to be having much effect. I don't feel I should have to police the users of these bikes and this company to get them to comply with their own regulations. It's stated plainly. And I have concerns about city liability for when those doubled up teens, youth, on the way here, I saw two bikes, kids must've been 12 or 14, called in two bikes that were illegally parked just on Bay Street. Please review this contract before you decide to approve the expansion. Take a look at what we are, this is our only leverage. I'm asking you as a representative, I don't know how many people who can't make it today. Please look at that. Please get them to do a little more. Perhaps return that $25 fee. That they'll listen to. I walked home one night from a council meeting, almost tripped over a bike parked in the middle of the sidewalk. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to this issue. I would like to echo the words of the gentleman who spoke before me, as I have encountered these bikes left <coughs> abandoned in awkward situations, whether along the sidewalk of the, uh, going up the hill along the river, um, in our neighborhood. I, I do think that before going further with confirming any future contract, this example that you suggested, uh, Drew Glover, that the uh, bikes would provide some income for the city, could also provide, therefore, uh, for some independent youth rangers who would be circulating and, and participate in community and supporting safer electric bike riding, et cetera. I think the bike itself is a great idea. It can minimize traffic problems, but I've been cut off by them. I've had them zoom out in front of me out of the blue, not looking where they're going or using pedestrian walks. And so I think there's there are hazards involved as well as benefits. Just like to have you reflect on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other members of the community who would like to address us on item number 10 of our consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back. I'll be for, uh, I'd like to see if Claire, if you have any kind of response to the mm. sort of the question that was raised regarding the contract um, or any clarification you'd like to offer. Um, I'm guessing you might have some questions for Claire. I'll, I'll let you lead and then I'll follow. Yeah. Okay, Councilor Yeah. 
Um, so the three things that I heard, and maybe Councilmember Crone heard some other ones as well, was the $25 in park per parking fee, is that still something that's being enforced? As far as I know, that still stands. Okay, um, and uh, would you be able to confirm that for us? I can double check today. Okay, yeah. that would be great. Um, and then, uh, to your knowledge, is there posting of 18 and over language on the station towers? Um, I will go check as well. I, I believe there is, I might be wrong. It's in the user agreement as well. Uh, okay, um, and then uh, just could you speak to the incorrect listing of site locations per the gentleman's statement about the 25-23 discrepancy? Yeah, so the only ones listed in the encroachment permit are locations that required an encroachment permit, not all required an encroachment permit. So the 25 active stations could be the 23 that required encroachments and two that don't? Correct. Uh, should, is there a way that we could specify that so that we don't get forced through the contract into the establishment of encroachment permits in places where we weren't intending to do them? Similar to, I just don't want to end up like we are in the Verizon debacle where we're forced to give encroachment permits. C City Attorney Kandati, did you have a response to that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I don't read the contract as providing an opening for, um, for Uber or Jump to. Uh, install um, stations at other public rights of way without an encroachment permit. We would have a um, very uh, good tools at our disposal to prevent that from happening. So yeah, then I would uh, be, you know, what some things I'd love to see incorporated in the language then is to make sure that there is clear confirmation that there is a $25 improper parking fee that will be assessed on people after their first warning is issued to them. Uh, also to ensure that there is language uh, restricting the use of bikes to people over the age of 18 or 18 and over on all station towers, as well as uh, just language, I'm not sure with working with the city attorney or whether it's a moot point, but to make sure that those site locations and the discrepancies between the mandatory amount that need to be operational and the ones listed as the uh, permit areas are clearly defined as to what that is, means and how it can be implemented. Okay, sounds like those were all, um, okay, pretty consistent with uh, things that you were going to further explore is from my understanding, okay. Is there any other discussion, Councilman Brown? Well, just as a follow-up to Mr. Dacchino's uh, point, so we didn't, we don't see the Woodrow and Westcliff location here because I'm guessing it doesn't require an encroachment permit. That one has been suspended, but what is its disposition as of now? So you don't see that there because you did not grant it an encroachment permit. So it is removed from the list. And if at some future time we were to add another location in the right of way, another item would have to come before you as with today with adding Loudon Nelson when we have a resolution that's adding an additional site to the encroachment permit. Thank so you. yes, that absolutely would happen at any time. Vice Mayor. Given the fact that Uber has the technology to identify when a bike goes outside of the city limits, is there any way, or I would just ask if there's the possibility of exploring whether or not we can actually have designated parking spaces in town so that we can avoid having um, bikes left on sidewalks because it sounds like for members of the community this is a big issue and if they have the technology to be able to detect if a bike goes outside of city limits, my understanding would be they could probably have the technology designed to where they can identify certain parking spaces that are um, specific for the bikes in town. It's pretty close but not with, within the reliability of GPS, we couldn't get to like a um, specifically where a station location is. One of the benefits of dockless bike share and why we went with this model as opposed to a dock based bike share as you would think of city bike in New York or other heavy infrastructure bike share systems is that the flexibility is what leads us to having the high ridership numbers that we have. So there are benefits and trade offs. Um, the benefit is high ridership, incredible mobility for people, being able to get truly from door to door. The trade-off to that is that there are a lot of growing pains with teaching people how to park bikes appropriately um, and working through that to get to a place where people are 100% of the time parking appropriately. Um, if there was a desire to go to only a station-based model, I would uh, first, caution against that. I think it would it would harm the utility of the system. And second, I would say that we would likely need to double the number of station locations that we have uh, right now. And as you remember going through the siting process, that was not the easiest process. Um, it was rather difficult to find locations that were 
acceptable, that minimized impacts to um, parking in neighborhoods and that people found acceptable. And we, with the number of stations we have right now and the projected expansion in number of bikes, we would not be able to accommodate that projected number of bikes with the number of stations we have at this time. All right, so now would be the time for action and delivery. Okay. Um, if this contract amendment, if we put it off until our next meeting to get some answers to the questions that have been raised, um, how much would that affect <laughs> the contract? It would just slow down adding bikes to the streets. That's yeah, because I, I, there's too many, uh, too many people are coming forward, and I think that this is a great program. In fact, I rode around about ten miles the other day on a jump bike. Um, so I don't want to see this program negatively impacted or um, get people angry at it. Because right now we have a lot of people who are pro jump bike, and there's a growing number who are anti, who who probably albeit never ride the bike, but it's being um, put in there in the right of way so often that it seems to me we need to figure this out sooner than later, how we're gonna stop this? Because just on my way here, I saw three, you know, in the, in the public right of way. Um, I don't know if you have any suggestions or ideas short of not approving this and coming back to us, how we can work on the complaints, address the complaints we're hearing uh, from folks about bikes being left, because I want the program to work. So what I've heard so far are three things. The first is to double check and make sure that we are assessing a $25 fee for bikes that are parked inappropriately. The first time is a warning, the second time is a fee, and then subsequently it's a suspension. So that's, that's one tool. Um, and if we get more aggressive on that and even remove the warning, that could be another tool. Um, the second is Children under the age of 18 who should not be riding, and I will repeat, do not sign your child up for a bike membership. Um, so that's another thing, and addressing that through education, I think that will be covered through the partnership with Ecology Action, especially because Ecology Action has so many school-based programs and already has so many contacts with um, the school system and parents. Um, the other part to parking, I think will be covered both by assessment of fees, as well as the education component that's coming up. Um, additionally, Jump is going to be putting hang tags, similar to luggage tags, on every single one of the bikes. They're gonna be kind of annoying, because when you're riding around, they're gonna be flapping, but what it's gonna say is, here's how you park appropriately. Um, so the annoying is a, it's a feature, not a bug, um, to really alert people to that. So that'll be rolling out in May as part of May is Bike Month. May is a time that we're ha having our one year anniversary of rolling out the jump bike program. And I think those things that we're doing are gonna continue to move us in the right direction. And um, just, I heard that Portland gets 25 cents a ride. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but could you maybe get back to the council and investigate to see if there's cities that are, that are actually um, getting uh, a fee per, for each ride that takes place? I can check in and see. I believe that Portland is the, uh, bike town system, which has a Nike sponsorship and everything is branded Nike. That's explicitly what we took out of the contract today was any opportunity for outside sponsorships. So it's it's likely a different funding model than what we have, but I'm happy to look into that. I appreciate, okay. I appreciate that you, okay. you took that out too, okay. the branding model. Okay, Council Member Brown. Thank you for the three point uh, summary of the questions and concerns raised. I would just make sure that um, we've covered the question or response to the question of whether or not um, must be 18 and over to ride as a very clearly marked on the, the tower. Signage, yeah, yes. The signage, yeah. Yeah, I'll follow up on that today. Thank you. Matthews? We do have a motion before us now, don't we? We do not. We, oh, we well, I'm frankly prepared to go ahead and move um, the motion before us in both components because I think you have given us uh, clear indication that there is a consequence. Uh, there will be increased uh, education and uh, physical notification on the uh, parking issue, on the underage instructions, um, parking bikes on the sidewalks. Um, I agree with all of these concerns that others have mentioned. And I think there's been a steady uh, effort to uh, make improvements on those. And many of the issues raised, kids doubled up on bikes and not riding helmets, that happens on non-jump bike riders as well. We all know that and cutting in front of people and everything. Um, but personally, I, I think this is a great program. Um, it continues to improve. 
um, I would like to see it move forward and particularly the uh, location in front of Lab Nelson Center is great. That's a high demand area. So um, I'm uh, prepared to move the item uh, before us uh, requesting um, specific information on the issues that have been raised by council members here. I'll go ahead and second. Any further discussion? Councilor McCurr? Final question was, would be that, it, what would it take for our parking people to be able to site the jump bikes that are in the right of way? Is that, how would that happen? I don't know the answer to that, but I can follow up on that. I, I appreciate that, thanks. Councilor okay. Glover. I'm just doing a quick scan of the document for the, um, let me get the, the document that was provided with regards to the contract amendments and just doing a quick scan and word search under fee, there's nothing in there about the $25 fee assessment, but there is conversations about $1 ridership fee, $15 membership fee. So at this point, uh, I would not be ready to move forward on supporting the contract as it's written because it does not specify the $25 uh, in the language specifically. Uh, is there a reason why it's not in there? It's contained in the user agreement. So it's, but it's not in our contract? Correct, and it hasn't been. We didn't remove it. Is there a reason why it wasn't included in the contract? Just not something that we had, no. Didn't come up, covered in the user agreement. Thank you. Okay, all right. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Nay. That passes with Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, Myers, and myself in support, Councilmember Crone and Glover voting against. Thank you, Claire. Okay, that is going to conclude our consent agenda. We'll go ahead and move on to item number 12, which is, um, sorry, excuse me. A presentation by Mike Ferry, a senior planner on the, um, public hearing around uh, amendment to Title 24 uh, zoning ordinance around small guiding policy for small cell wireless telecommunications facilities. It's a very long title. <laughs> I'll let you further explain in your presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, the Planning Director, and just wanted to briefly provide a little bit of context on this. The Council's heard a number of wireless communications items recently and has provided direction to the staff to explore how we can maintain a maximum amount of local control over these applications. And at the same time, we have uh, federal and state requirements that um, we are attempting to comply with. And so the provisions before you today are an attempt to balance those two objectives of um, making sure that we're providing you with opportunities to comply with the, the federal and state requirements in relation to design guidelines and in relation to the shot clocks, which are the time that we take to process these applications. And so with that, I'll turn it over to our senior planner, Mike Ferry. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. <clears throat> um, Section 704 of the Telecommunication Reform Act of 1996 has this language. No state or local government may regulate the placement, construction, or modification of personal wireless service facilities on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with the FCC limitations. So in practice, what that means is when we get an application for one of these facilities, we require a California registered <coughs> electrical engineer to provide a report and at that point of the process, they have modeled the potential output of RF emissions from the facility, and it's based on the type of antenna that they use, the topography, the uh, nearby buildings, that sort of thing. And they estimate what the RF emissions would be. So at that point, we're in a design permit process in the planning uh, or in the zoning section of the uh, ordinance. Um, when we go into the actual building part of that and they construct it, we require each of those carriers to come back within 45 days of firing up their system and they physically go out and measure the RF emissions to confirm that they are close to or similar to what was modeled. And I think in 90, 
percent of the cases or 95 percent of the cases, all of these facilities that I've seen in the last 25 years have been less than one percent of what the federal government allows in terms of RF emissions. Um, in September of 2018, the uh, FCC adopted a declaratory ruling and third report in order in the matter of accelerating wireless broadband deployment by removing barriers to infrastructure. And so as the title kind of indicates, uh, they've basically tied our hands when it comes to deployment of these facilities. And we're restricted at this point to the aesthetics of what a facility can look like. In response to that, we came up with these design recommendations and guidelines that will become a, a policy approved by the city council. It won't be part of the ordinance, so it can be amended uh, rather simply versus an ordinance amendment. The design guidelines uh, address antenna preferences, equipment preferences, site location preferences, and height limitations. Um, they'll also, um, they're designed to comply with the FCC ruling. We did get a letter from uh, an attorney a couple days ago representing Verizon and um, that had, he had some concerns about the proposed uh, guidelines and we got a response back this morning that I hope you guys got a chance to read from the city attorney's office that basically says that uh, they feel pretty comfortable with the design guidelines as we've proposed them. Um, the final thing about those guidelines is part of that FCC ruling required that those be published and available to the carriers by April 15th of this year. So we kind of were on a very quick timeline to uh, get this to you. Uh, the Planning Commission reviewed uh, <coughs> both the zoning ordinance amendments and those guidelines on March 14th. At that hearing, we had 15 people that spoke with concerns about taking it out of the uh, zoning ordinance, the entitlement process. Um, most all of the concerns were based on the health effects of RF emissions. Uh, we did have one speaker that spoke in favor of the uh, project and was not concerned about the um, health effects. The, co the commission um, made a minor change to the uh, zoning ordinance amendments and that was just to um, clearly um, say that the uh, design of these new facilities that were going to occur in the right of way had to uh, follow the adopted standards and guideline policies for small cell facilities. So that was a zoning ordinance amendment. And then they amended a section in the design regulations that had a minimum five foot, uh, 500 foot separation in residential zone districts between the facilities. And the planning commission um, extended that to a 1500 foot separation. So that's in the design um, guidelines. So, Here's a quick uh, slideshow of all this recent legislation. So in September, the FCC adopted this new ruling. Um, it was published in October and it went into effect on January 13th of this year. And the primary um, impact that we have is it came along with the shot clock. And I'll talk about that in a second, the shot clock changes. So the new rulings, um, have new standards and limitations uh, for what we can ask for. Uh, the new deadlines, the shot clocks that I just mentioned, limits on the amount of fees and rents that a city can charge, new standards for aesthetic requirements. Um, basically, I think it boils down to you can't uh, require them to have more of an aesthetic treatment than other carriers. And then new standards for spacing and undergrounding. So the shot clock business is uh, almost shocking for us because we're used to the State Permit Streamlining Act limitations, which gives you quite a bit of time when you're working with somebody. Uh, these new shot clocks are uh, 60 days. You've got 60 days from when the application is submitted to when the city makes a determination. And that's for um, a carrier that puts a new facility on an existing utility pole, let's say. <coughs> it's a 90 day limitation if they're going to pull a utility pole out and replace it or put in a brand new utility pole with their facility on top. Currently, the way that um, we operate is that you've got to go through the uh, 
planning approval process first, the Title 24, the zoning ordinance, get those entitlements approved, and then you'd go to the Department of Public Works. Combined, it's taking approximately 180 to 270 days for these carriers to go through that process. And it's now going to be required to be a 60 or 90 day process. So um, we're pretty convinced that it's gonna be impossible to meet the shot clock deadlines. Um, what happens if you don't meet those deadlines is that the project is deemed approved. If we don't have the design standards published by the 15th, they can design anything that they want. And if we don't decide within the shot clock limitations, that application will be deemed approved. So what we're trying to do um, until about three weeks ago, we were going to present the new public works section 1538 of their code that's going to regulate these facilities. We wanted to show you that at the same time that the zoning ordinance amendments came to you but it got a little more complicated on the public works side. We're currently working with the city attorney, public works and planning staff to try to fine tune this new process that public works will have. Um, and basically today, what we're hoping is that we can get the design guidelines approved. We can either continue the zoning ordinance amendments that we've got until we're ready to come back with 1538, the public works ordinance that are going to take over the small cell development. Or you can approve both today and we can hold the second reading of the zoning ordinance amendments until the public works um, amendments come back to you for a second reading. And I know that's complicated, but that just cropped up like three weeks ago. I did get a, a I did mention the letter that I got from Paul Albritton and um, the city attorney's response. Other than that, I haven't had any um, phone calls from the members of the public. And I wanted to show you the rest of these pictures. I'm sorry, I spaced out. Um, so the aesthetic guidelines uh, need to be reasonable, non-discriminatory, objective, and published in advance. And again, that's by April 15th. And the purpose of this is to prevent um, installations that look like this. And these are pretty typical for the last uh, seven or eight years maybe. And I think this was all in the city of San Francisco. You've got an antenna that's out on an arm that comes off the utility pole. And then it's got the switching equipment, a PG&E meter. They're all painted different colors. They're rusting. There's wires hanging all over the place. Um, this is another example where they have outrigger arms coming off. Uh, the an panel antennas are directional. They're aimed up and down the street. And down below, you've got all of this switching equipment, a big PG&E meter. Uh, a lot of times when they do an installation like this, they'll leave coils of wire so that if they come back to remodel in the future, they'll have the wire right there available. and They'll have big coils just stored on the uh, poles. So all of our design uh, criteria that we've got in front of you today is aimed at having facilities that kind of come out cleaner looking. Um, to me, they're obviously still a cell site, but um, aesthetically they're a lot more pleasing than the previous pictures that we showed. <laughs> so that is the presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Are there any uh, questions from council members at this time? Councilman McCrum. Just thinking about um, reading the minutes from the last meeting, uh, and there's gonna be some research being done by the by May 14th. Um, does this, what's be in front of us, if it passes, does it have to come back to us again or no? The zoning ordinance amendments that we're proposing today would have to come back for a second reading. Would they be able to come back at May 14th when we get Absolutely. to oh, Okay, I just wanna make sure. And, and the whole notion, uh, and I, I, I would just, like to hear from folks talk about the aesthetics and uh, placement of equipment, that that's, I think, what the focus might be about, even though I'm extremely sympathetic to health issues, but if you could include something about uh, your thoughts on aesthetics and um, the placement of the equipment. Okay. Are there any questions from the council at this time? 
Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up to the public. I received a request for additional time on behalf of an organization, EMG Aware, and I believe um, Satya Orion is going to be representing or speaking on behalf of this organization. You've been granted additional time for three, up to three minutes. Please come ahead. Thank you, um, Mayor Watkins and City Council. Um, I, I think the ordinance is good, but there's a number of changes that I think are very important. First of all, I'm, I'm very concerned that the public process has been completely removed. Um, that it does not seem right that the only thing left to us will be appeal to the council, which would cost. And we can't afford to pay for appeals. So my suggestion as an alternative to that would be um, public hearings with the Planning Commission. Now I hear you talking about the shot clocks, but I've also seen some, some comments on that, that these are not legally binding, that they are suggestions, that they're procedural. Um, I think public process is extremely important and we can't be bullied by the telecoms. We have to have public process or we have to have the fees waived for appeal. We have to have the right of the public to speak. Um, another important uh, piece that I'd like to see added, which was from the Monterey ordinance. They have the wording that they use um, for denial of incomplete applications, which also helps with the shot clock, immediate denial. If any portion of a submitted application is incomplete or deemed unacceptable, the application will be denied without prejudice. The shot clock will be terminated and the application disqualified. The applicant may submit a new application with the necessary accompanying fees to restart the shot clock and, and the approval process. So I think we should consider adding that. Um, and also the thank you to the, the Planning Commission for the 1500 foot minimum spacing. I think that should be also amended to be in all zones, not just residential. Um, and, and for a verification of that Verizon Zone CEO, we have this on video, Lowell McAdam, he verified that 5G does not need to be line of sight and will easily travel 2,000 feet or more. So there's no reason why they need to be in any zone less than 1,500 feet. Um, I would also like there to be um, immediate, I didn't see the public notification in there, I'm sure it is, but immediate public notification of everyone within a 300 foot radius of proposed installations and imme also immediate posting on the city's website so people can know that these installations are going in. And just, to, just to go back to public process, I know there's something in there about an applicant sponsored public hearing. And you know, while this is great for letting people know what's going on, it's not valuable public process. Thank you. It's propaganda. Thank you. All right, so this is for item number 12. For any member of the community who would like to address the council on this item, you'll have up to two minutes to speak. Hi, my name is Sylvia Skefich. I'm a doctor of chiropractic. I live within the city limits on Cayuga Street. And I've been here many times before and given um, comments on the looks and the height of the poles and I've lost my argument each time and I'm disappointed by that. But I'm here as a person and even though I know the validity of health effects isn't gonna go very far. I'm speaking as an electromagnetically sensitive person to the point where I would call it handicapped. I would call it ha handicapped. Um, so I'm also a health food nut and I will eat healthy food only. My neighbor can eat as many Cheez-Its and Hostess cupcakes as he wants, but no matter how much the industry supports him to do that, I am not forced to live that lifestyle or have that kind of ill health effect myself. However, if that very same neighbor wants his streaming and the industry supports him to have that, I am forced to undergo the health effects that I feel when I'm exposed to that kind of radiation, which is heartbeat irregularity, muscle aches and pains, head pressure, head pains, hot flashes, sounds in my head and nausea, none of which I have when I'm outside of the ambient field, none of them. So 
I'm just here to state that, and I'm also here to say that as I might go get a designation as a handicap because then the public rights a passage, I am afraid I'm not gonna be able to use the public right as a handicapped person. And I know that there is ways to get designated as that, electrically, magnetically sensitive handicap. And I might use that in the future to fight that my right of passage is impeded. And I'm gonna have to leave the room now because this room is highly uncomfortable for me. Thank you. Okay. Next, please. Oh, dear, I'm really grateful to hear um, Dr. Skefich's presentation, but I'm also really saddened by it. I too suffer extreme consequences and have noticed how my body has changed just being in here, even with the fans you know, the radiation in my head, the palpitations in my heart, and I have no problem speaking publicly. I've spoken many times to the county and also before you all. By the way, I did vote for each of you, and so I really want you to hear what I have to say about this. Um, you know, I, I, I understand that we're caught in a catch-22 with the um, FCC regulations, the old rules that were imposed way back in the day when there was a deal, uh, I think believe during the Clinton administration's rule, a deal between uh, Verizon and, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, my point is there is now a current um, debate here within our own nation, within our own state, and within other cities and countries around the world about the health risks of this technology. Now. I won't say that I don't ever use this technology. It's brilliant. But do we need more and more and more the next new device? And do we need it imposed on us everywhere all the time? I suffer from this technology. I use it, I have a cell phone. I use it in emergencies or as needed. But I, I also am seeing young people uh, walking, crossing streets without even looking where they're going because they're in their devices. With the recent brain trauma, I was told not to use any devices. It's more than a year and a half, and I'm still hypersensitive to all of this. Okay. I'd just like to conclude with 30 you're, seconds, you know, please. No, I'm sorry, I, I am pretty consistent with the time, so everybody okay. has an equal voice, but you're welcome to leave your comments and or email us your comments. So your time is now I just now think up. that the your, your um, time is up, testimony of your, the county health is officer up. is really okay. important to look at Next as speaker. well okay. from 2012. Your time, your time is up, thank you. Next speaker, you'll have up to two minutes, please. Hello. Um, Thanks for all the work you folks do. You really have you have a lot going on, don't you? Anyway, my name is uh, Rico Baker. I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I'm strongly affected by electromagnetic fields, partially because of the jobs that I had uh, in the Navy. I wanna emphasize two points. First, a state legislature, that's us, is not subject to federal direction. This was made exceptionally clear by the court case, New York versus United States in 1992, section 188. And I quote, the federal government may not compel the states to enact or administer a federal regulatory program. It is uncontestable that the Constitution established a system of dual sovereignty. The federal government was granted by the states only discrete enumerated powers in Article One, Number Eight, and this was made extra clear by the 10th Amendment. The Constitution ensured that the various state governments would remain accountable to its citizens. There is a separation into two spheres, state and federal, just like the separation of powers in the three branches of the federal government. This principle was made clear by Madison in the Federal Papers, number 39 and 51, for example. So the two points are, 
Number one, on one hand, we have the importance of maintaining the separation of powers as mandated by the Constitution. On the other hand, we have this rogue federal agency, the FCC, meant to protect the citizens, but now captured or commandeered by the communication corporations themselves. This is called having the fox guard the hen house. In general, we do not like to deal with messy lawsuits, but it is a matter of being true to our oath. We did take oath to, to defend the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne Walfeld. 4G, 5G. Um, there is a African proverb that says, if you go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. It is said 4G will take our health and sense of well-being. 5G in hours will uh, put us in the millimeter, frequent, millimeter wave frequencies and will make our brains disoriented. In days of millimeter wave frequencies, we may be, can have permanent brain damage, a society of dementia, perhaps Alzheimer's. We won't be able to care for our families nor ourselves. The credible scientists say 5G will destroy most living organisms on Earth, including humans. And the Earth belongs to all of us, not just those that have created the 5G agenda. We must speak the truth here, our lives depend on it. As we speak, Elon Musk, Elon Musk CEO of Tesla, the electric car company, and owner of SpaceX, is in the process of putting 12,000 satellites to be millimeter wave frequencies to Earth. He has already put up five of these satellites. 8,000 more satellites are planned by other companies for a total of 20,000 satellites to be millimeter wave frequencies on us, on Earth. This is weaponized frequencies used by the military. Also, Elon Musk is involved with the California-based company called Neuralink. I highly recommend you, go you Google neuro, like brain, Neuralink. In developing his brain mesh that has a radio frequency chip, he wants to install this mesh via the carotid artery, which will migrate up into our brains, so that our, the radio frequency chip will connect to robots. This is a form of transhumanism, and the future looks bleak unless we come together as a group, preserve our Earth and Thank humans. You. Thank Stopping you 5G is paramount me, to our survival. With gratitude Thank you. and thank you. Okay, I'm quoting Harry V. Lehman, a lawyer specializing in engineering and scientific proof cases. Uh, he had a seven years focus on DNA breakage from data mod modulated RF. He served with President Reagan. Um, he is urging the Senate to suspend its approval of a national close proximity microwave radiating system underlying 5G. And if 4G, 5G goes in, he says there could be massive data hacking, would allow foreign powers to track the day-to-day -day details of virtually all human life in US, including location and movement of military assets and personnel. Thereby, national security impairment uh, includes the ability to see inside buildings as well. Um, and this creates severe civil liberties, personal privacy impairments from ubiquitous surveillance, never previously experienced in the United States. So I'm, I'm trying to give you some other things in the health effects to, to work with. Uh, EMS is recognized by the American Disabilities Association, ADA. Public utilities may not incommode anyone in the public right of way. There's gonna be a lot of problems here as people are claiming disabilities and doctors are signing off on these. So you know, lawsuits usually come to mind. Um, we can't become a fascist city or county and not allow public process on these issues. Um, we elected the supervisors in the, the county. Um, clerks here, every, everyone here has been elected by the people and the planning committees too. Um, so it's important that the people who elect you get to have some say in process, not just a few wealthy elite people. Thank you.
Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Glenn Chase. I'm a university professor in environmental economics. I'm an expert in environmental toxins. I worked with this uh, city on the light brown apple moth and I was instrumental in stopping that program. It was a category three toxin. I wanna read something from Google. Uh, insurance companies call wireless radiation electromagnetic. Insurer Lloyds of London has excluded any coverage for injury resulting directly or indirectly from electromagnetic radiation. People know who Lloyds of London is. Here's a statement from Verizon on their annual report to the Securities Exchange Commission. Our wireless business also faces personal injury and consumer class action lawsuits relating to alleged health effects of radio frequency transmitters, which they're putting on your poles. We may be required to pay significant awards or settlements, so they're redisclosing to the Securities Exchange Commission, not to you or to the public. I wanna then read Nationwide's insurance policy on a premier business owner's liability coverage form. Every insurance company, including Lloyd's of London, who they all follow, has excluded coverage, liability coverage, from any uh, electromagnetic, which is wireless radiation, and they include the electromagnetic, in this they exclude asbestos, electromagnetic, lead, or radon. So what I would suggest to you is get in their way as best as you can, um, check every vendor and equipment that goes up in this city is required to have insurance, ask them for the insurance on their equipment. And the other thing is, is the attorney read that uh, the Telecommunication Act, as long as it comes within FCC regulations for, for environmental, I didn't hear them saying it comes within FCC regulations of the risk that insurance companies will not take. So they're gonna take it, thank and you. if you put your, it on your, your polls, you're assuming the okay, liability. Okay, next speaker. Thank you, you'll have up to two minutes. Sense? Hello, I'm Rabia Barkins, and I wanna thank the council for the changes they've made in the ordin ordinance so far. I would like the, to ask the council to deny telecom permits if the ADA compliance is not met fully, and to ask to expand the AD language to read all wireless facilities, applications, permits, and pr approvals shall be accepted issues and issued only if a full compliance with the ADA section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 as amended, the Fair Housing Act, California Government Code 11135 and all applicable state and federal disability or discrimination laws. There are real health concerns with three, four, and 5G microwave radiation. I'm a health practitioner. I know about the science. I know about the biochemical changes in the body. The NIH and US Toxicology Institute did a $25 million study showing clear evidence that microwave radiation causes cancer based on biological changes in the body. So it's not just thermal heat changes as the 1996 Telecom Act says. I propose the city of Santa Cruz is not fully aware of all the possible health side effects for themselves and the residents. And I wanna put special attention on the ADA plan. There is an important ruling by the California Supreme Court, T-Mobile versus San Francisco. The Supreme Court supports city governments to take power to regulate placement of cell facilities. We know that any 4G facilities will be eventually also 5G facilities with much higher microwave power and more okay. hazards. Your time is up, thank, thank you. you. Before our next speaker uh, continues, I'd like to get a sense of how many people in the audience are interested in speaking to this item. Okay, I will go ahead and, I, we have a presentation at 2.30. I believe if you could please line up to my left um, and uh, stand in line, we'll have up to two minutes, but with a uh, conclusion of public comment at 2.30 for our presentation and award ceremony. So please. 
Hello, my name is Tammy Donnelly. I've been in the area since 1975. I always had incredible health in early 2000 when they started deploying all the cell phone towers and some a quarter mile from my house. I got severe insomnia and watch it go from 2G to 3 to 4. I mean, it's been so hard just to be in this room, like the other speaker said, is like off the charts, horrific. And I feel for all of you, and I hope you do the right thing to protect our community, because we I don't believe we'll have one if you get put these 5G towers out. So everybody that's weak, pregnant, the children, it's gonna be horrific. It's already bad. So I pray that you do the right thing. I'll let other people speak. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Brett Garrett. Um, I think Council Member Crone made a good point in saying we should speak to the aesthetics just because of the crazy laws. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that I think all 5G antennas are hideous no matter what they look like. Um, <laughs> And I'm serious because, you know, if I see a nuclear power plant, it doesn't matter what it looks like. I'm afraid of nuclear power. I cringe. It makes me uncomfortable to see nuclear power plants. And 5G, I, I'm not aware that I'm sensitive, but I've heard very convincingly that other people are. And I will be frightened when I see those 5G antennas. I'm very proud to live in a sanctuary city. Sanctuary means we keep our, our people safe, not only from immigration authorities, but also from the FCC and from corporations deploying 5G technology that is untested, unnecessary, and probably dangerous. We should not become guinea pigs. We resist ICE, we can resist the FCC. Please keep us safe, thank you. I'm Carrie, and um, I am in the same category as many people here. I am sensitive. I worked in electronics for 25 years, and um, I have a master's degree, and I understand quantum physics. This is a hell quantum physics type of equipment. It's a laser. It's cold laser. It uses diodes, and when I turn it on, you can see that there's something coming at you. You can see that if you put this right up in, in your face, it might do your, may blind you. The cell phone, this is FDA approved for inflammation and pain, which is what I get being around cell phone emitters of any sort and or even dirty electricity or uh, internet that's inside uh, Wi-Fi. I get, ex that causes me inflammation and pain and oxidative stress, which basically makes me sick and in a lot of pain. And I suffer because of that. With these tools, technology can be used to benefit persons, but it can also be overused or in inappropriately used to harm people, places, and things. Every living thing is in jeopardy from microwave radiation. It's just a different kind of radiation. The sun is dangerous. If you get a, a blister as a child, you can have cancer as an adult because it takes that long to work. The new technology, however, has sped up these uh, same uh, kinds of damage. It doesn't feel like you're getting any damage, but you are, and it will come out. Now, this is not to be played with, Thank and you. the profits okay, are on the table time is set. for the corporations. Okay. Next speaker, please. Hello, folks. Um, I'm Varvara Pazis. I've lived in Santa Cruz County about most of my life. And I just recently retired from the university um, library. Um, this is my first time speaking in front of the city council. So it's great to see all of your faces and thank you for listening. Um, I'm here today because we are at a critical juncture. And I want to encourage you to be bold and to stand up for our future. One professor calls 5G the stupidest idea in the history of the world. 
Another research scientist calls 5G the most dangerous idea since the atom bomb. But it's even more dangerous because it's going to be deployed worldwide. The numerous negative health effects of 5G have been extensively <coughs> documented, less, yet this technology will not be tested for safety bef before being installed in our communities. Until these tests are done, I would like to see a full moratorium on small cell technology, on ugly small cell technology. <laughs> 5G will negatively affect all life forms at the cellular level, humans, plants, insects, animals, and microbes. Today we are here later discussing the homeless, yet with thousands of small cell units mounted on our neighborhood telephone poles, we will no longer be safe in our own homes, nor restful in our own beds. We cannot opt out as individuals, families, or households. We are concerned about climate change, yet fi with 5G. Thank you. Your time is Thank up. You. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker. Hi, my name is Gary Schofield. I'd like to read an international appeal, appeal to stop 5G on Earth and in science. This was uh, addressed to the UN who uh, World Health Organization, EU, Council of Europe, and gov governments of all nations. We, the undersigned scientists, doctors, environmental organizations, and citizens, by the way, 64,000 signatories from 168 countries, urgently call for a halt to the deployment of 5G wireless network, including 5G from space satellites. 5G will massively increase exposure to ra radio frequency, radiation on top of the 2G, 3G, 4G networks for telecommunications already in place. RF uh, radiation has been proven uh, harmful to humans in the environment. The deployment of 5G constitutes in an experiment on humanity and the environment that is defined as a crime under international law from the Nuremberg, Nuremberg trials. Telecommun telecommunications company worldwide with the support of governments are poised within the next two years to roll out the fifth generation wireless network. This is set to deliver what is acknowledged to be an unprecedented social change on a global scale. What is not widely acknowledged is that this is, will also result, result in unprecedented environmental change on a global scale. Despite widespread denial, the evidence that radio frequency radiation is harmful to life is already or overwhelming. In 2015, 215 scientists from 41 countries, uh, based on 10,000 uh, studies, peer-reviewed scientific studies, demonstrate harm to human health from radiation, altered, uh, altered gene expression, altered stem cell development, cancers, cognitive impairment, DNA damage, uh, miscarriage, sperm uh, damage, learning and memory deficits, and to children, increased autism. Recently, an MIT scientist in, uh, extrapolated that one in two children by by the year 2025 will have autism. This will only exacerbate that issue. Um, and okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Hello, City Council, Steve Concannon, uh, fifth generation Santa Cruz. And I, I just don't know if I could add to that. But I would like to speak on the more romantic and metaphysical the FCC or anybody or any company can't possibly harm human life. And that is the children and the unborn children. My God, if we were on the street and an adult was harming a small child, we would intervene to some extent. They might say, I'm the parent, the child is out of control. If they did irreparable harm to that child, we would go through a process. We would call the police. We might, in rare cases, intervene. We're at the point where we have to intervene. So regardless of the technology, as explained by the attorney, uh, this protocol, we're going too far. It's, it's, it's becoming, a, it's a state of war. Hopefully it's one we can talk about and we're losing the ability to speak publicly. Um, the uh, Jeffrey, uh, the uh, uh, supervisor from Watsonville, uh, he had to get involved. They wanted to put a cell tower right in their little 
community right in the middle because it would bring profit. It was defeated. And he said, it is unfair for the common man to have to go up against these corporations. This proposal uh, on 12, there's some way to drag the, our feet. Now, in, up in the Bay Area, there's an attorney advising city council and the, uh, the people run the stuff. The lawsuits that are gonna come in are going to be in the millions towards the billions. So we may postpone this, but we're gonna get nailed. I, I'm gonna probably join okay. in them. Next speaker. Well, I have to agree with Steve. We've reached the point where we have to intervene. We have been completely hypnotized by this technology. People have been sucked into severe addiction to, to their devices, and they've created the impression that there's an insatiable demand for ever-increasing bandwidth. How do you feel now? Do, do you feel much more fulfilled than you felt 15, 20 years ago when these devices did not exist? And yet, there are thousands of studies which are completely ignored by the legislative community and, and buried by the corporations which show the manifold harms of these frequencies and these waveforms. The Wi-Fi frequencies are pulse modulated. They come in little pulses, and those pulses are much more deadly than the frequencies themselves. They do affect us down to the cellular level. They, in, they interfere with our nervous system. They block biological processes in the body as amply documented by Martin Paul, who's the man who said that 5G is the stupidest idea in human history. There are many people now who are putting out articles to the effect that this is an extinction level event. But we're already being harmed by 3G and 4G. We are in a situation where we have to change the way we're going. We are being forced into this by federal regulations which, as the gentleman earlier argued... Okay, your time is up. Thank you. She's setting that up. I'm here to talk about real science. We'll go ahead and pause. Oh, do you oh. want to start the timing? I mean, you're up ready. Two minutes. You. Hi there. Um, I'm here to talk about real science, real math, and I have an example here. Um, WTF is not what you think it is. It's uh, wireless technology facilities, which is a blanket term for every kind of cell tower, 5G. Um, Let's go through a simple math exercise on why WTF 5G is gonna save many, many lives. Um, and I'm just gonna give you one example, self-driving cars, not medical, not all the other things. Uh, the, the key about 5G is latency. Latency is the amount of time it takes for a digital device to react. Current cell technology is 60 milliseconds right now. So, you know, your cell phone, your 5G, 4G uh, LTE has a 60 millisecond latency time. What does that mean in terms of a car driving at 60 miles an hour? That car will travel five feet in 60 milliseconds. That's not enough. Um, Latency, uh, not short enough latency to avoid hitting a pedestrian obstacles and so forth. 5G, on the other hand, one millisecond latency. What happens in one millisecond at 60 miles an hour? That car travels, you can, it'll only go one inch. What that means, those self-driving cars takes over from us humans who have drunk, who drinking, distracted, no more, no more pedestrian deaths, no more car accidents on 17. It, Think of the lives saved with a simple 
you know, this, this new generation technology. It's all in the math and it's all in the technology. Everything else you've heard so far is pseudoscience, unread, you know, hearsay, there are birds falling out of the sky in the Netherlands, which has turned out to be a hoax and so forth. I urge you to really focus on the, this next what the next uh, phase in our industrial re revolution, which is 5G, and this is just one example, real example, real math, real science. Thanks. Okay. Next speaker. Good afternoon. I'm Scott Graham. Um, there, there has to be other jurisdictions, states, cities, counties that are suing the FCC. And I think that you guys should join in on that because yes. this is ridiculous that yes. the, all this is being forced down our throats without any, any recourse whatsoever. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I use the technology, but I still think that there's a way, there must be ways to do it that'll be safer. I mean, we, we, we have a lot of very intelligent people in this country and, and to go steamrolling ahead with this without looking for a safer way to do it seems ridiculous to me. The other thing is on your aesthetics or uh, whatever of these towers, there, there should also be something in there to prevent birds from landing on them or landing near them because they can get fried and, or you know, have uh, cognitive damage done to them for being too close to the, the towers for too long. <coughs> and as my understanding of this is that we're not talking about just radio frequencies, it's a certain type of radio frequency called microwaves and that cooks food and so, you know, what are, are we cooking our brains with these microwaves? And are we, is this, you know, an experiment to like lessen the population of the world so that uh, the uh, rulers can then have more control over what, who's left? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And you, you'll, be our, you'll be our last speaker on this item. Feel free. You'll have up to two minutes. I'm walking slowly because I have a sprained ankle. I'm in a boot. And boy, are we being booted around by the telecom industry big time. Taking the word of the telecom industry about the safety of this technology is like, and we just had an example, is like believing big tobacco about the safety of their cigarettes. The evidence is overwhelming to the contrary. I'd like to remind you that no person, no child, no fetus has consented to 24 seven bodily microwave trespass from 4G, 5G, or any of it. We do not consent to this known harm being forced upon our bodies. And elected representatives need to be defending and protecting the public from harm. This is a toxic trespass issue. It's a corporate rule issue. If you saw the DVD I gave you or have seen the Verizon promotional videos about how 5G penetrates walls and goes into your house, if you have somebody trespassing into your house, you could call the police, but here they can trespass with harmful radiation and that's supposed to be all right. Somebody called this a telecom tower tsunami or telecom tower blitzkrieg. And I looked up blitzkrieg, warfare, sudden warfare, 
overwhelming like disaster. Thank you. This needs you're, to be halted. Thank you. And, and I'm going to give you thank copies. You. You're welcome to give copies. I'm going to give you copies thank of you. the 5G appeal okay. to okay, stop you. this. Your time is up. Please sign thank on you. to that. Okay, so now copies. it's, um, I'm going to go ahead and conclude public comment. We have a 2.30 presentation <laughs> at this time. We've concluded public comment, but you're welcome to leave your comments here with our city clerk. We have an, um, an opportunity to recognize some of our outstanding volunteers in the community, and um, they are enjoying a reception uh, in our courtyard conference, uh, courtyard area at this time. I'm used to saying courtyard conference room. Yeah. We'll go ahead and have, we'll go ahead and have, we've, excuse me, excuse me. Go ahead, pause. I'm going to ask that you please keep your, your comments down. We had an opportunity to hear from the public at this time. We're going to go ahead and take a pause on this item. We'll return back for action in just a moment, but we're going to have a moment to recognize some of our outstanding volunteers. Just really, um, we'll go ahead. Just really one second. One second, please. Just to, 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 were there other people waiting to speak? I think the older woman in the front. I've concluded one. public comment at this time on the item. They're welcome to submit comments at a future time. Do you want to make the motion? Okay, so Mayor, we're going to... Uh, point of order, I would like to make a motion that we have two more people who are waiting uh, in the front row to speak. Well, one was in the front row, one was in the back row. There's two more people to speak on the last item. They're waiting in line. They weren't able to stand up during the whole time. Second. Okay, there's a motion to extend public comment. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? No. no. Okay, so that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings in support, uh, Myers, uh, uh, Matthews, and myself against. If we could, since this has been extended and there's two additional people that were granted to speak, I would say one minute, but I will. Um, were you one of the two top, the two people that were granted yes. to speak? I'll go ahead, before we get started, will you go ahead and let the folks in the courtyard know that we won't be joining them at this time, but they're welcome to come in at the t at, uh, thereafter for uh, the, the presentation. They can have, the two additional speakers can have up to two minutes. Okay, my name is Brianna Garcia. Um, I've only lived in this community 14 years, I think, or 15 years, but anyway, um, just being in this room, again, for me, is very difficult. My heart's been racing. I know my blood pressure goes up. I went outside to my car. I felt much better. I think this is, I'm, 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 I'm afraid. I'm afraid for the children. I'm afraid for the old people. I'm afraid for myself. I'm afraid for the animals, for the bees. What are we gonna eat if we have no bees? I mean, this is very serious. And I think it's, I hope somebody, because people spell, spoke very eloquently today. I was really impressed. I learned a lot. And I'm really concerned about due process. Like, can't, don't we have any power? Are we just gonna lay down? It's just like a Holocaust. And maybe you, people, are, you know, you guys believe it or not, but it's true. And this is getting crazy. It's like on the level of, you know, genetically modified foods and other things like that. This really matters. You know, we need to be able to think. Lately, I can't remember, you know what? I can't remember anything. You know, it's, it's like I can't find my words. What's going on? You know, and I have a cell phone and I have a, like a shield on it, but I actually, honestly, my heart, I miss the time before cell phones. I miss the time before this, this technology when we were connected. And it's really, we're not gonna go back that way, but we really need to resist the federal government. And we're a sanctuary city and I know there's a way around this. And what's up with one month that this is coming? It's crazy, all right? So thank you very much for giving me this time. I know you extended it. Thank you. Okay. Governments and organizations that ban or warn against wireless technology. 1993, Environmental Protection Agency. The FCC's exposure standards are seriously flawed. 1993, Food and Drug Administration. FCC rules do not address the issue of long-term chronic exposure to RF fields. 
1993, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. The FCC standard is inadequate because it is based on only one dominant mechanism, adverse health effects caused by body heating. 1994, Amateur Radio Relay League Bioeffects Committee. The FCC standard does not protect against non-thermal effects. UK Department of Education in 2000. Children under 16 should not use cell phones except in an emergency. 2002, Interdisciplinary Society for Environmental Medicine, 3,000 physicians in Germany, recommends burning cell phones, banning cell phone use by children, and banning cell phones and cordless phones in preschools, schools, hospitals, nursing homes, events halls, public buildings, and vehicles. 2003, American Bird Conservancy and Forest Conservation Council brought a lawsuit against the FCC because millions of migratory birds were being disoriented by microwave radiation and crashing into cell towers. 2004, International Association of Firefighters opposes communications antennae on fire stations. 2005, Salzburg, Austria's public health department. Okay, your time is up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, you'll be our last speaker. All righty. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for extending. My name is Nan Schweiger, and I have just it's very brief. Please look at what <clears throat> Dr. Jack Cruz, a neurosurgeon, has to say about 5G. It will shred us. Please go to YouTube, go to the internet, Jack Cruz, 5G. Please listen to this brain surgeon. It busts our DNA. You want strokes? Forget about cancer. Strokes, aneurysms, that, this is coming. This is no joke. They're circumventing the Constitution with this. Please stop it. Thank you. Okay. So we will uh, conclude public comment. We'll go ahead and take a pause for our um, presentation and recognition of our outstanding volunteers. No, they'll come in. Two thirty is the someone, time for the paint. Did someone? Oh, anyway, go, they'll get back. Yeah. We'll take a few breaks. So Andy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Andy. Everybody smile. All, all you dogs. <laughs> Karen, you want to come? Okay. 
Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. Hello. Okay. Welcome. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. So we're now on item number 13, which is um, an opportunity for our uh, city council and community to recognize some of our outstanding volunteers who are at this time filling our chambers. So welcome to you all. Um, I'll just briefly make a few comments and we'll move forward with some of the recognitions. Um, so National Volunteer Week is about inspiring, recognizing and encouraging people to seek out imaginative ways to engage in their communities. It is about demonstrating to the nation that by working together, we have the fortitude to meet our challenges and accomplish our goals. The city serve volunteers who give their time and their commitment to the city of Santa Cruz are outstanding examples of what can be accomplished when people care about their communities. And so today we have an opportunity and privilege to recognize some of the finest of these volunteers. So Laura, please uh, proceed with your comments. I wanna thank the city council members for helping us recognizing our outstanding volunteers. In the past year, over 1,500 volunteers have given their time, talents, and commitment to our community. It is a privilege to acknowledge the outstanding City Serve heroes who work to make our local lives better and improve our community. I'd like to introduce Karen Delaney, the executive, Sen the executive director of the Volunteer Center and my boss who will help me hand out the awards. And um, I'll call out the name and I will apologize for saying people's names wrong, because I do every year, <laughs> no matter how much I practice. Um, and when I call out your name, if you would come up and the council member will read the award and then Karen will, will give you the award. So our first uh, outstanding volunteer today is Abby Young. Abby is the founding member of the first Firewise Neighborhood Group in Santa Cruz County. Firewise is a nationally recognized program that was developed to create greater resiliency within neighborhoods for the impacts of wildland fires. Abby and the Firewise Group have increased awareness of the tasks necessary to reduce fire risks and enhance emergency preparedness, but even more importantly, has taken action in the form of vegetation management in the Prospect Heights <coughs> neighborhood. Abby has served our community, making Santa Cruz safer and inspiring other volunteers to do the same. Thank you. <laughs> and our Tales to Tales volunteers, and um, I'm not gonna try to read everybody's name. <laughs> so if our Tales to Tales volunteers would come up and maybe introduce yourselves. My voice isn't gonna last a long time. <laughs> Just come up to the just come up to the mic. Introduce yourself. Sheila Dean. Caroline, but more importantly, Maisie. <laughs> I'm Phil Kipnis, and this is Nana. Nana is one of our wonderful volunteer um, poodles. Diane Kipnis, and I've got the other standard poodle, Miha. Norma Sachs and Schnauzer Cooper. I'm Lexi, and this is Isaac, yeah. Rose Shapiro and Maxine. Thank you very much for joining us. I love that I have this one. For one thing, my daughter's first word was, this is a true story, woof, woof. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, when we did the Measure S campaign for the Santa Cruz Public Libraries, this Tales to Tales uh, program was one of the poster children. It's such an appealing program throughout all our branches. So thank you. So with that, Tales to Tales is a volunteer program in which community members and their dogs meet with children and parents every week to listen to the children read 
and encourage them. It takes commitment to support this weekly program and the children and parents count on it. This kind of support has been proven to increase children's reading confidence and skill. Plus who doesn't love to snuggle up to a cuddly dog? So thank you to all, all the volunteers who share their time and their dogs and who has more fun? Everybody does, thank you. <laughs> Elise Soto. Hmm. So Elise dedicated her summer to volunteering at Super Camp, our camp that hosts 35th and 6th, oh sorry, 35 and 6 year olds. Over three months, Elise gave 200 hours of her time to this program. She facilitated games and projects for the children and always displayed patience, energy, and kindness. And as a former camp counselor, I would say uh, how wonderful it is that you are doing this work for our community. So thank you very much. Julia Bates. Congratulations, Julia. Julia volunteered at Beach Camp, running and assisting many activities. She took the initiative to teach water safety to the 30 campers enrolled in Beach Camp. Julia's strengths include leadership, responsibility, creativity, and energy. And over three months, she volunteered. Julia helped to make Beach Camp a great success. So thank you for everything. And I know Paul Martin was gonna be running a little late. I don't think he's here yet. So we'll hold off on him and hopefully he'll get here before we finish. So Helen Waller. Helen Waller. Helen Waller teaches line dancing three times a week at the Downtown Senior Center. She is responsible for the growth of the beginner class, which has upwards to 30 individuals per session. Helen's positive and patient attitude has made her a beloved member of the Senior Center team. Helen Waller, thank you. Judy Cobb. Judy Cobb helped lead our land dance, land, line dancing classes twice a week for over 15 years. Judy is an outstanding volunteer and has helped to build community for local seniors by organizing extra events and meals. Thank you, Judy. Ryan DeWall Dillon. Jim Carher. Oh, Karen. Karen, yes. And, and Joyce, you can come up too. So Jim was not able to come today, so Joyce is accepting the award for him. And I'd like to bring up my volunteers too, because uh, this award. <laughs> you should. Cool. If you're wearing uh, silver shirts and jackets, come on up, send us your volunteers. <laughs> So this was specifically meant for Jim, but I'll extend it to all of you. But actually you could speak for the entire group. Exactly, yeah, so I'm gonna extend it to everyone. But this fall, the Santa Cruz Police Department engaged a team of trained citizen volunteers to assist the department in non-enforcement duties. Uh, this team has been instrumental in creating the Volunteers in Policing program, as well as the You Are Not Alone program and the Vacation Check program. Um, these members, um, have always been willing to help and complete tasks in a timely and organized fashion. Um, they've invested hundreds of hours in the volunteer policing programs, have inspired and mentored many other volunteers. Their work and dedication helped to make Santa Cruz a safer and stronger community. And so I'd like to thank you all for your volunteer work and your commitment to this community. Hey, 
really has been a delight to watch this program get out the ground. It's just an, an outstanding program and very exciting to have it happening in our community. Uh, Richard Hodge. I'm uh, very excited to read about uh, Richard Hodge, who actually is my neighbor. And, uh, and uh, hi, Richard. And Richard is a retired judge and has provided legal support for the city's work with County of Santa Cruz Water Advisory Commission on Soquel Creek Water Rights Adjudication Implementation. What that means in normal language is that Mr. Hodge is uh, helping us understand how to keep water in the creek for both uh, use by people and by, uh, by the environment. Uh, his significant experience with California water law, uh, he has exper significant experience with California water law and has made significant contributions towards advancing a focus on the protection of environmental and hum human uses of water to the state's residents, fisheries, and overall environmental quality. His intellect, experience, and willingness to engage in this community effort pro bono has been very helpful in strategizing on this important issue. So thank you very much. And Phoenix Roberto, and I'll read his as nobody got assigned to that one because I didn't know he was coming, so I'm really <laughs> pleased he's here. <clears throat> Phoenix was the only volunteer at Junior X Camp this past year who demonstrated consistent involvement. involvement. Phoenix showed great dedication and a true interest in working with children. Phoenix is flexible and engaging and always had a great worth work ethic during the 300 hours of volunteer service he gave. No, Paul did not make it. Oh, he, he so showed his. Oh, is he, he here? here? He's parking his bike. Okay. Oh, there he is. <laughs> there he is. So we're back to Paul Martin. <laughs> Aww. Paul Martin and helpers. Well, we all know Paul Martin and his passion for keeping Santa Cruz graffiti free, but what you didn't know is how far he's willing to go, literally. Jennifer Young, the graffiti abatement coordinator, reported witnessing Paul painting over a retaining wall on Highway 17 near Los Gatos on Sunday. <laughs> Although possibly dangerous and not recommended, this example of his work shows Paul's incredible determination and commitment to keeping the highway clean and welcoming for our visitors and residents. Paul has donated tens of thousands of work hours over 14 years to this goal. Thank you, Paul. Keep up the good work. Please join me in honoring Paul Martin and his 14 years of extraordinary service. Yeah, you're on, you're on TV. No, it was one of the dogs. There you go. Okay. Thank you, council members, for participating in this awards. This is always such a joy to do. And I'm really glad to be able to bring you something fun today. Thank so you. So I'm glad. <laughs> You're here for it. Before we end, though, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of the following city staff who has served as mentors and guides for these volunteers. We really do have a lot of outstanding staff who've given their time and attention to volunteers, and we have uh, a really strong volunteer program because of it. So um, I'd like to set, uh, thank Jill Bates and Colin Herrick, uh, Meta Rodis, uh, Mike Godsey, Steve Gomez, and Mile Hicks, Robert Acosta, Maria Campa, Kelly Mercer LeBeau, Leslie Keeley and Nola, Noah Dowling, John Bombacci, Jay Guevara, and Jennifer Young. And this year I get to thank new people. Santa Cruz Police Chief Mills, he started this incredible program, and Joyce uh, Blotchke, uh, Beth Thurman, and Officer McBride, Chris Berry, and the Santa Cruz Fire Department had a f uh, volunteer they recognized this year. So uh, Jason Hyduke, 
uh, Denise Finch and Tiffany Wise West. And I really want to give a special thank you to our new Parks and Rec Director, Tony Ella Elliott and Superintendent of Parks, Travis Beck. They are really committed to growing the volunteer <coughs> program in Parks and Rec and are getting an adopted pro a park program started and um, we're gonna see a lot of exciting things happen in the next year with Parks and Rec. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to all the outstanding volunteers, the staff, the Volunteer Center. It's really a pleasure to honor all your work and recognize you. So thank you for being here. Have a wonderful day. Okay. We'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and bring us back at this point. Um, we're going to go ahead and return to item number 12 on our agenda, which will um, involve the um, uh, action and deliberation portion of the agenda item. So we'll go ahead and return back for uh, council action and deliberation. Councilmember Brown. Thank you. So I, um, I did want to follow up on a, I have a couple of questions related to this item and also follow up to the motion that I made at our previous meeting to confirm that we'll be hearing back um, on May 14th. Is that correct? That's what we're shooting for. Kandati. Okay, um, great. So um, with respect, so some of the issues that were raised by uh, members of the audience I'd like to, fo to follow up on right now. Um, with respect to uh, elimination of the public hearing process, I understand that is related to the need to address this shot clock question, but I am interested in um, consideration of a uh, fee waiver for council appeals for, for these, um, these uh, encroachment permits in the future. I am just wondering if staff has anything to say about that. I just want to express my interest in, in looking at that for our discussion. But is there anything that you... Um, it's a cost recovery. Um, the appeal fee is, is already low. And in terms of cost recovery, taking an appeal to the city council is quite a bit of work. But it's, it's ultimately your choice. Just given the fact that we're eliminating the potential for the public to weigh in, um, in other arenas in terms of the public hearing process. What, what we are thinking is putting the, um, the public process on the applicant and requiring that they have a community meeting and that they conduct a notification process and they post the site just to, pretty much the same that we do, except that it'll be their responsibility and it'll be one of their application submittal requirements that they've completed that. Does that include uh, 300 foot radius notifica public notification? Currently it's matching what we, uh, what we have in the zoning ordinance. So it's 300 foot notification, uh, uh, postcards and posting the site. So responsibility would be on the applicant to They'd have to that. conduct that prior to submitting an application to us. And is there any uh, remedy in the case that um, the applicant does not comply with those requirements. It would be an incomplete application. So it would be considered an incomplete application. Okay. With respect to the question around denial of incomplete applications um, that was raised by the um, member of the public, I am just wondering if that is something that we could consider looking at the language from Monterey County um, with, or I don't know if it's Monterey City or County, but with the Monterey ordinance in our report back for May 14th on other jurisdictions that are uh, looking at ways to um, maintain some some jurisdiction of, of our um, 
and uh, the way we make decisions around these encroachment permits. So can we refer that to? Yes. Yeah. Okay. If we have, do you need a mo Should I include that in a motion? Start the motion. Okay. Um, well, then I have another question. <laughs> Fine. I'll just make the motion and we'll carry on from there. Okay. So I would, um, so I mean, I think that we, you know, at the last uh, council meeting, I made some statements about uh, and having an interest in pursuing legal action with the FCC sh if there are other jurisdictions doing that um, and also looking at other, um, other measures that local jurisdictions have taken. So that report is coming back to us. I'm now hearing on May 14th. With that in mind, um, I would move that we introduce for publication an ordinance amending section 24.12.1400 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code as um, recommended by staff with um, the, uh, with one change that um, we, um, re we extend the 1500 foot minimum spacing to all zones rather than just residential zones. I think that seems to be a reasonable um, and allowable. Um, if we did that, uh, uh, cells wouldn't be able to locate within the city. <laughs> That's okay with me, but I, apparently it's not okay with the FCC. So okay, so it, we'll so we'll leave it with specifically for residential. <laughs> How does Petaluma? Can I ask a question then? As a, now I'm interrupting my own motion. How does Petaluma do that? Does anybody know? Here, how yeah. is it the Petaluma has that kind of minimum? They have a basis? 300 foot restriction from residential. Is that the one? 1500 foot, and according to a member of the public, 1500 foot minimum spacing in all zones. I don't know. Hold on a sec. Anything about Petaluma? Maybe if we could, we is, are you concluding your motion and then we'll have um, I was going to make, now I've got, an, so it's turning into another question. I was going to make the motion, but another question. I will second for, the motion. Maybe we can second the motion yes. for purposes of yeah. discussion, then we can modify we, it. Yeah, yeah. with okay. the 1,500 spacing in commercial zones, which is. We have a motion by Councilmember Brown with a second by Councilmember Matthews with further discussion at this time. Okay, please. I was just going to say um, that um, in quickly uh, huddling, uh, I'm not sure that we have a good answer for the Petaluma um, uh, ordinance at this point, but it's certainly something that we can look into and bring back to you at the May 14th meeting. Okay. But we're at the moment just we're, so we're including it for residential and commercial. No, just because what we heard was uh, it would prohibit any further yes. installations. And I got stopped mid motion by staff saying that we can't do that in commercial zones, I, I but we can do it in residential. So I just wanted to clarify what is that. That was what I heard. It's a 1500 foot separation in residential zone districts between towers. That's what we're um, recommending. We had originally recommended a 500 foot separation and the planning commission changed that to 1500. Between towers. Correct. I understand that. I'm just saying I was trying to include commercial as well. I was interrupted mid motion by staff saying that's not possible. So I'm, but now we haven't received clarification on whether or not it is possible. I can continue with the motion, including commercial. And then when we hear back, we can make amendments as needed. Okay. So I would like to extend that to all zones. Ending I'm, I'm going to withdraw my second. I second. There's not clarity on it. Yeah, you go ahead. And okay. Go. So we have um, a withdrawal of the second by Councilmember Matthews, and a Councilmember motion. Councilmember Brown's motion um, was to adopt the recommendation with the modification to extend the um, proximity footage. Essentially, that is currently outlined to apply to residential zones to all zones, including commercial. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And that's a seconded by Councilmember Glover. Do you have a, a comment as well? I have a comment and a motion. So if we wanted to finish this motion first and then I can 
go on to my next one. It has to do with uh, some statements that were made <clears throat> um, during public comment with regards to the notion of, quote, real science and uh, the next stage of our industrial revolution. Also looking at uh, some decisions other municipalities have made in the face of the pressure put on by the FCC. So uh, if we want to just move forward with Councilmember Brown, Brown's motion, I'd love to make a statement and a motion after that. We could do that, or you could um, potentially have an amendment to the motion. Uh, okay, sure. well, we can go that way. That works. Um, I just don't want to, well, I, I, uh, sure. We'll see if Councilmember Brown's into it. Um, so to address the issue of real science, uh, in an article in Newsweek dated on May 19th, 2018, entitled Radiation from Cell Phones, Wi-Fi is Hurting the Birds and the Bees, 5G May Make It Worse, there was an analysis done by Eclipse, an EU-funded review body dedicated to policy that makes an impact on biodiversity and ecosystems. It looked at over 97 studies on how electromagnetic radiation may affect the environment and concluded that this radiation could indeed pose a potential risk to bird and insect orientation and plant health. So as a local community that prides ourselves in our pollinator species and monarchs, I think it's something that we should be especially concerned about if there is even the slightest hint through research that it does negatively impact birds and pollinators since we are a marine community and we are uh, some a place for nesting monarchs. Also with regards to the uh, power or decisions that we can make as an, a body, the Portland City Council just voted unanimously to demand the Federal Communications Commission update its research on health and environmental impacts of the 5G radio frequency wireless emissions, and it also calls on the FCC to make that research publicly available. In addition to that, it also focuses on a 2017 appeal to the European Union by 180 scientists and doctors from 36 different countries uh, for the European Union to place a moratorium on the 5G rollout across Europe until potential hazards for human health and the environment have been fully investigated by scientists independent from industry. Uh, also in those statements, the com uh, commissioner likened the telecommunications companies to tobacco and gun industries that obfuscate health issues instead of trying to understand them. Uh, something that was brought forward too was that this is the next stage of our industrial revolution. The last time I checked, the last stage of our industrial revolution less us with climate change. And that was uh, refuted by industry. It was called pseudoscience. It was said it wasn't real. And now we're facing the very real reality that we are facing climate change due to fossil fuel industries and our irresponsible way of dealing with the environment. So uh, there's plenty of precedent and research to support the potential potential downfall or downsides of 5G, so I appreciate the uh, language that Councilmember Brown put forward. I would make or suggest a friendly amendment to that language that we, um, pause there for a second. I would make an amendment to that motion or an addition that we would withhold our decision on the implementation and installment of the cell tower uh, while demanding that the Federal Communication Commission update its research on the health and environmental impacts of 5G radio frequencies uh, and emissions and for the FCC to make the results of that research publicly available before we make our decision. You, please, you have a yeah, I have a response. So I am absolutely in agreement with your, the, the point you're trying to get out here. I just want to emphasize that the recommendation here is not about installation of a particular tower. This is about our own cell standards and guidelines. So it's not specifically responding to 5G. And I think that the place to have that conversation and to support your um, intent is at our May 14th meeting when we have a, a broader discussion about um, what local jurisdiction can, jurisdictions can do both to protect um, themselves from, um, you know, the FCC and also potentially um, challenge the FCC on the decisions that we're being forced to, to make. So I think that's where it would be appropriate to, to do that, if that's okay. Yeah, then I'll just withdraw the uh, amendment and make that as a statement to help uh, our colleagues better understand the importance of the separation of these cell towers and as we move forward into May 14th for them to be able to do research on that on their own. Okay, and if you can bring that back for the conversation on the 14th, I'm, I'm with you. you. I'm sorry, I just, I Yes, I just, I mean, I understand the motion and I think the council can introduce the ordinance um, with that amendment to also include commercial or industrial property as well. The concern I have is that I, I understood um, 
Mr. Ferry to say that if we did include a prohibition on uh, or a 1500 foot limitation on uh, commercial property that that would effectively preclude the placement of, of structures in the city. And if that's the case, then um, I do think we would run afoul of the federal regulations. What I would recommend is go ahead and introduce it as you want, but ask direct staff to report back on the implications of that and uh, the enforceability of an ordinance if it runs afoul of FCC regulations. And if, it, if, if I may for clarification, if it does, would that then make the next reading a first reading to make that change it or? could be, yes. And is it anticipated that it would? Is that your? I suspect it will. You suspect be it will. a recommendation to reintroduce without that, but I wanna research it. I also wanna have a chance to look into the Petaluma issue. I mean, it, it occurs to me that that the ability to impose uh, additional uh, distance requirements could be the result of topography or, ge or, or geography. So that needs to be analyzed. And so, um, you know, I th I'd like to have an opportunity to confer with staff and my office. Um, Stephanie Hall is here. She's been doing the lion's share of the work on this with the planning department and uh, and report back to the council. Okay, thank you. And council Member Brown, <clears throat> I had misunderstood you. I thought you were asking for a 1,500 uh, foot setback from commercial zone districts. And that's what I thought um, would eliminate the possibility of all site. And if you're just talking about keeping poles in residential and commercial zone districts 1,500 feet apart, I think, I think we could probably work with that. That's what I was asking. Okay. I misunderstood. Uh, Matthews. That was my reason for withdrawing the second as misunderstanding that was happening there. So that's fine. And um, if that's apparently not an issue, my suggestion was sometimes there's a, um, we introduce two versions so we don't have to go back and have a, uh, you know, start over with another first reading and given the time constraint, I just put that out as a, a suggestion. Well, we're looking at the design guidelines and that's a policy, that's not the ordinance amendment. Okay. So the design guidelines can be modified, they don't have to be read a second time. Okay. Is that right for design guidelines? That's right. An ordinance. Okay, so we're fine with the one motion. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Further conversation will be forthcoming in May. Uh, Councilmember Crum. Um, what what is the appeal fee uh, that, app, that that if you appeal this, what would to the city council? What would they, what would the fee be? If it was a, a discretionary permit in the planning department, it's six hundred and some change. I'm not sure what the appeal fee is in public works. Oh, Josh Bangrud, senior civil engineer, public works. Um, so we're still working on our ordinance with the city attorney's office. Uh, as far as the appeals, what I understand from and. Um, I leave this part to the attorneys, but from what I understand, all actions by the council are appealable to the council at some point. So, but I do not. I do not know that. So, by just by that alone, would seem to me that any action that the city takes on behalf of the council can come back to the council. Now, the practical aspect of that with the shot clock, I, I can't comment on that really. I mean, but it seems like at the very least, it could come in. Um, make themselves heard if, if there were appeals in that way. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, last other question is, if it went to the Planning Commission, Mike, what would, um, how, would that, how would that inhibit the process? Um, members of the public seem to see, think that it was a good idea for that there be a public hearing and that it go to the Planning Commission. It, from when they submit their application materials to when we get to the public hearings, typically about four <coughs> months. So we would be way, way beyond a shot clock restriction. So would you take as a friendly amendment, since that was th that, that's unlike a lot of other appeals, that we do um, waive the fee for um, for city council appeals? Yes. Okay, with a second. Accepted. Okay, so there was a friendly amendment to waive appeals. There was a friendly amendment to waive the appeal fee if it were to come before the city council. Did you um, staff have additional insights to this? Looks that there's some conversation. Did you have additional concerns or insights? 
I was just gonna comment that the ordinance that's in front of you eliminates the planning process. And so there would be no appeal because there's no process. It's the public works process that is forthcoming that um, would remain in effect. And um, so that's what the, the public works department is working with the attorneys on. And so um, the, the suggestion that there be an appeal for uh, the appeal fee be waived uh, for what's in front of you right now, there is no process. Uh, this, this would be eliminating that planning process in favor of a public works process. So, so there isn't an appeal for the planning process that is, is now pushed into the, the public works realm. So that Does that make sense? If, so the conversation could happen at a different time in regards to how the appeal process could right. look through how, the public works. How the application okay. may be heard by the council would be as part of the public works discussion chapter, the new chapter 15.38 that's referenced in this is what would identify that application process. It would be outside of the planning process to help um, meet the shot clock requirements. We could hold that amendment, then the amended. I, I still would like to keep it in there. And but but consider it when it comes up when we are talking about the public works policy, since it's inapplicable to this essentially process. No, we're, it's just not on the agenda for today. We'll get we'll be hearing about this in some. May. Some May. May. <laughs> sometime soon. Uh, sometime soon. Yes, we're working on we're working on all this. Then. And and to to the point being made is. Theirs is an internal planning process. Ours will have to issue per actual physical permits for, for the work to can take place. So that's probably the right place for it. Okay. All right, Okay. withdrawn. Okay, so we um, have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, so we'll move along to item number 14 on our agenda. And I will invite my colleagues who may be interested in saying a few words. Uh, this was their presentation for uh, item number 13. Volunteer. Item number 13 was the Volunteer Recognition Presentation <laughs> Awards, which we took a, a break in our original thing. So we're on to item 14. Item 14 is um, the City of Santa Cruz's Commitment for Civility and a proclamation <coughs> joining the initiative to revive civility. And um, it was an item co-signed by council members. And before I read uh, some of the elements of our proclamation, I'll uh, invite my colleagues to say a few words if interested. Councilor Matthews. Yes, um, I uh, was approached by members of the community with this concept who gave me some uh, references to national organizations um, pursuing this idea. And it's an, uh, an idea that has been uh, well received and welcomed across the political spectrum, I think, um, uh, going from national politics down to online communications, <laughs> wherever we look. Um, the um, decline of um, an attempt at civil conversation, communication, listening, and, and um, uh, discussion um, it has really taken a hit. And so uh, I was very happy to approach the mayor with this idea and uh, Council Member Cummings. And um, this seems like it should be pretty straightforward. And it's simply a proclamation declaring our uh, commitment as a community and reaching out to uh, the broader community to keep this um, goal and um, to strive to reach this in, in all our discussions. It does not bar having strong, passionate feelings, but just that we will get further and achieve more by, by trying to communicate in a civil way. And I should say this is endorsed by a very wide range of organizations, um, including the National Institute for Civil Discourse and the Goldman School of Public Policy at um, UC Berkeley. Um, so with that, it's pretty simple. I bring it forward. I hope it gets unanimous support by the council and the community. Okay. Vice Mayor Cummings. Yeah, I would just like to add that, I mean, we've been dealing with a lot of very controversial topics this year, um, some items that have been very concerning to our community and that um, we're trying to address in the best way possible. Throughout the 
national po political sphere as well, there's been a lot of tension and um, many people in the community have felt like that tension has even been um, kind of infiltrating into the way we engage as a community. And, um, and I've wanted to sign on to this as well because even with correspondence, as Councilmember Matthews mentioned, even down to digital correspondence, the way that people from the community engage with us um, can sometimes feel um, disrespectful and not in a way that's very constructive. And so I think that it's something that we should all remember that we're all trying to do the best for our community. And the only way that we're gonna achieve that is if we're able to actually communicate our feelings with one another in a way that's respectful. And so I was very um, happy when I was approached to sign on to this and um, hope that we can move forward in a way where we can work towards solutions to our problems uh, rather than point fingers at one another. Thank you. Well, um, oh, um, Councilmember Gufford, did you? Oh, absolutely, yes, thank you. I appreciate it. So I was really elated, actually, to see this item on the agenda. Uh, we haven't had an opportunity to talk in depth about the concept of civility since a conflict, which is yet to be resolved, was brought to the community's attention here in the city council chambers back in February. Since then, I've had the time to think and reflect on the concept of civility, politics, conflict, resolution, and more importantly, reconciliation. After all, my work outside of the city council is focused on nonviolent conflict reconciliation. So with that lens, while I support the proclamation, it seems a bit strange to me for us to be having this discussion with such an obvious chasm that exists between those that sit on this body. I call it a chasm because it's much more than merely a divide. It feels like there's almost a complete disconnect. And in that sense of being disconnected, there is seemingly very little desire or drive to address it or reconcile it or to move forward. And I only say that because the requests to reconcile uh, and resolve the situation have gone unanswered and without action. It's been about two months since our February 12th meeting and besides a half day session of talking about our political goals with no mention of conflict or reconciliation, there has been nothing that even resembles an attempt to bring this body together in real unity. But I'll say it again, I support this proclamation, but I do find it strange for it to come now. It seems in some ways rather inappropriate. And I say that not to suggest that a pledge to civility is inappropriate, because I think we can all agree that civility is important, but it made me start to ask myself, what is civility? Does civility mean being nice? Does it mean not disagreeing? And ultimately, the real question is when does disagreement become uncivil? As it turns out, the history of the concept of civility is deep and intricate, and even more interesting is the history of civility talk and how it's been used as a political tool. I was listened, uh, listening to a great TED Talk by a researcher named Teresa Bijan and her analysis of civility. She covered a lot about the history of civility and how it grew out of the conflict between religious groups in the 17th century when they needed to find a way to dehumanize and discredit those who did not agree with their religious beliefs. Or we could look at the history of colonization and the rationale used by mainstream anthropologists to say that other cultures were uncivilized and therefore it was okay to invade, conquer, and take over their lands. But Bajan draws a distinction between the modern concept of civility and civ civility talk as a political tool. I agree that civility is precious, but I think it's time when we start talking about civility to also realize that civility is something that makes our disagreements tolerable. It, it, when people talk about civility, a lot of times it can be used to stigmatize or make people who disagree with that person look like the bad individual. It was a tactic used to silence Civil War protesters, and even in these chambers, the call for civility has resulted in people consistently being cut off at the podium instead of being able to finish their last sentence. Many researchers and journalists suggest that instead of healing our division, civility talk is making the problem worse. That's not to say that we shouldn't be emphasizing and encouraging respectful conversation, but what makes a conversation civil? In our agenda report, it says that, quote, the effect of this trend, referring to the lack of civility, is uh, to discourage honest and open communication, divide our communities, and make it harder to work together on the challenges we face, end quote. I would argue that this is exactly the situation we're in right now on this body with the way that these issues have been handled. 
instead of having to make the effort to talk to each other, there has been this awkward pass to allow us to speak past each other or to each or, or at each other rather. Here is more support for the argument that I'm talking about in a paper titled Democracy, Civility, and the Dangers of Niceness, where political scientist Ian Ward points out that an ethic of generalized niceness can actually be in many circumstances a mean by which citizens conform to the requirements of unjust social arrangements. Jane Schmidt, a local organizer with Black Lives Matter, says that civility is actually used to shut down discussion and is often a way to tone police the folks that don't have the power. And New York columnist Joe Lonnie Cobb tweeted that civility is the coward's favorite tool as when uh, necessary, because when necessary, Jesus flipped tables. So let's talk about civility as far as what does civility mean? It doesn't always mean being nice or palatable or always landing in the middle. It doesn't mean standing by and st passing by what you feel is morally and ethically right. Does it mean, does it mean accepting what the power structure doles out or does it mean holding people accountable, avoiding doublespeak, and addressing issues head on and with courage. We're going to talk about homelessness later, and three people on this body have proposed that we shut down a community of people with no alternative options for real shelter. Would you call that civil? Are we allowing, or how about the allowing of the displacement of our low and very low income people? Artists, museums, or musicians, nurses, teachers, union workers, people of color, all of these vital groups that bring diversity and life to our city are being pushed out because of our inability or our unwillingness to establish anything that even resembles real protections for renters. Is that civil? To me, the many researchers, and to many researchers, civ civility and morals obligate us to dive deep, interrogate, and identify what it means to keep what Dr. King called a positive peace and not uphold a negative peace. Civility goes beyond being nice. It's not, uh, because being nice, as uh, uh, Bajay says, is not telling people what you think about their ideas that you disagree with. Civility means speaking your mind, but to your opponent's face, not behind their back. It means not pulling all of your punches, but not landing all of your punches at the same time. And civility is courage. So I hope that we can move forward passing this proclamation and not just talk the talk, but actually walk the walk as elected officials here in Santa Cruz. Thank you. I will just um, say a few words. Okay. <laughs> So I will um, just say, uh, just in addition to the, the co-signers of the item, that you know, as elected of our local government, we have the obligation and responsibility to um, express civility and to lead in that way. And that our community is observing, as you all are here in our chambers, but so are our children. And we can't help but acknowledge that there is a different tone at, at the national level, and there are different, that tone has infiltrated into um, local communities as well. I will just read the proclamation and each of the council members will receive a copy of the proclamation as well, but for the uh, community, uh, their benefit, as well as those who may be listening at home. So the, uh, the Mayor's proclamation on civility, whereas the erosion of civility in recent years has had an increasingly damaging effect on our communities and nation, dividing people from one another, fanning distrust and fear, and undermining our public institutions and sense of well-being. And whereas civil discourse is the free and respectful exchange of differing ideas in a way that respects and affirms all persons while hearing their perspectives. And whereas listening to each other, seeking understanding across differences, and exercising civility assists in the process of working together and rebuilding trust, fostering respect among various groups, and helping us forge solutions to our most pressing challenges. And whereas community members should feel safe and respected while expressing their opinions, as well as, as, well as exploring views outside of their own. And, he, and whereas heated rhetoric and resistance to collaboration hinder our ability to solve the challenges confronting our community, society, and nation. And whereas civility discourages the use of rudeness, ridicule, ridicule insult, and threatening behavior that undermines the open exchange of ideas. And whereas sharing our personal hopes, dreams, fears, and lived experience can help us understand what unites us over what divides us strengthening a, a sense of shared values so needed by our country and community. 
and whereas civility improves our sense of well-being, restores trust among individuals and institutions, and encourages us to participate in building strong communities now and for the future. Now, therefore, I, Martine Watkins, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby endorse the commitment of civility on behalf of the City of Santa Cruz and proclaim the week of April 5th through April 12th, 2019, as a week of conversation and encourage all citizens to support civility by listening respectfully to people who have different views, avoiding language or communication that is insulting and derogatory to others, and supporting efforts to work together across ideological, political, or other lines that may otherwise divide us. So that is the mayor's proclamation on civility. I will uh, see if other council members have any comments or if any member of the, of the public would like to address us on this item. This is item number 14. And you could uh, come forward, you'll have two minutes to speak and please line up to my left if you're interested in speaking. Please. Good afternoon. Um, this is sort of a weird thing because normally the mayor's proclamations are just part of the of the agenda and they're not discussed or brought before the public or be, for a vote of the uh, council. It's just a proclamation that the mayor makes. Me, so I'm kind of wondering why we're, we're vote, you know, there's a vote on a mayor's proclamation and my take on this is that <clears throat> there's also people have the First Amendment right to free speech. And so whether or not that speech is civil is not a matter of interpretation. It's a matter of they have the right to say whatever they want to say because that's <clears throat> what our Constitution guarantees. So whatever it is that this proclamation is trying to do, it should not impinge on people's right to free speech. The, the people's right to free speech should supersede anything that this proclamation is trying to do. Thank you. Hi, my name's Elise, and this is really interesting because a couple of meetings ago, I believe it was the special meeting on March 19th, late at night, I got very angry because I feel I've been witnessing obstruction of the city council procedures. And um, I feel that a lot of the things that have been happening to obstruct a progressive new council from actually being able to set new policy that is actually progressive has been done very civilly behind the scenes. And I can also say that I remember a certain council member here who's a landlord downtown was able to get a very um, beloved priest, he was an Episcopal priest in one of the churches nearby, removed from his office because he was serving teen soup, teen mothers. It was done very civilly and that person uh, had to leave their post. So what I'm just saying is first of all, this, this word civil, um, it's non-actionable. What is civil depends on what your opinion is, what class you come from, what ideas you hold about what's maybe fair play or polite procedure. Well, I just wanna say that in my many years of travel into being a part and trying to understand people of different races and classes, I've come to understand that my notions coming from a very white upper class suburb in New Jersey were extremely limited about what civility is. And I had to learn that people who were very so-called polite and dignified people who respected the law were doing things that first appeared to me to be uncivil. So what I'm saying is, first of all, I'm sorry that I lost my temper that night, but mostly I'm sorry because it hurts me. As Chris Crone said to me, it probably was over the top. But please don't pass this un unactionable item. It's a way for the upper classes to squelch free speech and behavior that they basically <coughs> don't like. I'm Nora Hockman, and Bonnie, if we could get the picture of WTF off of this screen, that'd be great. I know, but I'm looking at it, and I wanna say those three little letters out loud about this item. 
I just don't understand why this is a discussion in the public sphere. Uh, it, it certainly wasn't a discussion when members of the minority were in the majority and were distinctly uncivil to the majority. So stop this nonsense. You know, in the 70s, we marched angrily for abortion rights. We're still marching. Women began marching for our rights again five years ago. African Americans and people of color are still marching and they have since the Civil War. So when you talk about being civil, we're living with a mayor that doesn't let people get to the end of their sentence. And that is distinctly uncivil. This is just a goofy waste of time. Next speaker. Okay, pretend like you've just met me for the first time. So um, this is a little exercise in civility. So I'm wondering if you can uh, repeat back to me after I'm done speaking what I said, okay? I'm just asking you to try it. So in the interest of um, not criminalizing homeless people and not making a situation worse, my question is, um, has gravel been dropped at the old River Street shelter? site where there was a shelter for 80 people. Second to that question is, Go ahead and pause the time. is it possible to I'm just create? Gonna, I'm gonna pause the time really quick. We're on item number 14, which is um, a motion to endorse the mayor's It's okay, I'm using it as an example. You'll have an opportunity. Oh, you're, okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank Forgive you me. for letting me finish. Thanks. I understand it's really hard for you to keep it all together. <sighs> okay. I didn't, I didn't appreciate being interrupted, and I'm gonna walk away because I didn't appreciate being interrupted. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker. Well, I'll just remind the community that we'll have a chance, we have a chance to hear every person individually, whether we agree or disagree with each other. They will be given their two minutes of time or the allotted time no, that I will do. be consistent, no, I that I will um, ensure that's consistent for equity of voice. And um, please be respectful and allow each individual person to speak before us without interruption, whether or not you agree with them or disagree with them. And you'll have up to two minutes. Thank you. Um, when I saw the agenda and I saw this item, I thought, oh, wow, how timely. Um, it, uh, uh, the, the recently funded, $30,000 funded by your, this council here, Tenant Sanctuary Organization, uh, was holding a um, tenant counseling. And as you recall, when, when a couple months ago I came and spoke against it, saying it was kind of a bad look for the city given the, con the, the, the uh, constituents of the uh, organization. But hey, it, you know, okay, it was passed. So I thought, why don't I go see what um, our $30,000 is buying and offer my 33 years as a landlord uh, in Santa Cruz, over 100 tenants, a lot of knowledge of um, landlord-tenant relations and so forth, and offer my assistance and see how I can be of help. Uh, let me just play this video, and this is what happened Sunday morning. <clears throat> I, You're not welcome, Terry. I'm sorry. Well, we're going to have to have to, this is going to go to the city, okay. and we're going to have a discussion about You're this. You're welcome to do that. But this is, you said so it's funded by the city, correct? Correct? Yes or no? The program is, yes. And so, therefore, it's a public event. It's not open to you. It's hard. Right, that's all I need. explain why. Okay. I don't think it all came out. Essentially, I was blocked from entering by one of the, uh, cons one of the members of this tenant sanctuary. So... Again, our, our tenants here in this town, they really deserve better. You know, just look at the, just look at the webpage for Project Sentinel, for instance, and see the services and see the, you know, the uh, balance and so forth they have. You wanna talk about civility? I would start with maybe re reviewing the funding and maybe putting it out for a bid again, perhaps for some, a more civil organization. Thank you. And if I could get a sense of who would like to address the council on this item. Okay. Okay, great. 
And if you are, please do line up to my left. Okay, you'll have up to two minutes. Okay, um, I just wanted to talk about uh, my personal experience with the civility of the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, I've been hunted by the police for trying to sleep in my vehicle, survive, being uh, forced to uh, say, lose my vehicle and end up sleeping in people's doorsteps. Um, the the anti-homeless laws that have been passed all over California, not just here, are, are completely uncivil by any means of humanity. Like if you have any humanity at all in your heart, you would know this is true. Um, there are a lot of laws that are still in a place that are completely uncivil. So, I mean, really, like, look in the mirror. Like, what, what, what are we doing? Like, what, what is this room doing to, to address this? I think that all anti-homeless laws should be abolished. Uh, if you take people's rights away to, like, go, say, find their own spot to be safe, then you end up with tent cities that are completely, like, jumped up because people are trying to, you know, <coughs> find strength in each other to, to, to fight harassment. Um, ultimately, the, a lot of the power that's been given to the police here need to be taken away. A lot of the laws that, that target homelessness, all they do is perpetuate it by uh, putting the homeless further in debt. Um, that's completely uncivil. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Melissa Freebaron. Um, yeah, so what civility means to me, you know, it's interesting to hear certain members of this council talk about civility when uh, they don't give it themselves at meetings. Civility is, you know, a choice, right? To engage in dialogue with people who might not understand as much as you understand. They might not be at your level of engaging in certain issues. And it is possible to be a progressive and be compassionate and be a renter and not wanna walk down the street with your daughter as a single mom and have someone ride by on your stolen bike or have them flash your penis you know, to them in front of the grocery store surrounded by trash or have needles dropped on the beach. It is possible to be all these things, to be a public servant, to be a nurse, to deliver Narcan to addicts that are ODing, to also believe that our parks should be for the elderly and children and for people to run their dogs, for people to enjoy all the open spaces. It is possible to be all these things. And I find it really distressing that to be anti-enabling um, <coughs> of a certain group to be lumped into this category of non-compassionate and someone who doesn't understand the issues and someone who isn't capable of actually dialoguing solutions, you know? Many of us in the community work in these positions tending to people on a daily basis and we understand what it means to be civil. Ethics, as a nurse, you treat everybody the same that doesn't, that class is everything, class, gender, race. It is possible to be all these things wrapped up into one. And just to confirm, so I have an accurate understanding of who's interested in speaking to item number 14. Okay, so um, Mr. Norris, you will be our last speaker on this item. Go right ahead. I'd like to say that uh, for a town to dictate policies upon a population and then call the resistance to it uncivil is not good for a healthy community. The reason we allow uncivil discord is so we do not have uncivil actions as a means of expression. Thank you. Hello. Um, I lived in Santa Cruz for 15 years. I visit my family periodically. My sister's been raising three children here for the last 18 years. Her rent started at $1,400, and now it's $2,800. Not civil. Um, also, it's an incredibly wealthy town. I had a client here who complained about the streets not being repaired. I'm complaining about not having a bricks and mortar place for more people who need the darn, you know, good living facility. And so I have an image that maybe will get across to people. Can you see it? It says, um, it says 
it says people over profit. So whatever middle class is dwindling here to where it's upper middle class and the rest just really poor. And then of course the homeless, what has happened and what is going on with the budget in Santa Cruz? Who owns Santa Cruz? Hello, you probably all know me already. My name is Elliot, I'll keep this short. I think this entire item on the agenda is a huge waste of time because calling for civility isn't gonna change people's minds who are pissed off and want to act uncivilly, however you define it. I think that this section of the agenda is a waste of time because people are gonna be as civil as they're going to be. And if they do choose to be uncivil, depending on how they do it, whether you're talking about a very nice police officer or a very angry vegan, they're going to find a way to justify it. And federal law will generally usually back them up because according to federal law, I can flip you all off right now if I want. I can flip off all the police officers here. I can flip off the children. That's my right if we care about those, right. which apparently some people don't. Rights and laws. Um, the systematic violence of um, uh, the city council, city manager's office, uh, city attorney's office against the uh, d uh, most unfortunate people in our community is not civil. We have decades of incivility against the most um, um, marginalized people in our community. We even bring up proposals at city council that are not civil that will be on the next agenda item. That. We falsely accuse people as, uh, um, at the beginning of sessions about sexism just because their agenda item has n is not allowed to be on the agenda. That's not civil. There, you know, as the thousands of people continue to flow onto the streets of our country, you're gonna see civil unrest and that is largely as a result of intentional policies by bodies like this across the United States. So you're darn lucky that it's not more uncivil, considering how brutal the policies of this city are against thousands of people living on our streets or trying to survive in this city. That is not civil, attacking children and in their cars and towing their homes away so that they get to live in a doorway and come to Food Not Bombs and try to find out where there's a shelter and then only to find that there is no such shelter, that is uncivil. And that's the type of uncivilness that I think that this council, and you know who you are, should uh, consider. You, it's, it's, I'm just shocked that there isn't people storming the city council in total anger at the uh, constant arrests and harassment and violence and improper jailing and lack of ability to find housing. Time is up. Okay, so we have, uh, we have three additional speakers and after the last speaker, which is uh, there on my left, which will be you, Carol, uh, we'll go ahead and close this item and return for um, uh, action. Another speaker. Um, yeah, I think that would be civil to allow everyone who wants to speak to be able to speak and for a reasonable amount of time. Um, that often isn't the case at city council. It's been less and less the case over the years. Uh, we should be having three minutes, not two minutes. Uh, at least that was the tradition. But I mean, even these are really token amounts of time. You really need a different kind of dialogue with the community. I mean, I was impressed with uh, the dialogue that council member uh, Glover had the other day with uh, 70 people in the Depot Park area. He wasn't talking to his friends. Some of them perhaps were. He was talking to people who were critical of what he was doing. And he was dealing with that in responding to that. I think that's important. That's what, to me, is important. Now, you might say civility is really kind of, um, 
it's an affectation of the upper class. The upper class wants the lower class to be civil and quiet in its poverty and in, its, in the differential between privileges and wealth that they have, because otherwise they'd have to put them down. Now, we see that happening at city council with a police officer standing uh, aside, keeping an eye on the decorum of the, uh, this particular body. Uh, the real issue is power. If people have more power, then you can have real civility. Real civility. You can have, for example, agendas should not be made in secret. They should be made in a public process here in this chamber. Uh, a week before, perhaps, the council meeting. Not two weeks before. Not in a way that excludes uh, the majority that was voted on in this election from actually making the agenda, which is what uh, Mayor Watkins has done with the collusion of the city manager and other members of this council. So I think if you want civility, unless you're calling for submissiveness, which may be what really is the agenda item, I would say to this audience, don't be submissive. Whatever your perspective, assert yourself. Thank you. I'm glad the issue of civility came up. I think there's two sides to almost everything that comes before a body like this. And uh, you need to somehow engage people on both sides, whether it's the email or coming here and talking and whatnot. You don't find real solutions that, you know, are kind of balanced and people accepting of the government if they aren't, um, if you don't find solutions and you uh, polarize. And so I think that people uh, that don't have an opportunity to do that, we have civil government. We can go to vote. We can go to precincts and canvas and knock on every door in town and get out the vote. To me, that's kind of the, the last statement in the civil government is that we can vote for what we want. Um, you know, there have been times when we have to protest in this country to get noticed. I support that. But it's usually the vote in the end that in civilized governments, uh, you know, dictate the change over time. Thank you. And you will be our last speaker. Hi, um, I tried to stifle myself, but I couldn't. I wanna commend you on your bringing up civility. I think it's essential. I go to a lot of these meetings. I went to Drew Glover's meeting the other night. I went to the housing meeting. I come to all the city meetings that I can come to. We have some tough, tough problems that we have to solve. We are all in this together. If you are afraid to express yourself in a meeting because you think you're gonna get snapped at or hissed or booed or yelled down, which I've had all of those things happen to me when I was just trying to say what about this or what about that, how are we ever gonna come to any solutions if people are afraid to speak? People being afraid to speak is a function of how they expect to be treated. If they expect to be treated rudely, they're probably gonna not talk. So we have to be civil to one another. Civil doesn't mean rolling over. It means not yelling. It means actively listening to one another. It means trying to have an open mind. That's civil. Thank you for insisting on it. We won't get anywhere without it. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes uh, public comment for this item, item number 14, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. I'm gonna motion to endorse the mayor's proclamation declaring a commitment for civility in the city of Santa Cruz and join the initiative to revive civility. Okay. I'll second that. So we have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by uh, Councilmember uh, Myers, uh, Councilmember Brown. Just a quick comment. Trying to speak directly to the matter at hand, I think we've had uh, some wide ranging discussion about what civil how it's determined, it, I'm just gonna say, what we all know is that uh, civility is, um, so is a subjective, right? It's a subjectively assessed by individuals and groups. Um, there's nothing we can do about that um, as an abstract notion that yes, we should all be civil and, and treat each other with respect. I absolutely agree. Um, I'm gonna support the motion, um, but I do think that it's, it's worth reminding ourselves that um, again, s civility is subjective. So um, whether or not um, we believe that expressions of, um, 
um, discontent and, and robust political debate is civil or not, that's up to us as individuals. Um, and I think it's all of our responsibilities to comport ourselves with respect for others in those conversations. Um, I'll leave it at that and um, thank you. Um, further comment? Yeah, just, um so I appreciate the comments made by the people of the community. Really um, wonderful to hear the spectrum of perspectives on civility and the topics and the application of it. Uh, while I mentioned in my initial statement that I do support the proclamation, I do just want to go on the record and say that I hope that it's not used to squelch or restrict the speech of people as we move forward. And if it does, we may have to revisit it. But either way, uh, just wanted to make that statement. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. We have a four o'clock item on homelessness. We're gonna take a five minute uh, break and we'll reconvene here in about five minutes to begin that item. Item number 15.
at the Civic in the Tony Hill room. Um, and as a reminder, the order will be presentations followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment on item number 15 and all of its components and then return to the council for deliberation and action. I'll also just briefly remind um, the, the community and the council of our uh, conduct for city business, which includes to be respectful, to engage in open and honest communication, to be honest and truthful, address difficult issues, find areas of common ground, to be open to different perspectives, to keep an open mind, to give the benefit of the doubt, to role model good leadership, and to be considerate of each other's time. It's my job as the uh, presider of this meeting to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to participate, participate in uh, government in a way that is respectful and open for everyone. So I'll ask that you please um, uh, maintain quiet while we go through the process. And when your turn to speak is um, uh, available <laughs> to you, then we will ensure that you have your opportunity to speak without disruption. Um, if there is disruption and I notice that from an individual, I will um, give a warning. And if it is repeated, I will ask that individual to leave. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and see if we uh, can move right into our agenda and I'll invite up uh, our staff to briefly open the item. I'll just remind uh, the, the community that we'll have an opportunity to hear from you all, and now is the opportunity for our staff to briefly open the item before we have individual presentations. Okay, I'll just do a really quick, quick uh, uh, introduction. So you'll recall that uh, at your last uh, council meeting, um, as, uh, as part of the uh, public uh, oral communications uh, towards the, the end of, of the meeting, the council provided uh, some direction with respect to agendizing uh, an item with respect to uh, lot uh, 24 reconsideration and other homeless related agenda items. So uh, that is what is before you. Uh, so staff went ahead and agendized that. And then uh, in addition to that, uh, we have uh, some other items that are being brought forward by council members and that's items 15.2 and 15.3. And then in addition, the city attorney uh, has some recommendations as well, which is items 15.4. So I think the intent now is to go through and uh, updates on each one of those items. Okay. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Um, myself, Chief Hyduke, and uh, City Attorney Condotti are gonna provide very brief presentations on the current conditions at the camp. Um, an update on progress to open 1220 River Street, and then current anticipated litigation that we are in the process of reviewing. So I'll call upon Chief Hyduke to come up and provide um, an update on conditions at the camp. Mayor, Council, Jason Hyduke, Fire Chief. Um, and so I was asked to give some conditions on the camp, and I'm really gonna focus on the public uh, safety and some of the life uh, hazards that we have there. Since November 1st until uh, today, we've had 75 calls for service uh, to the camp, which is an unusual uh, clustering of calls uh, within the city. Uh, we've had nine uh, fire calls, uh, some of which, uh, even though they're termed fire calls, they were people driving by and seeing an open bonfire or uh, smoke, and so that we, we got called. We've had three fires that have resulted in uh, total destruction of a tent. Um, we've had people that have been transported uh, to burn units because of that. We've also had 59 calls for service for uh, medical calls. Um, and to my knowledge, we've had fa five fatalities that are associated with the camp. Uh, some of those uh, are have some concurrent health issues in addition to uh, drug use, um, which um, is not, um, I mean, it, the, the cause will come from the coroner. It's not gonna come from the fire department. Um, but our concerns uh, for the camp have nothing to do with homelessness or the, the fact that the camp is there. It's the manner in which people are there and the structures that are there. Uh, we have had a number of fires um, that have not spread from one tent to the other. And I attribute that uh, more to the weather um, and being wet than uh, the construction of the structures that are there and their uh, spacing. And one of my concerns is that um, we don't have a specific code for uh, uh, recreational tents. 
Uh, we generally don't uh, get engaged with the tent structure until it's 400 square, square feet or more. And then we require that that tent has, uh, the membrane is treated and so that it won't support open flame, it'll smolder. Um, and a number of the tents down there, um, people are, are trying to create shelter any way they can, uh, but they are all creating a hazard for themselves as well as the community that they're within because they don't have uh, construction materials that will inhibit flame. They don't have working smoke detectors. They don't have sprinkler <coughs> systems that we would require in any residential um, you know, sleeping uh, compartment. Um, a number of the tents are covered um, with um, blue tarps, uh, which in my opinion are solid, um, they're hydrocarbon. Uh, they have no flame resistive uh, qualities whatsoever and they're connected from one end of the uh, tent or uh, the encampment to the other without any separation uh, in between. So that if we did have a fire, you could expect it would stay within those compartments uh, there. Um, in addition, because of the congestion that we have down there, we also, I have concerns about people's ability to um, remove themselves at night in the smoke in a high stress situation. Uh, there's no clear pathways. Uh, my recommendation if we were going to um, do any kind of management of this tent would to have clear separation between aggregate groups of tents. Uh, anything more than 700 square feet would require a 12 foot break in between, not only for the ability to exit um, and to access for medical causes, which we do, but also to prevent flame spread from one end of the, the camp to the other. Um, and again, this, uh, these are codes that we have uh, within the adopted fire code that are based on real events. And we apply them regardless of your economic status, regardless of whether it's a business or a residence. Um, and it's when we issue a permit. And in this case, we've not issued a permit. And we're seeing with the weather drying up that this has become a greater potential. Um, and usually for us, our mechanism, other than finding people or holding them to a standard when they build it, is we evacuate or red tag a building. And we deny you the access or the use of that structure until you bring it up to code. And in this situation, uh, based on the condition of people that we have there, that mechanism has been removed um, on a lot of different levels, both um, politically as well as legally with Martin versus um, uh, Boise, that we, to, rem to enact sa life safety standards in that area, we would have to remove people from where they are to create that separation. Um, and I don't know of a good way to pick who uh, gets to stay and who gets to go, but it'd be my recommendation that we uh, create those separations within those tents, not just for the people that are uh, impacted or living within those uh, structures, but also for the <coughs> aggregate community that they uh, potentially can impact. All of the fires that have occurred um, have been human caused, whether they are intentional or unintentional. And we have tried to work with the camp about standards uh, for what you should and should not do within a tent. Compressed gases are being used for uh, cooking and heating, but a compressed gas inside of a tent structure is an asphyxiant as well as an ignition source. Uh, open flame devices, whether they're being used in candles, whether they're being used for smoking, whether they're being used for cooking, inside of a tent that is high piled um, is you know, a recipe for disaster. And so we've put those out there. This is what you should not do within your structure. This is what you should not do within your tent. Um, and we're continuing to have uh, issues with that. So my recommendation is even if we can't get to the point where this is closed or moved, that any uh, homeless encampment or any you know, encampment where people are using recreational tents as a full-time living facility, that we enact some standards, regardless of how they feel about it, for their best interest, for the community's best interest, so that we don't have a fire where we have a fatality or a significant injury to that person who caused the fire, but we also don't have a significant injury or a fatality to someone who's adjacent who had nothing to do with that event, who chose not to smoke, who chose not to have an open flame device. Uh, they were merely there. And so trying to prevent the, the impact to the individual as well as to the community. Questions? Do any of the council members have questions for our fire chief? Uh, maybe, maybe you said this, but how many recorded fires have we had there at the camp since in five months? Um, since November 1st, we've had nine responses for fires within there. I would say three of them were actual fire events, <coughs> um, probably what you would term a fire, but we've also had a number of open burning barbecues, uh, warming fires that we were called on, but they weren't a significant fire in the sense that they weren't destroying uh, a tent or causing injury. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilmember Matthews and then Vice Mayor. Yes, you mentioned uh, you felt there was a need to enact standards. Is that something that would be done administratively by your department? 
Potentially, it, but again, the mechanism for enacting these standards is removing people from where they are to create those spaces. And so there's, we have some conflict here between trying to recognize that we have people who have shelter um, and how they have that shelter is uh, not safe. Um, and in order to enact those standards, we are going to have to remove people from that place. I guess those are two different things, developing standards and then enacting them is. Uh, we, and again, we don't have direct standards for recreational tents. Yeah. That yeah. is something a little bit outside the purview. We do have the overarching opinion of the fire department that can be uh, imposed. And we have some, uh, some codes that we can use for tent structures that were not necessarily designed for habitation, um, that have separation uh, with, they have specific code that wouldn't be developed, it would be enacted. Vice Mayor Cumming. Has there been any, any attempt to get the residents at the camp to, or work with them to create spacing between the tents and what's been the outcome of that, if there has been? Um, we've, we've enacted, um, we've had some meetings with the camp council. Um, they've been very receptive to, to meeting. Uh, the problem has been that no one wants to displace their tent in order to create that spacing. Um, and a, a lot of the material that is there is, um, while it might provide shelter, it does not provide a, any, any degree of life safety as far as how it's constructed and how it will react to fire. That's Mayor Myers. It, I, I know at one point there was pallets, I think, brought in, and I'm just curious about whether those are still there or where, what, what the stat status is of those. There's a lot of pallets. Um, there's pallets that have been used as both uh, material to get off the ground because of wet weather. And there's also pallets that have been erected uh, as walls or, you know, to, to string, uh, you know, waterproof material over. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, wooden pallets in, in, the, in the encampment. So there's a lot of flammable material, it sounds like. And as we get into drier weather, it will. Okay. Thank yes. you. Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so thank you for your work in getting all of this fire safety stuff under control, or at least with the recommendations. Um, and thank you for meeting with the camp council because it's great to have that representation and interaction with the fire department. Uh, I've had a chance to meet with them semi-regularly also. Uh, and one of the things that they mentioned when I met with them last time was their interest in being involved in the cleanup and reorganizing process. So just in your opinion, if we did identify an additional transitional encampment location to move a proportion of that camp, would it be feasible to work alongside the people in that are remaining in the camp to set up the structures and separate them so they don't have to be completely removed to be able to do that, but can participate in the process of cleaning? Yes, but I would say that the final uh, say over what lanes would be opened up and what would be removed would need to be um, held to the experts and not necessarily the residents, uh, even though they have strong opinions about it. Um, and again, most of these codes and these recommendations are based on events that have occurred and coming up with best practices for how to uh, prevent it from reoccurring in the future. Um, and I think most people, you know, their experience with a fire in their home and their neighborhood in the wildland is pretty limited um, to television, to uh, maybe a singular event, whereas uh, those of us in the profession, this is a day in and day out uh, thing. And so our experience in what we consider to be dangerous or to consider to be safe um, I would take that recommendation over someone's uh, desire to, to remain in place. I agree. I just have a quick question, and I'm not sure if you know the most recent um, information in terms of some of the public health challenges that have come about along with some of the rodent infestation challenges. That have come so Dr. Leff wrote a uh, letter uh, recommend recommending closure based on the um, you know potential for the outbreak of disease. Um, I don't have the latest numbers for the types of dise diseases. I do know that we had one case of wound botulism uh, that may or may not have been associated with the camp, uh, even though that person uh, had been at the camp. Uh, we do have rodent control uh, right now in place uh, for trapping. Um, they uh, have caught some some rodents, but uh, probably not all of them. And because of the layout of the of the the tents and with the lifting up of the tents off the ground on the pallets, there's a lot of uh, habitat for rodents there. And so there is that potential for disease spread, uh, not only because the rodents are there and the people are there, um, but because of the proximity uh, and the number of people and the occupant load that is within that camp. Thank you. Yeah. All right, any additional questions for Fire Chief Martin? Okay. I was gonna say, uh, uh, Susie's gonna. Oh, 
speak okay. next on 1220 River Street. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and I should have introduced myself, Susie O'Hara, assistant to the city manager. And um, as you can tell from Chief Hyduke's uh, discussion, it's an ever evolving situation out there. And even as the weather um, gets drier and warmer, we have additional considerations that we must make. Um, I wanted to give a brief update on the progress to 1220 River Street and also just um, reorient the council to this process. It really is, um, I would say, a three-pronged effort on behalf of the county, the Salvation Army, and the city to get that program up and running. <clears throat> And as we have been moving towards an April 17th opening date, um, issues have arisen that have um, caused us to think about how to be most effective in not only opening the program, but thinking about how to most effectively engage with folks at the Ross Camp and ensure that they understand what that program is um, providing and, and understand how best to transition folks into that program. So as a brief update, um, 1220 um, is in the process of contract negotiate, not contract negotiations, but contract execution between the county and the Salvation Army. That um, contract will be brought to the Board of Supervisors on the 16th of April. Um, at this point, I did just get an update from Captain Harold at the Salvation Army. They are really poised um, to open. They have been diligently working on staffing, um, as you can imagine. <clears throat> with their third program, finding adequate staffing to support a 24-hour program um, has been challenging. Um, so, and we, you know, we are in a, at a point of kind of reaching capacity in our community for delivering these types of services. So I think that's um, a different conversation for the council to consider as we think about ongoing needs for staffing for um, any kind of homeless sheltering operation. Um, they have been working very diligently in staffing. Um, I do believe that um, they are poised to open very close to the 17th. The additional prong to that is the city's responsibility. <clears throat> so that program will um, provide shuttle in and shuttle out service, and that shuttle service will be provided by the city. So we are in the process of hiring shuttle drivers and ensuring that we have adequate capacity to de deliver the same level of um, shuttle service that we had for the River Street Camp. Um, we put out a call for applications um, about three weeks ago. Um, we have received about six applications for shuttle drivers. Um, it, that is a very limited number of folks um, for the time commitment that it's required. Um, ensuring that folks are adequately um, trained in conflict resolution, trauma-informed care, kind of understand the whole scope of responsibility that we have, as you can imagine. For instance, we have an Uber driver that <laughs> applied. This is a very different type of program and really trying to orient folks to um, the responsibilities of a shuttle driver for a homeless shelter is something that we're taking very seriously. So with that in mind, um, we are, yes, poised to open. Um, we, the infrastructure is there. My thanks to um, Mike Hopper and Public Works and all of the other city employees that have really moved quickly, including Megan Bunch, to ensure that the infrastructure is out there and ready. So we are, we are poised to open. I do believe that we need some flexibility to ensure that when we are ready to close the Ross encampment, that we take really deliberate and thoughtful time to think about how to transition folks most cooperatively and effectively into the 1220 program. And so with that in, in mind, um, I do think we need to, in this, the discussion later after public comment, really think about an appropriate timing to uh, move forward with not only the closure of the camp, but also opening of the River Street camp. Thank you. Is there any questions for Susie at this time? Yeah, um, Councilman Kern. Thank you for your report. Um, how many folks do we hope will, will be able to uh, live at the uh, 1220 River Street? So I, I think there should be um, room for about 60 to 80 people. That's individual tents or 60 to 80 total, maybe two in a tent? There are 60 individual tent sites of which we are gonna reserve 10 for double occupancy. Thank you. Any other questions for Susie at this time? Council Member Matthews? And then come just to confirm, that would not be the only resource available to people. No, no. So, right. Yeah. So, the really the intention around the closure 
of the Ross Street, uh, the Ross Camp, and thinking about maximizing our shelter resources is look across the county um, and to um, best understand the bed capacity that we have available. I mean, the River Street Camp or 1220 is deliberately built to accommodate our Ross campers. And we're really um, focused on transitioning as many folks from the Ross camp to 1220 as we possibly can. Those um, two programs are really tied together from that perspective. We also have uh, 60 beds at the VFW. Uh, we have 40, bed, 40 to 50 beds at Laurel Street. There are um, beds um, in Watsonville, there's beds at the Pajaro shelter, there's beds at the AFC satellite program. And so what we really, what's really incumbent upon us to do now is think about how to maximize those shelter options and then also provide um, additional layers of service for folks. There are folks that uh, would, might qualify for um, an SLE or residential treatment program. There's folks that might qualify for a mental health bed. Um, there's folks that might be interested in, in, in uh, obtaining a homeward bound ticket. So it's really um, necessary to think about the entire wraparound level of services for folks and not really focus on just one program. Although I will say that 1220 River Street was really built to accommodate folks at the at the Ross Street camp. Thank you. Council Member Glover and then Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, just uh, for anyone that may not be up to date on that, can you just describe the setup of the 1220 site and how that'll run? Yeah, so it's gonna run very similarly to the previous River Street Camp. So um, we expect with a 24 seven program that folks will be able to stay there during the day. Um, it will have the shuttle in and shuttle out um, program. That shuttle service runs nearly every hour. So there was multiple opportunities to come and go um, from the camp. It'll be fully staffed with um, a manager's deputy manager and at least two site monitors per shift, three shifts per day, um, a day, a swing, and a night shift. Um, there will be security that's provided by the city of Santa Cruz to ensure that um, there is um, kind of a look at the neighborhood and making sure that there's um, harmony with the neighborhood in terms of the program. Um, there will be one meal per day that's provided by the Salvation Army. That will be um, a dinner program. Um, and so very, very similar to the River Street Camp, the Salvation Army um, runs their programs slightly differently um, in that when people come in, people are searched, although there is an amnesty program. So if there is anything that folks are worried about having in their possession. It is a no questions asked amnesty program. Um, there's an amnesty box, so there is potential to leave things that might otherwise um, be a barrier for folks to entry. Um, thank you for describing that. Thank you for all the work in putting this together. The reason I was asking the setup also was for so that people could know, but also um, you'd mentioned that it was specifically designed for the Ross campers, but from my experience in speaking with the people over there, the 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 structure that you just described is not what they are interested in moving into. So I'm just, there's a little disconnect there just based off of if it was specifically designed for the Ross campers. Um, and then the other question, was, or another one I guess is, is there a reason that uh, we haven't explored the transitional encampment model that I brought forward that uh, is less expensive and or incorporates nonprofits and smaller uh, populations of paid staff members? So I believe this council has discussed transitional campments over the last five weeks. Huh? So I do believe that those have been considered. Um, I will mention, I think that the, the, what I am talking about in terms of those two programs being connected is really about accommodating the number of beds. Um, access to shelter and barriers to shelter is individualized. So suggesting that um, the Ross camp um, or even the camp council might not find the 1220 program be suitable, actually does not consider the entire um, membership of the camp. Right. And so I think it's important to ensure that we actually have individual conversations with 
each and every camper out there to understand their barriers. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Is there, but, um, so just back to that transitional encampment question, uh, is, it's been discussed within this body and the language and structure has been proposed and, uh, to my understanding, approved for implementation. So I'm just uh, confused why we're not exploring that model at the 1220 River Street site. I don't believe it has been approved by the, by the council. <coughs> <laughs> no, so we're wa we're waiting on the uh, on the ordinance language to come back again for final adoption, or where are we in that process? Because I'm a little confused. That was what that whole push was initially was to create transitional encampment models that are available to be used in here. That's we went over the language, we talked about the ordinance stuff, and that's what my understanding was when we moved forward, uh, which is why I was a little confused when we were talking about a safe sleeping program at Depot Park because the transitional encampments are data driven and more beneficial, so maybe you could answer that. As I understand, council uh, discussed uh, what approach to take uh, and chose to uh, move forward with a safe sleep zone uh, type of program as opposed to a transitional encampment at, uh, at the depot parking lot. Correct. That was a direction that council took instead of the, what you're suggesting, a transitional encampment approach. And again, since then, then council took action on March 26 to bring this item back for reconsideration. So that's where we're at with respect to, so with respect to the transition encampment, there's really no, no work being done on that uh, as the council you know, directed that we focus on uh, something else. Right, well, this is what my confusion can is. I, can yeah. I add to that? Actually, the transitional encampment discussion has been approved in, in the form of a project charter. And so um, much of what you described in terms of the efficacy, in terms of siting, um, the ordinance changes that were recommended as part of your original 11 point plan, all of that was wrapped up into the project charter and that project charter is process is moving forward um, with the expectation that we would come back um, late summer, early fall to um, continue on that with that conversation as to um, the types of transitional encampments that might be effective in this community after a stakeholder engagement process um, in terms of siting, the types of programs, um, and then also how they kind of fit into the larger scope of shelter uh, feasibility that we are looking into over the coming months. It just seems strange to me. Can, can you let me know how much the 1220 site under this model will cost to implement? I don't have that figure in front of me. I mean, that's pretty relevant. Uh, just, I'm just saying with regards to us to be able to make the decision. Uh, the county it. holds the contract. I believe it's on the order of about $75,000 a month. Okay, and then can we just get a quick reminder of how much money we received from the state uh, to address emergency homeless issues and how much of that is still left to implement for trend, uh, emergency shelter options, i.e. sleeping programs and transitional encampments? Uh, the total is 11.6 million. The only amount that is left is, I believe, 1.6 million dollars for the for the purposes of uh, phase two, a navigation center. Mm -hmm. And so, where's the funding for 1220 going to be coming from? That's coming from HEAP. It's already been it's already been allocated. Okay. Um, okay. And I'm just going. This is my last thing, and because the whole point of transitional encampments and the reason why I keep saying it is because they're cost effective. So they cost tr tremendously less amounts of money and we can do it with partnerships with nonprofits. So I, I implore this body, if we're waiting on a project charter to come back to implement transitional encampments, we should expedite that process so that we can implement transitional encampments to solve our shelter issue. Because right now, with all of this, $75,000, I, I really appreciate all the work, but $75,000 a month to run a program for 60 people is the definition of bureaucratic waste of money. Like we could do so much more with $75,000. So yeah. I'm just gonna say to the body, I think that we should be doing transitional encampments. So, um, I, I just, I, I do uh, appreciate that the the discussion was turned back to the council. So it's response. It's the re just go excuse ahead and me. Pause for a second. Yeah. Uh, if I could please keep your voices down. We'll have an opportunity for public comment on this item at this time. We're hearing from our staff. So it's the responsibility of staff to move forward with direction from the majority of the council with a vote. Um, that has happened over the last several meetings, including moving forward with 1220 with Salvation Army. That was direction from the council, including the, the, uh, the project charter for transitional encampments. That was a recommendation of the council, including moving forward with the safe sleeping and, and, and um, storage zone. That was a recommendation of the council. So our responsibility is to continue to move forward with that direction 
if the council has a will to change that, that's the responsibility of the council. I'll just um, remind you, or remind the council and the community that part of the River Street uh, concept came from the two by two conversation when originally uh, moving forward with the closure of the camp too. So that's also what was sort of the impetus of that as a proposal. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings and then uh, Councilmember Myers. Just curious um, what information has been gathered and compiled on the current population at the River Street Camp. Because at the Ross Street Camp? Yeah. Yeah, so we have, so Megan and I have been working pretty diligently on trying to get information from um, the camp council. So I think it was two or three weeks ago, you could, was it maybe three weeks ago, that we um, worked with the camp council to um, pass out surveys. And that was really, the intention of that was to understand how many people were there what their barriers to entry into shelter was, in, addi in addition to um, essentially with the types of programs that we have available, um, how do people feel like they might fit into those types of programs, Get, getting to um, much of what Council Member Glover is talking about. Unfortunately, we didn't receive any surveys back. Um, so we are in the process of trying to think about other ways to get to that information. It is very critical that we understand the needs out there. Um, so we will continue to work with the Camp Council to try to get to that information. Any other questions for Susie at this time? Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Myers, did you have a question? And then Councilmember Yeah. Um, do we, how do we certify that an organization or an agency is um, basically capable of running any of these facilities? Do we have any kind of licensing? Do we look at any kinds of professional qualifications? Do we understand whether people are even trained in first aid? Do we have any idea who could run these facilities? You just said that we have reached, our community is at capacity for providing services. We don't have any more service providers I, is, is basically what I have heard. So how are we going to establish transitional encampments if we're already maxed out? And how are we gonna take care of people? We've had five people die in this camp. Five people, one just this week a young woman that was 20 to 30 years old. That is not okay. This is not, we're not fooling around anymore, folks. <coughs> People are dying in that camp. Right. Do we understand this? And this is not about having transitional encampments run by people who are not licensed to do this. You have to get not if you're gonna be taken care of by a government agency. That is our job. Our job is to make sure that people are, our, our public is safe and the people who are under our guidance are safe. So until I see some way that we are able to provide all of this, this assistance, go ahead and put, go ahead and put. then I'd really like to make sure, I'd really like to make sure. All right, all right, all right. I'm gonna go ahead and stop. Somewhere else. I'm just gonna remind the community. I'll remind the community. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and take a recess if we can't continue on with our meeting. So I'm gonna remind the community that you'll have an opportunity to address the council during public comment. Right now is the opportunity for us to have questions on, of our staff, to share our perspectives of our, of our proposals, and then to hear from you. At that time, we'll have an opportunity to hear from you. If there is disruption, I will have us recess and we'll try again. And if it continues to happen, we'll continue to do the same. And if we're unable to reach a conclusion tonight, then that is how it goes, unfortunately. So I appreciate in advance your respect and ability to um, withhold your comments until the appropriate time, which will be during public comment. Okay, do you wanna further your question? I, I apologize for m the pointed question that I'm asking, but I'm just curious whether or not we have any way of evaluating um, the capacity and if you could just speak to a little bit more of that, I'd appreciate it, thanks. So absolutely, and I, I'll give some additional context. When we, when we were in the process of trying to open River Street Camp, um, we found 
no available nonprofit to run that program. And that was for a, a myriad of reasons. Um, the, the length of time, for instance, that we're planning on having the program open, the ability to recruit on behalf of our, of our nonprofit providers to do that type of work um, for a short period of time, for instance. Um, different value systems on behalf of our nonprofit organizations in terms of what emergency shelter actually is and how to accommodate the population that we're needing to serve. Um, that caused the city to move forward with running the River Street Camp on our own. Um, we also gained a ton of information through that process. This go around um, in research of transitional encampments, in research around um, contracting methods and who, what kind of nonprofit NGOs you would be looking for, you need nonprofits that have government related experience. You need nonprofits that can um, think about um, the fiscal risk, all of the responsibilities that an organization might be taking on to serve this population. Um, we have a very small number of nonprofits in our community that can meet these expectations. Um, we have found um, from both the city and the county that um, through our conversations around who might be able to run these types of programs, um, the list is very short, very short. And for folks that, um, let me go back, um, to meet the demands that we have that are ever evolving, that are crisis in, in level, um, that is something that our community is having a hard time meeting those expectations. And so I, I will say, with any um, contract, we have a procurement process. We have a contract process that requires many different levels of professional um, responsibilities. Um, that is across the organization in terms of our contract um, methods and processes. Um, that it, it would be no different for this. Um, we would expect to do an RFP and see what kind of responses we would get um, and then go from there. And just real quick, one last question. Um, the So I know working with state grants, I do a lot of that. Professionally, um, there's usually quite a lot of uh, restrictions in terms of how uh, funds are, are spent. Uh, is there any, within our grant contracts, do we have a requirement for any kind of certain kind of service qualifications or anything like that for this kind of thing? Well, absolutely, and with the heap, heap and cash funds, it's even more stringent. Um, but yeah, I mean, in performance metrics, um, what our expectations would be in terms of um, measuring what success looks like and also having kind of those contracts um, stipulations really spelled out, absolutely, that would be part of the process. Thank you. Okay, so we'll have a few more questions for Susie and we'll have more opportunity for um, discussion later. So I uh, will go to Councilmember Crone and then Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover. Councilmember Crone, questions for Susie? Yeah, thank you. Um, the, we have a letter uh, from the ACLU this this week um, threatening litigation if we uh, close this camp. Do you see a role, Susie, for the ACLU and their uh, real juggernaut of, of 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 resources that they could bring to bear on something like this in a way that? the city and the ACLU can work together on an issue such as homelessness? So after my presentation, uh, the city attorney is gonna be talking about this subject. So um, I'm happy to provide my perspective on that, but I, I do think um, generally speaking, it is incumbent upon the city to bring in um, a diverse cross section of stakeholders into this conversation. And I think the ACLU would fit into that as well. Thank you, and the question, another question I have for uh, Martine Bernal, it says that, uh, I guess in your um, letter to the community, you said there were 100 uh, folks living at the Ross camp. How did you determine that? Uh, that was the uh, best estimate that we got from uh, our fire department from when they went out and uh, uh, evaluated the site. So that's just an estimate based on you know staff out at the site uh, when they've done um, Inspections. So we haven't taken a census or, a, you know, as, as um, Susie pointed out, n no evaluations or, or been attempts questionnaires as, as have come she back. Described. There have been attempts, as, as she described, yes. But, and, but it has not been successful as And the letter we have says there could be up to over 200 people um, at that camp. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, Councilman Brown, 
question for Susan? I'll pass. Thanks. Do you have additional questions? Yeah, just two quick ones. Um, Thank you for doing the outreach to I'm gonna the- I'm going to go ahead and remind you to please keep your voices down so that we can uh, uh, hear uh, Councilmember Glover at this time. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thanks for doing the outreach to the nonprofits in the faith communities. It's really important. Um, can you just describe the outreach process to specifically churches and faith communities with regards to the establishment of transitional encampments? Yeah, so we held a community-based meeting um, probably, f I don't know, three or four weeks ago. It felt like five minutes ago. <laughs> um, actually had um, a signif significant number of uh, non, I'm sorry, faith-based programs um, come to the meeting. It was highly interactive, um, really trying to describe um, both transitional encampments and safe sleeping programs. I will say the outcome of that meeting was quite positive. There is a lot of faith-based organizations who are interested in being a part of the solution, although they really need more information about what is being asked of them. And they also, um, you know, really want to be a part of dialogue as to all types of different solutions. I mean, I think our faith-based partners um, have volunteer um, you know, uh, volunteers that outnumber probably a lot of our different sectors in our community that are really interested in helping with the issue around homelessness. So whether that being um, food drives or blanket drives or the whole kind of spectrum of different in-kind uh, resources that a faith-based community can provide. I think they are poised to offer that. However, um, during that process, we really wanted to get to a question of, um, is one of our local churches interested in siting and or operating a transitional encampment? And folks just didn't really have enough information at that time to be able to say yes to that. So um, just to be as clear as possible, you're saying that there are people and organizations like churches that have expressed interest but are just waiting on additional information for the potentiality of siting on their property or running a transitional encampment. I would say that they're interested in dialoguing across all different kinds, kinds of solutions. I think there's a lot of fear about encampments in general, as we've seen. I don't think our faith-based partners um, have any less challenges around what it means to site a transitional encampment um, on their property or in their neighborhood than any of our neighbor organizations. I think it's really about getting more information as to the program model and how it would be run and really thinking about um, how it would be um, kind of harmonious with the neighborhood. And so would you maybe be able to get me a list of the faith-based organizations or the organizations in general that were present at that meeting? I'd love to see that. Sure. Great. And then just the last thing, you mentioned that there was something that came up in the conversation that uh, helped you to identify a difference in values. Could you expand on that a little bit more and what you mean? Oh, uh, with nonprofit organizations? Yeah. Yeah, so I, um, you know, it's, we have a number of nonprofit organizations that have boards of directors that are helping to guide the vision and direction of those organizations. Um, each of those organizations are working to solve homelessness in different ways. Um, and as we work with these nonprofit partners, we must try to balance our needs with their program delivery and what they are intending to do. Um, and I would say that um, as it relates to even the type of shelter that they are comfortable in, in providing, um, different barriers are, are identified through that process. And so trying to get to um, a conclusion as to we need a certain type of program that meets these these needs and removes these barriers. Um, that is a different conversation with every nonprofit that we have in this community. Um, and some some are flexible and some are not very flexible. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Okay, at this time, we'll uh, turn it over to our city attorney for a brief update um, from him on anticipated litigation. Yes. Um, first of all, uh, in response to council member Crone's uh, uh, question, we did receive a letter yesterday from, uh, it was jointly signed by the uh, ACLU of Northern California and the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. And uh, what the letter essentially does is it points out, as we've already discussed at some length, the Martin versus Boise decision. And, uh, and it 
asserts that the planned closure of the Ross encampment in the manner that the council has previously directed um, would likely uh, run afoul of the Eighth Amendment and 14th Amendment principles discussed in the Martin case. Um, I have to say having, uh, it takes issue with a number of uh, different items. First of all, uh, with the city staff's assessment of the number of overnight occupants in the encampment, um, with the adequacy of both the number of <coughs> alternative shelter options uh, that the city has identified and the adequacy uh, of the of the shelter options based on the standards enunciated in the Martin case. Just as an example, um, in the Martin case, there's a statement that says, we hold that so long as there is a greater number of homeless individuals in a jurisdiction than the number of available beds in shelters, the jurisdiction cannot prosecute homeless individuals for involuntarily sitting, lying, sleeping, etc., in public. That is, as long as there is no option of sleeping indoors, the government cannot criminalize indigent homeless people for sleeping outdoors. And the point that's made in the ACLU letter is that uh, an alternative uh, uh, transitional encampment in tents and sleeping bags, in their view, doesn't meet the standard of being beds indoors. Um, I think different language in the Martin decision suggests that, um, that, that that's an, an over reaching reading of the Martin case. Um, but there are ambiguities in uh, the, the decision as well. Um, they take issue with the plan to have shuttle in, shuttle out uh, services. Um, I think some of the information that, uh, that appears to be assumed by the authors of the letter uh, are that um, the city's only identified one alternative site for the Ross Camp residents to relocate. I think um, Susie has ident spoken to a number of different options for potentially relocating the campers um, or the occupants. Uh, the letter also, however, offers to enter into a dialogue to discuss the issues. Uh, it also takes issue with the draft standard operating procedures that are included in your packet for your consideration this afternoon. Um, but doesn't really give specific uh, comments on that. Um, but I look at it as an invitation to open a dialogue. Um, it doesn't expressly threaten to, uh, to file suit, but certainly um, at least implicitly does if uh, the ACLU perceives that the city is going in a manner that's inconsistent with the Martin case. Uh, I will also add that yesterday I received an email communication from uh, someone who's apparently one of the occupants of the encampment uh, indicating that a lawsuit was being filed uh, against the city uh, seeking an injunction, a preliminary injunction to enjoin the closure of the Ross camp. Uh, and I received a uh, packet of documents um, just a few minutes ago that appears to be a file stamped uh, complaint for injunctive and declaratory relief um, that cites the 8th and 14th <laughs> Appears to be um, uh, the same folks that communicated with me by email yesterday. Okay, we'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and remind the community one more time that we're going to have an opportunity to hear from you. At this time, we're having an opportunity for staff uh, question and presentation. Obviously, I f fully agree that um, the Martin versus Boise decision constrains the manner in which the city can proceed to um, to close the Ross camp. I don't think it. It precludes the city from doing so, but I think we have to be careful. And that's one of the reasons why I've proposed a set of standard operating procedures um, to, to guide that process. Um, like I said, the Martin decision has some ambiguities and it raises some questions. Um, and whether or not I've uh, touched all the bases or uh, have proposed something that a court would, would endorse under the standards set forth in Martin. Um, I can't be certain of that, but I've done my best to provide a, a reasonable proposal for the council's consideration. Thank you, Mr. Kandati. Are there any questions from council members for our city attorney, Kandati? Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. You mentioned there's constraints around our ability to close the camp. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Like what are some of those constraints? 
Well, first of all, we have to be able to offer alternative um, shelter options. Um, we have to uh, provide a process for allowing or assisting the occupants to preserve and, and relocate their belongings. Um, we have to give advance notice before moving forward with the enclosure or with the closure um, to the extent that there's property left or that people don't have the ability to relocate all of their belongings, we anticipate um, storing that information or storing that uh, property and making it available to uh, individuals who claim it. Um, and we have an obligation under existing state law to maintain that property for at least 90 days under the civil code. So all of those procedures are built into the standard operating uh, uh, document that you have. Um, like I said, the ACLU takes issue with some aspects of it. Um, you know, I think it's worth having a dialogue with the ACLU to see if we can sort those things out. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, Councilmember Myers, then uh, Councilmember Crone. Can you clarify if we offer shelter for someone, what are the bounds around that? Is there a length of time? Is there a location? Is there... Do we have any way of understanding? I, I just heard um, our staff let us know that there's a number of, of potential shelters throughout the county. Um, does it need to be within a block? Um, does it need to be, I'm just curious if you have any guidance or idea or basically guidance or thoughts on that. I think the Martin case definitely um, stands for the notion that there has to be real alternative shelter space available. Yeah. And it, available. And it, um, Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and say that that's a warning. I, I've heard you speak out many times at this point. Um, you will have your opportunity to speak to the council during public comment as everybody else here in the chambers will as well. So please uh, refrain from making comments. And if you do, again, I will respectfully ask you to leave the chambers. Okay, please proceed. Yes, the, um, the constraints that the court looked at in the Martin case, one specifically involved uh, shelter space, but that required participation in religious activities that the court found under the establishment clause that <coughs> not um, force someone to stay uh, in, a, in a shelter situation that required participation in relig religious activities to someone who, um, who didn't believe in, in those activities. Um, the other had to do with um, the length of time that a person could stay in the shelter. So uh, one of the shelters that um, one of the shelters that the, the court looked at only allowed occupants to stay there for a short period of time, and then they would have to leave. So um, so that's one question that's raised. The court does not um, do a good job of explaining specifically what constitutes an adequate shelter space. Um, and I expect that that issue will evolve in the courts over the coming months and probably years. Um, but, it, but it does indicate that a temporary shelter is uh, adequate for purposes of, of closing the encampment. It doesn't have to be for unlimited duration. I also don't accept the principle that the alternative shelter location has to be completely barrier free. <coughs> For instance, I don't think that um, the court would uh, would require that um, the shelter space allow illegal activity to occur um, or allow uh, activity that's so disruptive that other uh, occupants of the shelter can't peaceably enjoy um, the shelter space. So, so I don't accept the notion that it has to be without any barriers, I, but I think there are limitations on the barriers that can be um, that can be uh, placed upon access to the shelter. Did you have additional questions, Councilmember Cohen? Question. Thank you. Um, when you say um, we have to uh, provide alternative shelter options, I, I, I think the point in time uh, study said there's over 2,000 homeless people in Santa Cruz. Does that mean we have to provide shelter for 2,000 people? Um, yeah. I, it was pointed out that the 2,000 figures actually countywide. I, I've heard the, the number more like um, 12, 
hundred or thereabouts, and not all of those people are living under the stars. Some are sleeping in vehicles, some are couch surfing. Um, the Martin case isn't clear on that point. At the one, you know, the broad holding is that so long as there are more homeless people in the community than there are available shelter beds indoors, that um, the an, an ordinance prohibiting camping on public property is unenforceable against homeless people. But it goes on to say, our holding does not cover individuals who do have access to adequate temporary shelter, whether they, whether because they have the means to pay for it or because it is realistically available to them for free, but who choose not to use it. I think in order to implement the Martin decision in a practical way, you have to be able to say to an individual who's on public property, you have an alternative to camping here, therefore you have to leave. Um, I don't think that a court would say that you can never enforce an ordinance that prohibits camping on public property for someone who would simply have to avail themselves of available uh, shelter space. Um, I also think that the Martin case doesn't stand for the notion that a, an ordinance prohibiting camping on public property is enforceable against homeless people under all circumstances. For instance, the city could declare certain areas of the city where camping is prohibited uh, and and not prohibit at other locations um, so that there are areas of the city that are available shelter or at least available places for people to shelter themselves uh, in the city, um, but not the, I don't, I don't read it as um, that it's a free for all for you know, open camping in all city parks and public property. Thank you. Thank you. Another question for council, uh, for uh, city attorney. I just want, I had a follow up question on that. So if we, so we've tried identifying areas throughout the city, for example, and many neighborhoods have, have you know, come out in opposition of any type of camping area, been in their, um, going into their neighborhoods. And so my question is, without having available shelter space um, and identifying areas for camping, where does that leave the city in terms of enforcing any kind of laws around um, restrict, restricting camping and camping bans? The, the problem is, uh, under the current circumstances, based on the Martin decision, our ordinance that prohibits camping on public property throughout the city is unenforceable. And so that's why the police department has um, administratively taken the position that it will not enforce a 636 violation citations at the present time, um, which in my view is, is a temporary remedy only. And uh, ultimately we need policy direction from the city council to amend our ordinance to make it more consistent with the Martin case. One more question. Yeah, one more question. Um, and how does that relate to other laws that, um, that make homelessness illegal? So it, the, the answer to that question is that the Martin decision is couched in very broad terms under the eighth amendment to apply to the situation where a person is cited for violating an ordinance that they can't help but choose, uh, that they can't help but violate due to their personal circumstances. Um, and, and how far that goes is uncertain under the case law, but the Martin decision did cite a United States Supreme Court case <coughs> called uh, Val Powell versus Texas in which the Supreme Court looked at and it was a plurality opinion, so it wasn't a majority decision, but it, but it examined the, specifically the issue of alcoholism and being drunk in public and said, you know, obviously a, a homeless person who is drunk in public has no choice but to be drunk in public um, because they're an alcoholic. Um, it didn't go so far as to say that an ordinance prohibiting being drunk in public is unenforceable against a homeless person, um, but that, is one way to interpret the, not the Martin decision itself, but its legal import as it is uh, interpreted by other courts. And I expect that courts will be looking at that question. Question for Mr. Kandari. And that pertains to, uh, I think, I don't know if this was the language that Vice Mayor Cummings was looking for, but that laws that disproportionately impact people experiencing homelessness, because that was part of the, 11-point uh, plan that was referred to a little earlier in the meeting, uh, but that was a 90-day turnaround time for that data. So uh, in like another 30 days, hopefully we'll be able to see the, the results of the different laws like smoking, loitering, camping, urinating, all that kind of stuff, correct? Uh, well, yes, those 
those types of laws tend to have a disproportionate effect on homeless people. Um, obviously, alcoholics who have homes to go to can get drunk at home. And, right. Um, most alcoholics don't have that option. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that I believe concludes the updates from staff regarding this item. Um, this is a sort of a somewhat unique and I'd say a little bit different kind of com complex sort of approach. So what I want to um, do is ask uh, for just sort of a brief summary of the two individual council sponsored items that are before us uh, now. Um, and then I've received um, a number of requests for some presentations for public comment. So we will have some extensive public comment on this topic and then an opportunity to revisit in more detail the, um, the two proposals before us. Councilmember Brown. Just a question, your intention is to have the public speak once to all of That's so 15.2 right. and 15.3. Right. Gotcha. So what we'll um, do is, and I'll just sort of, uh, so what we'll all do is, so for 15.2 is an item uh, sponsored by myself, uh, Councilmember Myers and Councilmember Matthews. 15.3 um, is a subsequent item uh, sponsored by Councilmember Brown and Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, I'll just briefly say, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues to briefly make their comments on our item, that you know, over the past, um, I think, five meetings or so, we've had extensive conversation and suggestions around um, solutions, and I think what we have before us are two potential pathways. And I just um, recognize that this is evolving, it's complex, it's um, uh, really, difficult social challenges that we have before us, public health challenges that we have before us, people's lives. And, um, uh, you know, and there's a, there's a level of gravity to that. And I 100% recognize that. Part of our jobs um, as, as leaders who are elected is to make sometimes tough decisions, given the information we have at the time, even, how, even if it's not clear. And I think what we have before us is an opportunity for us to choose two different pathways. So I'll go ahead and um, just sort of preface it that way, um, turn it to my colleagues to just maybe make a few brief comments about the item and then, uh, and then to uh, Councilmember uh, uh, Brown and, and Vice Mayor Cummings to make a few brief comments about your item um, and then we could potentially open up to questions for uh, a short bit but then allow some public comment so we can return for action and deliberation. Just, just a point of order, if, if there's three items, um, would you, and people can't comment on each one, but I mean, council members will be able to. Um, would you be willing to give folks three minutes on each thing? One, that's one minute per item. If you go 9.2, 9.3, 9.4, instead of two minutes. I will um, allow for three minutes for the numerous organizations that are speaking on behalf of a number of folks. Um, I will allow that, my, the process I will um, pursue is to allow any individual who would like to make a brief comment to come first in one minute, um, and they can self-select in that way, then to have the presentations, and then to reduce it to two minutes for um, other folks. That would be the process that well, I, would I would just make a motion then, because there's three items, three clear items, and we're only giving them one minute per item, that we give each person who comes to the podium uh, the opportunity to speak up to three minutes. Then I suppose that you would probably want to incorporate in your motion some sort of modification to our oral communications time, which could, um, it, that would likely impede into that time. And or would you suggest that we pause for at 7 p.m. for oral communications? Yes. I no, we're not, this is not an opportunity for us to hear from you. This is an, op we'll have a chance to hear from you. Thank you. You can make a moment, you can make a motion I'm if you like. I'm making a motion for, th for three minutes if, if there's a second. Second. Okay, so there's a motion to have every individual who wants to speak up to three minutes. Is and that uh, yes, pause for oral communication at seven o'clock. And to pause for oral communications at seven o'clock to allow for that to happen. Okay, motion by Councilmember Crone, seconded by um, Councilmember Glover. For the discussion? Yeah. Um, I know that typically we've been providing folks with the opportunity for one minute and above. Um, and so I wonder if that's in order to make sure that, sure that we get through all the people who want to speak, if we if sticking to that model might be a better opportunity. If there are people who want to speak for three minutes, um, you know, I think that we did have an opportunity for people to call in and or to uh, write the mayor 
and request extra time. And so I do think that um, in the essence of time, it would be good for us to you know, stick to that model because oftentimes it seems like a lot of folks um, want to get their, their point across in the minute. We have a, a huge turnout for that these days. And so I don't know if it's necessary that we have three minutes um, at this point in time. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews. Can we, can we maintain that model and give people who want three minutes, three minutes, but they have to wait as per your, the model that you've established, which I think works. But so people who want to speak for a minute can self-select, speak first, and others who want more time. Given the complexity of the issue, I, I am inclined to give people a little bit more time here. And um, we've got a lot to sort through. Um, and people are here and interested in, in weighing in. And they're going to be weighing in on a variety of, of items. So. But, but I think we can still get amendment. to the one minute for some people. OK, uh, Councilmember Matthews. There's obviously a huge number of people who want to speak on this. I think the motion on the floor is for everyone to have three minutes. Is that correct? Have I understood That's it correct? That's correct. Um, but I incorporated uh, the friendly amendment from Councilmember Brown that if folks who want to speak first um, can go for one minute if they want to choose to speak for just one minute. Except and those who want to wait uh, can wait and speak for three minutes. Um, my own feeling is there's a great deal of overlap between these suggestions and um, people. Um, I prefer um, giving the advanced or the expanded time to those groups, representative groups who contacted in advance, giving the quick one minute, giving others two minutes for the package of item 15 uh, issues, because we are also going to need a good deal of time, I believe to deal with this ourselves. But that still gives everyone a chance. But I think um, uh, I would prefer that. Three minutes for a group, one minute quick comments for those who want to do it, and two minutes for the remainder. That is still going to really tax us. In the interest of time, motion okay. to call the question. I okay. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 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 Okay. So that passes, I believe, with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crohn, and Councilmember Glover in support of modifying public comment time. Okay. Just for clarification, that that's still going with the one minute model, <laughs> allowing people one minute. That's how I that's how I do it. But if you want to change that, you no. voted well, to change that. No, that's so what, that's what the incorporated into it. There you have it. It's incorporated into it. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move on to the two different proposals that are before <laughs> us under 5.2 and 5. I mean, I'm sorry, excuse me, 15.2 and 15.3. Um, 15.2 was an item to um, resend lot 24 approval for sleep, safe sleeping to revise the Ross Camp closure plan and to form a community and expert panel on homelessness. That item was brought before um, the council today by myself, uh, Councilmember Matthews, and Councilmember Myers. Uh, we'll go ahead and have a few brief kind of comments to sort of overview of the item and I'll turn to mm -hmm. to do that. Okay, thanks. And I think everyone in this room uh, appreciates the um, changing landscape of these issues and the complexity. So given that, I, I want to uh, just explain that the uh, item that we will be bringing forward has some modifications to what has appeared in the printed agenda. It's, it's largely the same, but with some modifications. So I just want to explain, um, after we've had all the public commentary uh, and questions and comments from council members, um, what we'll be bringing forward as a modification will be largely along these lines. And I should say I wanted to put this on the floor now so people knew about it. Um, so the first element would be um, rescinding the council's prior approval of Lot 24 as a safe sleeping and camping site and not pursue further campgrounds in city neighborhoods and parks. So that would be the first one. The second, the second item, uh, which called um, in the printed agenda, calls for confirming the April 17th closure date of the Ross Camp with alternative shelter needs to be met. Um, given information that we've received in the intervening time, both about legal issues uh, that have been raised and the uh, delay in availability of the um, 1220 River Street Camp, that language would be changed to the following. Motion to postpone consideration of the closure of the gateway encampment and opening of the 1220 River Street program until the April 23rd meeting 
to allow further evaluation and consideration of anticipated litigation. So it would, it would not um, confirm the April 17th closure date as written in the printed agenda. It would defer consideration of what to do about the gateway encampment and scheduling of the opening of 1220 River until our next meeting. Because as you have all heard, stuff has been flying at us and there's a great deal of ambiguity. There's interest in speaking with um, ACLU and other parties. Um, so that's, that's what the revised amendment will be. The uh, uh, item as it appears in the printed agenda calls for forming an ad hoc expert council on homelessness and with representatives in various subject categories um, to advise the council on policy. Um, and in talking with people, listening to the community and trying to see what would be actually most helpful at this point in time, um, that language is going to be changed to the following. Form a community advisory committee on homelessness uh, to evolve the scope and membership of this uh, community advisory committee to focus on three stages, um, community education and engagement, developing short-term solutions and longer-term policy work. And that would still include representatives from various um, areas of expertise that touch on homelessness. Um, and there is, we can discuss when we get back to the longer discussion, um, amplify a bit on that, uh, how that committee would be structured. Um, but anyway, I just, I wanna put that out there. It's somewhat different than the um, item that appeared in the uh, printed agenda. Council Member Myers. Um, I'll, I'll defer my time to Council Member Cummings and Brown. Okay. If, if you would like to take a moment to briefly introduce your recommendation. 15.3, whatever. Yeah, I'll just go first. Um, so given the urgent need for alternative sleeping areas in order to meet shelter requirements, uh, to close the current camp in compliance with Martin versus Boise decision after the March 19th city council meeting, the two by two committee meeting had been working on this, the assumption that the safe sleeping program was gonna come online. Uh, on March 26th, the city council voted uh, to agendize a motion to rescind the decision to turn parking lot 24 into a safe site for sleeping and camping. Um, the city reached out to the county in an effort to set up a meeting with the two by two committee prior to today's city council meeting, which was uh, set for last Monday, April 1st. Um, on the evening of Sunday, March 31st, an email was sent out to cancel the homeless two by two committee meeting and no meeting was scheduled with the two by two committee, committee to discuss how we were gonna move forward uh, with providing alternative shelters after the decision had been made to not use lot 24. Um, and given the, that we had no opportunity to meet and discuss what kind, kinds of alternatives we would be able to utilize in order to meet the needs of sheltering people who are at the camp, uh, council member Brown and I decided that we would um, recommend uh, what we have proposed today. We were um, hoping to receive and get the community to receive an update on the city county joint action plan for emergency shelter provision and encampment management, including efforts to identify locations and resources for a permanent year round shelter and navigation and day um, services. And we were also uh, directing staff to develop and implement an interim site management plan for the gateway encampment consistent with the measures outlined in the report that we provided and including cleanup site sleeping space layout, installation of additional hygiene and security measures, ongoing and interim operations management with the management plan to go into effect no later than the opening of the River Street campground. Um, we proposed this because we understood that if we weren't going to have um, alternatives online that we would need to do something and at the point in time where we have not been able to identify sites within the community, it seemed that it would be best if we were to try to recommend and work with staff to get a plan for managing the current site as it is and to have that coincide with when 1220 uh, came online. And as we know, we had an additional proposal from other council members and I think that um, ultimately what we're trying to do is see if that there are alternatives that we can bring online um, to meet the needs of the community. Um, in addition to that, as we've been provided with new information regarding um, 
the legal challenges we have around Martin versus Boise. Um, I think that we are still um, hoping to stick with this model and then discuss this further uh, after we hear from the public. And I want to um, let Council Member Brown um, provide any further comments. Thank you. I think, uh, I think Vice Mayor Cummings has um, well um, summarized the rationale and content of, of what we're proposing here. I would just make a couple of related comments. One, I actually don't believe that these are completely mutually exclusive or diverging proposals, competing proposals. I think there are elements of them that um, we should be looking at and considering we did not include the, the uh, motion to rescind lot 24 because we understood that to be already coming to us based upon a motion that was made at the previous council meeting. So it wasn't that we weren't wanting to include that, for example. Um, secondly, I think um, the you know, discussion about um, community <coughs> advisory committee is not mutually exclusive with um, rationalizing the gateway encampment on a temporary, on an interim basis. Really what's at question here is are we gonna close, are we gonna vote on a date to close the Ross camp or not? And even that seems to be for the moment potentially off the table. So I just want to say that that's, that's, I don't, I see, I think that we should be able to talk about all of these and figure out where the council has agreement and where we don't. When the time comes, I'll ask that we consider these um, as individual items, but I'll get there after we hear from the public. So I'd like to do that. Mr. Kondati? I just want to make sure we keep in mind that the draft SOPs are also part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. that right. yeah. The public has an opportunity to comment on. And you had previously addressed that. I don't the think I need to go over it again because okay. I touched upon it at the introductory remarks. Great. Okay, so at this time, I think it'd be appropriate to open up to public comment, knowing that we'll have an opportunity for further uh, council action and deliberation. Um, so what we'll go ahead and do is allow for any individual who is interested in speaking to the council in one minute to come forward and be um, given an opportunity to speak first. Um, once we conclude, from hearing from folks who are interested in addressing the council in the one minute time frame, we'll go ahead and open it up to the groups who requested additional time. You will have your three minutes and then any other individual thereafter can also have up to three minutes to address the council. If you want to speak for three minutes, you gotta wait behind everybody else. That's correct. So any member who's interested in speaking, the co any, any member who's interested in speaking to the council in one minute, please come forward and we'll go ahead and hear from you. Okay, you'll have up to one minute. Sorry, hi. Um, go ahead and go ahead and pause the time. This is a line for any interested individual who would like to address the council in one minute. Please line up to my left. You can stay there. You can. If you're interested in speaking to the council for one minute, please make your way up forward to my left in some way, and we'll give, be given your time before we resume the time. I'm gonna go ahead and wait until we have an opportunity so that the individual who is gonna be speaking to us can be heard. So if you can, please keep your comments down. I will. Okay, you ready for Okay, me? we'll okay. go, if you could, please keep your voices down. All conversation in the chambers can please stop. At this point, we have an opportunity to hear from the community and you're welcome to go forward, please. Okay, thank you. I just wanna make two quick points. One is that um, I became aware this week through talking to Ryan Coonerty that there already is a safe uh, parking space program available and he sent me a flyer. And I think it would be awesome if, uh, I know it's not your responsibility to tell the community what the county is doing, but I think it might alleviate some of the stress and angst we all feel and the responsibility that we feel that we're the only ones doing anything. So um, I was happy to hear that there are 15 churches with all these parking spaces and they're potentially available for referral, which is awesome. And then secondly, uh, cause I'm a little neurotic and I like to count things, I tallied the letters again. There were 477 pages of letters. Um, 324 in support of um, Myers Watkins and Matthew's proposal, which represents 80% of the letters received are in support of your proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, up to one minute. I just wanna get a little clarification on uh, lot 24. Go ahead and On lot 24, have you taken it off the table or you're still considering it? Uh, it was a little confusing how you guys worded it. 
Go ahead and pause this time. I'll just clarify for the community that right now we have various proposals. We have not taken any specific action on Lot 24. That will be uh, one of the actions that we will we will revisit after we hear from the community. Okay, thank you. Councilman. And if I could just add, I believe there's general agreement on that. It appears that there's general agreement. I, I would agree with that. Okay, next speaker and you'll have up to one minute. As a public servant and someone who provides nursing care under federal lawsuit, I find it galling that you guys are still gonna keep studying the issue and keep a camp open where bodies are piling up on yours and the county's watches. You are sending a team out of there of non-medical people to hand out thousands of needles. One who is a fake nurse who used to work for the city of Santa Cruz who it is unlawful in the state of California to represent yourself as a medical professional. I find it disturbing that you are so uneducated about the issues. You need to talk to people who know what is going on. Mr. Glover, I have never seen any data that you propose for transitional encampments. Where is the data? Your own city staff has no surveys to even identify the people or their needs at Camp Ross. This is unacceptable. Thank you. I have a quick comment question. This is a, a huge problem. We're a small community. Have you reached out to federal and state agencies such as FEMA and the National Guard for assistance in either planning, logistics, financial help? Might be something to look into if you haven't. Next speaker, you'll have up to one minute. My name is Dave Willis. I just want to say, do something. It's time, it's way past time for all this talking. Do something, take action. You yourself have said people are dying. How dire, how serious is that? I mean, it was a lady up here, she was talking about $75,000 a month. What does that mean? Is that $1,000 a person a night? That's crazy money. So you asked her a dollar amount, she don't have that information. And you asked her a couple other things, she don't have that information. She go to a meeting and don't have materials. If I come to you, I'm coming like this. Y'all say, he's carrying too much. Check her work, who's doing her? Who's checking what she does? Don't just rely on what she's saying. You all are smart, smarter, smart people. Do something now. All that time for talk, that was 30 years ago. Show us something. Yeah, I'm Next speaker, please. I just hope that the city council will not close the Ross camp until another long-term solution for the homeless in Santa Cruz has been approved. It makes no sense to deny homeless people a place to sleep at night or to be in community with others. We all live in Santa Cruz and we need to treat everyone with kindness and respect no matter what their circumstances are. None of us know when we may become homeless because of the high costs of housing, loss of a job, a medical crisis, or a local climate disaster. Thank you. I would just ask whatever action that the council takes that they do still encourage the enforcement of at least some of the laws that we have, specifically the drug laws. I'm very concerned about the current state of affairs with needles in the town. It's not a needle exchange, it's a needle giveaway. Needles need to have inherent value and it should be a one for one exchange. If it was that way, we wouldn't see so many washing up on the beaches and our pathways and in parks. Thank you. Hello, Coral Broon, <clears throat> Santa Cruz. I live at the Tannery. I do believe I'm the only one here now um, that would have any comment, I mean, speaking about it. <laughs> and I'm fine with uh, the Ross Camp where it is, if it's to be there. Um, there are concerns about what the city said they would do. They would uh, modify some of the uh, uh, where the porta potties are, and I know that's probably difficult, but 
uh, when people have to cross through there, that's one of the things that if it's going to be a long-term uh, proposal, that maybe that um, it would be better that neighbors could you know, feel like they could access it and um, they could walk through or they could uh, pass by there instead of avoiding it completely and having more hatred. I'm not sure, but I'm trying to be civil and I know that's about emotion. So um, it's really the hardest thing I've done today. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hi, I'm Frank Desimone. I've been in Santa Cruz since 1974. Uh, I'm about to move out because we can't take it anymore. I live on Market Street. I'm part of the Grant's, uh, Grant Street Park um, neighborhood. And our concern is gonna be if you do close the uh, Ross or Gateway encampment, then is the Grant Park and other parks, are they gonna be invaded? That's a very, uh, big concern of ours, but most mostly we're concerned about crime. That's what's going on and it needs to be addressed and the police need to be able to do their job. The DA has to do their job. You have to have facilities to house these people. They're criminals. The criminals need to be addressed. That's what's putting a bad mark on all these homeless folks. It's the criminals. All right. Hi, my name is Megan. Before I had a kid, I used to prepare my speeches for city council. Um, I have a PhD and I have a really good job. Her father was diagnosed with schizophrenia earlier last year and lost his job and we are both currently homeless, me, my daughter, and her father. And so I just wanna make a point that uh, not all homeless people are drug addicts or criminals. I think there are criminals at the top of our elite political system. And I'm hoping that this political system and figure out a way to actually say, you know what, if I have a house and a roof over my head, I'm gonna take some time to be grateful and less time thinking how awful people are that don't have those same privileges. Yeah. And so thank you very much for the time. And also, this is not gonna go away. You guys are in the tech central. You guys are busing people from Silicon Valley to come enjoy the pretty shores here. And you're gonna have to figure out if you're gonna displace the people, can you give something in place of what they had that is um, dignified? Right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cynthia with Santa Cruz Tenants, and I just wanted to talk about getting a lot of letters from homeless constituents and tenants. It's, uh, you were elected and you're to represent people who don't have um, a lot of power and they're not gonna be the ones that are gonna send you a thousand letters and they didn't have a million dollar program organizing them throughout the anti-Measure M uh, campaign that left them with a great organization like uh, the landed folks in the town. So it, it's your responsibility to represent those people without a lot of letters and so I appreciate when you go and speak with them directly because that is how you will be uh, communicated with by the people who elected you. Students are busy, they're doing finals, or they're on break, and they're not sitting writing letters to the city council, but they elected you too. So um, please don't worry about all the letters piling up. Are there any additional members of the community who would like to address the council in one minute? Okay, I believe that you would be next if you're in line. If you can, please line up to my left. Go ahead. All right, I'll do my best, keep this just one minute. Um, so I was at the encampment a little over a month ago for the first time, and as a side note, I felt safer there than I did in the area that I live downtown, which is about a few blocks from the police station. Um, a member of the encampment spoke with me there um, who has a lot of connections within the encampment. At that time, a while ago, he estimated there was at a minimum 90 people there. Since then, as you're well aware, the encampment has greatly increased in size, likely exponentially, and um, his current estimate is closer to about 100 uh, 145, and um, I know there's been a lot of discussion on to, we don't have an accurate census and stuff like that, and that's something that needs to be prioritized, um, but at the same time, uh, even though it is difficult because people are coming and going, um, we absolutely need to make sure that there are enough adequate shelter beds before we do um, any sort of eviction of the Ross camp for reasons that have been not only moral reasons, but also legal reasons, which have already been brought up regarding the ACLU um, hinted legal threat, et cetera. We can't afford, again, for both a moral reason and a legal monetary reason to yeah. not evict. Okay. Next speaker, please. Hey, this one minute, three minute thing has gotten 
Well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, okay, that's a warning, and if you have an outburst, you're welcome. Want, Martine, well, the I'm next time, I am managing the meeting. If you don't agree with me, you don't get to, I'm going to, you'll have your time if you want to wait for the three minutes. That's how it's going. Next, next outburst, and I'm going to go ahead and ask you to leave respectfully. Please, you have one minute. I um, live in the Ocean View Park neighborhood. Um, I understand it's a very complex issue. It involves real people and their lives, but I like the proposal that you guys have made to study the issue with an expert panel. I think the, the issues are complex and need to be looked at, but we also have to, I think, take a look at everything in the community. Are we maximizing our, I understand we're having a sales tax revenue shortfall. What are we doing to you know, make sure downtown is thriving at its utmost? What are we doing to help these people who have, you know, who are out there? I, I understand that, but I agree with the Myers Watkins Matthews uh, motion to take care of the community as a whole and then address these issues as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker. Most people in, okay, most people ahead, in Santa, I'm sorry. No, just Please go ahead and, I, don't, I can't see who that is or else I'd be giving you a warming, warning. Please keep your voices down. If there's one more outburst, I'm gonna pause the meeting, we'll take a break and we'll reconvene in five minutes. So we'll go ahead and hear from you with your time. Anybody who's interested in speaking will be given their time. You, if you're interested in speaking in one minute, you can speak now. After that, we'll go ahead and open it up for anybody interested in speaking for three minutes. Please. Most folks in Santa Cruz are working right now, the, the hardworking citizens, they don't have time to come to this meeting. I actually quit my job because I'm so upset about the way things are going. Now, I encourage all you folks, most of the people in Santa Cruz don't know who you are because they're too busy working, they don't get to watch the TV shows. Go out and talk to the average citizen. Wherever you go, don't tell them you're a city council member, okay? Because everywhere I go, people are upset that we've got all these tents. Let's move them, move them to River Street as a temporary basis. We want to help these people, but not at the expense of the hardworking business owners and citizens of Santa Cruz. Uh, Ms. Myers Matthews and one other person seems to have a common sense solution where we're not penalizing the hardworking people of Santa Cruz. And I guarantee you it's more than 80% that are not in favor of opening up parks and. Homeless encampments don't work. The head of the Obama administration, homeless expert, Thank says you. they don't work. Thank Look you. it up. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Danny. I grew up here. Um, speaking strongly in support of Justin and Sandy's proposal. Um, as exciting as it would be to get to be part of the developing case law, uh, to have Santa Cruz be part of that developing case law around cr the criminalization of homeless people, I don't think that's the role we want to play. I think we need to play the role of figuring out how we like look at something like an unsanctioned encampment and make it work for people. Um, I don't think bulldozers are going to solve homelessness. I don't think bulldozers are an acceptable solution to people dying in that camp. And I'm really excited to see uh, the city council focus its resources on figuring out what it looks like to engage with the people there, figure out what they want, and figure out how to make that place a safe, dignifying place for them to sleep. Thanks. My name is Lee Brokaw, and I can do this in a minute. Uh, the last time I saw council, council Member Matthews, we talked about healing the community and bringing people together. I see promptly displayed on the desk an equal sign. My father is gay, I understand that, but I hope for you that equal sign means equality for everybody, and that includes the homeless people. There have been a lot of words spoken here, and I read in all deference to the city attorney, I read from the appellate decision on Martin V. Voise. And in this decision, they say there will be no further appeals. The next stop is the Supreme Court. The panel held that cruel and unusual punishment clause of the Eighth Amendment precluded the enforcement of a statute prohibiting sleeping outside against homeless individuals, no means access to alternative channel. 
The panel held that as up. long your, as there is no option for up. sleeping you, indoors, I'm going to go ahead and ask that you. The government your cannot comments. criminalize okay. indigent homeless we'll people for sleeping outdoors. Right. We're going to go ahead and have you conclude your comments. You uh, had an opportunity did. to. I just okay. did. I just did. Yeah. Okay. So we have an well, we have an opportunity for. We're going to go ahead and take a five-minute break. We're going to have a five-minute break, and we'll reconvene in five minutes from now. Yep. Five-minute break. reconvene um, our council meeting. We are on item number 15, and uh, we have concluded the one minute time for any interested community member who wanted to address the council briefly in one minute. Now would be the time for uh, group organizations who reached out in advance to address the council on behalf of the organization that they represent. Um, I've received a number of requests from various groups, the first being um, from Mr. Norris uh, representing Huff. You'll be given three minutes. I'll, I'll wait until the end. Thank you. I prefer that we go through the group organizations now. I prefer to wait until the end. This would be now the time for group organizations. As somebody who's... I'm, I'm a little bit hoarse right now. I've been shouting too much at the city attorney. Okay, so you will go. You will conclude after the last of the three of the group organizations before we open it up for general community. Okay, so Lynn Rinshaw, representing Santa Cruz Together, was the second organization I heard from, and you will have up to three minutes uh, to address the council. I'll go ahead and remind the community before we begin that uh, I anticipate that you can um, maintain quiet so that we can allow each individual to be heard when they are at the podium without disruption. And that could go for uh, folks that you agree with and disagree with, that everybody has an opportunity to address us, to be given their time. I try to be very consistent on um, equity of voice in the, that regard for the three minutes or two minutes or whatever that may be that they have, and um, want to remind you to um, adhere to that. If there is a disruption and you have already been warned and uh, you continue to disrupt, I will ask that you leave the chambers. If you have not been warned and I notice that you are disrupting the proceeding and the individual's ability to speak, I will give you a warning and if it continues a second time, I will ask that you please leave. Okay, so at this time, Ms. Lynch, uh, Renshaw, please uh, speak. You have up to three minutes. Okay, Lynn Renshaw, SantaCruzTogether.com. Homelessness is a serious and complicated problem requiring compassion. Very substantial resources and sophistication are also necessary. In recent council meetings, there is a pattern of voting on a single possible solution late at night with perhaps 10 minutes of discussion. This process yields rushed, flawed, ill-conceived, and frankly, outrageous proposals, like putting a homeless camp by a soccer field used by 1,500 kids, or the original proposal to potentially locate the Ross campers next to Westlake Elementary School or Council Member Glover's proposal to put the camp on the soccer field. See any public health risks there? This council process is inadequate. We support Mayor Watkins, Council Member Myers, and Matthew's proposal to slow down, study best prax practices for ending homelessness, and compare costs and likely outcomes. We also support the council proposal for no new homeless encampments, particularly not in neighborhoods, by schools, children, and families. The council's yes vote for an encampment at Depot Soccer Field was outrageous. It outraged thousands of people suddenly feeling threatened by potential public health, safety, and environmental risks of further sanctioned encampments. The map of potential encampment locations in neighborhoods put thousands on high alert. People are watching this vote. The United States Interagency of Homelessness cautioned cities against sanctioned encampments. Quote, creating these environments may make it look and feel like the community is taking action to end homelessness on the surface. People stay, staying within such settings are still unsheltered, still living outside and remain homeless, and oftentimes these settings are not providing them with a truly safe, healthy, and secure environment, unquote. 
the United States agency further finds that camps are expensive, hard to manage and maintain, and difficult, difficult to close, even if intended as temporary. Please take time to find a better solution. A few questions. How much per person per month did the River Street encampment cost? Would it be better to invest that amount in permanent brick and mortar shelters for lower long-term costs? Is there a million dollars in the city budget to run an encampment next year? In our city's homeless policy, please <coughs> balance the impacts on 65,000 citizens against the desires of 100 Ross campers. Please balance the input of all those communicating to you here today against those who cannot be here to speak due to work. Please listen to the community before proceeding with ill-conceived, inadequately vetted, and rushed land use decisions. Please Thank represent you. all 65,000 of us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Our next, um, I'd like to now invite up Raphael Sonnenfeld, who would be speaking on behalf of Friends of Depot Park. And you'll have up to three minutes. Yes, um, I'm here on behalf of Friends of Depot Park to urge the city to rescind the current plan for Lot 24 today. Uh, I started Friends of Depot Park to give a voice to people in my neighborhood who are shocked by the way the city rushed through a plan for a shelter program without involving input from the community or providing clear answers to questions about how the program would be operated. My goal from the beginning was, uh, has been to improve the processes around how these decisions get made. Community engagement should be a core value of governance, especially when making policies on divisive issues. Without the community being included in the process, the city is playing with fire. People fear what they don't understand. To quote the great philosopher Yoda, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. We need to move forward together as a community. Today we have an opportunity to forge a way forward from the gridlock on the issues of sheltering our, unha our unhoused community. Council Member Matthews plans uh, call calling for no tran transitional encampment will most certainly result in a lawsuit being filed against the city and a temporary injunction being issued preventing any immediate action being taken to close the Ross camp. Assuming the city prevails, it still has the legal responsibility to offer a shelter or alternative public space to people evicted from sleeping on public property. There will be new movements to occupy other public properties without a sanctioned shelter management plan, and we will be having a new conversation about how to close a new unsanctioned camp and where to send those people in short order. The vice mayor has proposed a plan calling for the Ross camp to be replaced with a managed transitional encampment, but the pro proposal hasn't addressed the timing of when this plan, plan would be implemented and as currently written could result in further delayed action. Passing this plan would clarify how the city intends to deal with the direct issue of the Ross camp, but is currently a narrow proposal that doesn't directly address meeting the needs of the surrounding community. Neither plan addresses how the city will continue to meet its obligation to allow public sleeping places or offer adequate shelter if a group of people takes unilateral action to occupy public property. The VFW and Salvation Army are set to close in June, as is the River Street Camp, uh, which is gonna be relocated in the end of June. Uh, the crisis we're facing is a result of a nationwide systematic issue, unaffordable housing, drug epidemics, and lack of mental health care. We must maintain public safety for all while focusing on finding long-term solutions with county, state, and federal government. We encourage you to create a proactive framework to tackle both short-term and long-term issues, uh, to, to so solve short-term and long-term issues, or else we'll be stuck in a cycle of poor outcomes, hostile relations between the community at large and homeless people, and limited progress. I'd also like to add that in the spirit of unity, I am personally supporting as co-author of the statement that Phil Posner with conscience and action is making next. Thank you. Okay, I will invite up now Keith McHenry with Food Not Bombs to speak on behalf of the organization Food Not Bombs. Yes, thank you. Um, I am, first of all, the the Moving a camp to De Depot Park, I think it was intentionally designed by staff and having sat here and watched it, to generate as much opposition to solutions to homelessness as possible, and that's what we have seen. Um, then um, um, there's been, I, I know that Food Not Bombs was never approached about managing, a, 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 like participating in a self-managed um, camp. And some of our volunteers actually have lived and cooked 
at such camps in Seattle and are, have former residents of those camps uh, many years ago and have a direct experience. So was, uh, in fact, um, in 1989, Food Not Bombs participated in a self-managed camp of about 400 people in front of City Hall in San Francisco where we provided food, there were meetings, sanitation, and the only reason it was closed because of people objected to seeing homeless people or internally displaced people in their community and we were forced out with riot police. Now, that lack, the reason that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal um, upheld the, the uh, Eighth Amendment, which is uh, Eighth Amendment is cruel and an unusual punishment, is because that is exactly what it is. It is cruel and unusual punishment. And uh, th so these, the thing I really urge the community to consider is that these are humans, these are people. The stories of how maybe somebody ends up being injured on the job, for instance, a, a, a acquaintance of ours who has, uh, sadly died of stage four cancer, um, uh, and, and then be ending up on pain medicine that he can't get off because there's no way, there's no access to drug treatment in this community. I spend the, try, I try to get somebody to, to call Janice. You've got to call, like a, in my, my experience, 60 days in a row. You miss one day, the 60 days starts up again. So the same people that are opposed to Ross Camp, opposed to camps anywhere, are also opposed to the siting of drug treatment centers. Um, you know, Dr. Leff explains that he gets funding for mental health and drug treatment in this community. But the same people that come out to, de to demand that there be no campsites, that we get rid of the homeless and so on, are the same people that stand in the way of these solutions. And so the, a beautiful thing would be if the city council, all of us, started to consider these people, our relatives, our neighbors, our friends, people with real lives and real stories and not dehumanize them. Thank you. I'd like to now invite up uh, Phil Posner, representing Conscious in Action. Thank you, Mayor. First of all, I want to thank uh, Raphael for uh, his collaboration in this comment, my, in this statement that took also involves uh, half food, not bombs. We are individuals, and while our co constituencies do not always agree philosophically, we are here because we are united in our belief that the city and county of Santa Cruz has an obligation to provide sanctioned, safe shelter for the unhoused both day and night. We recognize that there are currently some important public health safety issues at the Ross Camp that must be addressed. Many of those who live at the Ross Camp, that many are there because they have nowhere else that provides them a sense of security, solidarity, and community. Therefore, we are here to urge the city of Santa Cruz and the county to comply with and put into action the following set of principles. And you have this document handed out to you. One, that compassion for the unhoused members of our community be prioritized in any action taken by the city and county. In that context, we ask that they take all necessary actions to obtain and provide sustainable funding for homeless services, to develop and execute evidence-based policies that improve outcomes for homeless people by seeking financial and legislative support from philanthropic organizations, businesses, and governmental bodies, and to develop and execute homelessness-related policies that meet the needs and improve the well-being of the community at large. Two that should the city council decide to establish a temporary managed shelter program at the site of the existing Ross Camp, necessitating eviction of the site's current residents for two days 
to clean up site, sleeping space, layout, insulation of additional hygiene, shelter, and security matters and water service. The city shall only take such action if and when they provide reasonable notice and offer lodging vouchers or other immediate shelter opportunities to all of the Ross Camp residents a week prior to the beginning of the proposed two-day improvement period. Three, that adequate shelter space be defined as the physical space provided to shelter persons both day at night, night and day with, without unwarranted harassment or unnecessary inconveniences committed by the police or their representatives. Four, that the city be required to name and provide adequate shelter space to persons who are being accused of sleeping on public property or cited for sleeping on public property. Five, that the city and county form a permanent homeless program oversight committee made up of experts including homeless advocates. Okay. Well, Here's I didn't get to finish, but you have the statement. Thank you. Thanks, much. Mayor. Thank you. I will invite up Micah Posner representing Santa Cruz for Bernie at this time. The difference between Bernie Sanders and the status quo Democratic Party is that the status quo Democratic Party tries to make things better within the context of the way that institutions normally run. Bernie Sanders and we progressives say that if the normal way of doing things is not working, then we have to do things differently. I find it ironic that us blue state people are always turning up our noses at the red state people, but here in Santa Cruz, we have one of the worst human rights abuses in the country by visiting cruel and unusual punishment on 2% of our population on a regular basis as defined by the Constitution of the United States. Um, we, I, I heard Councilmember Myers assert that it's the responsibility of our city to take care of all of our citizens with and without homes. And I totally agree with that. But let's be clear that this conversation is happening in a context. Is the council aware that people before Camp Ross, people without homes were dying in the bushes and on residential streets? The fact that people died at Camp Ross is meaningless unless you look at how many other people died before there was Camp Ross. It's the same thing with the... <laughs> It's the same thing with the police calls. Yeah, with hundreds of people, you're gonna have police calls. How many less police calls do we have from my neighborhood and all the other neighborhoods because the people are now at Camp Ross? Some people say that they don't want homeless encampments, that they don't work. What about the fact that we have hundreds of homeless encampments already before Camp Ross? Which we don't have a choice to say we don't like homeless encampments. Our choice is to say, how can we make the situation a little incrementally better? That's the only choice we have. So status quo Democrats, they care about people, but when they're faced with serious institutional barriers, they just give up. They say, this is too ugly, I can't deal with this. The progressive side of the Democrat party takes responsibility for people no matter what. We figure out a way to change the way things happen so as to avoid putting cruel and unusual punishment on people and violating the institution. The Santa Cruz branch of the Bernie Sanders campaign supports 15.3, we support Justin Cummings and Sandy Brown and their proposal, and we're proud we helped get them elected. Now I'm speaking as an ex council member for the last few seconds. I wanna say I don't really like the phenomenon of homelessness either, and this might not be popular, but I don't really like the way Camp Ross looks or how it feels, but I think it's incrementally better than the way things were before Camp Ross. And I appreciate that the council is actually looking at not being denial and looking at, at making it slightly better still. So here's what I think you should do. I think you should open the River Street camp. You should take the barbed wire off the fence to make it a little bit less appealing, a little bit more appealing, excuse me. And when you do open it, you should close Camp Ross for a couple days to make it safer and reorganize it and, and get rid of the rats and all that. Um, I know that's a hard choice because Camp Ross is never gonna be a wonderful place, but it's a real choice. It takes responsibility for what's really happening yeah. and tries to make it a little better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite up Bodie um, to, um, Tunham, T Bodie Tunham, representing Grant Street Park Neighbors. Is Bodie here? Okay, um, I'm not seeing Bodie here, so we'll go ahead and return to Mr. Norris, representing Huff, as our final uh, organization speaking. So there's not enough room in the uh, 
1220 River Street for the people in the Ross camp you know, during a cleanup or at any other time. So what you really need are auxiliary camps for Camp Ross at, as it's currently situated. And it's the community that really has to help with this because I don't think this council has um, the will or the cohesion to do it uh, at the present time, and particularly since it's not the council that's going to be doing it, it's the staff. And that's what worries me because it's the staff and city manager Martine Bernal that has the real power in these situations. So, for example, this new standard operating procedure that's going to be used to remove public nuisances, that's the fourth provision that you're gonna be looking at, has a nice way of essentially walking around the Boise versus Martin decision, which says something to the effect of, we can force you to move even though we have no place for you to move to because we're cleaning up, because it's a public health problem, uh, because uh, we hope to have some spaces, as uh, O'Hara went on at great length about hoping to have this and that. So I, I think you need to add to the standard operating procedure some safeguards for the people who are in the Ross camp and elsewhere in other encampments. So long as there are insufficient temporary shelters or shelters that are not realistically available to indigents, homeless individuals, the city shall not issue citations to make arrests for involuntarily sitting, lying, or sleeping in public places is how it reads now. I would suggest you add or change well, add the additional language, and as long as there are insufficient temporary shelters or shelters that are not realistically available, Ross Camp residents will work with city officials in place rather than vacating the camp to facilitate cleanup activity in the camp. Unless there is a specific voluntary offer for a person to go to a place and they want to go there. No resident shall be forced to exit the camp unless she or he is offered and accepted has accepted adequate available indoor shelter or an outdoor shelter if they prefer that. No ticketing or nor forcible remover, removal will happen unless and until there is a finding by the city council, not the city manager, the city council, that adequate indoor shelter exists for the general homeless population of Santa Cruz, including but not limited to the Ross camp as required by the Boise decision. Please, I would urge a council member to make this motion and to pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes the approved uh, organization speaking on behalf of numerous people. At this point, we'll, I, no, I don't have any other notices. I got a confirmation call that the Ross Camp Council will get through. What was your, what's your name? Alicia Cool. Alicia Cool. I do, okay, you're well, yeah, I do think so. I do believe, I recall her seeing that. I'm, yes, okay, so Ms. Cool, you're welcome to speak for three minutes on behalf of I might not actually even need three minutes, but um, I have some serious concerns, obviously. Um, a lot of people know who I am. My name's Alicia Cool. I've been working with the Ross Camp. I'm the Ross Camp liaison. I've been the one in several meetings um, going over what the cleanup might look like. I was told by Megan Bunch that any cleanup would actually be done with the Ross Camp people where they are and that it would be perhaps done by Parks and Rec um, with the help of the fire chief and that everybody there would be able to stay where they are and work um, together in order to address health, health and safety issues. And so for the past several weeks, as I was talking with Megan, um, the fire chief came out there, that's been my understanding. And only recently has it been proposed that everybody needs to leave to get that done. So I do think that it can be done with everybody staying in place. Uh, we filed a lawsuit this morning for the preliminary injunction and it does have an underlined lawsuit. We're very concerned with the way things have gone. Um, we don't trust you at this point to make the right decision. Um, we're a little leery about the way things have been going. One thing's proposed one week, it's taken off the table the next week. We still have people out there that are concerned. They have anxiety every time you guys, you know, switch back and forth with these decisions. Um, I have a concern that you're proposing a homeless committee, um, but Mark, Ms. Watkins, you're the person that's going to nominate the people on that committee. No one has approached me and asked me if, you know, doing all of these things, if I would be able to help you in any of this, because I think I can. 
Um, I have about 50 people that are prepared to go to a, another encampment. Keith McHenry has offered to be the nonprofit that you're looking for. I could be the director. It doesn't have to be me, but I do wanna make sure that it doesn't turn into a FEMA camp looking situation with barbed wire. Um, like we currently have. Uh, 1220 will not accommodate everybody at the Ross camp in order to shut it down. That's a very small place that will probably only house about 50 people. Um, that's what it's slated for. It's not actually scheduled to be open April 17th. There are a lot of barriers to that, so I don't think that will be the opening day. The safe parking program, AFC safe parking program, they only have five participating churches, not 12, five. And all those spaces are not even being used. I do have a concern about how much money they got to do that, to offer you know parking for overnight. Everybody has to leave by seven. I have a concern over $75,000 being the river. I can work with less than that. You guys aren't even giving me a chance. I've got people ready to go. I've got a nonprofit. We have a lawsuit now. So I'm turning it over to you guys and I'm hoping that you guys will make a really good decision, both legally, ethically, and civilly. Okay, so at, at this time, I'd like to get a sense of who is interested in addressing the council and, uh, and speaking to us on this item, it, remaining in the audience here. Okay, at, at a certain point, you'll want to line up to my left and uh, you will be given up to three minutes. Nora Hockman, 30 years I have been working on this, 3-0. Years ago with Sherry Conable and with my mom, Bernice Belton, I outlived them both, I'm sorry to say, and the issue has outlived them both. You have overcomplicated a very simple process. You now have put profoundly homeless people in total uh, simpatico with housed community members. A and that really is neither group trusts you. <coughs> Homeless folks have proven it by not responding with a single survey. People in neighborhoods have responded by saying they don't want their neighborhood degraded. Some people actually came to this hearing counting the number of homeless people, let's say 400 or 1,200, and compared it to the 65,000 other people that work and have businesses. And I submit to you, Council, that we would never say that about African Americans. We would never say that about gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. We would never compare percentages of populations and determine whether or not we're then going to serve people. Get out of the way of this. Just get out of the way. You need a group of people that camp outside, that don't want to be held down, you need them to participate in their own governance and you don't get there from here with all this other bullshit that was uncivil, but that's what it is. It is bullshit. Okay, go ahead. It's a to, whole bunch I'm of- I'm gonna go remind you that um, it's important to maintain decorum that we have children that are either watching and some are potentially in the audience and to please keep your language. Uh, okay, go ahead. Continue, please. I get my time now? Am I back on the clock? So, you know, keep it simple. Get people off the ground, get their heads covered in the rain and inclement weather, and allow them to participate in some aspect of self-governance. There are plenty of people in this community that wanna help, you are not those people. And you have proved it by dartboarding neighborhoods and scaring the heck out of community members that their neighborhood might be next. You have proved it by scaring homeless folks 
that they're going to be confined into some kind of a camp, which is fairly disgusting to me. I'll just leave it at that. You can imagine why I think that's really frightening. So you need to just get out of the way. Hi, Damon Bruder. Boy, I don't envy you right now. <laughs> Babysitting is tough. So, <clears throat> There's a lot of press coverage, much of it inaccurate, regarding the ruling from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, e.g. Martin versus Boise. The majority stated, quote, naturally our holding does not cover individuals who do have access to adequate temporary shelter, whether because they have the means to pay for it or because it is realistically available to them for them for free, but who choose not to use it. Nor do we suggest that a jurisdiction with insufficient shelter can, can never criminalize the act of sleeping outside. Even where shelter is unavailable, an ordinance prohibiting sitting, lying, or sleeping outside at particular times or in particular locations might well be constitutionally permissible." End quote. They paraphrase it. In short, the Ninth Circuit did not just grant homeless people the unlimited right to camp or sleep anywhere they like at any time, nor did it bind local cities' hands in removing homeless people from public places in the interest of public health and welfare, or in preventing homeless people from setting up tents. <clears throat> Mr. Condotti said that a week or two ago, uh, damn near verbatim. Um, that, that ruling, there you are. That ruling relates to sleeping, not camping. It says you can't criminalize someone for sleeping. Okay, you can't ticket them. Doesn't say you can't ticket them for setting up a frickin' uh, tool shed in a camp over there. Why do they have the right to do that? Why don't I have the right to do that? I spent seven years with a needle in my arm on streets here, homeless, in and out of prison. I got lucky. I was able to pull myself out of that. I'm now a contributing member of society. I got a few years under my belt, I'm lucky. I've got a job, I'm lucky. I've got a home that I bust my ass for, pardon my, sorry, that, to provide for my wife and myself. I have grandkids that wanna walk down the street to the boardwalk without having to step on a needle or have to go to the other side of me because they're scared of that person that's doing whatever they might be doing in the bush or hanging from the tree or literally building a tree fort next to the road. Why are the 200 plus mostly drug addicted criminals at Ross Camp more important than our community is? I have no problems with homeless people. I've been there. I have no problems with addicts. I've been there. I am one. But when I was doing it, it wasn't okay. It's not okay now. Where is the county in everything that's going on right now? Where is it? Demand that the county do their share, and if they're helping, tell us. We don't hear that from anybody. We don't hear from the county, and we don't hear from you guys. We have a vague reference of the two by two, but we don't get anything from them. Agendize one of those meetings so that we can know what's going on. Okay. Thank you. Errol Darling, if I had been speaking uh, earlier after Phil Posner, I would have simply said in my one minute, I want to associate myself in every way to uh, uh, Phil's, uh, Rabbi Phil Posner's statement. Uh, since I'm here now, I'll do that. And also uh, simply say, <clears throat> that what we decide, almost everyone in this room makes up our mind in the, the liberty uh, and the comfort of homes. Uh, I can't think of more than maybe a handful of people who really do want to live in the woods, and probably if they want to live in the woods, most of those people would be live responsibly as stewards of the woods. Setting those folks aside, I don't think there's a single one here uh, at the DS 
nor out here in the, in the, within the community that would say the Ross camp is the ideal of human community, nor where I would prefer to live. But your job is to put yourselves in the position where that's the last shred, the last piece of earth where you have that you can hold on to, where you can uh, pitch your tent, eat the rain from falling on your head and anybody that lives with you, child or other adult, you, until you put yourself in that position and, and recognize they are there only because they have no other place to be. This is, they are doing the job of, the first job of every organism on this planet, and that is to survive. Put yourself in that, in their place, in that person's place. It's the last place. If you can improve on that, I am confident that you will. That you are their community of last resort. Do it. I'm confident you can. Hello, City Council. Thanks for hearing us. My name is Christy Bittner. Um, I wrote out what I was going to try and say today, and I feel like there's so many things to respond to. Um, I'm glad that we're starting to see some. Is this better if I talk like there? I can even hear myself better. Uh, I'm glad that you're starting to break up the and modify the uh, motions. They're set in bunches that, you know, it's hard to say we agree with all of it and don't agree with all of, some of it. I would like to see the lot 24 rescinded. Um, I wholly uh, support the motion to establish a, a subcommittee to address these issues and hope this committee will work very hard to maximize public outreach and transparency. Um, someone else also addressed the composition of this. Uh, it's stated that the, the mayor will decide who's on that committee. I hope it's a really, um, that when the committee is formed that the community as a whole feels like it's got a good representation of all of the parties because otherwise it's, you know, we're gonna have the same thing all over again. It also needs to have a lot of public outreach. I think um, that the current sometimes quite polarized arguments have been uh, badly inflamed by the shotgun approach that we've been taking. Uh, I'm disappointed to hear people blaming it all on the government. Um, a good portion of you just started in January. Um, some of you have been around a little longer. You know, what I see and what I feel is that there's um, good faith, effort, well, I hope it's good faith efforts. There's a lot of efforts being put forward to try and come up with real solutions. Um, I hear a lot of compassion, a lot of you know, trying to do it. The problem is it's just not always clear what the right way is. <coughs> and as much as we can all reach out and start to renew our faith in each other in real conversation, that's what dialogue is about. Um, starting out speeches with, uh, you know, everybody's a bigot. Um, I know that's, comes from frustration, but it's not gonna enhance the dialogue. Um, as far as what I support here, I'm sympathetic that many people are struggling with basic expenses in this economy. Um, there's statistics about, you know, how many GoFundMe accounts are set up just to cover medical costs. You know, the, it really has the whole uh, number of people without homes, uh, without shelter is exploding. Uh, and I, so I support, um, government resources, it's both money and space and energy going to help people in need, but it does need to be balanced with the needs and concerns of all citizens. Okay, your time is three, thank you. Next. 
Hello, my name is Michael Spatafora. The first time I came down here to talk to you guys about this was the middle of November. I've been talking to you guys about this over and over again. <coughs> met with several of you different city council members, city uh, manager, I met with supervisors. The question I have for the city attorney is, what is the definition of camping? Right, we have that, we have those people camping. They've been there for five months and they haven't left. The city has not done anything. I'm a, one of the business owners at Gateway Plaza. The city has not done anything for the employees or the business owners of that center. They haven't done anything for the owners of that center. The owners of that center built that levy. The owners of that center built the intersection all the way down to San Lorenzo Lumber. They put together that a whole project. And what does the city council and what does the city do for us? Nothing. We don't get extra officers. We don't get a command vehicle. The command vehicle is there for six hours a week maybe, right? You guys haven't done anything. So maybe you haven't cleaned up our parking lot. You haven't cleaned up the graffiti that we have to deal with every day. Since for the past five months, every day, I have to deal with my staff members having to kick somebody out of my store. I've had to deal, the security guard got beat up the other day. Just like they said, somebody died at the camp the other day. There was a drug bust, guy had $1,500 worth of cash, plus 350 hits of heroin, plus meth. I don't know if you guys saw that, right? So the, the criminals and the drug addicts are ruining it for the other people there that need a place to live, right? And you guys aren't doing anything to help minimize the impact that that center has. We built a fence, it was a $15,000 fence. Every time it's cut, it's $1,000 to fix it. Nobody, city hasn't done anything. Me, out of my own pocket, my sales are, I've lost tens of thousands of dollars in sales and I've had to put, pull thousands of dollars out of my pocket to pay my rent, right? Because this is all impact. I had the attorney, that was representing these people kicked me out of my try kicking me out of my store the other day because he didn't like what I was talking about when I was saying all the impact that the center has. I had one of the one of the people that just sued uh, sued you guys say that oh the security guards at Ross are just there for looks. There's security guards at Ross. There's security guards at Xfinity. There's security guards at Chipotle. Um, security our security guard got beat up the other day. He can't work for I don't know long, how long till he's off workers comp. I mean what have you guys done? Nothing, right? Give us some protection. If you guys want to keep that there, you guys need to do something for the people there, for the customers. Our parking lot's a mess. You got street team that cleans up the levee. You got street teams that clean up Felker Street, right? The people at Felker Street don't like to walk over there. The people at the tannery don't like to walk over there. When is it the people that are working, right? The ones that don't want to become homeless. When are you guys going to do something for us? Because I can't keep pulling money out of my pocket to pay for this. All right, I'm gonna remind you. All right. You'll have up to three minutes. Mayor, council, uh, first I'd like to apologize to uh, uh, Councilperson uh, Myers earlier uh, and also the city manager. I, I, don't, I don't hold the city, the, you people responsible. In fact, the council, you're representative of the community. You're not like the government, you're representative, representative of, of us. So I don't, I don't expect that Blood is on our hands as a city, but and yet, what happened last year in the Benchlands? Be, two women died in that camp before the city took o uh, ownership and cleaned it out and put lines, and then two more people died after. So we have five deaths now in this encampment. I'm not saying blood is on our hands, but but these deaths occurred on our watch. So when you say we want to hold these uh, transitional encampments or any nonprofit to, ver to a very high bar, we're not actually taking our responsibility for what's already occurred. And what's already occurred is, is is what the city's been up to. And when I say the city, I do say the city manager's office. And I think we are, we are doing a lot of policy by city management. It's really, really bizarre how this is working. In fact, uh, Drew brought the issue up. When did we actually say we're not go, divert away from transitional encampments? I'm gonna remind you, you actually didn't. 60 minutes before that early March uh, meeting, I was told in a city manager's office, and they got their, their knives into me. They, they, they got their blows. That's why I'm a little rough on the city manager these days, because they got their, their licks in but they des decided to switch immediately to that red herring out in uh, uh, the park, parking lot 24. They were never going to put a camp there. They knew it. They know how to see dissent. So, but in that meeting, uh, you were told we're not recommending transitional encampments, and we, everyone diverted. But let's be clear: transitional encampments 
and, and rent control and things like that. These are actually what four of you have been voted to be to do. So you have a new policy, a new uh, a thing you're bringing forth. It says no encampments in, uh, in parks or in the city. But I wanna actually encourage four of you to stand up now for transitional encampments. Get it back on the front burner because this is what, I don't, I'm not talking about a lar the larger problem of homelessness or, or, or that encampment. What we are trying to do is stand for something that's highly successful all over the Northwest. In fact, I have data right here that shows that people leave transitional encampments in the Northwest at, into permanent housing way better than they did last year at the, at the Ross camp. And I'm gonna give you that data. It's puffery. So we're, the city manager in the city manager's office is really doing a, a lion's share of this work and we're bringing these motions forth. It's amazing how much we're going into it. But I, I just say, now is the time to do something healing, healing from the inside out. Transitional encampments are not expensive. It's not a, a, a ridiculous thing. Um, somebody's talking behind me. Uh, it, it's, it, it's far better than the Ross camp and I encourage you to stand up and make that stand now. Transitional encampment, city council, thank you. Hi, I'm Garrett, where I wish I'd known I had three minutes so I wrote more stuff, you know. But, uh, you know, your job is simple. It's, you have two jobs. That, uh, you may think you have other jobs, but you really don't. And you have the uh, job to enforce with force if necessary, the respect for individual uh, sovereign rights of everyone, every single person, a child that picks up a needle, everybody, the, you know, the people are victims of crimes, the whole thing, as well as homeless. And, but I don't know how many rights they actually have. They have pretty much inalienable rights and freedom. I don't know what other rights they got. Um, anyway, um, I'll just read this, I guess. Homeless is a national problem that cannot be solved by a small city. I assure you every single person wants, needs, and is willing to pay something for fewer homeless to be here. Nobody wants more. All future homeless services must be located outside the city. Otherwise, you invite a greater permanent plague of the homeless that will be on your hands forever. There are reasons our burden is crazy higher than elsewhere, including the many mistakes that have been made. You should look to eliminate all of them and not make more. The city is a dump for the county's homeless. Don't make it a permanent bigger dump. You are being suckered by the county to become so. The other cities are laughing at you. Now, to be fair, I'm gonna take the other side. I will take the opposite side of some of the council in explaining a Ponzi scheme theory I call the economy of the poor, which is the idea that everybody can live off the government while the government lives off of everyone. The economy of the poor is the suckling of dependent resources from outside the city into the city, justified by the presence of ever more poor and homeless. It functions on a balance of trade drawing money into the city by using poor and homeless, a one-way trade producing a fixed size pie divided equally. I cite the $51 million Medi-Cal bill for injection infections drawing state money into the county. We provide the drug addicts. If you work it out, that's 50,000 per homeless, the equivalent tax base, equivalent of five to 10 property taxpayers. That's some homeless, homeless gold. Uh, balance of trade welfare is their contribution. More sick homeless, more Medi-Cal money, big money. I cite the city's 1,300 Section 8 housing vouchers, which obviously, if you could crank that number up to five or 6,000, would be a lot more money coming in from the Fed's welfare system. Who's more productive? Somebody who draws a good size freebie check for nothing, or some slob who works 40 hours a week? I say the dependent one. With more vouchers, even if we didn't have enough poor to qualify, I'm sure plenty of poor would come from far away to grab any unused ones. Now you need advertising to invite more homeless here, and there's no better than a block-long homeless encampment at the intersection of three major highways, unless it was a two-block-long encampment. I'm not sure Food Not Bombs couldn't do a better job of homeless advertising by their grandstanding feeding at the boardwalk instead of uh, drawing new homeless here at Water Street. Now, you need to get the planning department to create a new zoning call. Co Thank you for your time. Sure. My name is Liv. Um, I'm a member of our community. Just want to say thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, to quote my trusted peer and future AESUC president of UC Berkeley, when you serve marginali marginalized, targeted communities, you can serve everybody. The reverse is not true. 
It is our differences that make us such a strong and dynamic force. When we come together to create a dialogue where those differences are celebrated, we can truly represent a divine, responsible democracy. My heart is heavy for my community. I ask you where your heart is when you consider the livelihood of these people who reside in the Ross camp. Whose heart do you hold in yours? It is my belief that everybody deserves the right to be responsible for themselves. Everybody deserves the right to auton autonomy in their body, their spirit, and their community. And I hope and I plead that you share this belief these people I've heard referred to as criminals today are sincerely insightful, valuable members of Santa Cruz. Their voice represents a knowledge and understanding that we may never know. I remind you today that violence systemically enforced perpetuates violence. I want to note that too. Drug addiction is not a criminal act. It's a medical and mental health issue. It needs to be regarded as such. If you want an expert panel for insight as to how to move forward, Ask the members of this community, the people who are living this reality, the people who are out surviving in the face of unjust policing and exploitive gentrification, these are the real experts. Please inquire them. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda. I've been here for quite a few city council meetings. And I have to say, I think all of you, in my eyes, are growing. And you're opening uh, your minds to the different members of the community. I can see that. Uh, I'm an apartment manager, and um, I manage about 26 apartments. Uh, and one of the sites where uh, the neighborhoods where was targeted for potentially moving the homeless camp, it, it, my apartments are near there. And if I were in your shoes, and I don't know enough about everything, I would be in favor of the um, measure to try to get a lot of professionals to understand uh, uh, what, how best to handle it. Because I think that, you know, if there's 1,200 homeless here, if, I do believe you could parse them out some and help them in a less divisive way. For example, we were talking here about opening up drug treatment centers or um, mental health, uh, you know, going out and surveying the folks, and I heard that mentioned earlier, and see who needs mental help. Um, or, you know, there, there's a need for homeless uh, uh, shelters for, you know, a person that's affected by domestic violence. There's all kinds of reasons to help the homeless. But you have to understand from our side too, um, not non-homeless, um, or the homeless non-criminal. In my apartments, um, I don't have experience on the streets, but in my apartments one day, somebody just came in there and they had a switchblade coming at one of my tenants. They didn't even know him. They were in, just went into the apartment. And I put myself in between that person and the switchblade. I, there's been so many crimes there. Every time they go up on the levee uh, to go ride their bicycles or whatnot, we had MS-13 there, and they put graffiti on our building every day. I had paint buckets going out to paint them until they had the raid, and now we don't have that problem, thank goodness. So the Ross Camp is here. You wouldn't believe how the crime has gone down where we live. It moved over there. I go to ProBuild, to buy something and the managers have got a guy cornered because he's got a flat bar he stole. Somebody used a flat bar on one of our apartments and broke in. I know what the flat bar tool is for. One day I was at Ross and there was a guy checking all the doors on all the cars to see which one was open to steal from. And I can't afford security at our apartments. We're gonna be put out of business if, you know, uh, if a camp comes in, uh, near where we are could the city pay probably the 200,000 I'd have to pay to give security to my tenants and me? Um, I, I've been really terrified. I really have, and I, I thank you. Hey, my name is Kelly. I both live and work in the downtown area. Um, I am so compassionate towards homeless people and those that are hard up and need a helping hand. And we have a lot of resources for those people already in place. Um, I feel like I'm speaking on behalf of the people who are opposing 
the Ross camp and Lot 24 when I say it's bigger than homelessness and our issue is not homelessness, our issue is the criminality that it goes along with it. And it's not, it's not the, homeless, the homeless veteran that is sleeping quietly in a corner, it's the heroin addict that is committing property crimes and violent crimes against our citizens. It makes us afraid to go outside, makes me afraid to park my car on the street, makes me afraid to walk to work in the morning. And that is unacceptable and I know that it is not your job duty to enforce our laws and it's not you as the prosecutors to stop giving them plea bargains and to take these charges away when they're in the courthouse but that has to change because the people five overdose deaths are you going to tell me there's not criminal activity happening there do you overdose on the legal drugs yeah. you do oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There are bigger issues here though, and it, I understand it is not just your job. I'm asking for you guys to work with our law enforcement and with our attorneys to effectively punish people who are breaking our laws and to help protect those of us that are not. Because it's, this town is going in the wrong direction and it's unfair for the, those of us that work really hard to stay here. Thank you. Hello, council members. Uh, my name is Faz. Um, uh, and um, I mean, Martin versus Boise is very clear. And I just wanna say for the record, it's really sad that in our progressive community of Santa Cruz, that it took a federal ruling for us to not be able to kick people out when they're sleeping on the streets. I just think that's really sad. Um, uh, we're facing a morality crisis, right? I understand and I hear a lot of people here who are talking about drug addiction and we're talking about, you know, people stealing stuff and people acting violently. And I, I, let's not forget that these people are disproportionately advantaged by a system that continues to criminalize them. The moment that you don't have a house and you don't have resources and you don't have mental health services and drug rehabilitation services, you'll be looked on as a criminal forever. You will become eventually become a felon. You won't be able to apply for jobs. You won't be able to find housing. So these people aren't inherently bad people. And I think to perpetuate that stereotype is just incredibly dehumanizing. I think we need to understand that these people don't have services. And I understand that mental health and drug rehabilitation are things that the county is supposed to provide. I understand that. And you as a city have one basic job and that is to provide shelter for these people. And the Ross camp, you know, has problems, and I understand that, and we can do things to solve those problems. But evicting those people are only gonna exacerbate that issue. It's gonna move the drug, re the drug problem, it's gonna move violence, and it's gonna cause these people to become even more aggressive, and you're gonna disperse that out into the community again. This deadline is set for next week. Do we have enough beds to, to put these people in? I don't think so. Um, so we need to hold off. I think Justin and Sandy's proposal is the only clear, clear common sense proposal that we need right now. We need to take time. We need to find the right solutions, but kicking these people out so hastily is not the right solution. So please support Justin and Sandy's proposal. And please have some compassion. Thank you. Hi, my name is Veronica Hamilton. I'm a graduate student at UCSC, and so I work in this community. I also study um, legislative debates about social class issues, and so that's why I felt compelled to talk today. And, and so I wanna talk a little bit about issues of dehumanization, and, um, and also neoliberal values of hard work and whose work is hard work. Um, and so as somebody who goes to the Ross camp uh, once a week to help pass out supplies to our fellow human beings, I wanna remind people that uh, when we refer to these communities as criminal and as drug addicts, even if we think that we were once part of that community, even if um, our, we think our businesses are maybe compromised by their existence and our compassion toward them, that they remain human beings. And, um, and so when we talk about civility in public discourse or political discourse, I think it's also really important to police ourselves on the ways that we dehumanize others. And so if you're gonna cut off the mic for people who say bullshit, I think you should also cut off the mic for people who dehumanize those that work at the Ross camp. Um, I also wanna make another point about uh, the issue of business owners over in that area. 
Um, I feel really concerned about the equivocation of their profits and these people's livelihoods. And I'd like to um, just make it heard in this space that um, the money that comes out of their pocket is not as important as people's livelihoods. And that's important to our community that we remember that. Thank you. Hello, City Council. My name is Bradley Jin. Four years ago, I moved here to Santa Cruz and fell in love with the city. I ask you and my fellow Santa Cruzians, in discussing the Ross Camp, what message are we trying to send here? What are we trying to tell the world? Is this a city which does not welcome the most downtrodden, the most marginalized, the most impoverished of our community? In closing the Ross Camp without recourse for its residents, we will be telling the world that we are a cruel, unwelcoming city. We would be saying that we don't care about the people who need our help most. Is this what we want to tell our children? No. I implore you not to destroy the last bit of structure and safety that these people have left. Help the homeless, help the city, have compassion. Thank you. Do, it, do I get two or three minutes? Three? Okay. Three minutes? Okay, great. Um, my name is Elise Casby, and I just Elise, want to start by saying pause? I would really- Maybe pause for a sec? Oh, sorry. Let's go see it, thanks. Uh, oh, it was going. Was it going. Going. Oh, it was? Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry. I was I just want to say I would like to be able to support Sandy Brown and Justin Cummings' um, proposal. It's probably the best of all of them, but I, I'm sorry to say it does not go far enough for me. Um, first of all, I don't know when you say consistent with the measures outlined in this report, what report, I'm not sure what report you're referring to. And at the end when it says no later than the opening of the River Street Campground, I'm afraid that the River Street camp, Campground, it does not go far enough um, in the way that I'm hearing it be presented. Um, the also 15.4, I'm really worried about the standard operating procedures for vacating homeless encampments that contain significant health and safety or nuisance conditions. I just have to say that I won't talk very much about how I became homeless through a very pernicious type of domestic violence because it's still too difficult for me to talk about how my family that I raised when my mother had multiple sclerosis, including my brother who's developmentally disabled, was ripped for me, just totally ripped for me. And I raised them. I, I can't even begin to talk about this. But I used to walk the streets of Berkeley every single night and I was there because my therapist was so rank and unethical. And she for eight years did not believe me. I can't tell you the damage that was done to my life and I resent it so much for people to be described in the way we're describing it. And I'm sorry, Ms. Matthews, but my understanding of your record on homeless people is that it is deplorable. And I don't think Donna knows this, or I don't think she would be aligning herself with you. You've been really bigoted about your treatment of the homeless. I'm gonna ask I think I can say sec. that legally, and that's my right to say that. Can we pause for one sec? I'd like to ask that you address the entire council. Um, so if you uh, you're telling me I can't address a political person in seated on the council specifically because of their political behavior over the last 20 years? That's not my right. I would like to ask that we, we address the item and then that you address the entire council. Do I have the right to do that, uh, Mr. Condotti? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, I want people here to go study the record on homelessness and how mean Cynthia Matthews has been toward homeless people decade after decade, and she keeps coming back. But I just want to go back to this. The Ross Camp is about people trying to survive. I used to walk the streets of Berkeley thinking if I could just find a place under the bush to sleep. Well, I became really good at surviving. And I want you to know that I'm finding this debate to be really sad, just like the sellout of the Democratic Party of our people across this nation. And it is because of them that we have Donald Trump, who is a despot who will not voluntarily leave office. And I think any Democrats that are on this city council need to step up and serve all the people in this town. And for once, serve the homeless, keep the camp. Let's get some real available beds for them. You'll have up to three minutes. My name is Jeremiah. 
I'm not. Oh, excuse me. I, I'm going to go ahead. You can. Homelessness is a demographic. Okay. This is homelessness. That's what that is. Those five people, Asa, Anastasia. Asa died of cancer. He would have died anyways, no matter what. Nobody said five overdose. Okay. My father was electrocuted. I walked 800 miles. Okay, to take his ashes to Shasta. There were days that passed when the demons came. All I could do is put my head down, and when my head came back up, I didn't know where I was. That happened to me one time. I looked up, and there was a boardwalk. So three years have passed, and for all intents and purposes, you folks are my friends and family. I don't like all of you. Y'all don't like me. <laughs> but you all pride yourself on being a small town, and yet you act like big city in this argument of the value versus the worth of things. My name is Jeremiah. Now minimize me. Now objectify me. You go down to that Ross camp, or excuse me, Santa Cruz 1865, there's little gardens there. There's people that you give them a shovel. They built their house on elevations. There's art there. There's scientists there. It may be so infinitesimal as to be so small. If you people make it any smaller, it may not exist at all. But people don't come here except to get away from their lives. Santa Cruz is not really the real world. Not really. You know, I'm just saying that. When you lose your abstraction, your logic and your rationality will always suffer. Okay, those are just different forms of insanity. Okay, and who is anybody to tell me different? My name is Jeremiah. I have, what is your homelessness problem? We need to give everybody name tags and the people that talk to their shoes a Bluetooth earpiece. You know, you're gonna profile me because I'm standing in a parking lot or I'm carrying a trash bag. I dig through your trashes. I know more about a lot of you than you know about me. You know, this is my home, all of Santa Cruz. You're my brothers and sisters, you know? In my mind, I'm thinking, hey, I'm gonna say something great, I'm gonna say something good, but you know what? What you all are doing is quoting. I'm not a statistic, okay? I was in the River Street camp. You take a group of marginalized people and you march them to the edge of town and put them in an enclosed area, okay? Where, where was the shade? It was just on the other side. Right now, we're trying to plant trees in whose shade we will never rest in, folks. Okay? We can't even wave at each other. You don't even look at me. Now you understand I'm a man of science. Some of that's maybe no worse than an allergic reaction, like when some people shudder cockroaches. Okay? But you will look at me, and you will address me as Jeremiah, and I'll address you as whatever you wish to be called, even if I don't like you. And I'm sorry to the business owners, but what you need to do is a sense of community, okay? People crave structure inherently. What is out of Africa? What is any migration in history? Homeless people. Everyone in here is descended from a homeless person. Thank you. My name is okay. Jeremiah. I am Santa Cruz. Right. That was great. Wow. Okay. How you doing? My name is Randy Watt. And uh, I've been in Santa Cruz off and on for about 16 years. And this monstrosity uh, that you guys are doing about the camps, the camp, Ross camp, it's criminal. I used to work at a South Satini uh, tent city up in Seattle. 1073, 1074, Nicholsville. They were all self-containing. It does work. Yeah, there's gonna be a drug problem anywhere. There's gonna be homeless everywhere. But you could say that we're criminal, that we have to move on. The biggest criminals that I see is our city of Santa Cruz because they're making people leave, getting ill, and dying. My uncle died because your city park officials decided to shred his tent shred his, his sleeping bag in the middle of winter. That's the true criminal. So if 
this monstrosity that you're trying to do <coughs> is criminal. The, just think about it. Instead of killing lives, save lives. That's all I have to say. Before we get you start, before we get on to the next speaker for this item, right now we're approaching seven o'clock and seven o'clock is the time when we have oral communications. And that is for an item that is not on our council agenda. Is there any member of the community who is here to speak to the council that is on an item not on our agenda? Okay. So we have, please keep your hands up. Okay, so we'll go ahead and um, hear your, uh, if you could please line up to my left and you will have up to two minutes to address the council on an item that is not on today's agenda. At, after we conclude oral communications, we will resume public comment for up to two minutes. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, what I'd like to address is the agenda. And I've sent a number of you. Uh, Can we please have quiet, excuse me, please quiet while you, okay, please proceed. I've sent a number of you the um, Berkeley representation of how they do their agenda. And although we don't need to do it exactly the way they do, we need a clear process here where council members can get things put on the agenda. Right now, it seems like this whole process is a little muddy and it's really unclear on how items get agendized. And so I think that there needs to be a discussion and a clear way for council members to get things put on the agenda in a reasonable amount of time. Right now, things get denied and are not agendized at all. So it'd be really uh, helpful if there was some sort of conversation on how we can do this and make it a clear way, not some obscure, uh, you know, muddied thing where, well, you can do it this way, but it doesn't have to happen that way. No, we gotta have a clear choice in how things get agendized. Thank you. Next speaker. Council, this is tangential. Um, so I, I have a, an office right at the footbridge at Felker Street and people, usually elderly, are always complaining that that footbridge is far too dark at night. It has these sort of like really dimmy, dim lights and so it's uh, difficult. Guess what has occurred? Maybe the city manager knows about this, maybe you've heard about it. For the last week, all of the lights on that bridge, the big street light over the camp, the running lights all the way under the levee towards uh, uh, Tannery have been completely blacked out. It's dark outside at night, it's so dangerous. So you take that camp that has a big LED light over it for all this time, uh, and, and now it's totally pitch black. It's actually shocking that you can't get across that bridge uh, without bumping into people. So imagine that, can't, and, can't, and I don't know if anybody has heard about this, but every night, it's been a week, it's completely blacked out. Uh, and the people from the tannery, they were, you know, they were upset with the, and had made a lot of uh, requests, but now you can't even get under that bridge. It's completely black. So I, I hope that uh, somebody does something about it. Every time I cross that, I'm like, oh, I, 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 I should be riding, but this is, is tangential because this is like we say uh, we care about this encampment and those people, but what happens in, uh, uh, when something is so dark like that uh, in the morning, it is ridiculously, uh, it's upheaval. And uh, you know, people do really uh, uh, dumb things in, in, in very dark. And so I hope we can get on that really quickly. I just wanted the council to be aware that the foot, that Felker Foot Street Bridge has no lights. There's no light over the encampment and uh, all the way the running of the uh, uh, levee path under the uh, Highway 1 Bridge blacked out currently. That's atrocious. Okay, next speaker for oral communications, items that are not on today's agenda. 
Good evening, I'm Brett Garrett, and I'm here to talk about public banks. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of our local group, People for Public Banking, and it's part of the California Public Banking Alliance. We urge the city of Santa Cruz to enact a resolution to support public banking, and specifically to endorse California legislation AB 857, which will create a legal framework for local public banks. AB 857 was introduced by David Chu of San Francisco and Miguel Santiago of Los Angeles, our own assembly member, Mark Stone, is a co-author of this bill. So why do we need public banks? One reason is because cities are discovering that large banks do not live up to their ethical standards. For example, Oakland is trying to divest from institutions that support fossil fuels, but Wells Fargo and Chase are among the largest investors in fossil fuels. Meanwhile, San Jose prohibits itself from contracting with institutions that have issues of wave stuff, theft. So all of a sudden, they're scrambling to find an alternative to, you guessed it, Wells Fargo and Chase. Um, smaller banks and credit unions cannot meet municipal needs, but a public bank can. And a public bank can finance projects at a much lower cost than using a com commercial bank or issuing bond funds. Santa Cruz is too considered to be too small to viably have its own public bank, but if San Jose creates a public bank, they might allow Santa Cruz to be a customer. Another possibility is to create a tri-county JPA that is a public bank serving three counties, such as basically the way Monterey Bay Community Power does. Um, County of Santa Cruz has endorsed the concept of public banking, and next we, exp we expect cities like San Jose, LA, and San Francisco to specifically endorse AB 857. We're asking the city of Santa Cruz to do the same, preferably at the next meeting, April 22nd, because our bill is going into committees that week. We'll follow up with more information and uh, sample resolutions. Thank you. Thank you. Were there other members of the community who wanted to address the council on items not on today's agenda? Okay. This is during oral communications. This would be your opportunity to do that. Hi, Amy. Um, don't forget about the tenants. So we're talking about the homeless people today, but you know, we got a lot of tenants that are suffering too, becoming homeless every day. So today, um, I just want to put out three little ordinances. They're really not going to help that much, but they are ordinances that you could easily pass and the landlords won't come down on your head about it. These are for Section 8 people. Um, one of them is a reusable tenant screening report ordinance. Oh, these ha housing application fees cost me so much. I have that apartment for sure, but my background check said I had an eviction that never happened. So this ordinance supports the use of reusable screening reports by setting guidelines for landlords regarding tenant background reports. The reusable reports are a verified report purchased from a third party company by a tenant who can then give the report to as many landlords as they would like to within a 30 day period. The reason you need this ordinance is to complement a source of income uh, ordinance so you can't um, you know, you can make a law, which you should, that says you can't discriminate on the basis of the source of income. People can get around it anytime they want, but you should make the law and then the tenant will know that that law is there and they'll know the landlord's lying when they turn them down, but at least the, when they go to 30 landlords, they won't have to pay for a new credit report every time. All right, so there's two laws. The third one is there's a first in time ordinance you can make. I'm gonna just pause you. Could you please keep your conversation down here in the right, please? It's distracting to the woman who's speaking at this time. I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you please conclude your conversation so that we can allow for this public speaker to speak without distraction. And so it's a first in time ordinance. So these are three little ordinances. I'd really like you to pass those. You didn't do, you're not interested in helping tenants or rent control whatsoever. And I understand that, you know, uh, some of you and your backers that threaten to recall the ones who are. So how about a few little tiny ordinances? And first in time means like, if they accept somebody, if they accept, there's if they get a few acceptable applications, they have to offer the place to the first first one who meets their criteria. So um, I can send you more information from the Haas Institute about these. Thank you. Okay, Our, um, the next speaker who wants to address the council during oral communications on items that are not on today's agenda. Come forward. Hello again, uh, my, name is, my name is Elliot. I hope you can hear me talking into the microphone this time. Uh, I have two things. One is on a council city level uh, to all of you people up here, 
I would just like to reiterate that this is an incredibly inefficient way of doing public engagement and collecting people's opinions. Um, despite myself engaging in it right now, I think that it's very inefficient and mostly a waste of time. Secondly, to the people behind me, I'm not gonna turn around because I have a quiet voice when not in this microphone, but I would like to encourage everyone here to do something other than come to these meetings, even if you continue coming to these meetings, go do something else about these issues that you apparently care about so much because it will be much more productive, at least in the short term, while we are waiting for the city to do things. That's all. Uh, Council members Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, the group I work with. Uh, we're still hoping that uh, we, the rent control just eviction protection ordinance will be dragged out of the crypt and tenants will be protected. Uh, you need ovaries and balls for that on the progressive side, but please do it. Uh, we also need on the, the issue of tenant stats, there's a, supposed to be a committee that's looking into all these issues. How about figuring out what kind of profits landlords are making over the last four years, what the rise in their taxes and costs has been, how many people have been evicted over the last four years, and how long those people were in Santa Cruz before, to get some idea of whether the landlord's whale of concern actually has evidence-based basis. I would also request on this meeting that you put on the agenda for next time agenda items. That is to say, one, restore the right of the, member of the members of the public to speak on consent agenda items without groveling before a council member. Now, Sandy Brown has been very good about this. I want to thank her for that. But it shouldn't be necessary for one council member to bear that burden. It should be a change and a restoration of an old policy. Secondly, of course, the agenda should be made if not in a public manner, at least in a fair and nonpartisan manner. So, that being the case, please put on the agenda for the next council meeting a discussion of these issues, and I hope that some member of the city council will essentially present a staff report, get some action on these matters. And that's pretty much what I got. Thank you. All right. All right. Elise Casby here. Um, the thing that I want to discuss tonight that is not on the agenda is the um, very likely possibility that Donald Trump is not going to leave the presidency. That is willingly. And at the current time, the complete and total discredit if that's a word, the, he is discrediting all of our other government departments. I really hope that y'all are paying attention to me. I know that it's super long and I don't think I could do what you do, honestly. I do respect it. But this is a, we are just a hair's breadth away from this man and his cohorts declaring a national emergency. This is a history that it's absolutely de rigueur for all of our representatives in all levels of our government to, to understand deeply and intricately that has become familiar with it because what happened in Germany is exactly what's happening here with the great exception that it was a totally different time in history and no two periods of history are ever the same. But Germany, before Hitler, was one of the most free and liberal, one of the most erudite and intelligent places, the ab abundance of independent newspapers in every single city. We absolutely have to understand that already Trump is putting out thought bubbles about him not leaving office. This is not just a, 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 I hope you understand just how real this is, and I hope you understand that we have been coming here over the last 20 years. So we are in a very dangerous place, and we actually are in a state of emergency. We as government representatives and people need to come together and have this conversation and plan for our freedom, not our security. We're beyond that. We have to mobilize for our liberty, so say the experts. Thank you very much. Are there any other members of the community who want to address the item an item that's not on today's agenda during oral communications. 
Um, I just wanted to get back to what I had an outburst about earlier that you caught me on. Um, it was just something in the Berkeley that, that I've seen done inside these city council member uh, meetings where if uh, a member is on a speech that, that's actually you know interesting to everybody in the room, rather than being uh, cut off really abruptly, um, allowing another member that's in line to uh, give them their minutes if they feel that what that person is saying might have more impact or similar impact to what they want to say, then that'll allow them to finish their thought process. Just an idea for future, you know, meetings. Thank you. I just want to say a few comments uh, about respect. And I said this before, but I would think of respect would be not cutting people off and letting them finish their train of thought or at least their sentence. That's all I need to say right now. Are there any additional speakers for oral communications? Items not on today's agenda. Is, are, is, uh, yes? Any additional other than Okay, so you two? Okay, you will be our last two speakers, and then we'll resume to the public comment of item number 15. <laughs> I believe the... The gentleman is signing in. Is that correct? Yeah. Two or three minutes today. You have two minutes for oral communications items that are not on today's agenda. If you're interested in addressing us on an item that's earlier, not on today. Earlier today we were at three minutes. Three minutes. We'll resume three minutes to um, continue our conversation. Thank you. Namaste. I am not a Jedi. I am not a dancer. I will never be, have not been, and never hope to be, and never was a prize winner. My preferred mode of work is exceedingly dark has the advantage of after long intervals of time offering few excellent photons and when that happens typically anywhere from negative 59 million years to 10 years are felt to have gone by which works just fine for me but it doesn't work well for other people that either get to know me or that try to follow me or that try to harass me or that try to steal my identity. Um, my lifestyle is not that far removed from people that excel as contestants in something like this, which is the Forestry Challenge. Now, for some reason, I'm offering you direct evidence that they had absolutely no sponsors. No one knew about them. And, uh, you know. Okay. And you will be our last speaker on our, my left. Thank you. Not together for this. My idea is that okay, please. I don't need it. I'm, I'm really anti electronics. I'm really hoping that all the rest of us go that way. We've been way over electronicizing this world. It's doing so much damage to our environment. Talk about petty theft, things like that is nothing compared to what we're doing in large scale ways to our environment. Driving these oil cars, supporting these companies that are killing the environment all over the planet and humans all over the planet. We gotta start changing these ways. There's a person across from me that warmed up his truck for 57 minutes one day. He uses more in one day driving than I have in years. 
Their lights are on all the time. Many lights, even in the day. They use more lights than I do in years. You know, I mean, come on. It's, this is the time we've got to change. We've got to grow. And it means we've got to also love everyone and everything on this planet, even if you take its life. You need to respect everything and everyone. And you can't label people this and that. You want me to start going to your houses and telling you what you're going to put in your body? Bonnie, will you pause the time, please? This is an opportunity for you to address the council. So please direct your comments well, towards well, us. Now you're trying to control me and tell me who I can talk to. I want to talk to everybody, OK? I'm talking to you and everybody. I'll look at you, too, OK? Go back to Paul Revere. I've been reading a lot of Paul Revere lately. Very dynamic, beautiful. He wasn't just a messenger. He was a huge part of the revolution. And you know what happened when people started getting poor? He started a, a company. He started to save and help everybody that was in poverty. What did Ben Franklin do? The same thing. These guys were active people. I said about Drew about action. We need to make action. Maybe it's not always going to be right, but let's make action and do things that help everything and everyone on this planet. We got to put. It's a holistic thing. It ain't piecemeal. All right. And learn about the Kogi or the Koji, <coughs> the, the Colombian Indians that have given everybody a message if you look at their documentary. Okay, thank you. Okay, that concludes oral communications. Mayor, um, excuse me. Councilmember um, Cohn. Uh, as part of oral communication, we cannot respond to what people have said, but we can ask staff to come back to us for, with, uh, with information. Um, and I'm just wondering if they come back to us with information about why the Felker Street, uh, where the bridge lights aren't aren't on right now. Um, if Ms. Berger wants to send the council uh, an ordinance, that would be great. It has to do with the tenant screening. And also, um, I assume we may be talking about agendizing items at a meeting that we're having, uh, a council retreat coming up. So that's what I'll, I'll bring that up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. So at this point, we'll go ahead, uh, Councilmember Brown. Can I just clarify that the issue about the black, I'd like information about the Felker Street Bridge, the levee, all of the area that where lights have recently gone out. So the surrounding area there too. <clears throat> okay, so at this point, we'll go ahead and resume public comment for item number 15 on our, our agenda today. Um, how many members of the community are still interested in addressing uh, the council on this item? Okay, so eventually you'll wanna make your way to my left um, at this time, the uh, time is still up to three minutes. So you'll have up to three minutes uh, to address the council. <coughs> you My name is Bill Chapman and I come here with a heavy heart. Uh, I have loved ones and friends and family that are living in Camp Ross. And they're living there by choice. They're not living there because they're homeless. They're living there by choice. They're not living there because they're homeless. They had homes before they went there. They went there by choice. <clears throat> and that's an issue that we, we need to look at. We have a homeless issue here, but Camp Ross is first and foremost not the homeless issue that it is. It's an it's a issue of drug addicts and people committing crimes to support their ha drug habits. And I implore, and I no longer want to be a part of that problem of enabling my friends and family that are living there. And I implore the city council to look deeply in, inside and there's, I don't know there's answer, but we have to stop enabling the drug addicts. We really, really need to figure out a solution, which is, it's a hard one. We, um, because if, the, if my loved ones there can't figure out how to hit a bottom, they're gonna die in Camp Ross or they're gonna die in another camp we set up. A 23 year old girl died yesterday because of a her asthma condition and her drug addiction. Her boyfriend wanted to call 911, she didn't wanna. Yes, we have a homeless issue, but at Camp Ross, it's, 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 a, it's, a, a, it's addicts that, and I too am a drug addict. And until I hit bottom, I wasn't gonna do something. If we keep on having the bottom easy, or having it easy for them to live there by bringing them food, bringing them needles, and all they have to do is, is go from an, another camp and just stand in line at one of those tents and buy drugs with the stuff that they've stolen from the community, okay? 
we, we and you look at all the break-ins we have, okay? We have to look exactly what it is, okay? And I implore us to close Camp Ross. I don't wanna see it opened again anywhere else. Yes, we need some tradi uh, transitional housing. Those transitional housing come with rules and regulations. And the one, and most of the drug addicts that are living at Camp Ross won't move to those places because they have to be in by midnight and they can't meander out and bring in stolen property all day and night. And I know that the solution is really hard. We need to f really dig down deep and figure out how we can get them, the drug addicts into uh, rehabilitation. And a lot of times that's because that's, they think more clearly when they spend some time in jail, okay? And we need to get the drugs out of their jail. There's too much drugs in jail. So there used to be, thank you for listening. Good evening, thank you for your time and listening to everybody. My name is Lisa Ward. I'm a mental health social worker and I moved here in 84. Went to UCSC and taught for a while. And then when I was 40, I went into training to be a social worker. And I did my first internship with Homeless Persons Health Project. And I was nervous. I was scared. It wasn't my first choice. Um, I was studying at San Jose, and that was kind of the only physician over here left. <laughs> um, and I have to say that my fears um, were alleviated on the first day of meeting my supervisor, who was amazing. Um, and so that's a county program that's still going, I do believe. And um, what I learned was that a lot of the people I worked with in the outreach program didn't want our services and they didn't want our vouchers. They took the sleeping bags and the tarps and they were grateful for the company. Um, but they didn't want to sign up because there was a lot of mental health concerns and, you know, maybe some paranoia with some extreme mental health, but they didn't want to be part of the system. They didn't want to sign my forms. They didn't want to join my job programs that we had to offer them. And that was a real wake up call for me that they needed more and something different. And so for the years that I've lived here, I've seen the homeless people on the streets and it always makes me sad that they have to pick up and move along every day. There's no permanent place that they can be. I'm concerned about the legality of people being able to survive and sleep. On, if they don't have homes, then they're sleeping on the streets. So when I saw the homeless encampment at Ross, I was actually uplifted that I saw these community, this community, these people were able to stay in their tent overnight and every day and not have to move every day. And what I think is important in that is that if there are mental health challenges, we don't wanna add to the stress of that. So the people that are homeless now, the people without housing, they're gonna be out on our streets. They don't have homes. So if they have an encampment like this, they have community, they can watch out for one another. I've been there, it's, you know, they're doing the best they can to keep it clean, to take care of one another. I want to put in my voice that I hope that Ross Camp does not get shut down, that it definitely not be shut down until there are available beds and that transitional camps be allowed by the city council and law. Um, there are nonprofits, um, Food Not Bombs is coming forward, and I would be happy to work as an advisor to offer training for mental health and substance use concerns. Um, like it's been said, people without homes are not the problem necessarily to the crime going on. And I just want to say that I'm happy to be joining. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Serge Cagno. Uh, I made a website, Stepping Up Santa Cruz. It's got a resource directory on it. Um, I wanted to put the picture, you guys are talking about the short-term issues that you have of you know homeless people, but you're also, uh, in some of the things that you're talking about, you're talking about the long-term things. So you're talking about going from homeless to housed, and there's a bunch of steps in there. The first step is what she was talking about, about engagement. That, whether somebody is willing to go into a shelter, whether somebody is willing to talk to HPHP, whether they're willing to do mental health, substance use, 
for whatever reason that they may be resistant to part of the system, there are people that are choosing not to go to a shelter even if there is a bed. So that idea of how do you engage people, whether that's a compassionate conversation, whether you can connect with them, you give them a pair of socks and maybe next week they're willing to talk to them. But that's a piece of whatever, whatever program you choose, it's how do you do your engagement to get the disenfranchised to feel like they have a voice, to feel like you're respecting them, you're a friend, they've been burned a lot, are they willing to take a risk on you and try the program you're talking about, even if that's building K and Emmeline? Because of that relationship, they may be willing to try the system. The next step is whether it's homeless case management, mental health, substance use, whatever kind of program it is, how good and robust it is. That's a necessary piece on them moving towards being housed. There's housing navigation, which is also something that is not something that you guys are talking about or legislating or deciding how good that part of the program is, but how good are those people actually trained to do it? whether they're programs that are housing stabilization and help them, whether there's funding for different kinds of programs and there's some funding that you guys help with, whether there's housing stock, that's also something that you guys work on. But I just wanted to put out there that what you choose on how you decide your immediate services is whether they're willing to play the game on the long term and whether they're willing to go through, start this process to be housed. So whether that's encampments, whether that's safe sleeping, whether that's Salvation Army, whether that's HSC, it's, it's not just that there's a program, it's how they're treated. Do they have more social worker conversations or more conversations about move it along? Like that's the, the entire idea of they see everything, the bureaucracy and government as that thing that is a challenge for them and they wanna stay away from. Making more of those conversations engaging and giving the, the police, like the mental health liaisons and giving them the tools to be able to have the, the nice conversation. How are you? How did that meeting go? Did you get that place? Did you get into that program? Oh, you need a reference. Oh, hey, I can call. They would love to have those conversations more than the conversations about you're just trying to live your life and I need to enforce a rule. So just putting that into the discussion. All right, so my name is Jose Pena, and I really have been living in this town for 25 years. Um, it's been quite a struggle. I l moved here from Lake Tahoe, and you know, up there was like pretty expensive to live here, and moving down here was even more expensive, and I think that's where our whole homeless thing s strives from. I have so many friends that went to college with me 20 years ago who were good, upstanding kids, and now they're homeless because the rent is so freaking expensive in this town. And like, we're doing nothing in this community to help like the people that have the working class jobs. I mean, it's great that like, you guys are like city council members and like, you know, you have the money to live your lives, but like, what about the people that like work in restaurants? What about the people that have to work at like stores? It's, these are the people that like, are the backbone of our community, but yet, they can't even afford to like live here. And so they they break their leg, they break their arm, they, they, they're out of work for like a few days or like for a, a month or two, and then all of a sudden they have to go homeless. And this is just like a real thing in this community. It's like anything happens to you in this community and you can't like pay your rent, you're done, you're done. And that's how this whole camp has started. A lot of people in this camp are there because they had something bad happen to them and now they're living on the streets. I lived up in, I lived, like I had to live in Poganit for three months because like I had something happen to me, you know, but I picked myself up, I, I got back to working my job and like I got a job and like I had to do that and like it, it's just like I have two, I, I have to have two jobs just to support myself in this town and I feel that it's like, that is like one of the things that is the biggest problem with this, t I, I love this place, I, I, I tried to move away but I just got draw, drawn back because I love this area. But I really think it's just, just the hardest part is our rent and the fact that like everyone that owns a house thinks that they can like charge 1100 a month for a room to live, like seriously, seriously, to live. But like, then, then, then they come to my restaurant and they complain that, you know, a pizza is $32. It's like, come on guys, like, 
Seriously, yeah, yeah, really, okay. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. We need to do something about the rent, and I think like lower prices will actually get people off the street. If, they, if you can actually have like a real job and just work your job and be able to afford like living here, I don't think there would be like a thousand people living over behind Ross, and that's all. That's all I got to say. Good evening, Council. My name is Brandon Robbins. Um, I don't have a prepared speech today, um, but I'm just would like to make a few remarks in strong support of uh, Council Members Brown and Cummings alternative. Um, essentially, what essentially Martin v. Boys is now law. Um, the what that basically means is that you can't, as the decision has said. Resisting the need to eat, sleep, or engage in other life-sustaining activities is impossible. Avoiding public places while engaging in this otherwise innocent conduct is also impossible. As long as the homeless plaintiffs do not have a single place where they can lawfully be, the challenged ordinances as applied to them effectively punish them for something for which they may not be convicted under the Eighth Amendment, sleeping, eating, and other innocent conduct. What basically, the, what, for about, 20 or 30 years, the city of Santa Cruz has generally followed the policy of just total, basically total ban. Um, we've seen multiple, we've seen multiple encampments form and then be broken up and then another one forms again because you can't take, people try to go for community. Um, and essentially, what, what, what we need to have is a, is a, uh, something is a stable place where people can um, not have to, you know, wonder where am I, where am I literally going to sleep tonight? A place where there, a place where there is a self-governing council, um, and what, and when we look at the alternatives that are being p proposed, where people would go, basically the the River Street site, which really resembles a prison more than anything else. Um, it just is not a, it's not a logical way and it's not a workable way. So I really would say um, to just keep, to just basically don't keep on going with the same failed policy that we've spent the last 20 or 30 years doing and stop playing whack-a-mole with human beings. Um, so keep the river, keep the Ross camp open for now. Hi, council members. Uh, my name is Pedro Castillo. Um, you know, um, I know you guys have a lot, a, a big decision to make, and then, um, you know, maybe most of you know, you know, what's the, the best decision that you need to make. But I, I was gonna say this fable. Um, there's this man uh, walking this donkey with his, his, his boy. So he's carrying his, he's carrying his boy and his donkey, and as he's walking by, people walks by and then tell the men, they all tell the men they just whisper among themselves, what are these full old men walking, pulling the donkey while the young man that is a lot of energy, he can walk. So he tells his boy, you know, walk and I'll be riding the donkey. So he goes riding the donkey and then another people walk by and then they're whispering, this, this old man is, you know, is uh, why he doesn't walk and then have the boy be on the donkey. And then, so then later he goes, well, he and the, and the young boy go on the donkey and they, they, they're walking and then there's another people walk by and they whisper at the end and they say, see this unconscious man, uh, both of them riding the donkey, poor donkey, you know, it's all tired. So then they decide to, both of them walk and then pull the donkey. Then another uh, group of men walk by and then they say, look this fool, you know, they have a donkey and instead of riding the donkey, they just uh, put in the donkey by itself. Well, what I wanna say is that it's always gonna be different um, people, you know, different ideas. And then the one thing I wanna say is you're not gonna be able to please everyone. Uh, either close the Ross camp, don't close the Ross camp. Uh, there's a homeless issue going on for years. Uh, what is the best thing to do? You know, like offering free housing, you know, offering low, you know, low rent housing. I mean, there's a lot of ideas that have to be done, uh, but you guys have to decide, you know, what is the best thing to do. Uh, it's not an issue, easy thing to do. 
um, the other thing is uh, a lot of times feelings get on the way. And if feelings get on the way, it can affect the way uh, we decide what to do. Uh, I had neighbors that had come and, and speak to the city council, and then they feel like there is no reason to go. Nothing happens, nothing gets done. People get discouraged, they don't come. Um, there's other citizens, you know, that they don't want the, uh, this kind of population on their neighborhood. Uh, if they don't have the issue, they don't come to the council meetings. Uh, it seems that the, the, the people that are more affected, they're here. So I see that big support group for the Rosen and Carmen. Um, you know, they, you know they, they feel being threatened, you know, they want to stay there. Uh, there is, there is uh, businesses that don't want them there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any um, others ask. interested in speaking who haven't spoken before for item um, number 15? Okay. You two in the front? I haven't spoken on the wrong. You haven't spoken on this item. I believe. Let's hear from folks who haven't spoken. I'd like to. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I know it is get confused. We'll go ahead and pause. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and pause. If you could just one moment, please. Who hasn't spoken to the city council yet on this item or any item yet today? Okay. We're going to go ahead and hear from folks who have not yet addressed the city council on any item today. I've been waiting for the three minutes. We'll have you go. You'll have your opportunity, but we're going to allow people who haven't quite yet had a chance to. Yes. 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 Okay, so we'll go ahead and get to you. Go right ahead. You have up to three minutes. Um, thank you for taking the opportunity to listen to myself and everyone else here. Uh, my name is Jeff Bergstrom, and I'm a social worker, a community advocate, and um, I haven't lived in this town very long, a year maybe. So I was listening earlier to how people who have been here for 25 years have experienced the, what we might term as a transition period between Ollie, when pause the time? housing was affordable. I'm going to go ahead and pause your time. Could if uh, the person standing in the front filming, if you could please uh, take a seat, uh, you're blocking the view of others behind you. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, it sounds like there's been a transition. I don't know you know, exactly when that occurred, but um, I'm assuming that within the last maybe 10 or five years, the uh, cost of living, essentially affordable housing has continued to rise and go to a point where there's just some people who feel disenfranchised and can't afford to, you know, live in a, a reasonable place anymore. Now, um, I don't believe, because I've lived in various places up and down the West Coast, um, including Los Angeles, where I see the homeless um, population there too. I don't think that Santa Cruz is unique to this kind of situation, but it's like, you know, um, when, when people start talking about snakes being close by and um, as long as it's not on my doorstep, you know, everything is okay. But as soon as I open the door one morning and there's a snake on my doorstep, then there's something that I feel like I need to do about it. And um, in a sense, I get the uh, feeling that this is what's happening with Santa Cruz now. Suddenly this has become an epidemic. And I think that the state has set aside some money now to actually address this issue. And Santa Cruz has some of that money. And so we're going to be doing something about this, hopefully. But I've worked um, in various communities doing things that, um, are called models that work where we don't have to recreate the wheel, so to speak. And there are places in this country, and in fact, other places in the world, where, you know, people that choose to live in communities like we have here at Ross are actually thriving because they have a voice. You know, people um, in, that represent, people that are representative of our government sometimes want to feel like they, I need to tell people how they're supposed to live their lives when, in my opinion, the best approach 
is to go to people and ask them, how would you like to be supported? And then get a consensus from, from that population because they're the ones that know what's best for them, not us. And so as a social worker, I would be Thank willing you. to donate my time to make this happen. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Colleen Sullivan. Um, I would just like to encourage you all, I know that I've read that you're all working more closely than ever with the county to work on this issue and that it's an unusual thing that you're working with the county, but one thing I would like you to encourage you to look at is maybe locating services and locating these encampments near where county services are, right? Because that's where people need to get to. And so rather than putting them in a parking lot in the middle of the city, put them somewhere where it's much more easy to um, access services and I would really encourage you to continue working with state and county and federal sources this is a really complex issue and um, really needs to um, have a lot of uh, study and um, please look at the data behind what you're looking at thank you okay. how about we'll hear from the two folks in front who haven't addressed us on this item at this time Ms. Berger, it was brought to my attention that you have spoken to this item already. So you won't be allowed to speak again, okay? You spoke to, during oral communications is my understanding. Okay, go ahead. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, so on item 15.1, consider rescinding the city council decision on lot 24 there's no alternative given here. It's just rescind this, but there's no alternative as to what are you gonna replace it with? What, you know, you're replacing it with nothing. Let's not, you know, let, let's come up with an alternative on that item. Um, 15.2, uh, close the Ross camp immediately. Uh, that doesn't, that's not gonna fly. Um, they, you need to have some place for people to go. Right now, the only alternative you've got is a prison camp. Yeah, you know, and, and people can't even walk there. They can't ride their bicycle there. They have to get on a shuttle bus, which is an added expense to this whole program, and go there and then spend 12 hours there. And, you know, they can't leave. They can't go, come and go. Um, they have to be searched in order to enter the place. I mean, th this is like, who wants to go, who's gonna wanna go there? You know, and then you're gonna offer this to people, and if they say no, then you can say, well, you're just gonna have to leave Ross Camp because you've refused this service. You know, that, that's ridiculous. You set up a prison camp and then you tell people that, they, that they're gonna have to leave because of that. Um, as far as having a ad hoc expert council on homelessness, I'm sort of in favor of that, but, uh, I would like it that each council member would be able to appoint somebody to that, not just the mayor. Um, and, the, you know, and then the other thing is, if you say that you can't have any park, parking lot, or any other city-owned thing be a place for an encampment, where, what are you talking about? Where are these encampments gonna be? You know, and you've got this uh, two by two committee. Well, where, where is the input from the, the county? Why isn't the county allowing, there's a piece of San Lorenzo Park that is right next to the, to the county building, adjacent to the county building that is owned by the county. That would seem to be the most logical place for this short-term camp because it's, it's not near the children's play playground, it's not near the river, and it's not near the seniors that are across the street on Dakota Street. It, it seems like the perfect spot, but I'm told that the county won't allow that. And they have the biggest parking lots in the city, but they won't allow any overnight parking for homeless people. I, I mean, it's like, what is their, input into this if, if they're not gonna help us as the city when they have all this. Time is up. That's Thank already you. three minutes? That's right. 
Yes. <laughs> okay, anyway, thank you. Your time um, is up. Your time is up. You no, have no, no longer, you have no time left. Yeah, okay. Please take a seat. But the, thank you. Uh, Go ahead and sit down. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to get a sense of how many other folks in the audience are interested in addressing the council on this item. I, I just, I see, <coughs> can I get, if you could please raise your hand to indicate if you're interested. I see four, four additional folks. Okay, if you could line up to my left and we will have uh, the, you uh, in the purple be our last speaker on this item at this time. I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I've said this before, so I'm gonna say it again because I think it's really important. I'm addressing those of you who really wanna close the camp. You say you, all of a sudden, some of you are saying you really care about the people at the camp. Thank you, I appreciate it. But where were you when you t just recently took out the, part, the benches at the bus stops? What about, that's, that was last week or something. So six benches out of the bus stops, is that really caring about the people? What about the, what about the um, fences that you've put up? What about the parks you've closed down? What about the legal signs that you put all over the city? Um, and all of a sudden you say you care. And by the way, I um, wish Tony Condotti was here, but he said that they're no longer enforcing the camping ban, but um, November 20, I think it's November 27, 2017, I have someone who gave me a ticket that showed they got 6.36, which is the camping ban. So I don't really trust that information. So they are still giving out tickets. Um, um, but I don't have everyone's tickets, so I can't know that for sure. Um, we've been speaking to you for years about cruel and unusual punishment as soon as the Martin versus Bell at the time uh, decision came out and then it turned, um, I said Bell versus Boise, sorry, and then it became Martin versus Boise. Um, you know, there are several stores at the Gateway Encampment that are actually getting even, I don't know if it's more business, but all the people that go and give out donations, I'm buying at Office Depot, I'm buying at Ross, I'm having meetings at the camp, at the coffee shop, but I won't anymore because that owner seems to be really rude. Um, and same with the Mexican restaurant there, Chipotle. So, um, and I've asked some of the managers, I just asked the manager at Bay Federal, have you had any issues? No, we don't have any issues at all. We haven't seen any difference. Um, so it depends who you talk to, of course. Um, Susie O'Hare explained that one of the components is to talk to the neighbors. Um, that was an important component. You, did, you didn't talk to the neighbors. So I'm wondering if you pers personally sabotage that. Um, you, the, the committee that you're promising, you did a committee in May of 2017 and you had 20 points that you promised. It's simple things like a charging station, like showers. It's been oh, um, two years and still those haven't been done. So I don't trust the committee, I don't trust dialogues, I don't trust any of that. Um, I, I don't think it means anything. I think you, you've, action, not talk. Um, the nimbyism that's happening here, we need education. I sent you a e letter yesterday. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'm Lyon. Uh, when, you, when people show up for this camp, I wanna call it Gateway Camp. It's a place where people come to Santa Cruz because they come here to live. Some will die. But we can show them life. We're good at that. I've been coming here for a lot. I've been living here for 40 years. I was in the wilderness a lot in my life. And people say, wasn't well, that dangerous? I never been accosted by anything. I took care of African lions and tigers and cheetahs, all kinds of wild animals. I've never had a problem with them. What I have a problem with is humans. And you know what? Humans have, have attacked me. People from houses. I've been shot at a couple different times. I've had my stuff taken in the middle of winter. I've had my tent sliced up. I've had guys show up and wake me up in the morning with big metal poles and huge sword and bat. Come on. And how about you people that live in the houses? 
doing eight prescription drugs on an average, according to Dr. Oz show, when a whole Iowa town, I think it was, showed up and said, we're all addicted, addicted to drugs. How about murder? How about molesting children, wife beating, husband beating, coaches, police officers, anyone and everyone in our community can do bad things. It doesn't matter where you live. These people need to be respected for who they are, first off. Who they are, love for who they are. I don't care who they are. And then everything on the planet, again, like I said, who they, whatever it is, we cannot judge them that way. It's what they do. Then we work with what they do, okay? If they do bad things, we work with them, we help them. But when somebody, when you see somebody slamming a needle, <clears throat> that's not the greatest thing, but they're in pain and they're doing just like, what do you do when a child starts crying? You tell them to shut up and go away? They're asking for help, right? They're doing that in front of you because they're asking for help. Why don't you say, well, I love you, or have a good day, or what can I do for you? You know, this has just got to change. You people, we've got to grow. And we're in Santa Cruz and we're in California, and we've been showing the way for a long time to the rest of the world. We got to keep doing that. And we can spin. We're in a storm, yeah, and we've got a lot of different directions within our storm. But we got to move forward. We got to grow in a way that's going to make this whole world and our community healthy. Just like I said, the founding fathers have been reading a lot about what they started. And they were starting a socialistic democracy. It didn't even include capitalism. I'm throwing that at the end, OK? So that's the end thing we got to work on. I want to take of everybody, even the capitalists, too. But we got to work on taking care of our democracy and all of our people and all the creatures that live on our planet, OK, including and the plants, okay. everything. Your time is up. OK. Okay, your time is up. Your time is up. We've had a chance to hear from you. Your time housing is up. trust. Your time is up, sir. Please take a seat. Thank you very much. Hello again. Um, back, different items, so I'm allowed to talk again. Um, I just want to reiterate, actually, a few of the last things that got said by, uh, I think his name was Lion. Uh, anyway, I work in the mental health field, and there's a lot of overlap with homeless people, of course. And I bring that up because he's right. People who are homeless and people who are housed do a lot of terrible things, whether they're homeless or whether they're housed. But something that has become increasingly apparent to me recently is that very often homeless people are the ones who are being, and I don't like the word, but they're the ones who are being victimized when terrible things are happening either because they're homeless and they're easy targets, or they're homeless because of these things that have happened to them and they haven't received support to cope with those things, and that's how they ended up homeless. So I think that if so many of these people were legitimately worried about the dangerous murderers or whatever it is they think homeless people are, they would be up here and they would be condemning the people who go and throw frozen water bottles at homeless camps, not the homeless people themselves. Because while homeless people sometimes do bad things, everyone does bad things. And that's like literally so simple that it amazes me how many people can get up here and say all homeless people are bad. They're literally, it's just a way of classing people into a group. It's ridiculous. That's my final point. This entire thing is ridiculous in the original meaning of the word, deserving of ridicule. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the bottom line is this is my first three minute as opposed to a two minute. And the bottom line that I've allocated for the last 60 seconds is to discuss one of almost a dozen of the best parks anyone could hope to find anywhere in the world, and they all happen to be in our county, for some very mysterious reason that I've not been able to find any clue or 
crack the answer to since 1986. There is a government office building that terrifies the local population to the point where they don't even want to be seen on camera walking in the front door. I don't know how to mitigate this risk yet, but the bottom line about it, this bottom line item is that if you go into the visitor's office around the corner from the Shell Station at Ocean and Water, it could be because Starbucks is an extremely evil corporation which is constantly proved by their poorly trained staff managers making horrible decisions at least once every 30 days. Um, the bottom line is that Brighton Beach State Park has over 100 camping spots and they have a reservation system. <coughs> and I choose this opportunity to remind viewers from previous that the border from Brownsville to Tijuana is a system. And when people that care about systems step up, the systems officer that I have the highest respect for is a professor of engineering in a school near LA with an untrustworthy mascot. And he was the original B2 program manager for Northrop Grumman. Professor George, <clears throat> um, who I expect to take golfing near Lawrence Livermore by the end of the year, most definitely without family. Um, the most important item in my time remaining is from today's New York Times, where one of the scariest words that can come up in a Pentagon Joint Chiefs uh, minutes is well, I just choose to call it a splurge. When I want to celebrate transitions and new investments and old deaths and things to be forgotten in the rearview mirror as fast as humanly possible, I think of a splurge as in a shopping spree. Thank you. Right. Next speaker. Yes, good evening. Um, like some other people here, I didn't have any prepared remarks. Um, didn't even necessarily know I was going to be speaking until the last moment when I <clears throat> decided I uh, needed to respond to some things I heard from the community. Um, in particular, I noticed one committee member referring to homeless people as a plague. And I just want to note at this point how dangerous that kind of characterization of the group of people can be. Um, it's certainly true that there are criminals among the homeless population here. In particular, there are a lot of drug addicts, and in particular among those, in our experience, a lot of methamphetamine addicts who are awake all night, aggressive, dangerous, we've had things stolen from us, we've been threatened, we've been attacked by them. We would certainly speaking as homeless people who don't live in Ross Camp because we don't want to be close <coughs> to the kinds of threats that we face as Muslims, as well as homeless people. We sleep a distance away, but we certainly want to keep that camp open. We also want to see the community try to distinguish between the criminals there who need law enforcement. They need to be stopped from doing this. And the rest of us who are just trying to survive. The second point I want to make regards the roots of homelessness. Um, this problem isn't one of people coming in because there are magnets here that bring in homeless people. I've been here since 1976. I imagine quite a few other people have also res resided here for a long time. I'm not homeless by choice. I don't know how many other people are. I think it's a minority who are. Most of us would sign a lease today if we were offered a decent place to live. But the problem is that it's unaffordable in this county. And that problem isn't going to go away unless this council starts finding radical solutions to completely change this game so that it's no longer this artificial scarcity where people actually can make use of the space that's available and we could house everybody here. 
if we have the will to do it. That's really all I have to say. Thank you. And you will be our last speaker. Thanks for um, meeting on this, for considering it. I'm really concerned about the classification that we talk about homeless people like they're all the same. There's people who don't have houses. We have, in that community, we have drug addicts. We have people who are well-kept, who just have no other choice. And we have a few people who may have mental illness and would, and would ha be happily, they live there on purpose. But we have different needs in the community. <coughs> and I'm really concerned about um, people, the logistics of being, of not having a home in this community or not having a car. When you, I, I see people in my neighborhood, I live in Seabright, I see people in my neighborhood and I think if they wanna go to the soup kitchen, they have to walk all the way across town. If they wanna take a shower or use the public bathrooms, they have to come very far to do that. And then if they wanna sleep somewhere, then they have to go somewhere else. Who's talking about keeping services centralized so that they can have the methadone clinic and health services and food and all of that stuff in one one place, but um, also provide safe places for people who don't wanna be among drug addicts. I see empty church parking lots all over my neighborhood all day and all night, and I don't understand why a sober person with an RV or, or a car can't park there overnight safely. Um, so, and then the other thing was that I was talking with a, an employee of the city yesterday who does a lot of the cleanup on the streets, and he told me that a lot of the homeless people who are addicts are, um, are able to get their um, meth, methamphetamines or whatever they're using easily because there's no enforcement um, on preventing the drug dealers from doing anything and that he's seen um, like guys, young guys in, our, in uh, BMWs with brand new BMWs with no plates pulling up and he's watching them and then they stare back at him like what are you, ta what are you looking at and they flash a gun at him and he's like uh, nothing apparently but w where's the enforcement? If you don't want the drug addicts here then get rid of the, those drugs. Um, so anyway, um, I, I really have a lot of compassion for the people on the street. It's upsetting to my kids. I'm concerned about the MRSA that's going around. Um, one man was sitting in my neighborhood and I was driving by and from my car driving by at like 20 miles per hour, I could see how bad his leg was. And I, I stopped to try to help him. But the wound clinic's all the way in Watsonville and he can't use the emergency room as a regular care and he has to, he, he can get care at um, M-Lime, he has to walk from here to there to get, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to me why. Thank you. Okay. All right, so that concludes public comment on this item. We'll go ahead and return back to council for action and deliberation. Um, I wanna thank the community for uh, coming out. I know that this is incredibly complex, um, that when we agendize these uh, discussions that it really highlights all the complexities that uh, accompany uh, this big social issue that we're hoping to tackle. Um, Right now, we're at a point where we're gonna have a chance to uh, discuss three separate uh, proposals within this uh, item, item 15. Um, we'll begin with 15.2, and um, I just want to, before we begin the discussion, I just want to um, sort of ask the council to uh, remember that we have a lot of city business to do that this evening's item at 7.30, which was slated to begin at 7.30, was um, originally uh, around strategic planning and uh, around trying to figure out how we can work towards other types of uh, 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 work plan goals as a council, and that will still uh, take place. Um, and come on, and, and I, I see, I see you. On, um, on February 12th, you know, we had a significant amount of homeless proposals come before us, at which time there were a number of suggestions, including um, removing parking restrictions on Delaware, et cetera. We returned back on uh, the 26th and uh, made some changes, including rescinding that. 
On the 12th, we um, further directed staff to explore uh, shelter emergency as well as other potential transitional encampment locations with specific locations. And that um, on the 19th was returned to us with a vote on um, Depot Park. And then on the 26th, there was a proposal to return today to discuss a potential um, re to resend the Depot Park item and uh, other solutions for the gateway encampment. So um, over the past five to six meetings, there has been a significant amount of time spent looking at solutions with very um, little decision being made. So although there are two separate choices before us, um, my hope is that we can make a choice and move forward in one direction or another. I do see uh, two differences. One, the first item specifically mentions the removal of parking lot 24, uh, which we can vote on, um, and I think was something that was uh, interest of all council. And, and then the, se and the second difference that stands out is really looking at the closure of the encampment. Um, and one, having the enclosure happen with existing uh, uh, shelter spaces being utilized with the, um, with, the, uh, with the beginning of the 1220 River Street Camp also accompanying that decision and potential of lodging vouchers to fill any potential gaps for folks who may not have um, a place to, or not be able to access some of the other shelters. Um, the other potential option would be to create essentially that location to be that shelter option in the interim. Um, so we'll go ahead and move forward with 15.2, and then we'll move on to 15.3, and then uh, finish off with 15.4, which is essentially the uh, city attorney's uh, recommendation for standard operating procedures. Okay, Council Member Brown and then Council Member Matthews. I'm gonna make a request and if necessary, a motion here. Uh, specifically about the ordering of the decision making here. I think we have, um, this is a complex issue. We have uh, a set of kind of action items, potential action items and recommendations. I'd like to ask that we take those um, in turn rather than asking to vote on these two packages separately. We're gonna end up with different, with mo motions and substitute motions or potentially all over the place and conflated discussion on the floor. I'd like to take the items separately, um, independently. And so I'd like to um, ask that we vote on rescinding lot 24 as its own item, standalone, regardless of, because it's in 15.1 and 15.2, um, that we do that. Um, I'm not prepared to um, personally vote on any of the other um, recommendations without first reviewing the SOP and what we're gonna do with that. So I'd like to place that up front as its own separate item, I believe it is in 15.4. I'd like that ordered um, appropriately. And um, then with respect to um, the other recommendations, I believe that uh, the proposal about having some kind of community, um, it, it's item three in 15.2, I believe. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, that that be um, considered separately and discussed separately, um, and then um, we can carry on to um, recommendation um, in 15.2, number two with discussion um, about that, and then 15.3's recommendation for conditions of um, maintaining the camp in the interim. So I think it would be really helpful for all of us if we if we took those separately. And Councilmember Matthews. I, I don't disagree with you. <laughs> and. Um, the original motion that I uh, laid out, just listening to all the discussion and the various components as we learned about them this afternoon and throughout the course of the evening, I, I see those components and a few others. So I'm just gonna run through them super quickly and then we can see how they parse out. Um, first, uh, of course, dealing with uh, lot 24 and um, not pursuing campgrounds on other city neighborhoods and parks. Um, then, um, the standard operating procedure, um, I was uh, speaking with the um, fire chief and um, the feeling there was the uh, to have a standard operating procedure for removal encampments on city and non-city owned public property, understanding that there will be future modifications based on pending discussions. So that's how I would do that. Let's get something on the record, understanding that it will morph. Um, also, um, again, in consultation with uh, the city attorney, um, adopting, a council, adopting as council policy 
the chief of police's administrative practice of suspending enforcement of ordinance 6.36 against homeless individuals camping pending adoption of an amendment that is consistent with the Ninth Circuit decision in Martin versus Boise. So that would be, um, it's, it's a practice we currently have, but it's not council policy. So um, going ahead with that. Um, can I pause you for yeah. just a moment? Maybe we can go ahead and move forward I, with I, that. I just we... wanted to get on the table that there are other components that I think are, right, right, thank they're you. compatible. We, we just, we've learned a lot. <laughs> are you interested in moving those at this time considering that? Is essentially what I we, feel. We like. could do, I, I think the only other one that that's different um, than a date is um, immediately engaging with the ACLU and others regarding the legal issues that have been raised and reporting back on April 23rd. I mean, I think we want to give direction on these things. Um, and then uh, directing staff to develop and implement an immediate management plan for the Ross camp and any other encampments on public private on, on public property. That again is a request of the fire chief that it's not just related to the Ross camp, but it's any other encampments. He feels strongly he wants a, a general policy to deal with fire safety, health and welfare issues with this management plan to be delegated to fire and building professionals. And then that kind of just leaves the last little bit to deal with. But I think there's a great deal in common here. Okay, so would, do we want to move forward with the commonalities and uh, try to get those taken care of and then move into some of the detailed conversation regarding the two different proposals brought forward? Is that a, would that be? Would make sense. Do you want to, I'll entertain yeah. a motion. Would you like to? I'll, I'll start and do them one by one. I think this is okay. something each, each component's a little bit different. So I'll start with saying um, that um, I move to rescind the city council prior action uh, prior approval of parking lot 24 as a site for safe sleeping or camping and uh, direct that we not pursue further campgrounds in city neighborhoods or parks. Okay, I'll second that motion. So that was the motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by myself to rescind lot 24 and not pursue any um, additional uh, locations. Uh, do, will you clarify specifically where, what your language was around? In city neighborhoods and parks. In city neighborhoods and parks. Okay. Uh, dis let's discuss that and then we'll move on to uh, Council Member Glover and then... Yeah, so that was one of my main concerns from the proposal brought forward by Council Member Brown and Vice Mayor Cummings was specifically that language in number three which says, uh, and not pursue further homeless campgrounds in city neighborhoods or parks. I think uh, I really appreciated what Mr. Castillo said with regards to the donkey analogy and that you're unable to please everyone. And I think it's really, uh, that. then we heard from other people, it's time for us to take some really serious and tangible action. So my question to my colleagues is that if we do move forward with this and decide to not pursue further homeless campgrounds in city neighborhoods or parks, where are you going to explore homeless campgrounds? Councilman Brown? In, the intention, I believe the intention here was not to pursue at this time, um, given that the um, where we've been it has been um, suspicion, fear, uh, reaction to the potential for any and all sites being, just trying to put that, that idea to rest that we are not considering, currently considering other parks, other spaces at this time um, well, was, was the, the intention of that. The, okay. the concern I have with that is that, for example, Friendship Garden, which is over in Harvey West Park, which was a site, to my understanding, that was dedicated to the community and the relationship between housed and unhoused people, is not near a neighborhood or highly dense area. There's only one school that's located probably like a half mile away. Yes, it is in proximity to, say, the pool and farther away the baseball fields, but that is a place that could be a tangible and viable location for a potential transitional encampment with the correct amount of community input. Now, I'm really disappointed by the, you know, I identified another location at 115 Dubois Street or Dubois Street that I brought to the city manager's office months ago when we had our little retreat over there at uh, Harvey West Park, but only until last week when I called to remind them that it was a potential location did they let me know that oh, all of a sudden it was rented and leased, but that was after months of it being unleased for a long time. So I'm concerned about this line and I won't be able to support this 
package motion, I, I uh, support the rescinding of lot 24 because of the lack of community engagement that the staff did in that process, which elicited such fear and, react and reaction into that state, but not to cut out all of our options of looking at any city neighborhoods or parks, because ideally through uh, the process of community engagement, we'll be able to create a sense of community, both with either within communities or ideally within parks, where people will not only be receptive to it, but be constructive and productive in doing it. We need to act and no more, no more of this dancing around not doing stuff. It's like, it's time okay. to move. So I'll just, uh, for clarification. <laughs> Can I just clarify the one issue? I'm gonna make one point of clarification. There is actually a school at Harvey West that is a alternative school that's located right next to the pool, just as sort of a FYI, um, and multiple education uh, services in that area. Um, and then we'll have you, uh, City Manager Martin Bernal, and then back to Council Member Brown. I just wanna clarify also that the council direction was to look, to bring back city property, city owned properties. That's okay. what we were focusing on. Okay, great. Councilmember Brown. Just once again to reiterate the request that we take each of these items separately rather than as two packages. So I think we can, if we just talk about them independently, we can get there. So the item before us is a motion to uh, rescind city council approval of parking lot 24 um, as a site for safe sleeping and camping and uh, to not pursue further homeless campground, campgrounds in city neighborhoods or parks I believe at this time. That's the motion that we're addressing at this time. Okay, so any further discussion on that? Okay, yeah. Council Brown. Why don't we, I mean, the, the recommendation here is motion to rescind city approval of parking lot number 24 as a site for safe sleeping or camping. Why don't we vote on that and then move on to the, the next issue uh, that might preclude all parks and, you know, um, that was not the motion made by Councilmember uh, Matthews uh, to essentially look at commonalities between the two proposals, one to close the parking lot 24 and the other to not pursue further homeless campgrounds in city neighborhoods and parks. So that's not the motion on the floor. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember. And Brown. I just wanna say I intentionally borrowed that language from the other proposal because I think the community has been so jerked around right lately over the last few somebody. months, weeks of um, this site, that site, this site, that site. And we really need to focus. It's caused such anxiety and anger and fracturing in the community. And we have some critical issues. We have some critical opportunities. Uh, we will look at some point in the future at other city property, but right now I think let's get the parks and neighborhoods off the agenda. Let's focus on the things that that take so much energy. I don't think we have the, um, the capacity to get into yet another site that's next to schools and parks and everything else. So that I purposely want that language to go together. Okay, would you like to restate the motion and, and then we have a question, is it a question? From no, it's a substitute motion. Okay. You wanna go ahead and restate the motion for clarity. Motion to rescind the city council approval of parking lot 24 as a site for a safe, for safe sleeping or camping and not pursue further campgrounds in city neighborhoods or parks. Okay, so the motion um, was made by Councilmember Matthews. I believe I seconded that motion. Okay, um, Councilmember Glover. I'd like to make a substitute motion for, uh, to rescind the city council approval of parking lot 24 as a site for a safe sleeping and camping, period. Second. Okay, we'll go ahead and vote on whether or not the substitute motion um, will continue. Whether or not to accept the accept substitute, substitute motion. motion. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No? No. So that passes, that fails with Councilmember Crone, Glover, and Brown voting in support, Vice Mayor Cummings, uh, Matthews, uh, Myers, and myself voting against. So we'll go back to the original motion. All those in favor, oh. Can I ask a fr uh, friendly amendment to the motion? that we include the language of um, in city neighborhoods or parks at this time, um, just so that if in the future neighborhood, neighborhood groups. You know what? Anything we do is at this time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. Yep. So that's a uh, friendly amendment that <coughs> seems to be accepted by uh, Councilmember Matthews to incorporate at the end of the motion at this time. Okay, and that's fine for me. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. 
So I'm sorry, I didn't catch your vote. Did you, were you in support? Yes. Okay, Council Member Crone, um, Myers, Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself in support. Uh, Council Member Glover voting against. Okay. And then the second was to uh, move forward with item 15.4, if I'm understanding correctly, in regards to the standard operating procedures for vacating homeless encampments. And I believe uh, Council Member Matthews, you had some language around how to move that forward. Is Just that a very slight addition. It's a resolution adopting standard operating procedure for removal of homeless encampments on city or non-city owned public property that contains significant health and safety or nuisance conditions subject to further modifications as appropriate. Okay. Is that a motion? I'll second that. Okay. So motion to uh, adopt the recommendation of item 15.4 uh, made by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Myers, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with uh, adopting the standard operating procedure as it is today, although I do think that given the letter from the ACLU, this is going to be um, referred for additional conversations, and I, I don't think this, so, so, so having the subject to further revisions language makes me okay with supporting it today, but I do think that's going to happen. That's the assumption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Cummings. I just wanted some clarification because... Uh, my understanding was that the homeless two by two committee meeting was canceled because the, the standard operating procedures weren't ready to bring to that meeting uh, last Monday. But at the same time, they were then put on the agenda without having gone to the homeless two by two committee. And I'm just kind of curious why that meeting was canceled when this was supposed to go to the meeting and now we're seeing it um, on the agenda without it having gone to that meeting. We have assistant city manager, Tina Scholl. Good evening, um, Mayor Watkins Council. Thanks for that question, Vice Mayor Cummings. Yes, we were slated to try to get a two by two committee meeting together as soon as possible with the purpose of, if we're contemplating these SOPs, it would make sense for the county to also contemplate the SOPs and see if there are points of commonality. Um, we weren't able to get a meeting scheduled and we did not think that we had urgency to bring this forward. However, upon later review and discussion with the city attorney, we said, no, it is prudent to come forward. So it was, we didn't think we needed to after all, and we did, and so it came about rather quickly toward the end of the week. However, we did share that material with the rest of the two by two members this week, and I did not receive any comments back. Okay, okay. Council Member Crone and then Council Member Glover. Uh, just a question, why, why was the, two, I'm not sure why the two by two committee was canceled, um, since we're, this is, all this stuff is on our agenda right now, and I thought it would be good to have their input on directions they might uh, you know, working with the county might like to see us go to communicate that with our representatives. Yeah, absolutely. So the two by two has been meeting on roughly a bi-weekly schedule. And this was not a cancellation of a regularly scheduled meeting. This was a last minute request from us to try to get something scheduled within just a two day time frame in the spring break <laughs> week when we didn't really have good availability anyway to discuss this one this one um, subject. But regularly the, um, it has been meeting and discussing things. How many times so that ongoing, um, I think this year it's met maybe three times, maybe four times, four times actually already this year. So I think the first meeting was within the first or second week of January and it's been fairly regular um, since then. Um, so again, this was not a regular meeting that was canceled. We are trying to schedule a special meeting. We didn't believe we had a need to meet urgently. It turned out upon further review and consultation with our city attorney, it made prudent sense to go ahead and bring this forward to you. Um, but I did um, send that around. This was published, as you know, Thursday available to everyone. I did send around specifically to the two by two committee um, this week, and I did not receive any feedback. Councilmember Glover and then Vice Mayor Cummings. So I just have uh, some concerns with some of the language here, specifically on page seven of guidelines for property identification. The city will not search through piles or bags of items for valuable or personal property. So does that mean that if there's a bag that is confiscated, taken, found, whatever word you wanna use, that it'll just be disposed of without identifying what's inside the bag? No, it will be um, <clears throat> set aside, tagged, and, and uh, kept with unclaimed property for a period of at least 90 days. Great, thank you. And then the next question was um, under items that will not be taken to storage, specifically bedding, sleeping bags, pots and pans, and books are the ones that are most concerning for me. So can you talk more about that and what will happen to those items if they are seized? 
Um, generally, beddings and sleeping bags are considered biohazards because they they have um, issues with um, contamination. Um, I, you know, this this was put together in a short period of time in an effort to provide uh, a, a, a blueprint that we could follow that would be legally defensible based on um, the, the city of Oakland case and the SOP adopted by that city. So it's modeled on that that to some extent. So Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally appreciate y'all putting this together in the timeline. I'm just concerned that my colleagues are ready to, to pass. eliminate books from the from the list of items that would not be uh, kept as property, you know, I don't have any problem with that. Right, my, my, my point was more so that I'm, it's disconcerting that uh, the colleagues or members of this body are ready to move on uh, the restriction of people's <coughs> books, pots, pans, and bedding and sleeping bags. Uh, it just seems like uh, rather callous to say, what, what if someone has a really special book? What if they journal? What if they whatever? And someone comes in and takes that away and then throws it away just because they're inhabiting a camp. Uh, that is unsanctioned. So, um, is envisioned though is not is a process whereby, um, first of all, people are, are allowed to take whatever personal belongings they want with them, mm -hmm. and stuff that remains is what will be will be um, sorted and either stored for up to ninety days or discarded because um, of the reasons outlined in the in the policy. Right. So I would uh, then. I don't know. Uh, I would also just uh, point out that um, I took the motion uh, amendment to make the adoption subject to further modifications as appropriate. Right. What I intend to follow up with is to open a dialogue with right. the ACLU and, and discuss these details, possibly with an eye towards bringing back a modified version for the council's consideration as early as the next meeting. And I'm sure those are some of the items that um, that the ACLU will like to have uh, discussed as well. I was leading into it. I would love for us to remove books, pots, and pans from the list of things that won't be taken to storage and add a stipulation under bedding and sleeping bags when deemed to be a uh, biohazard. Council Member Matthews. Um, that's that's not entirely a friendly amendment. I want to first of all say that there is, uh, as I'm sure you know, a notice to vacate. So there's prior notice that items should be removed. Um, I think there is reference to unless they're uh, like if pots are dirty and moldy, you, you don't take those if they're clean. Yes. Uh, same with if books are all wet and moldy. No. I mean, there, there's some degree of judgment right. going on there. So, I'd love um, for that be reflected in language. Um, you know, this is just to get it on the table. I think we'll have uh, amendments very, very shortly. So I'd like to just proceed with this and um, um, anticipate that we're going to have some some modifications very soon. Okay, so not accepted, uh, Council Member. I would I would move it as a as an as an amendment. That was a request. I was just requesting that we add the language, but if you need to go through the formal Well, but channels. I think there's some discretion involved there. Let's talk about it. So the friendly amendment, I believe, was not accepted. Right. Now we have a motion to amend the motion by Councilmember Crone. Second. Seconded by Councilmember Glover to incorporate the changed language. Um, I just am not clear on what the uh, modified motion is. Because we haven't talked about it. Well, the, uh, my under. Well, do you want to? You have do you wanna, to say what it is. To do you want to state your motion, right. your amended motion? Uh, to take out the, the the things that Councilmember Glover was just um, referring to. Um, I'd be happy to restate it. What's that? Yeah, I'd be ahead. happy to restate it. Um, that it would be to strike books and pots and pans from the list, or add uh, when deemed a biohazard and add that to bedding and sleeping bags, pots and pans and books so that they're not just automatically uh, discarded because even though there will be a uh, notice of vacating, if people don't have anywhere to go and they wait until the last day and then the police come and kick them out and then take all their things, which we've seen happen in other cities during uh, camp enclosures, they're going to lose their stuff and I want to make sure that doesn't happen. Mr. Kondati, did you want to add? Um, <clears throat> no, I just wanted to make sure that I understood what the what the substitute motion um, language was, and I think uh, Councilmember Glover made it 
made it clear. Okay. Can I ask a Kill. question of um, Vice Mayor uh, Cummings? Did you, were you suggesting that you would like this to go to the two by two committee before we voted on it or does it matter? Or is, it, is there a time uh, sensitive thing here? I think at this point, if it's gonna go to the ACLU for review that, um, that we could move forward with it at this time. And then um, when it comes back that, or if there's recommendations by the ACLU before it comes back, then we can have it go to the two by two committee as well. Do we need to incorporate the ACLU into the motion or? The <coughs> that's, that's my next motion. <laughs> <coughs> It, it okay, says, well, so before we do, let's say we have a motion on the floor by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Myers to uh, move the recommendation of 15.4 subject to further modifications as appropriate. We have an amendment on the floor made by Councilmember Crone, seconded by Councilmember Glover to add some specificity into the language around specific items. Um, we go ahead and vote on the amendment at this time is my understanding, correct? Yes. Okay, so all those in favor to accept the uh, Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Glover amendments at this time, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 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 So that passes with Brown, Cummings, uh, Crone, and Glover in support, uh, Matthews, Myers, and myself voting against. So we'll go back to the original motion, which is to move the recommendation 15.4. And um, any further discussion? I guess I want to have something there. Priorities taken to storage, items that will not be taken to storage. Um, bedding, sleeping bags, pots, pans, and books then are automatically moved up to items that will be taken to storage. Okay. I think the language that I, uh, what I understood Councilmember Glover saying is that those items, if deemed a biohazard, would not be taken to storage. So that was what I understood to be the amendment to the main motion. That's correct. If not deemed biohazard or clearly soiled. I mean, That's like rotten books and moldy pots and pans, you know? I, I would consider those to be a bio, biohazard. The problem I is not just the person handling the materials, yeah. it's that it's when it's stored with other materials, I it contaminates. Yeah, um, right. I think it goes to the original comment, if I may, around some discretion around trying to make that di distinction and to discern what feels the appropriate. And so I think that was sort of part of the original process. We can further refine this, we but will. yes, we want to have some ability for uh, s some some discernment around what and cannot. So, right. okay. I mean, I think it's, yeah, okay. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. That was to move the recommendation of 15.4, subject to further modifications at the end of the recommendation. Do you have another vote? Because I know you voted to accept the amendment, but was there a vote on the amended the motion? Mo the main motion. The main motion. Right. As amended. As amended. I know you voted to accept it, but I don't have a vote on the amended, on the amended motion. We voted yeah, to yeah, accept it. So, that it became that so what I understood the, the council did was it, uh, by a 4-3 vote, uh, voted to amend the main <coughs> motion to add the language proposed by council member Glover. Then what the council just did is unanimously approve the main motion as amended by uh, council member Glover's mo motion to amend. <laughs> Okay. Um, another item, I don't know exactly what order we ran through them initially, uh, was to immediately engage with the a ACLU and others regarding legal issues that have been raised and report back on April 23rd. Motion. Motion. Second. Okay. okay. So motion made by council member Matthews, seconded by council, vice mayor Cummings. Um, and you know what I might just say is no later than April 23rd. It may well be sooner. No later than April 23rd. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Councilmember Glover? Yeah, I'd just uh, like to make a motion. Uh, so I'd like to make a motion for the city attorney to return to the body with amendments to the city code to ensure our policies are consistent with the Martin versus Boise decision. Second. 
Okay, motion by Council Member Glover to essentially make any changes to any policy around. I was going to suggest uh, an alternative that accomplishes essentially what Council Member Glover is uh, proposing. And um, while we were on a break, I provided some language to Council Member Matthews that I think the council would might be interested in hearing before you vote on the motion. Okay, yep. if Strange. I could. it's. It's exactly where you're headed, it, but it a little is more It's exactly complete. in line yeah. with what you're proposing. You and it, it's, it's, it's what I read. Me, point of order, why doesn't the city attorney just give us that language right now instead of going to another council member? Because I wrote it out for council member Matthews and I didn't save a copy for myself. I'll find it. <laughs> I can the, paraphrase. The, council member Glover? Here. There's just an issue with that um, because in giving council member Matthews a motion, you give her control over managing amendments and any kind of of the process of that conversation. So what, what I was going to suggest is that um, that that you consider amending your motion to read along the lines of to adopt as a council policy the chief of police's administrative practice of suspending enforcement of chapter 636 of the municipal code against homeless individuals pending an amendment to that ordinance that is consistent with the Ninth Circuit's decision in Martin versus Boise. So in addition to directing that um, an amendment be brought back for further consideration, the council formally adopts the practice that's been implemented by the police department as council policy in the interim. Mm -hmm. No, I get, I totally get it. It's the process though that I'm concerned with. Understood. Yeah. Okay. So um, is that the motion you'd like to so make? So moved. Okay, so the, um, is there a second? Yes. Seconded by Council Member Crone made by Councilmember Glover. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? That two passes unanimously. Okay. And if Councilor I could Matthews. just very briefly comment, the reason we had this interaction is I went and asked the city attorney, what would be the language you would recommend to achieve this purpose? And I asked him the exact same question, so. Oh. <laughs> Yes, so we'll go no. ahead now. That we, I think I believe that we kind of covered a lot of the uh, kind of over. There's the community advisory committee. I don't know if you want to leave, leave that to the end or. Um, I think we should definitely talk about the community advisory committee. There's also. The camp. Okay, would you like to discuss that at this time? I don't know. We might as well. I mean, I think the camp closure might be a while. Okay. Do you just, just proceed with this? So, yes. Do you, is there a motion? Well, so uh, we've sort of covered, I believe that we've covered um, some of the broader concepts that we wanted to address. At this point, we're sort of looking at two different um, kind of pathways forward. One, which is including a closure date, um, and the other, which does not include a closure date, but um, includes modifications to the existing site um, in, in um, conjunction of opening the River Street campground. So, and then the, the other recommendation, which is 15.2, also includes the proposed uh, community advisory concept. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for sort of uh, clarity, I think it would be helpful to go through the different proposals and then move on to the next ones. So, it would be them returning to 15.2. Two which is to confirm a closure date using the existing alternative shelter uh, locations, 1220 River Street, lodging vouchers if necessary, but essentially um, kind of adhering to what I think was one of the recommendations uh, by our county uh, public health uh, officer, which uh, recommended that because of the significant public health risks to the individuals at the encampment, um, and the general community that it should be closed as soon as possible for those concerns uh, are very, very strong for me personally. Um, Council Member Brown and then Myers and then Vice Mayor Cummings. As with all of the other items, I'd like to take the community advisory committee separately from the closure yeah. date. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. okay. So do you, so we'll go ahead and talk about the closure date of, so you want to go into that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Council, did you, or Vice Mayor, did you wanna? I, had a, I just had a comment um, and a question because I thought that um, when 15.2 was brought forward earlier that the um, the date was removed from Council Member Matthews' proposal around changing language. So I just wanted to get some clarification it, around that because when it was introduced to the public that was removed from the motion. 
you are correct on that. And then as further discussion went on um, with staff on the availability of the um, uh, 1220 River Street facility and other alternative shelter options, um, I was satisfied to my, uh, I was, uh, I felt comfortable to my satisfaction that there, there were and would be adequate uh, shelter options um, concurrently with the closure of the uh, gateway encampment. So I feel if we set an April 30th date, we can achieve that. And I am personally interested in setting a, a date for the closure mm -hmm. of the gateway encampment concurrent with opening of the River Street facility and the full utilization of other resources. So that's where I'm going. And also that assumes, and I think this is where everyone has concern, also directing staff to develop and implement an immediate management plan for the Ross camp and any other encampment on pu public property to deal with fire safety, health and welfare issues with management plan to be delegated to fire and building professionals. So maybe two paragraphs. One, you, one has a date specific, but I think the implement, implementing an immediate management plan is a shared concern. And what I did hear from the um, fire chief is that it will take more than two days to do that. That's a bigger project, so. So why don't we um, go ahead and address the date specific uh, recommendation at this time, which I um, share, uh, you know, a commitment mm -hmm. to have um, and recognizing that the April 17th date might be up in the air in terms of um, feasibility with 1220 River Street, but um, with there near near there would be appropriate given the other utilization options, including potential lodging vouchers. Um, so if you wanna make that into a motion and then we could address the, the sort of second portion of that separately. Okay. So the first part of that motion is a um, motion to set April 30th as target date for closure of the gateway encampment concurrent with the opening of the 1220 River Street facility with other additional shelter needs to be met by other shelter options throughout the county. I'll go ahead and second that. Do we wanna have further discussion, Council Member Crum? Yeah, I have a few questions here. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Susie O'Hara is still here or Tina Scholl. Um, uh, Susie is. I'm wondering about, um, it, now we're up to April 30th, but, it, but we had said previously April 17th, but April 17th is not, not gonna work for the opening of the um, River Street camp. So as I mentioned earlier in the, in the afternoon, um, the closure of the camp being concurrent with the opening of the, of the 1220 program is really a process that we have to actually use the SOPs, which includes the noticing and all the different processes to ensure that we have an appropriate transition. <clears throat> There's staffing that's required for the shuttle drivers as well as the campground hosts and managers. And then just also the process, which I think is critically important, which is to engage with the Ross Street campers and ensure that they understand the resources that are available to them. With all of that in mind, I don't think April 17th is reasonable, but I do think that we can in the next few weeks before the end of April move forward with the closure and opening up of the camp. When you say closure of the camp, what, what, what do you mean? The closure of the gateway encampment and opening of the 1220 program. The closure of the gateway encampment means what exactly? Um, following the SOPs that you just um, adopted unanimously. I'm still uh, I'm not understanding. Are we gonna that shut the camp down for two days, clean the camp, and then have people be able to stay there for- I'll go ahead and, I'll go ahead and pause maybe. Um, Council Member Cohen, we're voting on 15.2, which was the uh, potential pathway moving forward by Council Member Matthews, Myers, and myself, which did not include maintaining any existing uh, transitional encampment on um, that loc at that location. Item 15.3 brought forward by Council Member Brown and Vice Mayor Cummings did include that. So we'll go ahead and vote on this. And if that right. doesn't move forward, then we could go ahead and vote on the second. My, my last question was, um, when is the, it's gonna open April 30th, but then the River Street, 1220 River Street will close when? So 1220 River Street, um, that site is not available. Um, in perpetuity, we do have a water um, pipeline replacement pro uh, pr 
project that is scheduled to begin in early July. And so, yeah, it, it would, would be a temporary program. Um, and it really gets to the question of um, be, this council, you know, s soon starting to um, grapple with what to do with the interim site. Um, and that is part of the joint action plan to open um, an interim navigation center for 100 beds. How, how critical, maybe Martine um, Bernal knows, how critical is that site if we needed to um, maintain it longer than July 1st or the beginning of July? Well, my understanding from the water department is that the project that's uh, slated to, to happen there is, is critically needed. It's a replacement of the main water supply line that goes underneath the river uh, that connects the water treatment plant uh, to our water supply. So. Uh, and it's been on the books for quite some time. So it's a project that's been, been scheduled that it's really, really critical to the public health and safety of the city's overall water supply. So we're gonna lay out all this infrastructure for two months, it sounds like, uh, 75,000 a month, 150,000. I'm saying that sounds like staffing as well as any infrastructure. I assume showers are gonna be there and um, bathrooms and washing stations. Yeah, that has always been a consideration that the council has made is that that 1220 program is temporary um, and will be replaced by an interim site that hopefully we can get up and going as, as quickly as we possibly can. Yeah, it, I mean, I, it's hard to support the motion um, if we can't, if we're gonna close that one and only have a two month reprieve. Um, I don't know, I think we're going down a difficult road. Councilmember Glover, um, and just clarifying on both that program and the Salvation Army program. Um, <clears throat> when is the, so the Salvation Army program on Laurel, when is that program supposed to terminate? So the current um, programs are funded through June. We are in the process of working with Salvation Army to extend both the VFW and the Laurel Street program. So um, I am scheduled for a meeting with Randy Marr and Captain Harold hopefully this week um, to talk about potential extensions. So the HEAP funding that was utilized to support both of those programs going from April 15th on through June, which is typically, um, we usually, um, and those programs um, April 15th, um, that funding is available. What we don't know is if those sites will be available moving forward. I suspect that Captain Harold and Salvation Army will be um, open to those discussions. Um, it really is about <coughs> ongoing funding options um, and then ensuring that um, we have the resources and staffing capacity to continue to move forward with those programs. And then just so the community knows, how many beds are at each site and what's the operating cost of each of those programs? I don't have all of that information, but I can say that there's 60 beds at the VFW. There's 40 to 50 beds at Laurel Street. There is a little flex there. Um, there's 35 to 40 beds at the Poly Loft. Um, there is about 70 beds uh, between the South County programs at the Watsonville Salvation Army, as well as the Pajaro Rescue Mission. Uh, I believe there's 16 beds at the AFC Rotating Shelter. So. Yeah, you know, it, I appreciate that. It adds up, it, it, I mean, and in terms of the cost, it really does vary um, program by program, but for fully staffed models, the cost for shelter, um, you know, it's, it's, they're all pretty similar, quite frankly. Thank you. Um, so my reasoning for asking those questions uh, for my colleagues was to illustrate that worst case scenario, if we aren't able to secure the Salvation Army for an extended period of time, then and just so the public knows, then that means that we're going to close both the 1220 River Street and the Salvation Army location on Laurel at in or at the end of June. So we're gonna be right back where we are right now, trying to figure out where to go. And this is why I protested my colleagues in taking the op options of parks and neighborhoods off the table. If we have two and a half months to build a relationship with the community and established transitional encampments that are proven to run at half or a quarter of the cost of these fully staffed encampments that we're talking about. I don't understand why we made that decision. We're just tying our hands. But um, I do think that that should even more so elicit the understanding that we cannot set a closure date for this camp until we have solid, consistent shelter beds available for the people. Okay. Well, we can go ahead and vote on that and then vote to the so at this time we have a motion to close the camp. Um, we could also further the discussion if, if need be, or did you have a you it's related urgent? To this, it's related to this item. To, the, to motion number two yeah. point two, okay. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask the city attorney when, um, 
the expectation around the discussions with the ACLU about closures and legalities of closing this camp down. What's what does the timeline look like with that? I mean, well, I mean, my intention would be to reach out as early as tomorrow and hopefully have a discussion in relatively short order. But I haven't had that uh, communication with the ACLU yet, so um, it really depends on uh, availability. And I would hope to expedite that and bring it any suggested changes or agreed upon uh, in principle changes back to the council for your review at the next council meeting. So it's a pretty short timeline um, if we're able to open up a, a meaningful dialogue in short order like that. So at this time, we have a motion on the floor by Councilmember Matthews to uh, confirm the April 3rd, now April 30th, so it'd be to change the date to April 30th, 2019, to close the camp with the alternative shelter needs being met to maximize the spaces that will be the oncoming at 1220 River Street Camp while fully utilizing other existing options throughout the county, including the VFW, Laurel Street Shelter, and possibly lodging vouchers. That's the motion on the floor. Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Myers. Okay, well, all the, do you have further questions? I just, I just wanna say the one reason why I'm not gonna be able to support this at this time is because I think it'll be good to hear back from the ACLU about the conditions that we would need to meet in order to set a firm date for closure. Um, because I know that there's, since, since we don't know what we'll need to provide in order to have a date for closing the camp. Um, I'm just really hesitant with trying to set a firm date without a, have, n having the knowledge of what do we need to do to actually make sure that we can close it. So I just wanted okay. to make that point. Yeah. So this is all very fluid. Okay. Just so Councilmember Myers, we'll you, go ahead. Councilmember Brown. Okay. Um, and then go ahead, Steve. I'm just going to follow up on um, Vice Mayor Cummings' point. Um, particularly given that we've now been asked for March 15th, April 17th, April 30th, there is no reason to continue to leave people in limbo um, and create new firm closure dates when we Thank anticipate you. that we may not be able to meet them. So that's another re reason that I can't support this motion. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Matthews. I think that's, uh, I guess my comment is that, you know, we've been, we've been trying to, to, um, to find a closure date that works for the folks in the camp and also for providing uh, uh, alternative beds within the community. And unfortunately, uh, we just keep kicking the can down the road. And um, we know that the conditions in the camp are not, uh, not appropriate. Uh, we know that there's um, all kinds of different issues in the camp right now. And so now here we are again this is our fourth attempt to try to close the camp. And the reason we need to close the camp is because um, there's significant safe, public safety issues in the camp. Um, we also know that there are effects to local neighborhoods. We know there's effect to businesses. Um, it, this camp is not, not costing the city of Santa Cruz any money, frankly. It's actually costing us a lot of money. It costs us money in police and fire services. It costs us money in infinite amount of staff time that has gone into evaluating every time we meet, every two weeks, trying to figure out how are we gonna do this. So this idea that somehow this isn't costing anything for us to continue to try to bring closure to an area that has been deemed by our public health official from the county as a public health and safety um, hazard, um, it's it's it, it. This is not this is not a free ride, and I just want to say that. And here we are again, going to kick the can again. So, okay, Councilmember Matthews, um, Vice Mayor Cummings. I also just wanted to say the language in my motion was to set April 30th as the target date. We know we're going to be talking with the ACLU. We know there's ambiguity in the Martin ruling. And so I think if we say a target date, that gives us something really to aim for, knowing that we will um, have some very serious discussions between now and then. Can we have the, we'll go ahead and have you please keep your voices down and then if no. you can, please. Okay, um, Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, I think that by not setting a date, this isn't saying that we're not, because the follow-up motion is to um, develop and implement an interim site management plan for the gateway encampment. And I think that the point of that is to try to get at some of these public health and safety issues. Um, I understand that 
that there are issues at the camp that need to be dealt with. And I understand that we need to work with the fire department to like work on spacing and all these other um, concerns around public health with the site. Uh, my concern is that without knowing that you know, what, what we need to do in order to close that site, whether we need to find additional spaces, whether we um, need to provide some alternative in addition to 1220 is my concern, which is why um, I don't wanna take, you know, ha implement a specific date. I'm not implying that we should not go out there and try to mitigate some of the public health risks. So I just want that to be clear. And we, we, can, have that, we can have that conversation after. Um, okay, so um, I think, did you have an additional comment? Yeah, yeah. Um, there was something that, that um, Councilmember Myers said about we've worked with the people in the camp on the closure date, a date that works for the people in the camp. I wanted to uh, call on Ms. Kuehl if that ever took place. Could you, could you answer that? Uh, no. Wait, we'll go ahead and pause for a second. We've had an opportunity to hear from the community. We have our staff here who could potentially ask and answer any additional questions if you'd like. Um, at this point, you know, we can have a further discussion around best policy next steps. We um, are significantly behind in our agenda at this point. And so I, it, you know, if that furthers the conversation around how to move forward at the policy level, I think that would be, and you have an answer that was, so. Uh, how about a question for the staff then? Did they, have you worked with, have you worked with um, the folks on a closure date and that, did they, did, with the camp council and they said, yeah, that's a closure date? So we have not worked with the camp council on the idea of a specific closure date because I don't think we've had substantial direction at this point to have clarity about that and I don't think that's appropriate. But we have worked with them on numerous occasions around um, developing an interim plan to effectively manage the camp knowing that it's a temporary encampment and I think there's general consensus amongst the camp council from my interactions with them that um, it's important to ensure that the camp is effectively run, that safety and health concerns are addressed and um, they do have the interest and will to help with that, but I don't know if they necessarily have the ability to do that all on their own. And so we really have had a, a lot of conversations about how best to work together. Um, there is interest on behalf of the camp council and I, I don't wanna speak completely out of turn, so um, this is just my interpretation. Um, I think that um, interest and will does not necessarily match up very effectively with the ability to do the work that needs to be done and the, so there needs to be a more coordinated effort between the city um, staff and the camp council and the greater camp community to um, put this management plan together. I do wanna, I know you're gonna get to the conversation about the management plan. I do wanna remark about um, should you move forward with a management plan, we are going to have to move everybody out of that camp to clean it up. Susie, can and we go ahead and restructure let's go, let's around Let's pause for that yeah. okay. conversation. Because right now we have a motion to close the, 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 the camp um, by a specific date utilizing existing spaces. And I think I'll just, uh, by having a target date of April 30th. And I will just, um, you know, I don't think there's any easy solution. I don't think it's clear. Clearly it's not, there's a lot of ambiguity in terms of the interpretation of the law or the challenges that associate the complex social issues that surround the encampment, the those residing there, the surrounding neighborhoods and businesses, the health and public safety issues, 100% completely complicated. And we have uh, to weigh that in terms of the health and human safety issues, the public health risks that have been um, illustrated by our county public health department saying that the camp really poses a significant public health challenges. And that to me is a huge concern and that's why I support the motion moving forward. So at this time we'll go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. So that fails with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crone, and Glover voting against. <laughs> and then that um, with Councilmember Myers, Councilmember Matthews, and myself voting in support. Okay, so we'll, um, at this time, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, I wanna. Um, restate a motion that I mentioned a while ago and just because 
um, to, the, to, the, to date, we still don't have much demographic information on who is at the camp. And so I just wanted to, um, I prepared a, and wanted to restate a motion just so it's on the record. Um, but to gain a better understanding about our homeless population, I would like to motion that the city manager is hereby directed to ensure that the city is collecting demographic information necessary for the process of developing a sustainable and outcome-based homeless policy included but not limited to such information as may relate to the work history, residence and life history, family eligibility for government or private support and employment disabilities, special needs and other relevant data related to the individuals to be served in shelters, facilities and when an individual is to receive report or support. Said information shall be confidential as to the subject individual to whom it relates, but shall be made aggregated and made available to the city council, city staff, and the public at large in a report format that does not identify the individuals to whom it relates to better inform our population about the demographics of our homeless population so that we can provide adequate resources to aid our homeless population as it changes through time. Second. Okay. okay. Um, I, motion by council, Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Council Member Crone. Um, Question by Council Member Myers. I just have a question, uh, how that differs than the homeless management information system that's already in place and being operated by the shelters? Are you, is that, I guess I'm wanting clarification. Are you desiring to collect this data from the Ross encampment uh, residents or mm -hmm. is this, Correct, because that type of information is already being collected countywide in our various shelters and service areas, I believe. I would say that this is to be collected, for example, um, in the events like our current event right now where we're trying to get a better understanding of who our homeless population is at the camp, what are their needs, and this is information that um, was told to us that was gonna be coming back and um, you know, maybe these, these, these surveys apparently were given out to um, the camp council and they weren't brought back. And I think that it needs to be clear that we need to be gathering data on the populations that we're serving, not only the ones who are using our indoor shelters, but the ones who are also residing outside. So even if we are, if, if um, the policy will be to, um, to disrupt encampments throughout town, if it's that we're gonna manage the current encampments that we have, and we're gonna bring new encampments online. I think that this information is important so that we know who we're serving and the demographics of the people um, who are in these camps and in other services. Thank you yeah. for the we'll clarification. Go ahead and we had a chance to hear from the community, so now is our chance for action and deliberation. So if you could please keep your comments down, and now is the chance for us to do uh, some policy direction. Councilmember Myers a, and then Councilmember Glover. I just Glover. have one follow-up. I don't know, Susie, could you shed any light on this? I do know that we have pretty much daily uh, uh, presence by police, fire. I know mental health is there, behavioral health, um, uh, medical folks who come and do wound treatment. Is there, of, of all those touches that happen at the camp with the residents there, are we collecting any of that data just as, as those kinds of uh, interactions are happening. I'm just curious if you happen to know that. So both the city and the county are out there um, doing outreach for different purposes. The county is going and doing outreach, HPHP staff, as well as HSD staff doing benefit eligibility. Um, they collect information that cannot be shared with the city. Um, they certainly can share that information and we do have the ability with the web EOC to understand demographics, um, but that information um, has not been compiled at this point. The city, um, through our outreach effort, really does need to come at a different angle in terms of understanding barriers, <coughs> doing a census and understanding barriers to entry into shelter and really under trying to get to um, an understanding as to the specific needs of the camp population. Um, that was the intentionality of the survey. Um, there are other ways to get at it, but I wanna suggest that the council <laughs> is in a bit of a catch 22, because for us to effectively go through the process of implementing the SOPs, we need an accurate census. And to get to an accurate census, we need a plan to do that. And the plan to do that is going to be a very difficult process, whether we work with the camp council or not. The camp council, I would suggest, is not connected intimately with every single person in that camp. Um, and I think that we need to really think about um, 
kind of the process for which we implement the SOPs and giving city and county the resources to do that. So while I agree, I think it's important what Vice Mayor um, Cummings is suggesting, and I actually think it's necessary for the closure, I do think that we, we need to be given resources to do that, and that really does need to be part of this discussion about the, the closure. Um, the, the impetus to get information and actually understand how many beds we need available really does need to be part of a plan to actually close the camp. Okay. So that's that's the situation that you're okay. in. One more okay, follow -up. and we have Just that. one, one follow -up. quick follow-up, sorry. Um, could we, is there a way to put in place with the intent of, of um, Council Member Cummings, something that we can, sorry, Vice Mayor Cummings um, request, is there any way that we can bring HSC, I mean, is there any way to operationalize this information being collected at the camp? I would recommend to do a, and this is me speaking somewhat out of turn, <laughs> I would recommend working with ASR to do a mini pit count out there. Um, that's a neutral party. Do it very similar to what we do on the biannual uh, bi annual pit count. Um, the same practices and procedures. Um, th the county and the city, ha there is different perspectives about why we're there doing the work that we're doing. I think it would be important to, get to hire a third party to come in and, and do a pit count to really understand what the vice mayor is getting to. And the further clar for, for, for clarification for the community, the pit count means point in time count yes. by ASR. Okay. I would request would the vice mayor consider that as an amendment to your motion so that we can move forward? Substitute. Or substitute. Amendment. What's the language? To, oh, so to basically get direction to, to, to put together a, a mini point in time census process. Right, to direct staff to potentially yeah. contract with an outside neutral party to conduct a, a <laughs> site specific point in time count that would also um, get to the questions that you have in your motion in terms of um, some of the more specific demographic data. Ask a question related to that. Please, and then we have a, we have a comment or question. By um, I know that there's a lot of people in the community who have mentioned that they would be willing to volunteer their time to do that. And I also know that with the point in time counts, we actually have asked people in the community to come out and volunteer their time to do those counts. So I'm wondering, instead of spending money on trying to get pe people to go to the, to the camp to count people, whether or not we could send out um, and ask the community for volunteers to come and do a point in time count. I think there's, I mean, my interpretation would be you could do either one. One would have sort of statistical relevance and significance based on being a third party evaluator and assessor based on, uh, as opposed to uh, volunteers essentially. My, so I have a, a little bit of confusion then around that. Is the idea that the people who would go and do the point in time count, would they be also, would, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll take a step back. Would the contracted group also be doing the data analysis associated with the surveys that would be administered, or would they just be administering the surveys and then the city would be doing the data analysis? Because I think I there's think, a difference there. Yeah, I think it's fully up to the council in terms of what level of con consulting you would want. What I'm suggesting is um, there, there are many different ways of going about getting this information. We want the information to be accurate and we want it, I, I believe it would be important to come from a new, neutral party that is not preconceived to have a set of expectations as to the outcome. Okay, Councilman McLaughlin. Thank you. And then uh, Councilman just a quick question on that surveying process. Uh, you said before that uh, there had been surveys distributed but none of them returned. So I'm just, maybe you could clarify for me the difference between having volunteers going into a camp and collecting data and just distributing surveys and expecting them to come back in. So we had worked with the camp council to disseminate the surveys and had planned on meeting back with them, I don't know, a week to 10 days later to get those surveys back. And there was a commitment on behalf of the camp council to disseminate the surveys tent by tent get the information and bring it back to the city. Um, when we met on the subsequent meeting, um, no survey surveys were, were, were returned. Okay, thank you. Um, just a question since there, uh, for, uh, thank you. Um, a question, and so I noticed that you were, uh, Mayor, going to stop Councilmember Crone from asking a question of a community member, but there's someone here that is 
directly involved with the camp council and may be able to answer the question as to what their perspective of the most effective way of data collection is. I you can make a comment and then I can make a response if you like. No, what? I, I, you generally what the process, how the process unfolds is that we have an opportunity for the community to speak and they can speak from varying perspectives and with different um, expertise lenses. And once we hear from them, then we have an opportunity for us to have further clarification, but they've had their chance to speak. If you want to have that as a subsequent action that is further pursued at a different time, I think that would be appropriate personally. Um, but. Can just clear just to clarify. So then, so City Attorney Kandati, I cannot ask for someone who has direct experience and connection with the group that we're discussing to clarify a question about what would be effective uh, surveying strategies because we're talking about surveying strategies and how to implement them. But is it, so I can't do that, or is that just? It's general practice. Is my interpretation. It's general practice, but the council could, by motion, direct that further additional comment be received from a member of the public. Okay, and I'll just remind uh, the council that we are now um, f about five hours into this item. Um, we have an evening item on strategic planning, which was expressed um, with high interest as to uh, interest and want and desire to do that. Um, that has not occurred at this point. Um, there has not been a dinner break either. So if, um, you know, I, I would just, I mean, I'll allow uh, Councilmember Myers, I know that you had a comment you'd like to add. Um, I would then maybe suggest that we take a break potentially and then reconvene after that in about 10 minutes or well, so. If I can't ask the question, then I have a, uh, something that I will replace that question with. Do you want to make a motion that you can ask? No, 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 I'm going to make a, a statement. Um, so what was mentioned earlier was that there was a certain level of distrust between the residents of the camp and the city entities, especially the police, especially the fire department, but also the liaisons that have uh, come from the city to go into the camp. So there is a disconnect or a concern there because if there's a level of distrust between the people that are in the camp and the city and the city is sending representatives in to collect data from the people in the community, then there's going to be a conflict there and the trust of wanting to give accurate information to city representatives. So that's the reason why I was hoping to ask Ms. Cool about what the ca camp council uh, believes or from her perspective, what the best uh, and most effective way to not only build the trust of the people in the community, but also to collect the most quality and valid data because we want to get good data since I support uh, council or Vice Mayor Cummings motion for data collection, but. Let's just make that statement. Uh, point, point of, no, point of order. Myers had a um, on Kidding. page 20 of our uh, uh, council member's handbook, it states in paragraph two, each council member may recognize a member or members of the public for additional time or move additional time for public discussion. Yeah. Okay, you want to make a motion to move that? Uh, make a mo <laughs> I was, um, yeah, I, I'd make a motion that uh, council member Glover could recognize um, member of the audience who has expertise, uh, Ms. Kuehl. Okay, it's motion by Second. Councilman. Okay, um, Ms. Uh, Councilmember Myers. I just wanted a clarification whether or not the amendment would be accepted. Um, and I just have a comment about using applied survey research, which is a professional uh, data collection service uh, that is doing point in time counts throughout the nation actually. and. Um, I think, especially with the current lit litigation um, situation, as well as sort of the policy that we're trying to develop overall in terms of meeting our objectives for housing homeless individuals in our community, uh, this is an important data point. And uh, I think it needs to be consistent with the way that we've collected our data over the past 10 years, 12 years. I think it's been going on for quite some time as far as I understand. So that's, that's the reason I'm just interested in making sure that this data point is consistent with the other types of data collection uh, approaches that we've used over, I think, probably closer to 20 years now in these point in time. More. more. <laughs> so that's just for by clarification. And then just if I could get a, get a uh, whether the amendment was accepted or not, and then I'll be quiet. Could you, can you just clarify the language used? Sorry. So I would um, offer to amend your motion by, um, basically uh, identifying a, I believe Susie sort of referred to it as a min mini uh, point in time count, utilizing uh, applied survey research as the consultant, 
with data processing to be determined uh, by, uh, by city staff. Uh, so that would be my, my amendment, thank you. Okay, so that was an uh, amendment to the main motion by um, Council Member, I mean, Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, on is, it, is it okay if we vote on that separately? Yeah, we can go ahead and vote on that. Uh, we I, have I, a I don't know if I want to accept that as a, as a, friendly, as a friendly amendment. Um, the motion as was a second. By, as a seconder. Okay, so it was not accepted by the seconder of the motion. Mm. Okay, so that. Um, I mean, I'm happy to vote on it separately, but as part of the main motion, I, I prefer not. Okay, so we'll go ahead and. Because um, I want an opportunity for like, there's a, a, a lot of classes up on campus that can collect information. Steve McKay's trained his people to collect information, and um, they're familiar with the campus well. So I'll, I'll make I'll I'll make that as a substitute motion. Um, uh, can I do that right now, Tony, or is that, yeah, because the amendment was rejected, correct? Yeah. So I will make that as a separate, as a substitute motion to the main motion. Okay. You, you don't have to, I, I think you just make it a, an amendment to the main motion and we vote the, that up or down. It was rejected as a reject. You wouldn't, you weren't, so you weren't going to second it. As a friendly. As yeah, a friendly, so we just vote on the amendment so itself. Friendly. Okay. Just motion to amend will, the main motion. I will yeah. move to main, to Amend the main motion. I will second that. M Mayor Watkins, I'm sorry. Um, I would recommend, because we have not gauged the capacity of ASR to mm -hmm. be able to do this Put on quick party. order, uh -huh. I, I think we should say any ASR or um, another, you know, s statistical data, collection qualified data qual evaluator. Yes, um, to leave it a little bit open, um, just because we know we need to have this happen quick. And I, I, you know, this was on the fly, and I'm not sure their their availability at this time. Okay, so the amendment is then to include changed language around uh, specifically calling out a, a specific a organization, but to make it firm. Okay, a qualified qualified survey, survey and research firm. Okay, Mayor, Mayor, I would I would take third if if what. She said third party, I would take that as a friendly amendment. Because that, that leaves it open for various. We'll go ahead and pause for just a second. Uh, city Clerk, uh, go Bush. ahead, Bonnie. I had a hard time hearing the amendment because you guys were both talking at the same yes. time. So can <laughs> Sorry. I get, oh, either one, if I can just get you to repeat the change that Susie just said. Okay, so it sounds to me that the change that Susie just said um, was specifically around calling out a uh, business that could potentially do the independent assessment and evaluation um, data collection to now be uh, stated as a third party uh, professional consulting business that could do that evaluation or data assessment. That was, no, was that accurate? If that's the amendment, then I'm not that's sure. I, I, if it were qualified, um, third party. Third party. Third party. Third party. I'm All fine with that, but it, I don't think it has to be a professional consultant. Third business party. Business license. Because okay. the university could be doing it and right. somebody else. Okay, so do you want to clarify what mm -hmm. you and in your intention as the maker? I, again, am worried about data consistency, survey, and research methods, which is typical with regards to how um, data is collected over the long term. So um, I'm fine with saying a third party, qualified third party. Uh, and uh, I, do, I do have some reservations about having volunteers go out and collect this important data. We are being asked to um, try to assess and document uh, these, uh, you know, part of a population of homeless individuals in our community, and we need to have consistency. We're now on the hook uh, as a city, apparently, according to recent uh, court decisions, that uh, we will gonna be needing to provide housing. And so I'd like to make sure that our data collection is consistent and that I'm okay with a third qualified third party. Um, I'm not uh, okay with having volunteers do this. So as long as we... I, okay, I, qualified I, third party. I think qualified third party is, is appropriate language. Uh, okay, so we'll go ahead and... Um, uh, res One second. I'm gonna go ahead and restate where we're at. We have yeah. a motion by, Council Mem by Vice Mayor Cummings, a seconded by Council Member Crone to have a data collection process ensue with now a... Uh, amendment being proposed to incorporate that be done and by a qualified third party um, uh, and exploring if ASR is available. Um, does that reflect where we are at this moment? 
And that was not originally accepted as a friendly amendment, but would you, it was indicated by Council Marcos that that would be accepted as a friendly amendment. Without that last part, if ASR is uh, available. Okay. Just I a qualified third party. Qual qualified third party, okay. Does that, feel, yes, okay. Fine. Do we wanna go ahead and vote on that at this time? Yes. Councilmember Glover, do you have any additional comments? Just a quick statement, um, just with the concern of volunteers doing the work, I do just wanna make it clear that ASR does use volunteers to collect the data. Okay, quick. Correct. Okay, thank out. you. Okay, I, know, so I understand all, that. Okay, great. Thank you for that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. There was a motion to engage in conversation with a uh, uh, representative from the camp council. Um, I'm assuming that since there was existing action taken that we will be working with a qualified third party that they could get out the best uh, techniques and uh, approaches to gauging and, and, and acquiring that data. Does that satisfy what you were hoping to gather from that person? Well, I was hoping to hear from Ms. Cool with regards to the, the strategy of data collection before we passed the motion and went through the data collection. But so it's, since it's a moot point now, there's no need and we can talk about it offline and some other time. But it just seems strange that the reason I made the motion was to hear from the community before we made the decision and that kind of got lost in the- Okay, so you're gonna withdraw your motion board. at this point? I will, I will withdraw my motion. Yes. Okay, motion uh, to do that, uh, to engage with the individual of the public at this time has been withdrawn by Councilmember Crone and uh, the seconder was Councilmember Glover. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, have a 10 minute break at this point. We'll reconvene at uh, 9.35 to further the discussion. Right. In action, we essentially covered um, Good portion of the various proposals. I believe that we were going to return to the um, potential of a conversation around a community process um, and then to move forward with a additional proposal if I recall the proposed timeline. Is that correct? Vice Mayor Cumming? There's some language that was in the composition that I wanted to see if we could address. Um, for the, with regards to the expert council. And I believe that uh, Councilmember Myers was interested in sharing a uh, updated document regarding the composition and, and a specific proposal. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Are we on that now? We're not running, we're not doing 15, 15.3? Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna go finish 15.3. We're gonna go ahead and Got wrap up 15.2 and then we'll move forward with 15.3. I'll just pass this out. That way. <coughs> that way. Are you? Me too. Is this the one you're using? Oh, I think you want up. Uh, yeah. Can you guys put it on the screen? If you yeah. 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 Okay. I will go ahead and hand it over to, here we go. Uh, Councilmember Myers. So, um, we received quite a number of um, communications around it, so um, we've, uh, the three of us have talked a little bit, and uh, we have a slightly revised version of this, um, starting with the name, which would be Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness. Um, it would be an ad hoc advisory body of community members and staff of 10 members representing diverse local stakeholder relevant subject matter, matter representatives across sectors. And these are listed here, homeless advocate, homelessness advocate, healthcare with special focus on the local system of homelessness care and solutions, education, employment and job creation, local business, neighborhood representative, community member with lived homelessness experience, behavioral health and or addiction and treatment local system of care, policy and governmental expertise on homelessness, youth homelessness, others as identified by nomination and selection process. Uh, we would, uh, these members would be nominated by individual council members and selected by the mayor. And it would focus on three stages. Uh, and this is really reflective of a lot of the communication that we've received from our community, which is, um, people are struggling with what, what our objective is at this point in time how we are where we are today, and what the future looks like, not only for the next six months to a year, but actually over the next several years. Uh, and the intent of this committee 
would to be to uh, accomplish um, those things through this this uh, uh, series of, of work. Uh, stage one being education, community engagement, with uh, increasing the community-wide understanding of homelessness-related issues and alternative solutions, and develop a collaborative approach to immediate challenges, give community members a seat at the table and ownership of solutions. So we would do this through five community meetings citywide. They would be educationally interactive uh, from staff and experts about basics of homelessness, current challenges and constraints, legal frameworks, services and resources, concerns, expectations, and alternative solutions for community consideration and feedback. Stage two would be looking at synthesizing that feedback and exploring short-term options for addressing unsheltered homelessness. Um, this would include a presentation to council with community feedback on criteria for site and program selection for intermediate shelter, which um, we are obviously struggling with um, pretty much every other week, among other alternative solutions to maximize effectiveness, um, sector coordination and community co collaboration. So this would be done through a community meeting that conveys feedback from the five prior sessions and focuses on immediate solutions testing for summer, fall 2019. And the meeting would be highly interactive with the goal of evaluating and prioritizing solutions, notably siting and, and alternative countywide strategies. Finally, the stage three would be policy work with um, reflecting on the prior education and engagement, taking up key policy issues affecting the city and serve as a community-based platform for exploration and development of needed future policy. And we've uh, listed um, what, we, what we would anticipate as upcoming citywide policy changes, which would include transitional encampment and facilities project charters, unsanctioned encampment management policies and processes, citywide ordinances changes, shelter feasibility study, countywide systems integration and homelessness governance, an update of the homelessness coordinating <coughs> committee recommendations, which have been mentioned, um, which were done in 2017, develop recommendations for homelessness priorities for, for the city via the upcoming strategic planning process, and finally developing coordinating plans with partners across sectors, including the county, H, H, uh, homeless um, action, partner. action partnership, the nonprofits uh, that work in this sector, faith, business, and neighborhood organizations. So the overall intent is to broaden the number of voices at the table uh, with this community advisory committee on homelessness and to uh, provide a predictable and managed uh, method for us to um, engage with our community and work through these uh, important stages. Uh, the committee would um, be convened by May and would uh, have recommendations coming back to council uh, uh, after February 2020. So that's our proposal. Are you making that a motion? Yes, that's a motion, <laughs> a very long motion. I'll go ahead and second it. Okay, so motion by Councilmember Meyer, seconded by <laughs> Councilmember Matthews. Uh, Vice Mayor, can you? Did I hear correctly that this is to come? So when are the, the various report back periods? So the t is this timeline, is this when the report backs are supposed to be between August and February of 2020? Yeah, so the first, uh, the timeline for the education community engagement would be during May 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, we would then do stage two, which is synthesizing that feedback and exploring short-term options for addressing unsheltered homelessness. That would be um, done in a June meeting, and then finally working August through February on the on the on the last <laughs> stage three policy work. Does that help? I have a couple um, friendly amendments to this. Um, when it comes to the um, stakeholders, uh, I was just curious around education because I think it would be important that rather than education, we have mental health and behavioral health, and then specifically specifically someone who works in mental health and behavioral health, and then specifically a person who works in addiction and treatment. Um, I, I wasn't really, it's not really clear why we, like someone in education would have the expertise to deal with homelessness, unless you can further clarify what that would be. So we do have on the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Eighth uh, dash down, we have be behavioral health and or addiction 
and treatment local system of care. I'm happy to add mental health. Homeless we'll go ahead. We'll go ahead, and this is um, we, we've had a chance to hear from the community at this point. Okay, the, I'm going to uh, go ahead and ask whoever's speaking to please not speak, or I'm going to. Okay, you have been warned. Please do not speak out. We've had an opportunity to hear from the community. I would have to ask you to leave if you were continue to do that. We're at a point of of, of council deliberation and action at this time. So the, please proceed. The intent with the education person. Um, was actually to bring that perspective in terms of uh, uh, really the needs of the of the community in terms of getting access and understanding how to get access into, uh, for example, Cabrillo, bringing those bringing that expertise, people who are helping people ladder into those kinds of opportunities. So it's not necessarily to, as an education person around homelessness, but more bringing the perspective similar to employment and job creation. So that um, in talking with different service providers around town, uh, you know, one of the things is is whether someone's ready for employment or job creation. Uh, the other is how do I get back into getting myself back into my education? So what are the kinds of things? What how do I access GED information? So someone that brings that perspective that's servicing that specific population, so that we have some some kind of um, feedback on that. So like educational support, I guess, might be a. Kind of what you're. Yeah, I mean, uh, as far as I understand it, it, it would be part of that continuum of care, wraparound services. Um, it's it's a specific thing that um, some of the service providers in town um, specifically try to bring to the table when they're working with clients. So it would be that kind of that kind of situation. Council Member Glover and then Council Member Brown. And then Thank you. Um, I just want to point something out. So. It's, we hear consistently from people in the community, especially those that are currently experiencing homelessness or that are advocates for people that are currently experiencing homelessness, that a lot of times when these expert panels are formed, they're made up of people who are experts potentially uh, with degrees, but no real in like experience. And I appreciate that there was a line here for community, a, a single, community member with lived homelessness experience, but I fear that that single representative from the community of people currently, and that means, is this currently experiencing homelessness or is it with lived ex homeless experience where they've lived homeless 15 years ago in some other city and now are providing their context and their framework for what they think this should be with regards to the body. So I'd love to see more, and we can talk about this, uh, so I don't, not unless I have to make it an official motion, but the incorporation of more voices of people that have are currently experiencing homelessness like for example I realize there's no here there's no students for example who are currently experiencing homelessness and we've heard students come to the city council to talk about their experience of having to sleep in their cars because they're being criminalized by the university so where is that representation in this uh, expert panel? I would question. suggest, if I could, the youth homelessness component really actually could be a partnership with a group that convenes on a regular basis to address youth homelessness in our county that uh, draws on an advisory group, um, I believe called the TABE, and I'm, I'm blanking on what that stands for, um, transition age, um, Anyhow, it's uh, all directed around youth homelessness. So I think in terms of expert re uh, representation, it would make a lot of sense to have them be part of that conversation for advocacy and non-duplication of resources, essentially. Yeah, I would add that youth as a category, as a recognized actual category of home homeless uh, population here in our community is quite large, and so that is defined from the age of 14 to 24, and that absolutely we need to have representation um, from from that from that uh, population. Yeah. So I mean, I'm just saying because youth homelessness is very broad and vague. So you could go to if we pass this with this existing language, then you could go to anything that has to do with youth homelessness and say, okay, we have the experts. But if there's a specific group that you are thinking about then I think it would be responsible to put that into this language. And it sounds like you're already thinking of the group that you're thinking about bringing in without any conversation. And then uh, the other issue I have is that the potential members will be nominated by individual council members but selected by the mayor. I opened up uh, our meeting talking about the ideological divide that exists on this body, and I don't feel comfortable having the mayor select my representative on an expert panel regarding homelessness. Just a couple of comments. Um, first, 
I really appreciate the thought that's gone into um, trying to bring us a proposal that we can wrap our minds around, work from. It's really helpful. Um, with respect to the education line, um, I, I think I understand your, what you're getting at. Could we call it education and job training to make it clear that that's what we're talking about? So when we're, so we could roll it, we yeah. could even roll it into education, employment, and job creation or job training. That'd uh, be fine. What, either if yeah. you want to have to. So I just just to make it clear that that's what it is, it's and not the idea like an education that, and outreach about homelessness. Right. right. It's just that idea of continuing care and wraparound. Got it. Um, with respect to the overall makeup, I, um, you know, I don't want to start trying to like negate some in favor of others, but I do think that there ought to be at least two representatives um, that are addressing kind of the, this kind of broad behavioral health um, questions, mental health addiction. Um, this is a huge, as we know, we talk about as a huge issue related to this encampment, the homeless population. I'd like to see at least two seats for mental health behavioral health and addiction, however that is parsed out. Um, I think that's important. Councilman Matthews. Yeah, I don't disagree. Um, <clears throat> there is that final one, others as identified. And that to me is, <clears throat> there should be a category if um, either a community wants to self-nominate or we think of someone, you know, they're not any of these, but they would be really valuable. <laughs> I think it's good to have an extra. Right. Oh, and as I read this, any of us could nominate any number of people in all categories. Um, and we recently went through this process with the, um, who should be contacted as key informants for the rent, rental services. And we all gave names with some description of why they'd be useful. And then it was <clears throat> at the discretion of our consultant in that case, but I think the mayor would do a really serious job to get a, uh, a representative uh, working group that that drew on all these nominations. So rather than each one nominating a certain person. So I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that approach. <clears throat> well, I, that, I wasn't finished with my comments. Um, so I, I just want to include, so that was, I had a comment related to makeup, but I also have kind of a question comment related to nominations process. The previous, uh, the agenda report that we received talked about an application process with the mayor um, then making a recommendation to the council. And so what I'm seeing now, and might understand that's a different, you're proposing a different process. Yeah, we've updated the process. Yeah. As opposed to applications. Exactly. Potential members nominated now by individual council members selected by the mayor. That's our current proposal. Correct? Mm -hmm. yep. okay. Councilmember Glover and then Vice Mayor Cumming. Thanks. Uh, so I didn't really get a clarification on the youth homelessness. I heard that there is some group that we don't know the name of that could potentially represent the voice of homeless youth. I'll give you clarification on that. That's the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program. It's a HUD-funded grant uh, effort underway countywide, really coordinating and organizing around all things youth homelessness um, in the county, primarily ages uh, 14 to 24. And so they would be the experts to draw on when trying to get a broad understanding of what um, and how to best support their efforts within our city, essentially. But, but that doesn't answer my concern of it not being representation of homeless youth. Homeless youth are an integral part of the makeup of the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Project. There is a critical component that allows for the youth voices to be made in that work. Do you have any tabs? I do. Yeah. She's talking about the Youth Action Board. It's the Youth Action Board. Mm -hmm. yeah. Agreed. So they would be consulted in terms of. Uh, we'll go ahead and well, that's. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and. We're the uh, the other thing is uh, the process that we're going through right now with the just cause evictions and renters protection task force is with a independent nonpartisan third party that is not associated with this body at all in any kind of decision making or power structure. Plus, has no beholden ties to any political interests in our community because he lives in Sacramento and runs an independent organization. So I find it really, really hard to believe and really, really kind of strange for you to be able to say that someone would be able to make, especially someone that is obviously ideologically different than people on this body, to make an unbiased and equal decision on who should sit on an executive body or a, an expert panel. I, I, 
I do not agree with your uh, assertion, Councilmember Matthews. And I'll just add that um, this is typical process that's generally performed when considering these types of things um, under normal circumstances, I'd say. So perhaps these feel like not normal circumstances, but generally the mayor has had input from council and has had the discretion to appoint um, various subcommittees and bodies that could be potentially ratified by the council, but it definitely include um, council approval. And I mean, and I'd look to our city manager, our, our assistant city manager to talk about that in terms of past practice. Please, in terms of past practice with the mayor having the discretion to appoint these types of subcommittees or ad hocs, this isn't something that just, I think it's just created, I guess the point is to be made that this isn't something I mean, that's this, just unique to this being created at right. this moment. There's been various examples. I mean, obviously it's, uh, it's up to the city council, but there are, that is a practice that we've had where uh, nominations have been given to the mayor. There are a variety of task forces over the years where that's occurred and then uh, the, mayor makes a uh, the mayor makes a selection. Okay. Um, okay. I think a great example of my concern was your decision making, specifically, M Madam Mayor, on the committee structures and the, the lack of equity in that decision making process and the fight that it took to make sure that there was equitable representation on the different committees that required the body to force those changes. So even though we gave you the opportunity to make those decisions and changes on your own, we had to take it within our, in our own hands. So uh, you'll have to excuse me if I find it hard to believe that you will have that ability to make those changes. That's just where I'm coming from. That's totally fine. Okay, Councilor McCann. Yeah, um, I, I also am gonna have a hard time um, supporting this uh, if this goes forward as far as the selection process. Um, I wanna take us back to, I was on the council for four years previously and um, it, the, the decisions were never, the mayor, the mayor never made these decisions. Um, I was on the council for four years. We, in fact, maybe Donna remembers the river committee. Um, and there was also the master transportation committee. There was the zero waste task force. And these decisions were always made. Every council member selected someone. And I'm just gonna go back to um, the last council and I'm uh, making the, the case, and then you can either, you know, one scenario would be to bring all 10 members and have us vote on it like we've been voting on commissions, or each council member gets a selection, which I find fairer, and it's definitely fairer for a minority view on the, of the council or you know, minority members. Um, council Member Brown and I didn't have that uh, for the first two years. We didn't get anyone <laughs> on any commission. Uh, so, I mean, I would be willing to support one council member, one vote, and one nominee. Um, as, of course, if the full council thought that was an absurd nomination and that person doesn't belong on the committee task force, um, they could, you know, bring that and, and vote the person off. But I think we should have some trust and confidence that council members uh, should be represented on this committee. And I, I think there's a history of it. I don't know how you've been doing in the last 10 years, but previously uh, it was one council member, one vote. I, I can give some perspective about the Public Safety Task Force, because I think it's actually a hybrid of what you guys are talking about, which might be helpful. So at that, pro that process was an application process, um, and then the mayor did do a selection, but it was brought back to the council for ratification. Um, the critical part of that selection process was to ensure that those different sectors were represented. Um, and so my concern about one council member, one nomination, or one selection is that you wouldn't necessarily get the cross-section and diverse diversity um, that you would need in this type of um, task force or, or committee. So that might be something that you could consider. Okay, Council Member Myers and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Brown. You know, the intent I believe from my fellow council members and the mayor was to um, recognize that the community um, has really been uh, playing catch up with us in the last um, two and a half months. Um, there's been extensive um, 
actions, uh, motions made very late at night at midnight on um, a lot doing a lot having to do with homelessness prior to that uh, as the staff report uh, or at least the agenda report noted. There had been several adopted policy um, and programmatic approaches to homelessness. Um, and I believe that um, um, at least our intent was to try to create something that we could engage with our community through. And um, at this point, I, 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 if, if my fellow council members are, are uh, uh, amenable to this, I, I, I personally would just want, want to withdraw this uh, as an option. It's not, uh, this was not, this is not an intent to try to control anything or place people. This was to, um, to basically have our community have a conversation around this. And uh, I'm sorry if it comes across as some kind of sneaky thing that we're trying to do to get a bunch of people to talk about homelessness in a way that doesn't seem to be um, you know, supportive. Um, that was not our intent at all. So I think uh, we're gonna withdraw the uh, proposal. Thanks. So we have a motion to withdraw the proposal at this time. Um, Don't need a motion. Even. Oh, sorry. Withdrawing. We're withdrawing the motion of to form the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, which was, as Councilmember um, Myers uh, expressed, was an interest in trying to um, really engage our community as they've expressed interest in wanting to support uh, the city as partners in this effort. Uh, Vice, Mayor, Vice Mayor Cummings, uh, Councilman Brown, Matthews, Glover. Well, I think this is something that's very important because this is something that I had actually been discussing with members of the community and was gonna be preparing to bring a motion forward to actually convene one of these groups similarly. Um, so at this time, I mean, I think that it would be good if there's some way that we can work together to address some of the needs of members of the city council and bring this forward because I think that additionally, it's a, given what's happened over the past few months with a lack of community input and communication, I think that this is something that would really help for our community to be um, you know, in communication with and, and doing outreach. I also um, just wanna add to this, and I'm gonna add this in the form of a question to the, uh, to um, um, city manager, I just wanted to, to touch base and see what what was the task of the public safety committee? Because my understanding is that the public safety committee used to actually work a lot on homelessness, and I know they haven't met yet. And so I was just kind of curious if homelessness was one of the things that the, the public safety committee works on. Uh, you're talking about the city council public safety committee. Um, uh, the public safety committee has really focused on, and, and Susie is actually the staff, so she's actually worked on some of these projects, but they really focused on public safety related items. There has been some overlap, I, I suppose, with homelessness and the impact of homelessness, but it's primarily, primarily been focused on various public safety issues that have arisen. Uh, and people have, it has, it has become a forum for, for example, for people have come to talk about the concerns about needles and the finding of needles uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, Susie, do you wanna add more to that? So there had been a very deliberate um, decision to move away from the topic of homelessness as it relates to the public safety committee and not conflate those two things because I don't think it's necessarily appropriate. And so I think that what the public safety committee really did focus on was perceived behaviorals, uh, behavioral issues related to drug, property, mental health related crime. Homelessness was intertwined in those conversations, but that committee was very intentional not focused on status, but behavior. And so really the, the question of, of where homelessness should be considered was really part of the community programs committee, not the public safety committee. Okay. Well, okay. I just want to state that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna add the, the, other, the other concern that I would have with respect to, to the public safety committee. I think that the committees, their work should be aligned with whatever the city council's sort of work plans and priorities are. Um, and that you don't, you don't duplicate and uh, an overlap uh, discussion of issues. Um, and I think, I think we had some of that, which I think made it more difficult and confusing to move forward. So I would really recommend that you, you know, be clear about what are the objectives and issues you'll be working on. And if it makes sense for a public safety committee to take on aspects of that, that you know, then maybe you consider it in, in, from that context. Okay. I was just mentioning that because I thought that if, if we can bring this group forward, that it would be a good subgroup to have 
them report back to so that they're not reporting and then we can get a, a report back from those members of the city council so. in the interest of time and with the, in the kind of the context of complexity with all of the different items before us it sounds that there's interest in concept but not a consistent uh, council um, kind of uh, alignment in terms of structure so I think what we'll go ahead if we can we'll just go ahead and we've had this withdrawn as a potential action we can go ahead and move on if that is fine for the council at this time and we could revisit it at a future time in terms of structure. I want to, did you have additional com comments, Councilman Brown? No, I mean, I, I was just, I, mean, I can, I think we should have one of these um, community advisory committees. Um, the motion's been withdrawn in that case. I'm willing to move that we proceed with one. If we'd rather do that at a different time, that's okay with me too. Um, Second. I can make that motion. All right, so I'll m go ahead and move that we um, uh, develop an ad, uh, community ad hoc ad community advisory committee on homelessness with the composition um, kind of as delineated in the proposal that was just um, distributed um, with the, uh, I, the only, I believe that we talked about some changes, one of them being at least two um, representatives to cover the gamut of behavioral health, mental health, and uh, drug and addiction um, services, and s what else? The appointment process in terms and of how was, it would go. Through. Yeah, so I, I'll get there, but I'm talking about the seating before I go to nomination, or the appointment process. The, the other thing was just specification and clarity on the youth homelessness, uh, or specifically speaking about students experiencing homelessness. So do you, uh, because I mean, previous conversation, I was going to ask the question: Would you like to include um, a student? Because I think that would make sense. Yes. Um, okay. So we'll add student. Um, and you said you were going to get to the. Um, I'll, um, yes, but I'm, I'm just if, if people want to weigh in on makeup, we can do that, and then I'll move to um, the process for appointments. Or I can just do it all, and then you guys do it all. Back. And make all right. So, so that's my. So, with respect to um, makeup, that is my proposal. Welcome to you know, we'll entertain uh, additions, changes after I finish this. Um, potential members um, to be appointed through um, an application process. Um, and I would ask that, so I, I think that the, the mayor can make a recommendation uh, with, with recommendation to be made by the mayor, but that council members receive all of the applications and approve the recommendation made by the mayor based upon an application process rather than individual nomination. Second that. I think um, um, if I could, I'll just sort of say, you know, that was, um, it, although not, clearly sort of identified that was essentially a component that was encompassed in the original proposal, but I think we've gotten there. So um, at this point, uh, I know that Councilmember Matthews had some comments and then we'll go back to Councilmember Glover and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, I know that Councilmember <laughs> Cummings. <laughs> and I'm the night owl, um, had some other ideas. Um, I was going to suggest that he and Council Member uh, Myers, um, since they were the most interested in this, I thought go off and refine the proposal and come back with it. That's another idea. Okay. Yes, please. I think in terms of the fact that we have an additional item that I think is all really have high interest to the council in regards to strategic planning and work planning, um, that would make a lot of sense to me if that's the direction that the council feels comfortable in at this time. Would you be comfortable with us developing an application process at this point? Because I, I do think that we, in the abundance of need to move quickly, because we would like to have these engagement meetings in May, mm -hmm. I really think we should move forward with some aspect of this before the next meeting. Please. And I have, yeah, I have some thoughts on an application form or process that gives us some good information to go on. I think there should be references and that sort of thing. Okay. So if I could understand correctly, you're making a, a friendly amendment to the motion to essentially have some of this information then be deferred to Councilmember Myers and Vice Mayor Cummings for further consideration to also concurrently contain uh, a process for the application. Does that feel accurate? 
For your, the maker of the motion. Yeah. Your your um, additions or suggestions were substantive, or do you feel like this is okay going ahead with this version? The only the only additional item I was going to mention was that all members of this committee should work and or or should live and or work in the city of Santa Cruz and only two people from outside the city maximum could be on this committee. Support that. That's okay. kind of a standard procedure anyway. Okay. So would that be considered as a friendly amendment at this point? Okay. So we'll go ahead and um, pursue the original proposal um, with the additions made by Councilmember Brown and uh, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Um, and with the uh, additional language to incorporate the Santa Cruz City specific representation structure. Um, Council Member Glover? That was a friendly amendment, but I don't think it was ever accepted. Was that accepted as a friendly amendment? Yes. Okay. Uh, I look, uh, the language for Vice Mayor Cummings to be added, but not the direction to have them come together and do something separate and then go from there. That's right. It seems we that that has not it. been, uh, that's not been. Enough. And then my other thing was I want to make sure because it was uh, insinuated when the motion was withdrawn initially that this was because uh, the thought that it was some ploy to control something and or that there seemingly was a lack of desire for there to be community involvement by those expressing dissent and concern about the structure of the selection process. I think that's really uh, dangerous to make those assumptions without asking or for clarification. And secondly, uh, it's based off of experience that the when left to the decision-making process of a certain individual on the body, the results have not been equitable and distributed equally. So uh, that's the impetus. It's not because the pr proposal itself was to control anything, but that we have seen a pattern of a lack of representation in the decision-making when left into the control of one person. And secondly, no one ever said that community engagement was not important, and that's one of the most important things. In fact, I am the one that is coordinating conversations, community conversations around the community with large groups of community members so that I can educate them, can get their feedback and synthesize it in the policy. So I would just caution my colleagues to uh, think about what it is that they're inferring before they make statements suggesting uh, uh, motivations. Also, I wanna clarify just in this language that the selection process will be done by creating an application process that will then be voted on by the city council similar to the committee or the commission appointments. Is that, no. that, that that's my understanding? That's my understanding, yes. So correct. Um, Selected by the mayor. Mm. By the city council. Uh, just like the commission appointments. No, uh, no, it's selected by the mayor for comfort and then confirmation from the council. Okay. And uh, I, I just also point out that the applications will come to the city, to the city council for review. So, right. with the, so the mayor will select, we will be, we will have access and then it'll be ratified by the city council. I can accept that. Okay. Uh, qu so, question. Uh -huh. um, can, could we include a, um, a person who is homeless at the time they are selected for this? Uh, so you wanna, so was that changing the language community member with lived homeless experience, homelessness experience to a currently, a, a, member, a community member who is currently homeless? Yes, at the time of appointment. I accept that. Councilmember Matthews? <clears throat> who made the motion? Sandy, yeah, um, you know, leave it, I would leave it as is. It could be someone who is very recently gotten out of homelessness, who could. Okay, so it's with lived, with homeless, I think it's really encompassing of anybody who could potentially fit as a current or past or former um, homeless persons in our community. And, um, that could be explored based on the applications that we receive and interest in participation, depending on their setting. I'm sorry, I just, I thought I said um, current, homeless at the time of appointment, yeah. and that was accepted. I, I don't know if you wanna vote on that or not. Can I? We, have, we have the maker of the motion. The, well, the maker of the motion has um, conflicting feelings about this. I, I think, um, it's important that we have um, representation um, 
from somebody with lived homelessness experience, I agree that there may be cases where um, a person who has recently be became housed but has some uh, expertise or uh, you know direct experience, um, I mean, I wouldn't want to discount the ability of that person to, to participate or apply, so I'm a little conflicted about what to do here. I, I think the point is, um, People with direct experience with homelessness apply. We'll see what those applications look like and make a determination. Yeah. yeah. Is that okay? Right. Yeah. So, um, okay. Does that conclude the conversation on this item at this point? Okay. I will just go ahead. Would that friendly amendment accept it or no? No. At this time, it does not sound like it was. Because it was all encompassing based on the language like to, that's currently. I, I don't want to preclude right. somebody who was recently housed. I, I know, but but maybe that person can fit another category. If they're re recently housed, maybe they're in local business, maybe they're education, maybe they're employment. I mean, there's a real, a, I think, a real need and, and a category that a uh, currently homeless person fits that's not represented on this list. And we could look into that when we have the process into at a future time based on the applications that we receive, is my understanding. Okay. Fine. That's fine. I, I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna know the right person when we look at the applications. We'll find somebody who's representative. I don't want to. That's that's totally fine. Sounds like that's accepted. accepted. Okay. Um, is there any further further discussion? Okay. I will just, if I can, just to say, I um, I'm very committed to moving forward with diverse local stakeholder and subject matter representation across sectors. Um, given that this is a sector makeup, I um, you know, feel comfortable uh, making recommendations to eventually have ratified by the council as a whole. I know that's been uh, part of the discussion process in terms of um, overall trust in the process and uh, sector representation. I also just wanna say how um, supportive our community has been and saying that they are interested in participating in the solution um, and wanting to engage in all ways as uh, in terms of their time or their resources or advocacy in solutions. So um, that's the intention behind this item. Um, I recognize that there may be differing perspectives behind who is the right person to fit in the various subcategories, but diverse category representation is, I think, very essential in terms of that cross-sector uh, support that we're going for in this regard. So I um, look forward to seeing the applications and I will um, look forward to bringing some sort of recommendation to the council for further consideration at this time. Okay, so at this point, we'll go ahead and vote on the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So now we'll move along to 15.3 of, I'm sorry, yes, 15.3, which is the um, uh, item brought forward by Council Member uh, Brown and Vice Mayor Cummings in terms of an alternative strategy and how to move forward with the gateway encampment. And I'll go ahead and turn it to my colleagues to see if there's any type of uh, discussion or uh, further explanation or proposal that we'd like to bring forward at this time. I'd just like to make um, the first motion, which is to receive an update on the city county joint action plan for emergency shelter provision and encampment management, including efforts to identify location and resources for a permanent year round shelter navigation center, navigation day service center. Um, yeah, I was looking at that. Second, and uh, but I, I think what you're, I just want to clarify, you're talking about um, getting that update, receive an update at the next council at meeting. the next council meeting. Okay. Okay. So be, I'm sorry if you could please restate the motion. I'm not sure if I caught that. So is it? It's recommendation yeah, item number yeah, one. Room. Item one. Oh. Oh. Okay. So that was in addition to what we had today. Okay. Okay. So uh, motion for item number one, seconded by uh, Councilmember Brown. Any further discussion? Is there any um, staff input in regards to potential plans for this type of presentation already? 
Well, we, actually, we've already been directed to come back um, in April. That is part of the joint action plan to give an update on not permanent. So I wanna make sure that's clear to the council. The direction in the joint action plan is actually to come back in April, which likely will be early May at this point as to the fe feasibility of the interim navigation center, which is you know, what we had planned to open on or around July. So that would be the one distinction I would make between um, what the vice mayor um, is talking about and what we've actually already been directed to do, to do. So it seems like that wouldn't necessarily maybe occur right at the next council meeting, but sometime in the near future. And is already underway, particularly, because I think our two by two is also gonna be discussing that as well. And, and so what you're saying is we don't really need a motion, this is just already happening. I, I would say. I don't necessarily think so, and I also think based on what you just adopted with the Community Advisory Committee, there actually is a need to ensure that that public engagement process is also talking about siting and feasibility for the interim site, so we should, we do need a little bit of flexibility around timing, but we certainly can come with an update on the joint action plan, generally speaking, because um, there's elements that are around alternative shelter locations as well that we certainly could provide an update in, on. So do you want to withdraw the motion given yes. that? Yeah, I'll withdraw the motion. motion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to move on to the other? Sure. Components? Yeah. Right. So the next item is to direct staff to develop and implement an interim site management plan for the gateway encampment consistent with the measures outlined in this report and including camp cleanup, site sleeping space layout, installation of additional hygiene and security measures, and ongoing interim operations management with the management plan to go into effect. Um, I would actually change this language to um, say as soon as possible, just be, given the fact that we need to mitigate the public health concerns that are currently ongoing at the Ross Street Camp. Um, and I'd just also like to add in my, the language that we'll work with the fire chief to determine codes and standards for that site um, additionally. Second. So there's a motion by Council Member, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Cummings, seconded by Council Member Brown, uh, Council Member Matthews, and then uh, Council Member Glover. I, I wonder about the term interim, uh, maybe just deleting that, um, developing and implementing a site management plan for the gateway encampment. Sure. We're, we're expressing the intent that it will be closed, but um, so if we could do that. And then I believe the language that was requested by the fire chief was um, uh, uh, management plan for the Ross camp and any other encampments on public property. So that was not specific just to that, um, to deal with fire safety, health and welfare issues um, with the management plan to be delegated to fire and building professionals. So that was language that they requested. I'll accept that. Okay. Yep. I can accept. Okay, Council Member Glover. Yeah, I'd like to make a friendly amendment <clears throat> to that. Uh, that not only will staff develop and implement the interim site management plan for the gateway encampment, et cetera, but also that we as a body and staff will reprioritize transitional encampments for both the 1220 River Street site and the Ross encampment after it uh, is going through this revamp and instruct staff to in explore the potentiality or the potential nature of a partnership with Food Not Bombs and Ms. Cool for a third party management of a retrofitted Ross camp and with that, establishment of those two transitional encampments, which statistically cost tremendously less amounts of money, we can then split the funding between the two camps and offer quality service within each. This was a friendly amendment to the motion, or uh, I apologize, didn't, did you frame it in terms Friendly amendment. Okay, to the maker of the motion. I would say that what would be acceptable is if um, the staff explores third party individuals who can run the Ross Street Camp. I think that at this point we've we've come a long way and we've done a lot of work to identify Salvation Army for 1220. So I don't think that at this point in time that it would be appropriate for us to now then switch who our provider is given the fact that we're extremely close to opening up 1220. I think that that should have been something that was brought up if that was a concern back in um, like January or when these RFPs had gone out. 
I'm just sorry, Vice Mayor. I have expressed a concern and a uh, issue with the level of spending at the River Street Camp since we campaigned together. So it's not like it's new and saying, well, why didn't you say $75,000 was too much money before? I did many times. And uh, if there's the potential option for us to be able to find more cost effective ways of doing it, even though I brought forward language for transitional encampments, the, even though the staff, specifically the city manager, uh, didn't, didn't instruct his staff to figure out ways to establish transitional encampments, which are statistically less expensive. So I don't understand why there was this abandonment of the transitional encampment structure, but if there is even the possibility for us to be able to establish, even through the Salvation Army, a transitional encampment structure which will cost less money, then I don't know why we're not exploring that option. So if the city manager wants to respond to that, I saw some hand movements going on, but otherwise, that's where I'm coming from with this. and. It, it's, it seems foolish not to explore the most cost-effective data-driven options that we have available to us. I just don't see what the resistance is. So my understanding is that there was a friendly amendment made to um, modify the motion that at this point, based on the response from the maker of the motion, was not accepted. Is that correct? Not without clarification around, I mean, I, I think that it would be good to hear from the city manager because mine, because we've been making decisions on this and we've been voting on this now for the past few months and we've been voting around um, the opening of 1220 and this is the first time it's ever come up that there's been a concern and an issue with Salvation Army and so I have concerns around the fact that this wasn't addressed months ago when we had the opportunity for this for um, your recommendations and your proposals to come forward at that point in time so I would not be prepared okay. to accept a friendly amendment stating that we change who our service provider will be at 1220 especially given the fact that one of the issues we've had with setting up transitional encampments in the city of Santa Cruz is that we haven't had providers. And that's been stated repeatedly that we haven't had anybody stepping up as providers. Who, and so I think that that is a, a major concern right now at this point in time. Okay, before you respond, I have Council Member Brown and then any input from Council, by, by Martin Bernal. Right. Well, in addition, the uh, you know the RFP process that was uh, gone through the HEAP and, and cash process provided for that opportunity for anyone to submit proposals relative to um, transition encampments or any kind of shelter facilities. Uh, um, so that that was an opportunity to do that, but you know what we what we've been working on has really just been council direction specifically, and with respect to transitional encampments, there was a the charter uh, direction to look at to look at that, mm -hmm. but then otherwise it was to um, initially it was to identify sites uh, which they were identified, uh, and then for transitional encampment, and then the direction was then to look at uh, uh, a sleep sleep uh, sleeping zone, and the council. Uh, provided that direction and identified a site. So we haven't had direction to look at alternative uh, transitional encampment sites uh, at, at this point from the council. Okay. okay, Susie, did you want? Yeah, and just to further clarify, we don't have the ability to control the contract that is moving forward with Salvation Army. That is long past. It is tied to heap funding. Um, and so that is a HAP led process, not a city-led process, and so um, I believe that is off the table at this point. I think it's important to con consider what our purview is in this decision-making. And moreover, they're ramping up. I mean, they're in the process of hiring people and all of that, so yeah. Okay, I have a question in regards to, did you have further questions? I was next, yeah. Please, go ahead. Take it. So then. Oh. Uh, well, let's go ahead. Actually, you're right. You were next, and then I was reporting mm -hmm. back to you. Go so, ahead. I just want to make the statement here that um, as the second, I'm also not inclined to take the amendment, perhaps for a different reason though. What I see in this particular, in this motion is um, a direction regarding a short term plan related to specifically to the Ross, the gateway encampment. I don't like identifying it by a brand name. Um, the gateway encampment as opposed to what we're doing with 1220, what we're doing with transitional, potentially doing with transitional encampments. This is just specifically about this site now. Um, so that's why, um, but I, I do agree with um, Council Member Glover about um, the, the need to, to keep those other options on the table and I'm not sure that this is the place to do that is the only objection I have. 
Councilmember Glover, and just then talking I have a question, and then short term. Okay. Yeah, okay. I appreciate that feedback. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, with regards to the 1220 River Street site, as we found out earlier today, I was under the impression that there was still the uh, exploration of transitional encampment options moving forward, even though the charter agreement hadn't been completed yet, that the city staff was still looking at the best ways to be able to implement that as quickly as possible. After clarification from today's meetings, I understand now that from previous meetings, the instructions that you have received do not emphasize or prioritize transitional encampments, which was very discouraging. Uh, and I really appreciate, or disappointing, I guess I should say, not, dis not discouraging. Um, but with uh, the feedback I just received from Vice Mayor Cummings and uh, Council Member Brown, I'd be happy to rephrase the friendly amendment so that it would be to reprioritize transitional encampments, period and then uh, instruct staff to explore a partnership with, and now this is just because it's a th third party nonprofit and volunteers <clears throat> that have stepped up and said, hey, we'd be willing to, to manage a camp to explore partnership with Food Not Bombs and Ms. Cool for third party management of the camp site, because if, of, of specifically the gateway encampment, because if we're gonna have another structure that costs the same amount as the other one, because we adopt a heavy security, no ins and outs, constant supervision, fully staffed model, then we're just gonna be spending more money waste, wastefully. So um, I'd be happy to remove the 1220 River Street language out of there since that's uh, gone down the river already. Uh, but I would like to reprioritize transitional encampments and instruct staff to explore partnership with Food Not Bombs and Miss Cool for the third party management of the retrofitted gateway encampment. So that with the friendly amendment, is that adopted? I'll accept that. Is that accepted by the seconder? Okay, and then I have a question. Okay, so, okay. I Can guess I that answers my question, because I was I had a question in regards to the interim operations management plan, the cost of the plan, if it were to be something that was managed by the city and for how long and how the cost would then incur. But I guess that also would go to number three, which is essentially, if we're not se selecting a date, I can't understand uh, what short term might mean, but I'll go ahead and. Yeah, I just to get to the friendly amendment, what the, the public engagement process that you just approved Stage three focuses on that more challenging policy, long-term policy work, and trans as you'll notice, what you just adopted was to have this public engagement process and community advisory committee actually take up the question of transitional encampments. And the reason we had the project charter and the reason why you move forward with um, that, that language was table current consideration around transitional encampments in lieu of moving forward with a project charter is to focus on on engaging with the community. So I fear that the that the council is kind of moving back again to um, making hasty decisions about transitional encampments, where at the same time you already have policy direction that's been voted on both unanimously to ensure that the public has an opportunity to engage on that very subject. So I just wanna make sure you understand that there is some issue between consistency with, your, with the motions that you have brought forward today. Okay, Did you, well, okay, Council Member Matthews, and then we'll have you respond, and then back to the Council Member. I, um, for one thing, don't have clarity at this point on the wording of the motion right now, but my understanding of the intention of this was um, for moving as rapidly as possible towards closure of the Gateway campsite. Is that a correct? I'm, I'm just- My asking. intention behind this currently is that while the Gateway campsite is in existence, and given the fact that we've had a lot of public yeah. concern mm -hmm. around public health, we've had concerns around fire, that um, we've had a lot of concerns around public safety with regards to the camp, that what we need to do while we're, and, and the other issue is that we've been coming 
um, across a number of different dates that we've been set that we've been having to move for a variety of reasons, including having other options come online. In addition to that, um, now having to deal with some of the legal constraints with closing the potential legal constraints. And so what we're trying to do is mitigate those health and safety concerns right now while we get um, all of our alternatives figured out so that we can eventually close the camp when sufficient campground or non-campground emergency shelter beds are available. Um, my direction with this is to have staff develop and imp implement this management plan. If that includes considering um, other nonprofits to help manage the camp, including Food Not Bombs, um, if that, and from my perspective, um, the way that that site would be set up, I'm hoping would be that there would be offering some services, there would be some in and out policies. And so from my perspective, that in and of itself, if it's being managed, would seem like a transitional encampment. Maybe that's a different definition that, than what's been proposed. But for the purposes of this site, I, what I'm really trying to get at is that we need to manage the Ross encampment so that we can mitigate some of the health, public health and safety concerns down there. Okay. Um, I think it was, I can't remember. Well, I'll just, I, I asked a question, you a question so I'll okay, just continue, Mike. The, that's taking this thing in a completely different direction than I originally thought it was. I thought it was a uh, basically a physical logistical site management plan to deal with the really critical health and safety issues in the immediate time until the gateway camp could be closed. What I'm hearing now is it's uh, active management with in and out, um, you know, privileges and all. That is not what's going on there, and I don't see us setting that up. So I, there I want clarity on <coughs> what we're talking well, I, about. I think, I think that we're actually on the same page with regards to what this is supposed to be, because I think that what we need to do is we need to go in and create spacing. We need to... Um, pull out a lot of the trash that's in there. We need to deal with, the, the objective of this is to mitigate the public health and safety concern, um, which is what the concern has been while we explore not only trying to provide alternatives and get these other alternatives online, but deal with the legal constraints, as I mentioned previously. That's the intention of what, um, what I'm trying to move forward. I'm not trying to turn this into a permanent transitional encampment, um, but I imagine that currently we have um, public safety, public health officials going down and working with the individuals down there. I would imagine that we would be trying to get those individuals to move on to other services. So I, my understanding was that that would be a part of it regardless because it's already currently happening at the campsite. Okay. Uh, see Attorney Kandati. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I understood the initial motion to, um, to be designed to address immediate health and safety concerns while we move forward with an orderly process to um, to close the camp in view of the legal constraints that we're operating under. But I just want to remind the council that if you start talking about a longer term uh, city managed encampment, um, we are also talking about property that the city doesn't own. It's <coughs> partially Caltrans right of way and, and other state property. Um, and so I'm not sure that it's a viable alternative uh, transitional encampment location and, without and input from those agencies. Right, and can I add to that too, that I think it's only the, the city is the only one that can do that because to, as I understand it, to do um, I mean, to do this uh, program would require removing everyone over to some other temporary location. So we would have to sort of figure that out. I don't think we figured that out. Going in, cleaning, marking up, doing all the improvements and then having everybody come back or I do think there is a unique opportunity because we will, and I want to clarify this, and I tried to do it earlier, but it was out of turn, we will have to move everybody out to do this and then move everybody back in. And I think there is a unique opportunity to work with the camp council to ensure that we are moving forward together, even if it's a short period of time, to ensure, quite frankly, what's gonna be the most difficult process is adherence to the rules that are created by the fire chief, building department, and public health officials. And so we will need some internal coordination to ensure that that happens. So it's not just law enforcement, 
um, that's coming in there and asking to do that. So I think there is an opportunity to do that, but I agree with, with City Manager Mar Bernal that uh, this, this is something that the city is gonna have to do because it, there is gonna be a require, requirement to be really thoughtful about how to secure the location and how to ensure that what has happened now is not going to happen again. Okay, I, um, I, I, I have a quick couple of questions just in regards to where we're, where we're at and what we're talking about, if I, if I could. Um, I, I don't necessarily see how this isn't, um, I don't quite understand how what is being offered isn't essentially a uh, designated city-sponsored location until we get enough um, kind of adequate, adequate campground space available to close the camp, given that there has been a moving target in defining what adequate means. So for me, I think there is the risk of potentially making this the designated location, which is essentially um, the default designated location. And, and that's simply how I read that. I, I completely agree with the need to have a cleanup and a public health, uh, I, I see you and I will get to you, public health um, information, public health uh, di uh, inter interventions take place there. Um, but my concern is that without, with the ongoing operations management, then I don't know what that really reflects in terms of how we as the city then manages uh, the camp after that process ensues without further clarification on what uh, a timeline for closure um, means. <coughs> so I, I just struggle to understand conceptually how this how this actually plays out, other than um, a support and recognition that we want to have the location cleaned out. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and have the maker of the motion respond, and then I'll go ahead and go over to Councilmember Glover. I'd just like to say that we've now had to, we initially had March 15th as a date, that got changed to April 17th, which is now a vi not a viable date. And until we have a conversation with the ACLU on what it's gonna take for us to be able to, um, what, m what alternatives we're gonna have to have in place in order for us to close this site, we're, even if we set April 30th as the date, it, we are constantly coming back to this issue of changing the date. And for myself, I would find it, um, acceptable and I think that it will be helpful to actually have these conversations and be able to understand what we need to provide so that we can have a closure date. In the meantime, what my intention is with this motion is to try to deal with some of these issues, the health and safety concerns that we've been facing at the camp. Um, <coughs> if the proposal of the transitional models intention was to um, have this as a permanent site, then I would reject that friendly amendment. But if it, it is to be a site where we are trying to mitigate the health and safety concerns that we have been presented, then I think that that would be an okay a uh, amendment. Um, additionally, if staff is going to work with other members of our community to take into consideration working with Food Not Bombs and Alicia Cool, I think that that is um, something that they can take into consideration along with other nonprofit and volunteers in our community who might want to help with some of the work that's gonna take to mitigate some of these health and safety concerns. So I just wanna put that out there. Councilmember Member Glover. And then Councilmember. Member Thanks, yeah, I'm just confused about the confusion because uh, it's very straightforward. We don't have the shelter spaces available for people. We cannot close the, camp until we have the shelter spaces available. So we need to address the health concerns in the camp. The only way we can address the health concerns is if we retrofit it and get it so it's up to fire code and make sure we take care of the rodent infestation and other kinds of stuff. But if we, but if we do that and we don't have any kind of a structure system in place, then it's just gonna happen all over again. And if the city is responsible for managing it, it's gonna cost us an exorbitant amount of money. So so instead. Can you go ahead and put, I, I, I don't know who's speaking, but please, uh, please sir, lower your sign and please whoever is speaking to keep your voices to yourself. Okay, yeah, you can go ahead and leave at this time. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank continue you. with your comments. So then uh, with the, 
uh, with the partnership or exploring the potential partnership between Food Not Bombs and Ms. Cool, it allows us the opportunity to start creating a system so that if and when we do identify a transitional encampment location or a transitional encampment model that goes through the charter process, we'll have a nonprofit and an individual or group of volunteers that are experienced in working with the population and in a structure of what could transform into a transitional encampment, not at this site, but at another identified location later on. So just to clarify with the maker of the motion that this is not to establish the location as a permanent transitional encampment, but a way to mitigate the public health and safety concerns that are experienced by a non-managed camp and to save money so the city doesn't have to take on full responsibility of management. Okay, we have a, a Councilmember Myers and then. It, just in the interest of time, we have another item uh, tonight. I'd like to just call the question. Okay, so we have a motion to call the question by Councilmember Myers, seconded by Councilmember Crone. We'll go ahead and uh, call you the question. state the question. Well, the motion is to incorporate the friendly amendments that were that were added by Councilmember uh, Glover at this time. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. No. So that passes with Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Crone, and Glover in support, myself, Matthews, and um, Myers voting against. Okay. So I believe that concludes this item, Councilmember Glover. Can, can, can we be clear about what the friendly amendment was? I just yeah. want to be absolutely oh, clear. Do you want to reread it? Or do you want to actually, then do you have the, do you feel? Motion. We voted on an they, amendment. They accepted the, the friendly, friendly amendment. amendment was accepted by the maker of the motion. So it had been incorporated into the main well, motion. Actually, we voting on the actually went amendment. back and said that I was going to reject it if uh, the transitional encamp was supposed to be long term. It's not. But he, I think there was clarification that it was not. So just to clarify the language of the motion, or the amendment was to, uh, so reprioritize transitional encampments in the conversation just in general, like bring it back to the front burner so we can start talking about it. Uh, and just talking about it, doesn't have to be something we're implementing, but so that we're discussing it. Well, I'm gonna ask to reconsider the motion, because I did not think that that was part of it. Do you wanna strike that and just include the instruct staff to explore partnership with the groups? I think at this point, That's what, yeah. I'm just gonna go, I would like to withdraw or to um, reject the friendly amendment and to go back to the original motion um, to direct staff to develop and implement an interim site management plan for the gateway encampment consistent with the measures outlined in this report, including cleanup, um, site sleeping space layout, installation of additional hygiene, security measures, and ongoing interim operations management with a management plan to go into effect. Um, um, as soon as possible, and um, also take into consideration the recommendations made by the fire chief. Okay. I'll that second the, that. <laughs> so that motion Sorry, was made that has to be a motion to re oh. reconsider. That's a motion to reconsider the prior uh, action and my <laughs> to replace it with yeah. the, the motion that was just framed. Can we have a okay, so there's a motion to reconsider with the replacement of the motion that was just framed. Is there a second? Anna just did it. Okay. Anna, yeah. You so we are doing the motion that, yeah, okay, so the, the way that, that was, you the just motion read. Was placed out here, yeah. But are you, vote, uh, but this would no, be a vote to reconsider sin. that motion, not to vote in support of that motion. Yeah, exactly. yeah, okay, let's, okay. Probably would yeah, make more sense to just vote to, to reconsider the prior motion first and then to reframe a motion to, uh, um, as, as uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, um, Forth. Councilmember Crum. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor, could you clarify a little bit more what why you, you don't want to accept uh, the friendly amendment? At this point in time, my understanding with the language behind that is to bring back the con the consideration of transitional encampments. The consideration of transitional encampments has now been moved on to be one of the tasks to be considered by the community, and we also have. Um, a number of issues that staff are working on in relation to transitional encampments. So I don't, I don't think that at this time, um, especially given how much um, we've been proposing transitional encampments and a lot of these other models on the community that we need to bring this back at this point in time. I think that at this point, what we're really trying to do is mitigate some of the health and safety concerns that we have with the camp and allow staff the opportunity to come up with a management plan of the camp uh, as we pursue other alternatives to closing the camp and also finding alternatives, sheltering alternatives throughout the community. 
I think that the intention is that we focus on what we're, what's happening right now in front of us and that we're not bringing back transitional models at this point in time. So you mentioned something about Food Not Bombs and Ms. Kuehl um, participating in this. Or take that up. I want to leave it, I'm going to leave it up to staff to identify people within the communities. I know that when the staff was working on the safe parking program, that they were reaching out to members of the community to help work on that program as well. Um, I think that it's been expressed through the city council tonight that Food Not Bombs and Ms. Cool are both interested in working on this. And so if staff wants to reach out to them, I think that that's fine for them to take them into consideration and to explore working with them. But I think that at this point in time, the motion is to direct them to develop this plan as best they see fit. And so even if we, and, and so I think that that's what I would like to stick with at this point in time. Okay, so we first need to have a motion to resend the previous council action is what I'm understanding is the best course moving forward. Is there a motion to resend the previous council action? I'll make the motion to resend the previous council action. There's a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings to resend the previous council action. Is there a second? Yes. We had vote, seconded to mm -hmm. resend that action. Yeah. Okay, Council Member Matthews seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. Okay, so that passes with Councilmember Myers, Brown, Matthews, myself, and Vice Mayor Cummings in support. So the new motion is now to incorporate um, the original recommendation minus any additional language proposed um, and uh, to uh, continue with a public health management plan while the gateway encampment con continues on. Is that correct? With the incorporation of the recommendations made by the fire chief with the incorporation of the recommendations made by the fire chief. For me, I just will say without um, understanding what a uh, final date could be and without clear understanding, which I know that the courts don't have clear understanding of, of what constitutes efficient campsite um, and campground uh, availability, it feels to me that we are by default making that our uh, safe sleeping or transitional encampment. And I don't feel comfortable with that. I do feel comfortable with with all of the uh, considerations regarding the public health and safety concerns, as well as the fire management plan, 100%. But to um, create an interim operations management plan feels to me like um, without a target date or potential inability to manage who comes in and out um, feels to me like a very difficult way to move forward at this place, at this time. So I won't support um, the motion for that reason. If we wanted to parse out the uh, ability to clean out the camp, I'd be happy to do that. But at this time, I, I'm not sure if there's interest of the council to do that, but I'll just maybe make it for the record that I support the public health interventions, but not the interim location for the management of that being our uh, kind of default location for this type of shelter. Okay, so we have a motion made by Vice Mayor Cummings to move the recommendation. I believe that was seconded by Councilmember Brown back to the original. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 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 Mm -hmm. so that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings in support, Councilmember Matthews, Myers, and myself voting against. Councilmember Matthews. And I would like to go on the record as supporting fully the uh, public health and public safety measures on this mm -hmm. for the immediate future. I would echo that for record as well. And for the record, as I've mentioned many times tonight, I agree as well. Um, our highest priority does need to, pr to be providing uh, uh, addressment of those kinds of things right away. Thanks. Okay. It seems to me that, the, okay. that you all want um, health and uh, without people. <laughs> you want to just like clean up, clean up, health, health, but no people are involved. So um, I'll go on the record saying that I think people should be involved with health and safety at the camp and that it should be for the people uh, who live there. I think that you, you um, I will just, um, I appreciate that we all are trying to come up with solutions regarding the people. And I think that we have different pathways that were proposed this evening in regards to address the people, which include the health and environmental impacts um, affecting the people there, as well as the surrounding area. So I would just um, express that there is a consistent commonality amongst every one of us here seeking solutions to support the people in our community. It's just the pathway moving forward. I think there's a difference of opinion on, um, but um, 
we'll go ahead and uh, move along at this point because we still have more items to get to. So we'll go ahead and close item number 15. And now we're on to our evening item, which is snow. Excuse me. We have Mayor. that calendar. Excuse me, Mayor. Councilman McGovern. You were looking that way when, before you closed the uh, item and I have my hand up. Um, we heard earlier from the community that there were uh, 20 points uh, recommended by a 2017 task force for action um, with regards to the topic of homelessness. So I would love to make a motion for us to get a report on those 20 points recommended in the 2017 task force and bring them back for action at the next city council meeting. There's a motion by council member Glover. I'll second it if it's get a report on the, uh, on, and then we can decide about whether or not where we're gonna take action or not. Right. I would like to get some I think within the last six months, you've get you've gotten an update on the Homeless Coordinating Committee 20 point recommendations. And then it's also part of the, the process for which the Community Advisory Committee would be considering um, what what is the current progress with the 20 points, 20 point recommendations, as well as providing an, an update to that plan. So I think that's really embedded in this community advisory committee process. Thank you for the reminder. I'll withdraw my second. <laughs> okay, so it seems that that is in our agenda brew packets for review and will be forthcoming, I'm assuming, in a future time. Okay, so that second was withdrawn by Councilmember yeah, Brown. It's in the packet, but we can't have action on it. So it, it, we can't like look at it and talk about it and say like, hey, you know, let's implement this because it's important to do it. And I get it that it's a part of this community engagement process, but that's slated to be done in February of 2020 at the latest. So why is it, why can't we just discuss it at the next meeting? I don't see what there's a resistance about. I don't know why you withdraw your second Governor Brown, but it's confusing as to why there's resistance on this. Okay, well, the other um, thing I would add, and I, you, if you're happy to respond if you like, is that we have uh, other city business to conduct. Um, and so um, given that there has been an update most recently and that's in our packet, and there will be continual updates moving forward um, that I wouldn't support it for the same reasons that it sounds like we are at a place where we need to be for now. So, um, okay, that was withdrawn as a, as a, as a second. Is uh, there an additional secondary of the motion at this point? I, I guess I just want to respond to Councilmember Glover's question. I'm just withdrawing the second because the clarification for me was that we are going to have opportunities to hear more about um, the, you know, the status of those recommendations and, and potentially take action in the future. So. I don't wanna force it into the next council meeting in that way. I do wanna make sure that we continue to um, hear about it and, and take action. Okay, great. So at this point, we'll move on to the meeting count. Oh, you have additional. Yeah, I just want, um, I've had a number of discussions with members of the city council and um, around scheduling. And so I just wanted to make a motion to direct the city manager to contact the public safety committee members this week to schedule a public safety committee meeting um, where they can have an opportunity to address public safety concerns that are including but not limited to um, concerns around um, public safety concerns related to homelessness. Second. So there's a motion to... Uh, can, can I comment on that? Uh, you know, the request has been, the question has been asked, uh, and I think I've responded to a member of the public with respect to why the committee hasn't met. And the answer to that is that Susie is the staff to that committee, and Susie has been working 100 plus percent on homelessness issues. So it's not the lack of interest in wanting to hold a meeting, it's just that we just don't have the staff capacity at this time to hold, uh, to plan for and coordinate those meetings. That's been the challenge. So just so you know, it's, it's, it's really just, staff If capacity. I could just add, um, and, I'll, and then mm -hmm. please Susie, one of the things that we have in our next agenda pa item is to talk about a work plan and to think about a strategic planning process because this is not the only subcommittee that's been put on hold in regards to our city uh, work that we could and have potentially had underway. So when we're thinking about prioritization and scheduling and agendizing uh, various types of meetings given our constraints for capacity and and um, the lengthiness of these, this specific topic over the past several months, really, um, I think we could maybe have that conversation when we talk about the work plan. So that would be my. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, 
the necessity for the next public safety committee is the police auditor report. Um, that is something that is long overdue so that we actually have an agenda that we need to we need to do as quickly as we possibly can. Um, so um, I would recommend that we, we do in the next week or so <laughs> schedule that so we can move forward and get that business taken care of and then we can move forward with um, returning to the public safety committee around work plan development that hopefully would be concurrent with your strategic planning process. How often did the Public Safety Committee meet last year? What was the regular, what was the schedule? Was there a regular schedule? Uh, there, there was a regular schedule. It was every other month. Um, and they really did focus on issues that arose um, that were outside of the city council's work plan, um, kind of on an ad needed basis. And they had spent the previous, I would say full year trying to develop a very specific work plan that they were not able necessarily to achieve. Um, so the intention for this year was to regroup around developing a work plan that was consistent with what was happening with the council and to um, remark about what Martine was talking about, you know, we are d very deliberately trying to ensure that the committees are expressly fitting in with the charge of those committees, which is to work within the framework of council direction and council, council focus, and that has um, long been a challenge with our subcommittees, and so um, there is a significant amount of work to do to ensure that we move forward and have those committees actually doing the work that they um, are really intended to be, to, to be doing. Thank you, I would move just to call the question and um, get this committee meeting. Is there a second to the call of the question? Second. Okay, Councilmember Crone called the question. Councilmember Glover seconded. And the motion is? To schedule a public safety meeting to talk about homelessness and other issues. Uh, I, I would. And the auditor's report, it sounds like. The auditor's report. So I would request that the vice mayor <coughs> consider the um, information provided by staff and work with staff offline. On the public safety committee? Oh, oh you're not even. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Three of us. I mean, okay. I, I, j just Second. honestly, I, I think we have to respect the workload that's being put on our staff. The auditor's report is hugely important. It's a big deal. Um, and the idea of syncing up the um, public safety committee work program with the uh, citizens advisory committee makes a whole lot of sense to me. And, and. To my mind, normally the idea of um, scheduling a meeting or something like that is less productively done by a motion and a second and a date that's two weeks from now rather than consultation. And Just to so remind the council that there is a motion to call the question on the floor. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. No. That passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings in support, Matthews, Myers, and myself against. Okay, so now we vote on the motion. Vote on the motion. Okay, we'll go ahead and vote on the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. That no. passes again with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings in support, Matthews, Myers, and myself voting against. Okay, so now we can conclude that item and move to our meeting calendar. And I'll look to our city clerk because I believe we do have some updates. There were... Um Two special meetings added to the calendar for department presentations ahead of budget, budget hearings. Um, December 16th, uh, December, sorry, <laughs> April 16th and May 7th. And I, I sent you guys meeting invites, mm -hmm. so it should be on your calendars. Can you say that one more time? Uh, April 16th with a start time of four o'clock and May 7th with a start time of 12 p.m. Okay. Thanks, Dean. All right, so. What are the special meetings for again? They are budget. for department, yeah, uh, department head presentations ahead of the budget hearings okay. that have been postponed. Sorry, thank you. That's fine. Okay, so at this time we'll go ahead and move on to our remaining agenda item, which was originally calendared for 7.30 p.m. this evening, um, and that's the count city council work plan and strategic plan. Um, we have a brief PowerPoint, did we, 
have that set up? It is set up on the staff computer and I'm happy to help um, <laughs> the mayor walk through this because we actually haven't had a chance to talk about it because of our meeting today. Thank you. So all in the interest of time, um, I'll just briefly uh, go through the PowerPoint and allow for staff to weigh in as uh, interested. Um, so one of the things that in the staff, re if not staff in my report to um, move forward with a work plan and strategic plan was a response to why we haven't been able to move forward. And in summary, I think um, without going into detail, as the uh, report indicates, we've had a number of really high community interest items before us um, on a regular basis. Um, and as a result, we have been unable to really get to uh, the process around uh, work plan and strategic planning. Um, turns out I actually love strategic planning. I particularly enjoy it. So I was very happy to hear that the council was wanting to make this a priority and that is also why I felt it would be appropriate to make it our evening session. I have to say I am a, a bit disappointed that it's at 11 p.m. that we're only now at this time able to get to this. But I think what ultimately this does is just set the process in place, um, knowing that we'll have the ability if approved by the council to move forward um, um, with that more robust conversation in, re in regards to the content. So essentially it's coming up with the framework and going over the framework with you all at this time. Okay, and if that, I think that summarizes. So if we'll just briefly, um, without kind of getting into um, the details, We've had a, a two-year work plan, July 2017 to June 2019, um, that was generated by uh, the prior council, which was comprised of a few of our council members remaining, and ultimately created a work plan that uh, that worked on how to incorporate our vision for the city and the community and also have a roadmap for making service delivery, delivery decisions and allocating resources given the um, reality of not having as many resources to do all that we want to do, unfortunately. And so there's a prior, there was a prioritization process that ensued with programs and policies um, uh, put into place to achieve these uh, priorities and ultimately um, work towards improving the quality of life in our community. As you can see from the title of the slide, the work plan is expiring and so um, it is now an opportunity for the council to sort of revisit the work plan and um, what might look at it, what it might look like in terms of a process moving forward without getting into content as I said last earlier. Susie, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, okay. Or, or, or Martin, please. Um, so the work plan and decision making process on the next slide, yep. Um, would essentially encompass the immediate and long-term needs and would recognize that we had prior council direction and up count, upcoming council uh, calendar items. So really how do we build on previous work? I know Councilmember Brown and myself um, had an opportunity to serve on the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee and there's a lot of really great foundational work there. Um, and then also looking at how we use our limited staff time and capacity to take on um, where the council sees hopefully a common in terms of policy objectives and priorities. Um, and then looking forward towards a strong kind of knowledge base for decision making and study sessions um, in terms of how do we uh, ensure that we have as much knowledge as we possibly can when thinking about some of our policy directions, um, given that it's often very difficult to get to the place where you feel completely comfortable all the time. Um, it would look at terms of how do we have a work plan that would be uh, uh, effective and collaborative governance. Um, and what I, uh, along with staff, are interested in proposing is a full day facilitator-led facilitator retreat um, to develop that sort of intermediate uh, work plan for the remainder of this year. Um, but simultaneously, one of the um, 
opportunities we have is to have a current sort of work plan to, man, to manage the upcoming council meetings um, and the priorities for what we want to accomplish, but then looking at how do we go um, a different route this time in terms of updating our strategic operational and accountability plan, um, uh, separate, essentially uh, separate from the work plan, but um, concurrent to it. And that would be a more inclusive process that would look at some of the longer, sort of three years uh, interim, but longer term needs, um, have some strategic direction um, and um, incorporate the community in the priority, state, priority setting. And this would be uh, facilitated as a, um, a council and community and staff process over a four to six month strategic planning um, timeline. Susie. So I will just add to um, give real tangible context to the need for a work plan for the remainder of this year. And I will use homelessness as an example. This is not sustainable. It's destroying staff morale, quite frankly, to have these long meetings and to continue to push staff to move forward with <clears throat> items that we are not prepared to do. So uh, that needs to happen and the council does need to um, ensure that you are talking about staff capacity when you're thinking about policy objectives for the rest of the year. Thank you, Susie, I appreciate that and um, acknowledge all the hard work and very difficult timelines and uh, pressure the staff has been on, so I appreciate your comments as well. <clears throat> I also, um, I want to um, go ahead and we'll go ahead and move forward with the timeline and essentially um, in a more visual uh, demonstration we have is the opportunity to hold a one day retreat to develop a 2019 work plan um, and that would uh, be uh, that temporary or sort of interim work plan. And then having the one day retreat to really talk about as a council, what do we envision the strategic planning process to look like? And then between July and, and December, having that process take place with uh, community engagement, priority setting and facilitated council sessions um, with ultimately um, returning in, the, in, the, in February of 2019 that we would have a strategic and operating accountability plan before us for potential adoption that would cover the years of 2019 to 2022. 20, uh, so, um, excuse me, Mayor, um, 2019 or is it 2020? I don't get that. Oh, sorry. It is 2020. Sorry. Yes, thank you. 2020. And the year goes by fast. Okay. So the recommendation before us this evening that I um, am seeking our council approval on is to calendar a special city council meeting to develop a work plan for the remainder of 2019 and to initiate an inclusive planning process to build a three-year strategic plan and obtain consultant support to facilitate these planning efforts. Um, before we potentially move into um, the remainder of the discussion, I maybe would ask if any of the council members have specific questions and um, and then we'll go ahead and open it for public comment in return for action and deliberation. Council Member Matthews? Quick one, if you could go back to that previous slide or just everyone look at this slide. So May 2019 is a one day retreat to develop a 2019 work plan. <coughs> would that be for the remainder of the 2019 calendar year? Yes. Yes. Calendar right. year, I suppose, yes. fiscal year. And then June 2019, hold a one day retreat to develop a strategic planning process. And that's Three -year to, planning. to develop the process that then would be carried out over the next six months. Perfect. And that would be for a three year plan. Got it. So it's sort of a work plan management proposal. Um, based on sort of the, the rapid um, movement of the council for the end proposal for the next few months, while also initiating a more inclusive community process at the same time. And I, I guess the only other thing that occurred to me in June 19, we will have just gone through the whole budget process for the 2019-20 fiscal year, 20, 2020 fiscal year. So that will set the stage for the first year of our Strategic plan. Your strategic plan. Yeah. And the budget, budget. I think the budgets up. will absolutely. Yeah. Right. That's right. Because uh, you'll be making some major budget decisions and learning about what the what you'll be able to work with uh, the next uh, plan. 
Okay. Are there any additional questions, Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Cron? Uh, it's a commenty question, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so I'm I'm all for proceeding in this manner, in particularly um, getting us to uh, our work plan for the immediate future. I think that is absolutely critical. Um, with respect to the longer term strategic planning process, I also agree that we ought to be doing that, but I do have some reservations about um, approving that now without any consideration of the co the potential cost, how, you know, when would and how would consultants be hired? I mean, an outside facilitator for both of these meetings makes sense to me, but I'm concerned about um, talking about a consultant for some big strategic planning process. Um, when that that could be very, quite pricey, and um, so I'm I'd I'd rather just stick to the basics of what we know we need an outside facilitator, and then make those decisions about future costs at a at a work plan meeting. And this this is just approving it in concept with costs potentially returning. I, I think that's essentially what's what's being proposed here because the there'd be the two retreats uh, that would be facilitated, but the second retreat with respect to the long term three year plan, the council would discuss the process and therefore also talk about what that would mean as far as cost and approach uh, in that, and then make a decision after that. Um, Council Brown. I'm just wondering the uh, idea of a three-year work plan compared to two-year work plan that's been happening, I guess. Uh, I don't know, when did the two-year work plan start and why three-year now? I can answer that. The three-year work plan was proposed because the two-year work plan started right after we were elected and it was a really short turnaround. That was the first one? That was the oh, first one. And so this allows a buffer time for uh, a new council to, if thinking of forward beyond our time, to have that a transition time of getting adjusted to the council role, um, the council work and the work of our city. Um, so it kind of gives a little bit extra time in that regard. And I'll let Susie answer. Yeah, and it time. also um, causes the expiration to be on a non-election year, which I think is really important. So we don't have brand new council members, much like you were when we first did this um, work plan two years ago, that were just you know, forced into decision making before you had an opportunity to get more up to speed on city business. But my other question is, um, I'm not. I'm not sure it makes total sense, but maybe you can l help me out to have the strategic planning process after the budget is set for this year. It's, a, it's like when you want to have strategic planning, what we're going to go forward to and maybe uh, pr learn about priorities of the council and then budget for it. No, so the May 2019 is ahead of hopefully the budget process or at least the final ratification of the budget. Um, and the June 2019 is really just to develop the process for which we will actually go through likely a six to eight month process to do the strategic planning, not in and itself developing the priorities. So which day in May would that be? That'd be like the third day, we, uh, week in May? We're looking on the consultant's availability potentially. So. We, did you find a date? No, okay, no, we'll but yeah. you know, the intention is to um, have it on perhaps one of your off Tuesdays for, for instance. The 21st, it looks like, in May. It, we, we have to figure out who is available to do the work and there's, uh, you know, there's prep that's needed as well. And what, what, what's the cost of the consultant to just um, revisit what Councilmember Brown is saying? A, a ballpark, 30,000, 25,000, 10,000? Not 000. for f one day, for oh, one no, day. One day, no, for the whole strategic process. I thought we were talking about having. Oh, uh, we would not know have that information at this time, but it could be anywhere from twenty to $30,000 maybe. This really depends on what on the process and how uh, extensive it is and, and what you want to include in it. So it and really it, and that, that conversation will happen when we decide and have a special retreat on determining the process that we all feel is inclusive to the level that we want it to be, but also gets us to the place we want to be for a strategic plan. And I don't think that's uncommon for an organization to invest in generally for a strategic planning process. And the budget hearings are May 8th, so we still might have that one day after the budget hearings. Mm -hmm. Possibly, but the, the, the one day uh, retreat is to develop a work plan in terms of council priorities for the remainder of the year um, without sort of, and then while having the strategic planning process happen underway. Same time. 
Thanks, Megan. Um, I had two questions. One is just trying to understand, given the two-year work plan, is there any way to get a report back on um, what was laid out in that work plan and then what was achieved or how far the, the council, the previous and current, deviated from that work plan? Just to understand whether or not um, when those work plans, because it sounds like there's a lot of work going into creating this work plan. And um, I just want to have a good understanding of whether or not these work plans, how, how often they're adhered to, because it, I think it could be a, a big waste of time if we put all the effort into creating this plan and then we don't, and, and if it, in previous years it hasn't been adhered to or stuck to, then it might be a waste um, of time. I would say that, I mean, a lot, a lot of it has been completed, yeah. mm -hmm. actually a good chunk yes. of it. Uh, and uh, certainly when we do the retreat, we can you know, update you on that as well or any other time. But And there, I believe there was a memo had, that had gone out in the past in regards to updates on the work plan that I'm sure we could recirculate. Yeah, we could recirculate that too. Councilmember Matthews, and then I, maybe I'll open it up to public comment. Or did I, just, you have I had a second question. Okay, go ahead. Do, is there any opportunity for us to see um, kind of calendars of what's being worked on at this point in time so that we have an understanding of currently what staff are working on so that we're not, because obviously there's gonna be some time in between when we're gonna have this retreat, when we're actually gonna have the 2019 work plan accomplished. There's gonna, we're gonna be wanting to take actions on different things between now and then, so is there a possibility to get a calendar so that we can see what staff are working on, have a sense of how we can be respectful of staff's time as we're bringing things forward. And I'm assuming when you're saying staff's time, you're anticipating city manager staff or all department heads? The, the workers. <laughs> oh, I, I think, I mean, I'd be, I, I'm just not quite clear in terms, I mean, we have our water department doing their water work. I mean, so what um, were you hoping to get answered? Just primarily the work of the city manager's office? Is that Yes. Right? Okay. Well, well I, I mean, would, it would yeah. be good to have as many you know, calendars as possible so we can have a good understanding for bringing things forward. You know, if it's water related, how does that fit into what the water department's currently working on? If it's public works related, how does that fit into the plan that they're currently working on? And, and what these different um, department heads are addressing because obviously um, we have a lot of issues that we, and there's gonna be the desire to bring other issues forward, so. And I'll just remind the council that we did agendize uh, uh, many uh, uh, individual pl uh, department presentations to help understand what they've been working on, which have been postponed because of the uh, uh, amount of agendized items, particularly around homelessness. So that will be forthcoming in terms of what they're working on and what the work that they do um, includes. And, and hopefully, hopefully this is helpful, I would, fully imagine that to prepare the city council and the community for this one day retreat, a strong basis of that conversation would be what is currently calendared and you would get that ahead of time so you could consider that that within the context of whatever you're prioritizing for that full day retreat. So I, mean, I certainly can come back maybe with the city manager's report over the next couple meetings and talk about that process and when you might be getting that information as individual council members um, to facilitate with um, the work that you need to do to prepare for this May retreat. That would be great. Okay. okay, so if we could, maybe we'll see if there's any member of the community that would like to address this. Okay, I see one, is that correct? Okay, we'll have one member of the community. You'll have up to two minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, Susie, I really uh, just want to say that I really sympathize and appreciate. Uh, I've been an, going to a number of whatever meetings I could go to. I went to Harvey Milk for the uh, for the facilitation day and just sat in on that. I've been to the HAP meeting where the staff outreach to the Association of Faith Communities. And the reason I'm saying this, it might sound like I'm trying to toot my own horn here, but the, the real reason I'm saying this is that it really so seems to me that we need to hire more city staff. But I'm saying that facetiously because I know so completely nothing about a lot of these processes. but. If we could usher in staff to help the staff, that's one thing. And it's probably a ridiculously simple solution that I'm suggesting, but I really have noticed that our entire city is so dependent on these people and they are just a very few and they're doing just tons and tons and tons of stuff. It's just not humanly possible. Thank you so much for everything you've attempted. And I think I just wanna also say, I've seen surprising discussion points. I've seen 
members of the city council that I completely disagree with and basically despise a lot of their longtime policy actions. Nevertheless, weighing in on issues, and there have been new discussions, thanks to city staff leading a lot of this, and I think real concern, even if we completely disagree. But I just wanna end by saying, I, I can't overstress that I think we are in a paradigm shift that our way of doing business has been dependent on financial models, and I wish I had more time, but I just really think we need to have content models. The homeless issue has brought enormous uh, difficulties, but it's also been ignored for the last 16 years and just shut, you know, pushed away. Anyway, sorry, didn't really get to say can I, can I just add one thing? The, the other thing, just to, to get back and answer, you know, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings' uh, question a little bit. It's also important to recognize that you know, over 80%, I think we did this analysis before, like 83% of our time is spent on the things that we have to do, the day-to-day -day things. I mean, because we're not spending all of our time working on all the special projects or the new initiatives or all the new direction. Uh, m m the majority of it is spending on the day-to-day -day things. I mean, Susie, even in our office, Susie has certain responsibilities and duties that they do, they have to do every day. I mean, so do I, so does Tina, we have to run the organization, we have all kinds of, personnel issues, uh, all, there's a whole variety of different activities that we do every single day to run the organization uh, and all these various functions and duties and responsibilities. And so the amount of time that we can spend on new initiatives and project is really a very limited resource. And that's a part that we will, we'll, we'll talk about that more at the retreat, uh, but it's not like, uh, We've, you know, we've got staff that is simply dedicated 100% for the purposes of working on new initiatives and, and new projects. We just don't have that in, or throughout the city or in our office. Okay. Thank you, and we'll return for action and deliberation. So, Councilmember Mike. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, make the motion then to calendar a special city council meeting to develop a work plan for the remainder of 2019 and initiate an inclusive planning process to build a three-year strategic plan and obtain consultant support to facilitate these planning efforts. Right. I'll second the motion. Oh, okay. So motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by myself. Um, any further discussion? Did you have a discussion of uh, point, Councilmember Glover? No, no, just the, the seconding seemed strange, but that's okay. Nothing, nothing we need to talk about. <laughs> I'll just only echo that um, bringing the person, being the person who brought forward the item, it feels great for me to second the item. And I'm all for strategic planning and work planning. So that being said, we'll go ahead and uh, take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes unanimously. I wanna remind the council that we are only now adjourning to the remainder of our closed session, which was a postponed uh, uh, potential litigation item that will return to the courtyard conference conference for, correct? That's right, it's specific, it's to discuss pending litigation, the Hatch Pomerantz versus the city of Santa Cruz uh, uh -huh. lawsuit. Okay, so we'll adjourn to uh, closed session.